was safe Curriculum changed PCP has gone and got a court case It's proof of the deniers Revealing all the liars UNESCO co-conspirers Stealing away your rights as a parent A guardian Remove your right to disagree Chosen from the age of three Exposing kids to CSE Change the name to RSE It's mirrored inequality Legally made it mandatory Dictated by the GOV Hello everyone and welcome. This is our 12 hour live podcast-a-thon. So this is a sponsored event, guys. We are doing this hopefully to raise a lot of money. So oh, and there's our girl by there. Look, we started without her. Hello. We started without her. Hello, lady. Sorry I'm late. It's fine. It's literally just started, Louis, a second. So you go ahead and do the introductions. Go on. Oh, brilliant. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone who's already watching. That's brilliant. So, yeah, we decided to do this uh, this 12-hour podcast-a-thon to raise awareness and also raise funds. Um, we're PCP Wales, as many of you know. Um, we have been, well, we've been leading the fight in Wales uh, against the RSC, that's Relationship and Sexuality Education, that's coming to schools uh, across Wales, well, coming to every school in Wales, already in England, Ireland and Scotland, and many of us are very, very concerned. So I don't know how far you went, Kim, if you actually went as far as saying about the court case that we're waiting for the judicial review um, results. Um, yeah, so five claimants, and Kim, you were leading those claimants, weren't you? You were the main claimant there, had taken the Welsh Government to court on the 15th and 16th of November. And um, yeah, it was a very, very good court case. Um, the, the High Court judge did actually hear, it was brought in front of the, the High Court judge, that the Welsh Government have been misleading the public. The, the Welsh government has said this is a Welsh, this is a Welsh education, Welsh sex education for Welsh children. However, it was brought in front of the High Court judge that, in fact, it was a part of a global rollout already, something which is already in 52 countries. And it is based on the, the assumption that children are sexual from birth. So we all need to be worried about this. So mo the main point of this podcast is, on, is to raise awareness, but also to raise funds because we still need funds to ensure that we can carry on with this court because we don't know the results, but we are expecting them today, aren't we, Kim? Well, that's, the jury's still out on that. Um, yeah. There has been some emails flying about and some whispers. So... We don't quite know, guys, so stay tuned. Yeah. Um, if we get, um, if we do get an idea that the judgment is coming, we will put it across the bottom of the screen for you to stay tuned. So if that comes today, it will be live, okay? There's absolutely nothing we can do. We couldn't cancel this podcast. We can't obviously stop what's coming. So if it comes today, it's going to be, guys, we're going to have our hands full. You're going to actually see us running around live on air like blue ass flies. Um, yeah, we're just going to wing it today, guys. Like I said, it might come, might not come. Um, but there has been a bit of a whisper, so that's something for people to look out for there. Before we go any further, I'd like to play um, a video, because that video that we did of, of everybody in Wales, I'd like to play that to start us off, to show that we are a common sense group we are a coalition we're a diverse diverse group and we're also inclusive so if you guys got no objections there i'd really like to start us off in our video if that's okay yeah brilliant guys let's see if this works then Hi, my name is Shafkat Khan from Newport. Myself and my community, we're against the sexualizing of our children through these RSE lessons. We will continue to struggle and fight and ensure parents have the right to withdraw their children from such classes. Do you have any hokabach pedoroid? Do you have an erbyn or RSC? Do you have a medal to the plants bach, Kali Viski, Hina Ogupol, and a Dospath? Ex youth and community worker. And Christian against RSE. Mothers against RSE. As a parent, I have the right to keep my children safe from harm. And as children, they have the right to be educated without being indoctrinated. Please let children be children. Say no to RSE and save our children. 
Hi, I'm mother of four. I am Polish mother living in Wales and when I find out the content of the RSC lessons on the Scottish website, because for some reason I couldn't find on the Welsh, I am against it. It's very harmful and very appropriate for the children. Just stop RSC lessons, please. The parents and guardians should have the right to decide what their children are taught, not the government. I am against the government forcing RSC materials on children. I am against RSE being a mandatory subject in our children's schools. RSE is comprehensive sexuality education and is a say yes to sex positive education. Mother of three, say no to RSE. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm a mum with three grown up children. I've been following and supporting Public Child Protection Wales for the last two years and I'm against RSE. I'm a parent who is so against RSE, I pulled my children out of school. Our children, our choice. I'm against the RSE code because it, it takes away my parental right to withdraw my children from a curriculum that I feel is very inappropriate. I do not agree with the promotion of sexual lifestyles, sexual behaviors, gender theory, and various sexualities. I, I feel, I consider that to be very inappropriate to be drilling into children at the youngest age three. I'm a parent of a primary age child and I should have a say in what type of education I want my child to receive, as stated in the Education Act. But at no point have my views on this relationship and sexuality education been taken into account. No parents have been consulted. I'm against the relationship والجنس للأطفال في ويلز، بريطانيا والمملكة المتحدة والعالم لأنه ينافي الفطرة السليمة للإنسان السوي وينافي الأخلاق في كل المجتمعات. My name is Francis. I'm here to speak for the voiceless children and to educate them with immoral adult sexual education is not a healthy education. It is actually lawless. The BBC reckon this material for this curriculum is pornographic and is unsuitable for adults to be discussing. How on earth can they even possibly believe that this is suitable for our children? Hi, I'm a nun of 14. This curriculum is absolutely wrecking our children's lives and I can't believe that the government are allowing this to go ahead. Susan Williams, How was that for a diverse, inclusive and coalition Wales, huh? Yeah, oh, it's yeah. brilliant. It's brilliant. Well, today, guys, we've got a fantastic lineup for you. We have teachers, parents, um, people who've been involved in the fundraisers. We've got Matt, Lucia. Yeah, we've from got um, Matt from Trans Against Groomers. Yeah, we got yeah. Nigel Thorne, Susan Williams, who's a retired teacher. Um, who else have we got here? Richard Lucas. We got Richard Lucas in the Glasgow Pubs in the logistics of the court. Um, Kath on for porn. We got Liberty Tactics. So we've got a really good day for you today, guys. And later as well, co host. So the, the hosts today are myself, Lucia, Joan, and Adele. 
and hopefully guys you will um, enjoy we're going to take you through some elements of the curriculum what our issues are um but what we're going to do as well guys we're not just going to present the problems we're going to discuss solutions how to get us out of this how do we get out of this mess so that's what we're aiming to do at the end of every session and what we'll do guys we will set the timer before new guests come on because we understand that when this goes out um it's going to be 12 hours long and people aren't going to watch full 12 hours so we will cut it down to the guests for you and we will put them out guys um individually then between christmas and the new year so any information you see Has it has it frozen has it, has it frozen for everyone or is it's, it just me? It's frozen for me, Lucia. Right. Okay. <laughs> so that means that Kim's Wi-Fi must be gone. So yeah, can everybody say if they can hear Kim still, <laughs> or if um or if it's me and Joan that are frozen? I can't tell if she's like talking away or not, Joan. It's very difficult to say. It's impossible to know. I'm just going to check. I'm going to check on, on Facebook because she's in full swing as well. It's It would be very unfair if she's... Um, if she I would, imagine, I would oh. imagine that she... She's gone. She's gone, which means that she was in full swing then and, um, <laughs> and it, it threw her off. Um, okay, I will just um, carry on. We'll just carry on, Joe. I just want to add as well, as well as, well as all those um, people that we've got on, um, we've also got some fantastic guests who have done sponsored events as well. So we've got various parents um, who have got their children involved in sponsored events. So they'll be coming on throughout the podcast as well. And as Kim says, we will chop them down into segments after the podcast. So they'll go out separately as well. But please do carry on sharing because this is a really, really important issue. And um, yeah, we just need... I, I don't know about you, Joan. I, I sort of still feel that a lot of people are still not fully aware of what's going on. That's the sad part about it. And as each day goes past, you have to scratch your head and wonder why. Because it, it's becoming more obvious each day. Is it just because we are looking into it? Mm. Is it because that this is a subject that we've actually... It's like, for example... Someone says, oh, that new car that Mercedes has got out is brilliant, isn't it? What car's that, you know? And then all of a sudden, you someone it. points it out to you. And then the following week, you see that car like maybe 10 times in a week on yeah. the road. And I think it's the same kind of system that's going on with the RSC. If you're, a, a, if, if you're oblivious to it and you haven't looked into it, and you haven't got a clue about it, and you're still in a position where you trust your school, you trust your teachers, you trust the educators, the people that are delivering this, bringing it as a package into schools, then why would you? Mm. Why, why would you even take the lid off it if you've got no inkling that it can be bad? But once you see it, it's like everyone says, you can't unsee it. Yeah. And it's like seeing that car for the first time. The first time I think, oh, so that's what it looks like. And then all of a sudden you're surrounded by them. That, that's just one example, but I think we've all had moments like that, haven't we? Yeah. We yeah. Have. You know, a blind Agreed. thing or something. And then, and the, or sometimes we bump, bump into a friend and we haven't seen them for like six years. And then we see them three or four times. That's not quite the same. But maybe the, I don't know, maybe there's a bit of... Uh, yeah, but the thing now, Joel, what, what we're actually dealing with now is we do have politicians making speeches in UK Parliament about this. So, um, you know, even if people want to hide behind the devolution of powers, well, OK, let's hide behind the devolution of powers. But the criminal justice in England and Wales is the same system, you know. And what we're told about this education is that it's safeguards. Well, who are we safeguarding against? We're safeguarding against paedophiles. So that's a crime. So that's an England and Wales system. So why people are thinking that this is only going to be in England or only going to be in Scotland is insane. It's absolutely yeah. insane. We've brought the evidence forward that all four governments have, have adopted this at the same time. 
But you know, um, you've got to think then if even if people do genuine, be, genuinely believe that it's not going to be in Wales, it's just England and Scotland, you've got to ask yourself what kind of people they are then. You know, because if yeah. this is good for one child, um, it should be good for yours as well. Mm. How can Day, as long as it's not your child as somebody else is but what we are going to see is we will be seeing some casualties of this because that's what a lot of people don't realize our campaign was preventative we were trying to prevent what was going on um we didn't realize this at the time but our our system was flawed anyway you know the rse here was flawed anyway and you'll see that soon we're going to be playing um presentation for you guys from miriam grossman who is a yeah. child psychiatrist from America, spent years um, challenging this sex education and she's seen the results of it. You know, she's written lots of books and she kindly took time out of her own life to look at our curriculum as it was then. And um, she's put together a PowerPoint specifically for us here in Wales, which applies to the whole of the UK as well. There's some stuff in this presentation that I believe personally as a mother, we all should should know this stuff because we learned stuff from that presentation, didn't we? Did you learn anything, guys? I learned a lot. Oh, I, unbelievable. I could not believe what I didn't know, actually, with regards yeah. to the detrimental effects of, um, you know, early sexual um, activity and also, um, you know, the detrimental effects of pr promiscuity as well, which I knew there was a detrimental effect, but I didn't know about the exact scientific, um, you know, the scientific research behind it as well so we're going to be yeah. watching that later which i'm excited about because i haven't watched it for since it she first published it which was a i think that was nearly two years ago now so well, yeah, i'm excited yeah. to see that again and there's a lot of details in it as well it's easy to forget isn't it yes but some yeah. of the key ones really do stick in your brain i remember thinking well i wish i'd read this when i was 14 or 15. yes you know especially about the specifics now, do you know what I've had from that presentation? So where she showed us the photo of the immature cervix and the mature cervix, we get told things like um, this sex education is in Norway. Um, it, they have a younger, it's far more extreme, and it's, they've got reduced pregnancies. But what I actually got from Miriam's presentation was the sexual intercourse with the immature cervix leads to cervical cancers. So what I do then is I look at the statistics for diagnosed cervical cancer okay we're not looking at death rates we're looking at di diagnosis here and when you look at the population in norway to the population in wales the diagnosis as well obviously we've got a real poor cancer care system here so we're not looking at the outcomes we're looking for the actual diagnosis the diagnosis for um women in norway for cervical cancer is extremely high it's extremely high so although we've got less teenage pregnant well we can't say we've got less teenage pregnancies we've got less teenage mums let's say that so they've got less teenage mums but they haven't got less abortions they haven't got less rates of morning after pill and they certainly have not got lower rates of cervical cancers so that is something i got from miriam's presentation which i which i have has followed me now these two years on and it's given me um, it's given me other areas to look in then, you know, so I'm not seeing statistics at face value now. But as, as a parent, if I was a mother of a girl, that presentation, guys, is brilliant for you, okay? You've got to watch it. It is, it is. And I just want to add as well about, you know, like when they first came out with, look at Norway, they've got less teenage pregnancies. It's, you've, always got to, you've always got to look into it, haven't you? You can't take any research at face value. And that's oh. what we've done all along. We never, ever will just take some, because people will always do research to try and, you know, make it favour what they want the outcome to be. People will of always course. do that. You, you can manipulate any kind of statistic, do you know what I mean? It's easily manipulated, you know? Like, um, if you did a big survey, like they keep doing these surveys on bullying and um, outcomes for children, uh, let's let's look at the Stonewall um, studies then for LGBT and things like that. They're only actually studying a small group of people. So if they've got 18 children in that group who are LGBT, who have had negative um, outcomes or negative experiences, then you're looking at almost 100% of their population sample. Yeah. You know, but when you're looking at the wider scale studies then, 
what you'll actually see is these, these poor outcomes for children come from single parent families. Yeah. So, you know, um, I would argue the focus should be there, you know, at, at explaining the impact on being a single parent family, the outcomes for your children, you know. So there, if we were looking at that, then we would be looking more at relationships. But what we're dealing with here is sexual liberation, We've been told time and time again it's got absolutely nothing at all to do with sex. Well, it's strange you should say that because I was looking at this book that I'm sure Kath will be talking about um, later. I think she's had a field day. She's had a field day. And even just looking at the introduction, desire and sexual pleasure come into it on a regular basis. Well, John, we, you and I, we went on that RSE course and we, it was two weeks in London. So two days, one week, two days the next week. And something that they started with there, which I found interesting, was they were talking about the different elements of sex education and what they actually address. So there was different parts and pleasure was one of them. But, he, but the guy delivering the, um, the training there, he said... We do not do pleasure in this organization. That's that's when they choose not to do. So I found that very interesting that he made a point of saying that organization does not address the pleasure. I found that interesting, Joan. Did you? I did, actually. And I was very heartened by it because you're getting into such swampy territory. Um, it's such murky territory. You don't know what the dynamics between a teacher and a child might be how they might progress, how they might evolve. They love this word evolve, don't they? Have you noticed? Everything's evolving. The evolving condition of the child, the evolution in the country. They love this word. Well, things do evolve. And things can sometimes evolve that you had no idea would evolve. Why put a teacher into a situation like that, you know? Uh, Into a situation which would get which could get out of hand in so many different ways. I'm not just talking about an inappropriate relationship between the teacher and the child. You're talking about just pressing the wrong button, just saying something, triggering something in a child that can never be taken away again, you know? Or planting a little seed that could then become something... um, like so, something overwhelming for the child that they can't cope with. Well, this is, we are seeing children coming home with, um, well, we got children coming home saying that they can be a mermaid or, you know, we had that little boy coming home dry humping his mum's leg because he wanted to give a spoon for a baby, you know. These issues, the children cannot comprehend what's going on. And let's go back to that video from Blind in My School, the primary school video. The teacher on there, she even said about the word consent. It's a concept that six-year-olds don't understand. So if they don't understand the concept of the word consent, then why are we even going down this road anyway? You know, It's not for for a child anyway. Consent is not for children. When you talk about consent, you're talking about it's either medical consent or it's sexual consent. And it's always, it's always got to be, I, I know sexual consent is over 16, sometimes it's over 18, certain consent has got to be over 18. So why are we even talking about consen- that word consent when it comes to children? And on that note, guys, I've actually got a PowerPoint presentation on the consequence of consent. It's aimed at teenagers as it is. I'm going to try to live with the team um, soon and hopefully, guys, we can get that out there. And you can show um, your teenagers that because it's a real, it's a different approach to what the schools take, completely different approach. It's jam-packed full of shocking information. And I think that's, I think it would be a good tool to introduce to the teenagers. That's something to look out for there. So before we go any further, I just want to keep reiterating, sorry, John, just want to keep reiterating, guys, that this is a sponsored 12-hour podcast. <laughs> So many of you have said that you'd love to buy us a pint, you'd love to buy us a coffee or whatever. This is your opportunity to do that, okay? You can do that via the fundraiser directly or through our bank. And if you put a message in the chat, Lucia then can transfer, can 
take it from the bank account directly into the fundraiser. So I do know there's problems. A lot of you don't have PayPal. And also, guys, when you look going through the fundraiser, it adds a charge. That charge is not I will not have to accept it, okay? That extra money is going into their pocket, guys. So I just want to pull that out there now. If you want to buy us a coffee, if you want to buy us a pint, now is your opportunity because we want to put all our coffees and all our pints into this fund, into this fight, into this cause, guys. Okay, Lou, are the links up with these posts? Right, it should be up. I was just about to say it should be up on the when I when I actually um, set it up. It should it should come up in the description. I have put it up again in the comments. I will see. Well, our bank if I... details, guys. If you click on the fundraiser link, our bank details are actually in the description as well. So if you scroll down towards the end of the description, you'll see the bank details there. If you send us a message, if you want, or even a private email, I, I'll be checking the emails throughout today because we're expecting some stuff to go on. So I will, Lucia will then put it onto the fundraiser and we'll see where we are. What are we starting at, Lou? Any idea what we're starting at? Well, for this, for this actual sponsored thing, we're on zero. So no, we I know can actually see what it builds up. But the, okay, the, uh, so we're on zero okay. starting off, but what's the overall fund? What's the total so far? I, we're on 52,000. I will tell you now, bear with me. Uh, do, 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 do. We are on 64,101. That's so the exact 64,101. So come on, guys. Let's make it up to at least 65 by the end of the day. We know times are hard, okay? We know how much you spent on gas last week because we did as well, all right? We know what's going on. But this is 16 pence per child in Wales, one pound. One pound is six children, okay? If you think that one pound is nothing, that's six children. That's yeah. three times the size of my family, three times the size of Lucia's family, and you've covered Joan's family, okay? So it really is that powerful. Your pound is that powerful, okay, guys? So please get behind us. This is your opportunity. We've got lots of stuff for you today. And like I said, we might even have some live news on it. You never know. Um, but yeah, guys, keep watching. Get donating. One pound is six children. Okay, guys, get us there. Please get us there. And also bear in mind that when you do add to the fundraiser, it brings us more popular on the platform as well. So, you know, even if you're like, oh, a pound is nothing. Oh, it that's is. not going to do anything. It is, as Kim said, it's, um, you know, 16 pence a ch child, um, you know, in Wales. So, you know, it's five or six children plus you're going to bring our popularity up on the plat on the fundraiser platform as well. So, you know, nothing is too small, like every single penny counts in this. There we are. Somebody's just said, I can provide a, a bouncy castle for a fundraising event if you want. Thank you very much, Simone, that is. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. This is what we need is everybody... If we come together and play to our strengths, this is what we're doing here, guys. We're, we're actually playing to our strengths. So, obviously, Lucia, certified chartered accountant, makes sense for Lucia to deal with all the money, you know. Uh, we got, we're all safeguard trained anyway, but most, some of us go more in depth. So, what we're doing is we're writing training packages. You know, we're coming up with solutions. This money isn't just to fight the cause, okay? We are aiming to get this money back. We are writing the training. We want to make this country the safest place in the world for raising and educating your children that is not going to change okay regardless of what happens in court that is not going to change because like we said we're all about solutions and this is what we want guys and we want you guys to have the knowledge we have we want you guys to be able to safeguard your children and let's create an environment where predators are reluctant to offend yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, as you said, it's the adults that need educating when it comes to safeguarding. The adults are the ones that need to be, oh, well, that's strange behaviour. That shouldn't be happening. Hang on. That needs investigating. Not let's tell all the children what sex is. So if something happens, they can come and tell us because you're going to cause more harm than good doing that. If you tell a five year old something, about you know something inappropriate something sexual do you think they're going to be like oh okay that's something adults do i won't do that till i'm an adult i was do just going to say exactly the same thing they're curious and What's you know 
They want to do what, what mom and dad's doing. And I know that myself. I've been studying since my youngest boy was three years old. And all that little bug, that little poor boy, he sat on the end of the table pretending to use a laptop. I'd be in bed with my books in the night. He'd be there with his books, you know. He really, he wanted a copy off his mum, you know. And, and that was study. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, you know, was study. me and my sisters, we used, to, we used to play accountants because my parents were accountants <laughs> working from home. So we do, you do follow what your, your parents do, what you see, what you're seeing adults do. You copy. And this is why we want children to be, you know... That's why we've got to set them good examples, you know? So, you know, by teaching them, well, this is how you, you know, this is this is what adults do. No, 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 they don't need to know that. It's, I can't imagine how I would feel if I learned about that at, at these, at a very young age. I was quite I, shocked when I learned, I think I was about 11. I was shocked then. I thought I was never going to have children. I thought, no way, no way am I doing that. That's disgusting. But I, I think... Just- and I was 21 pregnant and uh, I gave birth two months before I was 22 and I could not look at that book over six months. I, the images, I could not look. I couldn't even look at how my body would look and I was a 21-year-old woman. So, I, and I remember I was watching EastEnders and a child had gone into labour on EastEnders and I uh, burst out crying. I had to leave the living room. Um, so I was laughing stock because I don't cry. Um, but yeah, I was absolutely petrified at the age of 21. Didn't even want to look at the body, but that's the thing. Let me just answer this question here now. Can you explain in 25 words or less what is it about the newly adopted code your organization objects to? Right. So, what it's this is actually um, it's derived from comprehensive sexuality education. We object to comprehensive sexuality, full stop. So um, you need to look into comprehensive sexuality education to get a little bit of understanding what our issues are, cannot be addressed in 25 words. Um, But we are objecting to comprehensive sexuality education, the whole school approach. And if you looked at the reports done um, on the lead up to this, it's based on queer theory, gender ideology. So unethical um, ideologies based on studies that cannot be replicated, basically. So what we're dealing with here is, I'd say, it's a political ideology and a social experiment. We're seeing the results from America. So in 25 words or less, what do we object to? It is comprehensive sexuality education, which brings along sexual and reproductive rights from birth. So that's what we object to. The fact that it's not Welsh, we've been lied to, and we simply do not trust where this is going because we have extensive knowledge, almost 10 years knowledge of comprehensive sexuality education. So they're not going to shift us that easy. Yeah, I know this is the thing, like us in Wales, I keep saying, I've said it in quite a few videos, actually. We've got no excuse to allow our children to be um affected by this education because we've already got the evidence it's in 52 countries worldwide and even even the education that's already in the UK is proven has proven to be inappropriate and has had a detrimental effect on the youngsters so we've got no excuse in Wales at all so people who are waiting for the lesson content what are you waiting for it's already there it's already there. We can already see it. You just need to, you know, open your eyes and actually do some research. Yeah, if anybody's new to this, guys, some really good places for you to go is the informed parents groups. So you get New York informed parents, Massachusetts informed parents, California informed parents. Have a look on Facebook for those groups because these are parents who... Um, They've been involved in this education for a long time. They had no idea what was going on. And now they are seeing the aftermath of it. So like I keep saying, this is a preventative approach. You know, safeguarding should always be preventative. Um, What's happening in America, there is no cure for what's happened, right? So please, guys, look at these other groups, you know, look at where we are getting the information from. And that that really is a glimpse into the future, you know? Mm. 
And we've got Fahad there who's put a, um he's put an explanation up there if um if anyone can read that. Shall I read that quickly, Kim? Yeah, Excuse if you want to, yeah. My voice, my voice has just went then. Right, okay. So Fahad has written the Welsh Government Setup Relationship and Sex Expert Panel, which uses the following oh, the following whose definition, that's the World Health Organization's definition of sexuality which includes the definition applying throughout life, eroticism, pleasure, intimacy. The panel recommends RSE from age three and the Welsh Government makes RSE compulsory. RSE being made compulsory based on the WHO's sexuality de definition, in effect claiming that a central aspect of being an infant encompasses including eroticism, pleasure and intimacy. So that's yeah that 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 is that's it in a nutshell, isn't it, Kim? Yes. Yeah, he has a Paul second question here. So he said, if the comprehensive sex ed has been in practice for ten years, would there be a correlation to the decrease in teenage pregnancies in Wales over the same period? No, because comprehensive sexuality education is not in Wales; it's in America. So since the introduction of sex education, that's where teenage pregnancies um, increased. Now, what you need to do, Paul, is, okay, once this um, live has finished, you go back to the beginning, and that's where we discussed um, the actual stats of teenage pregnancies. So what they're actually discussing is teenage mums. And if you look at the rates of abortion, morning after pill, and the diagnosis of cervical cancer as a result of early, early um, intercourse, you'll see that the stats don't quite add up and they're not very favourable. So what people are looking at is the results of teenage mums, and so it, it's, it's the pregnancies that continue to birth. That's at the beginning of our video, Paul. There's quite a lot um, to cover. Like we said, this is a new thing. This is comprehensive sexuality education from America. When I say we've been following it from 10 years, it means we've been following it around the globe for 10 years. That's why it only took us 10 seconds to spot the reference in our 2019 RSE drafts. So what we're dealing with here is something that's been in the making for five years. You can find a lot of the documentation on our website, publicchildprotectionwales.org. So you'll see the reports that they publish on the lead up to this. So the code, what you see today, is actually what they've published after being under pressure for two years. <coughs> so even though it's still derived from UNESCO, we've got documentation going back to 2018, in fact letters between the Minister of Education, Kirsty Williams, and Janet Bryant. So there's a lot of there's a lot of work gone into this. We have tried to um oh Susan's trying to get on. We have tried to um put all this in one place for you all to see. But what you actually have to realize is there's a lot of documentation to go through and that's where that's where it's all referenced, you see. So the final code now is pretty much a whitewash. If you look at the Curriculum and Assessment Wales Act, Section 77, that discusses the RSE code. And what it says is um, the RSE code must be produced and presented to the Senate, but it can be changed at any time, and they don't have to consult anybody if they don't think it's appropriate. So again, you know, you can't just take a code at face value. The code is part of legislation and lesson content. But five years later, the lesson content is missing. So this has been a long going fight. We've been fighting it for two and a half years. It's been in the making for five years. So there's an awful lot to catch up on there. But we do have videos on our YouTube channel, PCP Wales. You can look at the Education Minister's speech, the petition committee, lots and lots of information there. So um, I can't come back and forth now answering all your questions, guys. We will try, but we're trying our best to address this. And I can see but there, Susan is, has tried to get on. Um, Sha she can I suggest, Kim, that perhaps... Go on. I was, on. I was just going to suggest... I just that maybe... wanted to add one point to that, you know, because yeah. one of the ideas of this RSC curriculum is to provide a healthy sex life for every human being, which is quite an ambitious thing to do, isn't it? Yes. Who defines what a healthy sex life is? Exactly. You know? Who who is who is the one that's defining that? We're not told. Morality is mentioned. Spirituality isn't mentioned.
But my idea of a healthy sex life would not include having a child that was dying from a, a disease, for example, living in Africa or in any other country, come to that, that was dying of a disease which could have been prevented by social intervention. For example, clean water. Mm. I mean, it doesn't do your sex life much good when you've got a sick child. No. Or when you've got a child that's um, very demanding on you for whatever reason uh, during during the night time or, or whenever. Or when you've got worries, when you've got financial worries when you're worried about how you're going to provide for your kids the next day. Why, why concentrate on one element of your life when there's a magnitude of other elements that should be addressed first? Let's prevent that child getting sick. Let's prevent anything that's preventable. You know, let's keep people healthy. If and you're not... If you're not healthy in, in your mind and your body, then you're not going to have healthy sexual relationships the odds are so let's work on the outer person you know I, first I, and do everything that's possible to put people in a situation where they can enjoy sex well this is the thing and they keep going on about like having a healthy sex sexual relationship and you know like uh, different ways to have you know interest in sex etc you know this is this seems to be embedded throughout the curriculum but i'm thinking why do new why do young youngsters need to know that they don't you have to learn how to have a relationship first before a sexual relationship now there are people that think hey no it, you know it's good to sort of go out there and you know have one night stands or whatever but i am not happy at all with that kind of attitude coming into schools relationship first before anything sexual you know you'll get you've got to get to know someone first you know like who they are what they like you know like do you have something in common all that has got to come first and then you enjoy the healthy sexual relationship that comes afterwards. It's no point having a, you know, sort of good sex with someone, but you've literally got nothing in common or they're abusive. What is the point? There is no point in that. You have to develop a relationship. And, and as you were saying as well, Joe, you've got to develop a relationship with yourself first. Acceptance. Love the person you are. You accept the way you look. Who, you know, like... Most teenagers, especially teenage girls, they'll have a complaint about the way they look. They want to be um, as skinny or as curvaceous as their friend, or they're looking at, you know, sort of people online, you know, or uh, and they're all filtered anyway, you know, these um, these people online. So they, yeah. you know, they've got these, they've got the, this, um, you know, silly, really, silly sort of expectations of what they should look like, where we really should be concentrating on making sure that those children love the way they are. They shouldn't be interested in, oh, you know, oh, having sexual partners. That should never come into it when they're, when they're so young. It's an absolute, yeah, it's, 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 it is absolutely crazy. Kim, Kim, how have you got on with getting Susan on? Is everything okay? Or are we having issues? I've sent her, I've sent her a link now through her messenger. Um, okay. And I really wanted to stay on for Susan because she's, I love Susan. She's an absolute beautiful woman. Uh, but Susan yes. will be on soon, but I'm going to have to shoot off when Susan comes on. So I've got some work to do in the background. But yeah, I have sent her the link through Messenger, so hopefully now Susan will be on soon. Those who know Susan, a um, newly retired teacher of 32 or 30 years. Susan is a Welsh speaking lady, and she's going to be speaking to us in English, guys. So that's thank you for that. You know what I mean? We're always grateful to people who make the effort so we can all understand. But Susan's got a powerful message. She's not. Um, the type of person that you'd expect to be involved in this kind of um, activism then, shall we say. But hopefully now Susan will get the link. Fingers crossed. Okay. Let's have a look. She's seen it, she's seen it. So fingers crossed Susan will be coming in now. Yeah, because, so you know, as, as, as you stated before, I don't know if I've paused now. Have I? Joan, are you still unpaused? 
no, it's Kim has paused again. Kim, you're having all sorts of issues here with your Wi-Fi. I've got to say, I think, uh, yeah, I think the Wi-Fi, someone out there <laughs> keeps cutting her off, unfortunately. But, uh, yes. yeah, we'll... what's that? Sorry. It makes you wonder. It does make you wonder. Yeah, as Kim said, like, you know, Susan, is she is she a retired teacher, Joan, or is she still teaching? Yes, Susan's retired. And I, I can't remember accurately what she was involved in after retiring as a teacher. I actually taught in the same school as Susan for quite a few months, I think maybe the best part of the year. And uh, th th that was sometime in the 90s. And she was, she and her husband were kind enough to give me a lift into the school because I didn't drive at that time, you know. So I know Susan from then. Oh. And um, I had tremendous admiration for her. Then I always thought that she was fun, that she was basically a very kind person. And I would imagine an excellent teacher. So uh, I had that kind of relationship with her before she came and joined PCP. And she was alerted to all the problems that are going on in education now. And so I know that we have a good soul on. We we have so many good souls on board. We this do. is the thing, Lucia, don't we? We have so many commendable people, wonderful people, and um, which keep us inspired. And Susan is one of them. And yeah. uh, I'd just like to say, um, a hot wife my wedding knee. Uh, for my Mineki here. I just love the work that she's doing and the way she expresses herself. Oh, you speak Welsh so well, um, Joan. You weren't even born in Wales, weren't you? You learned Welsh later on when you uh, when you moved to Wales. So uh, you, you speak it you speak it like a native Welsh lady. <laughs> um that that's arguable. I did my best anyway. I just okay. that's just one of my passions. I like languages, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I always did, and uh, you know, I always just like you probably would have loved maths, and I would imagine with the kind of job that you have, I like languages, and I just couldn't get enough of them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? We've all got our, we have all got our individual passion, and I think when it, well, I, I know that when it comes to teaching children, it's really sort of understanding what their passion is so you know for yourself it would have been languages I, I presume that perhaps you learned languages as a child as well no no, no i tried to i tried to learn welsh because okay. we used to come on holiday to wales and i remember hearing a little bit because we moved further and further west and ended up in uh medianith shows it was then and i was first hearing welsh there with the little kids i used to play with and it, it absolutely fascinated me. And I remember buying a Teach Yourself book. Um, it was a very ambitious project for a sort of 10-year-old to try and teach themselves Welsh. And I didn't get beyond two sentences. But no, the passion was there. Yeah. I just loved Wales. I just felt that coming from an industrial place, which was dirty, smoky, downtrodden, just generally forgotten in, in every way, shape or form by the government. Mm -hmm. I just felt that Wales had it all. It was paradise for me. Mm -hmm. And that week or two or six, or however many we had in Wales, was like a, a door opened literally into a paradise. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can never tell you, Lucia, how wonderful it felt to spend time in Wales as a child. And I always thought what my my ambition was to live in Wales and um, I used to want to be a, an authoress and live in Wales. We don't use that word anymore, do we? Authoress. I but when I was means. Yeah. <laughs> right, well, ladies, I've got Susan on the line. She's having bad technical issues, but she's on the phone now and she's happy to do it this way. And um, so can we welcome Susan Williams, please, guys? Hey Susan. Hi. Hi. Oh, oh, Susan. I'm so sorry about this. I'm not very techy minded, but um I just can't get on uh, the stream yet and um, yeah, I've tried different things but 
haven't I've been able unable to do so so it's going to be a phone call instead but thank you so much no thank you Susan can everybody hear Susan okay I can. Can everybody online, um, everyone watching here are okay? Can some people just say whether you can hear Susan? I can hear her loud and clear. Can you hear yeah. her, Joan? Can you? Oh, yeah, everyone oh, can. Go for it, Susan. Oh. Introduce yourself, love. Tell everyone who you are. Okay, well, thank you, Joan, for your kind words. Um, well, my name's Susan Williams. Um, I'm from I'm Enir's wife and the mother to Ivan and Marit. Uh, I started teaching in 1984. Um, and uh, I taught in the secondary sector for eight years. I had one year off, went to Argentina, to the Welsh colony where I taught children uh, and uh, adults, taught Welsh, and I also worked as a Christian worker I was helping a missionary out there uh, came back into teaching and after having Ivan um, I went to the primary sector and I taught children who had specific learning needs um, which is also called dyslexia um, as a mum I helped out in the uh, nursery school I think I've got a, you know, an extensive, I have extensive, um, proviant. Joanne, help have it, Joanne. Experience. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'll be switching words. I'll have, I'll have experience, you know, with three-year-olds up to 18-year-olds. Um, I've really enjoyed teaching. It is, it's an honour, really, to teach. And um, I'm absolutely horrified. By what's going on um you know i didn't go into teaching and i'm sure the majority of teachers have not gone into teaching to uh teach um sexuality to children it's um for me it's an abomination uh I i'm quite shocked I i'll just go back to the beginning shall i uh about my journey and how i become involved um this summer, I was on holiday, it was August, relaxing, and I was uh, looking through my Facebook and saw a post, uh, no, I posted something about something to do with the environment, and I got um, a message back from Griffith Williams, who is on the Gwynedd County Council, and he's a friend as well, he's a friend of my brother, and... Um, yeah, he answered that, and then he asked me, um, and what are you Christians doing about this new curriculum, the relationships and sexuality, um, uh, that aspect of it? And I must admit, I said nothing, because I don't know anything about it. Hmm. So after that, I um, looked at a few... Um, things on Facebook, came across um, Susan Mason's, um, yeah, there was an article about Susan Mason, Christian, who had been pamphleting outside uh, her children's school and making parents aware of this RSE, um, of its dangers and um, inappropriateness. So I looked, uh, read that, and then I read about um, how, uh, I think in the Hebrides, I'm not sure, but in Scotland, uh, that the councillors there had rejected this, um, well, it's not called RSC in Scotland, is it? No, it's uh, RSHP. And that they had said, no way were they going to allow that in their schools and that they were adopting a uh, Catholic, Roman, Roman Catholic um, curriculum. So um, anyway, I, I, yeah, I shared Susan Mason's uh, article and I shared the one uh, about the uh, Hebridean Islands. Um, and I, put, I, I wrote, you know, that I thought this is going to if, if 
if you're going to sew this, so, sewing as in S O L W I N G, you're going to reap so much pain and suffering. Uh, you're going to create more sexual perpetrators and attackers and more victims, you know. Uh, and yeah, it's become a very emotive um, thing for me. I, I've lost sleep because of this um, RSE. Anyway, I didn't know a lot uh, then when I put my post up, but, but I, in my heart, I felt this is wrong, this is evil, this is destructive, and I didn't have a lot of knowledge then. But somebody uh, answered my post and uh, he was quite scornful of what I'd written. And really I couldn't reply uh, because I didn't have enough information. So I contacted Griff again and he put me in contact with Sharon Williams from Nevin. Uh, well, she has been an inspiration for me. She's She's been a fount of knowledge as well. And, uh, yeah, she is. Oh, well, there's, there's no flies on Sharon. There's no flies on Sharon. Not at all. And she has the information on the tips of this. So she very kindly um, replied to this gentleman. And, uh, and then after that, I, I've uh, had a lot of information from Sharon and uh, I was put in contact with the Gwynedd RSE group and uh, slowly and surely became, you know, more aware and I started researching for myself. Anyway, uh, August, the, about the end of August, there was an extraordinary meeting uh, in Gwynedd Council mm. and I went. And before I went, I prayed. Okay, and I, I read my Bible and I pray every day. And, um, you know, I had been warned about PCP Wales, that PCP Wales were a bunch of extremists and anti-vaxxers and so on and so on. And I thought, I'm going to look into this for myself. Anyway, I, I, I was praying and I, I'd been going through the... Um, Gospel of Luke, and on that particular day, I don't use my Bible as a horoscope, okay, I don't, but on that particular day, the readings were um, from Luke, and uh, it was about Jesus blessing the children and telling the disciples off for telling the mums to keep the children away from him. And the other reading the previous reading was, if anybody, I can't quote it correctly, okay, if any makes, uh, anybody makes one of these little ones sin, uh, they should uh, have a millstone put around their necks and thrown into the deep sea. That's, that's the type of thing. And I prayed, should I go to this meeting or not? Um, is it right for me to go? And I felt I have to go. I felt it was right for me to go. And of course, uh, many of you know what happened in Gwynedd Council. It was, uh, yeah, it was... Um, it was a sham. Um, well, for me, it was, um, well, for us all, it was upsetting, I think. But, you know, I thought Louise Hills spoke magnificently. And the other uh, councillors who spoke for scrutinising and monitoring the um, curriculum, which was going to be rolled out in September. You know, um, they spoke really well. And then uh, two members of Plaid Cymru spoke. And I was absolutely disgusted with them. I've been a staunch Plaid Cymru member <laughs> since I was 18. Now that's 42 years. I've supported Plaid Cymru, I've believed in their policies, um, I've gone canvassing for them when I was younger, I'm a member, oh, well, no, I, I was a member of Plaid Cymru, uh, paid up and, you know, and the way they spoke, didn't say PCP Wales, but I'm sure they were referring 
Are you still there? Yeah, we still here. We listen yeah. attentively. <laughs> they were referring to. Are you still there again? Yeah, we hear you. Carry yeah. on, love. Yeah. Uh, they were referring to a certain group who were um, spreading misinformation uh, or pamphleting this misinformation. I was told that many of the Plaid Cymru members uh, others spoke and supported, you know, supported not scrutinising and not monitoring. Um, you know, there was a, some of our group spoke out and uh, the meeting was stopped, police were called and then the meeting resumed. But in the paper, it says that the gallery was cleared and the police, the police came, cleared the gallery. And, uh, you know, I've just seen so many lies and the misinformation is not coming from PCP Wales. So, um, yeah, it, it was very disillusioning, if that's the correct word. I was speaking to a friend yesterday and he said, this is not the Plaid Cymru that Saunders Lewis and Gwynvor Evans sacrificed so much for, you know? Yeah. Um, they just want votes, they want to be popular, and it's happened in Scotland as well. The Nationalists have done the same. Um, and for me, it's heart-rending uh, to see this happening. Anyway, after this meeting, um, I decided that I would, oh yeah, retire because I, I like teaching, I, I forgot to say that, I like teaching four years ago and went to work as a Christian worker. I worked with children and youth and families um, and I decided um, it was time for me to, um, I don't know, step into a, a new phase in my life. I wanted to know more about um, the RSE. I wanted to research more. <clears throat> I wanted to um, be, be more available for my family because mm. we've gone through a really difficult, really rough period uh, in the last three years as, as a family. Mm. So I decided to um, uh, retire. But I've been busy and I've been looking into, you know, this RSE and, um, you know, it, it gets worse every day, doesn't it? Yes. Um, I, I've looked at the Scottish Family Party material and, um, well, it, it can't be right to no. teach, you know, children about consent. But the only thing children need to know is to say no. Yes, exactly. Uh, say no. I love that. Um, oh, uh, that um, film, the Pantasaurus one. Yes, that's one good thing the NSPCC have done. But you know, they're not infallible either. No, I've looked into a Safe Schools Alliance and uh, their criticism of NSPCC. They are not infallible. They there are things which are they support which are wrong you know um i've seen pictures of you know for th this um um material i've seen graphic depictions of genitalia overly detailed descriptions of sex for uh children between six and nine years old um lgbt issues are not appropriate to be discussed with uh, children in primary school no. I'm not homophobic, I'm not transphobic. I believe that every person is precious. Yes. And that every person is, you know, um, I'm, I'm not anti anybody, but I am anti indoctrinating children. Uh, I am against um, the government forcing um, such issues and the issue of transgenderism on children and young people you know I, I find it shocking um and to think that this is being you know it's not just a standalone lesson it in every lesson available they mm. are going to promote this um, i don't think it's appropriate 
to speak of polyamory and swinging and porn in school. No, not at all. I didn't go into teaching and the majority of teachers, and I, I know that the, the teachers I know, uh, I, I believe they are, you know, they, they are against this, but they have mortgages to pay and yeah. they, you know, it's so, so difficult. It's, it's easy for me to speak out. It's easy for me to rant and, you know, have my say because I have retired, but it breaks my heart that there are teachers I know who are honourable people, honest people, people with good morals who are being forced to teach this um, RSC. And I think it's an abomination to teach children that, oh, perhaps they are not male or female. Perhaps they are something in between. Perhaps they're gender neutral or what's the other one? Gender fluid or, oh, you know, little, the little ones. When they are, when they are so young, they are so impressionable. Whatever Miss or Sir says, well, that is the truth you know yeah teachers yeah. have so much uh, influence influence yeah it's and influence. power and it's it's so it's an abuse of power it's and i'm really angry with the government because when parents do go in and complain about things they will not stand by the teachers the councillors from Plaid Cymru, uh, there were three of them who did not follow. There were three of them who, who behaved honourably and stood against this RSE. But, you know, nobody's going to stand with a teacher when they uh, have been uh, taught something uh, a parent deems inappropriate. Mm. Uh, it, it makes me quite... And I think it is this, um, you know, I've looked into... Uh, Freud and Alfred Kinsey and John Money, uh, all these um, uh, these people with this um, well mad idea that we are sexual beings from birth. You know, I've, I've read about Ellie Barnes and I, I've heard how she is, you know, teaching teachers to smash heteronormativity. Yeah. And uh, Emma Reynolds, who's, uh, you know, um, prepared this curriculum and used a lot of her own research in it. Mm. I, I absolutely love it. It's disgraceful that they expect, uh, you know, teachers to um, teach us. And I know, I, I, you know, I, I know that there are teachers who, uh, they've told me, thank you, Susan, for standing for, for us. You know, um, it's I, I can't imagine. You know uh, what what they're going through, but I know, as you said, there are some teachers who are not. You know, when there are children, there is the danger sometimes of, you know, predators getting in. Yeah, but I'm I'm um, I know I'm disgusted. Going back to I've seen, you know, that on the Scottish um, family party. Um, the materials, it's, I can't tell you, I, you know, it's, it's the afternoon, I can't go into that at the moment, but um, um, promoting, well, promoting um, self-stimulation and all sorts of different sex and transgenderism, um, children should be left to be children and not be, you know, um, and I'm upset as well when parents, you know, have gone into schools asking to see the material and they get so many different replies. Oh, um, the, the material isn't there yet, it's not ready. And yet there was this injunction, you know, you, you tried for an injunction, didn't you? Yeah. In August. And they said, oh, no, it's ready. The government said, it's ready, ready to be rolled out. And yet parents have been going into schools asking for lesson plans and so on and um, you know they've been told oh it's not ready uh, oh you can't see it because of copyright and then they oh 
you know, there was a man from Gwe speaking, so, oh, uh, some of the information is in the schools already, you know, with the scoliach, that's been used for quite a few years. I've seen some poems promoting uh, different sorts of sexualities and tra- transgenderism. So, I, what is, as you said, came a few weeks ago, Welsh Government, what is the truth? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. Going back to the screw going back to the um the councillor meeting, the extraordinary meeting, Susan, and oh. you said that Plaid Cymru had voted against the monitoring and scrutinizing of the yeah. curriculum. So yeah. if they were so certain that it's so great, why would they refuse to continue promoting this wonderful stuff? You know, wouldn't this give them the opportunity to say, Told it was great? Told it was amazing. Wouldn't that yeah. be the perfect opportunity? I mean, come on, modern and scrutinate scrutinizing this this rollout of this massive thing that's going on that they believe is wonderful anything anyway. Why wouldn't they want to scrutinize it? Yeah, there were three of them. There were three of them uh, who uh, uh, wanted it to be scrutinized and monitored. Because let's but be honest here were... now, scrutinizing and monitoring things, right, can go either what? way. It can, you know, it can go either way. It can be bad or yeah. it can be good. So if they're saying yeah. it's good and they're sure it's good, then isn't that the opportunity to show the people of Gwynedd how amazing their curriculum is because of all this scrutinizing or all yeah. this monitoring? Wouldn't that be a fantastic opportunity to shut up the, the misinformers like us? Yeah. 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 Oh, it's... Um, so even their the words and their actions don't even match up. Yeah. No, no exactly. It's a very well, good point, Kim. Yeah. So three of them voted against the motion to scrutinise and monitor. And then there were 19 independents who said they should be scrutinising and monitoring. And there was one that abstained. So, but, you know... Um, the schools, school, you know, we live in a very sexualized society. Anyway, mm. on TV, in magazines, pop songs, it's everywhere. And we see, you know, things like uh, Balenciaga bringing out these horrible these teddies wearing, what do you call them? Oh. Bondage gear. Yeah, bondage. And every day, something shocking. There's something shocking. You know, we want to keep the schools neutral and just leave the schools, leave the teachers alone, leave the children alone. Uh, just, you know, mm-hmm. and it's it's so shocking. I've seen, you know, like that dice game, the money mm-hmm. that, which has been paid out, uh, is it 100,000 yeah. pounds? Out of, the yeah, packs, and, out of the Tampax tax fund, that has come. Yeah, yeah, and the government have put their logo on it. Um, you know, um, like, like, it's unbelievable, isn't it? It's a, it's a sex game. It's a sex game for the yeah. younger yeah. from summers. Yeah. yeah. You know? And it wouldn't, it wouldn't be allowed for children. I, I, I can't imagine it would be allowed for children above the age, of, um, under the age of 18, had oh. it not had the government logo on it. Yeah. Well, this, we, we did, we did um, a live podcast, was it the night before last, with Reverend Simon Sideways? Yeah. And what I did was, Susan, so we went on to um, a, a PowerPoint for 11-year-old on masturbation. So I had signed out of YouTube and I had clicked the YouTube link on this presentation to show people. And do you know what it actually does? It asks yeah. me to sign in to confirm my age. So this PowerPoint is there for the teachers to deliver to the 11-year-olds. So I want to know who is signing into YouTube for these videos to be aired in our classrooms. If I can't watch it without yeah. signing in, then how are these children watching it? Because they ain't signing in, are they? So who is signing well, in children, for them? You know, children as young as 13 have played that game. Yes. 13, yeah. And, you know, they speak about also um, being pluralistic. That's the big word, isn't it? But I don't think it's pluralistic. It's um, it's promoting one view. What about the Muslim view? What about the Christian view? What about words like um, sex within marriage? Some people wait. Some wait till they're in a long-lasting relationship. You know, where where are all those options? Where where are words like 
faithfulness and respect and um, you know where are all these different points of view from what I see are, are, are they you know are they taught in the schools um, I doubt it no the only thing is them. they taught is they, they are taught whether they should have um, early sex or not and it's dangerous as you said before previously it's they don't do they teach children about the dangers of having sex when they're too young um mm. of the damage it can do you know uh, uh the, the damage um to the bo- bo- uh, to the body and to the mind and to the soul you were speaking about um you know this emptiness you feel uh, after well perhaps sleep sleeping around that type of thing of polyamory it's you know it's um it's really, really shocking that um, some of these things have been taught. What, what, if you know, we want RSC, don't we? But we want RSC to be um, well, true, uh, true, and um, give different points of view. Well, it's, it's funny you should say that, Susan, because out of the statements that's gone into court, there is only one claimant who doesn't want any RSE at all. The other four, are, you know, that there is no objection to the teaching of RSE, if it was what they said on the ten, you know. And also, I had a meeting in a mosque with some Muslims. And, you know, actually, they said as well that there is some elements of RSE that they need to tackle shyness now. So this is it. This, you know, we are not all saying no. You know, we're all saying this is a very delicate, sensitive topic that we need to approach yeah. as a whole, not a whole school approach, as a whole, as a partnership, parents, children, yeah. school. It's a three-way thing. You yeah. never ever close doors. Now, from the school's perspective, abuse happens at home. From my perspective, abuse happens at school. So right. I'm right, and so are the teachers, right? Okay. So why are we shutting doors then? We should be opening them up. Yeah. We should be opening up nothing to hide. Why are we closing down doors? Why is there a secret behind that school door with our children? I know yeah. what goes on there. So from my perspective, the only way you could prove to me a teacher's not getting sexual gratification from delivering these lessons would be to wire their brain up and I could read it. That's the only way you're going to satisfy me. Therefore, we're on the wrong topic. We're discussing the wrong materials. So if I feel like that, it shouldn't be in the classroom, correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Yeah. nobody's <laughs> denying abuse at home. And there is a lot of denial of abuse at school, mind. But nobody's yeah. denying that children are harm. Where, where there is children, there is risk. And, and if you think yeah. that there's not, there's something wrong with you. You know, yeah, children are yeah. a target for a lot of things. This yeah. is why the adults need educating. This is why RSE should be taught to the adults. Yeah. yeah. I'm a part of a group. Uh, um, I think you met Caris Mosley, Dr. Caris Mosley. She's been uh, looking into this since 2017. She works for Christian Concern. And we've started a Christian group and we're going through the... Um, uh, curriculum and looking at every box, you know, and and we, I think we've called ourselves a group for reforming the uh, RSE. We, you know, we believe that RSE is needed. But I, I must say at this point, uh, we are a very small group, and I am very, very upset by the lack of um, standing up against this by the Christian Church. I'm appalled, absolutely appalled by the Church uh, Church of England and the Church in Wales because they are endorsing and they are promoting this um, RSE curriculum. Uh, you know, I, I was brought up as an Anglican. I was baptised in the church. I was um, went to Sunday school, uh, was confirmed. Uh, I became a lay reader in the church. I... I um, what else? Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, this church is going against biblical teaching. Yes. Oh, again, you know, God has created us um, as male and female, and we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And the church is peddling this lie that we're not. Exactly, so exactly. Angry. 
I'm so angry. There's and a... then there are the nominations in Wales. Um, they haven't spoken out, really. You know, they haven't. Uh, many are, I think, I don't know, why not? Um, some say because the church is split. Some people, a few people, well, some people think it's okay. Uh, this are going with the flow. Uh, some people say, oh, we can't uh, stand against this because it'll uh, make people think that Christians are, con um, are very condemning people and will they won't want to listen to the message of the gospel, that God loves them and that Jesus died for their sins. I think, you know, but really, uh, when the church is being quiet on things like this, oh, uh, honestly, Kim, I've, I've been quite heartbroken for the past few months, um, seeing all the um, this evil things uh, coming out, you know, and it's not even being hidden. Um, no. You know, how can Balenciaga promote? these with um what's the word you uh, bondage. bondage yeah yeah how, how can they how dare they how dare they and oh i, I don't know sorry i'm going off on different tangents but no, well, if, if we, if we but did live I'm so, yeah i'm so glad I, I you know uh that there are people who are standing against this and i must uh, say i Maya, you and Lucia and the group of ladies who started this work and you stood your ground against so much opposition um, and you are inspiring and also I want to thank you know Christian Concern, Christian Institute, learnt a lot from them as well, got some you know a, a lot of really good literature from them and um, I'm just thankful um, for all the work that's been done. Um, I think, you know, it's, this is an attack on being human. Yes, it is. You know, on being human. Um, it's an attack on morality. Uh, and I think the government are pro promoting something which is evil mm. in the guise of being kind, inclusive, tolerant mm. and diverse. Because it's not really, you know. Um, I think it's hedonistic. It's all about pleasure. And uh, do, do you, you know? You have a pleasurable life. Never mind about anybody else. Type of thing. Oh, there are so many issues. You know, um, I probably left some things out, but you know, I'm I'm not intolerant. I no. I respect. No. Any everybody and anybody, whatever their um, sexuality, but um, well, I got know, a, I got a good contact for you anyway, um, that will compliment your group. Her name is Louise Kirk. She's from Alive and Kicking, and she's actually writing resources. They are not um, she is religious, but none of her resources are religion. It's about the first day in school and stuff like that. So I'll be giving yeah. you her contact details. She'll compliment okay. your group massively, Susan. Oh, brilliant. Oh, but, uh, it's very encouraging, um, Kim, to, to hear that. Oh, yeah, brilliant. Louise Kirk is going to be a great contact for you, but a website should be running now, Alive and Kicking is called. We, right. will, we will link her to our website anyway. We do need to touch base with her, but I think she'll yeah. compliment your group. Lovely, to be honest. Um, Susan, Lucia, do you want to say something? Yeah, I was. I would just want to say there are lots of organisations, lots of individuals that are fighting against this. Um, you know, this RSE and just the sexualisation in general. You know, in, in society. But what I want, what I, I, I just wanted to touch because obviously Susan has, has covered a lot in in what she was saying. And I want to say as well, Susan, there's been some lovely feedback um in the chat from YouTube and Facebook. They're all thanking you. Um, Adele said a very emotive interview. There's lots of praise for you, Susan. I just want to say that. Little Andrew, over to you, love. Yeah, yeah, Su Susan, you, you um, yeah. It's, you know what else is. Uh really really uh, upsets me is the cost of all of this you know yeah. it's, uh, now it's 159 million and by 2030 could be anything between 300 million pounds and 600 million pounds uh, my husband is a head teacher and he's scrimping and trying to get enough money 
to keep all his staff on, you know? And it makes me so, so angry that this money is being thrown at this vile, <laughs> it's an absolutely vile um, curriculum. Uh, yeah. When money could go to benefit schools and, you know, give children who, um, who need textbooks and who need, you know, children with special needs. But that's with, well, I've worked in, in that sector and I know it's underfunded. And it's going to be even more un underfunded now. So, you know, sorry, I have to put that in as well. No problem sorry. at all. Yeah. Susan, it's interesting you say about the money thing because it's very difficult. It's very difficult to actually find exactly how much they spent on this. Um, you know, like there is, I know the audit, Audit Wales um, did do a, you know, they do an audit on what they spend, but still they, they don't tell you exactly how much is spent. So, you know, a lot of money is going into the radar that we don't know about. And, you know, as you said, we're looking at about 300 million that we know about that's gone yeah. into sexualizing our children. And we're not happy about it. It's our money as well. It's the tax yeah, yeah. money. Well, the, thing is, the thing is, we're paying twice. We're paying for the curriculum once and we're paying to fight them in court then, aren't yeah. we? Um, yeah. Susan, I'm going to have to knock you off the line because I don't know if you heard my phone vibrate. And there's a oh. call coming through that I have to take. But thank you so much for coming on, and um, we really appreciate it. There's been great feedback for you, but I'm going to have to knock you off to put the computer on mute to take the call. Okay, thanks for the opportunity. Bye. No, thank Bye. you, Susan. Thank you thank so you. much. We really appreciate it. And I'll send you those contacts later on for Louise. Okay, bye. Bye-bye, right. You're a brilliant no, lady, no. Susan. Thank you. Right, guys, I'll leave you lot chat amongst yourselves. Now I'm going to take um, this call, Okay. Okay, no problems, um, Kim. Okay. See you in a bit. See you in a bit. Isn't that interesting, though, Joan? Um, I know, I know you were a teacher, you, you know, years ago. But you know, Susan, who's recently sort of retired, I think she said three years ago, didn't she? A lot of teachers. We do know a lot of teachers who have retired because they do not want to teach this RSE. And who is going to replace those teachers? That's what I'm really concerned about. If there's people out there, there's teachers out there who have actually, and I know, I know some of them personally, they have retired because they're they're looking at that, and I'm, I'm I can't teach that. Well, okay, if you're not going to teach it, they leave, and then they're replaced with teachers that want to teach it. You know, we've got we've got teachers who, um, you know, dare I say, very woke woke teachers, um, you know, teachers who have got like. The, like any profession, like any group or community, you've got different, you've got people in there with different um, opinions and different morals, you know, different perspectives on things. But this is why we don't want this, you know, this RSE just to be blanket teach the way it is, because it really does, it's really open to, to interpretation. And it really does depend on that individual's um, opinion on things like I keep going back to my uh you know my my college days I was 16 so we're looking at about 26 years ago 26 years ago I was in a sociology class and the sociology teacher was a full-on Marxist loved Marx's ideology he basically every single lesson we were taught how good that was and how bad all the other ideologies were it wasn't balanced it wasn't neutral so I actually was very confused in that lesson. I remember putting my hand up once when he had asked a question and delivered my opinion on it. And I was shut down and told I was wrong because it didn't, it didn't align with the Marxist ideology. Now that teacher wasn't teaching, he was indoctrinating. And this is exactly what's happening now at RSE. And it's not just for children who have, are in college from age 16, it's now gonna be for children from age three so you know we're, we're we're actually in a very very bad position at the moment and um it's massively worrying Lucia and is. also when you hear the way that these people talk about their subject can you hear water in the background no it's the noise in the background oh, okay um when they actually talk about what they're doing for example I was watching Emma Reynolds in a video talking to a teacher video which is about two years old 
So it was just before all this really came to a head. Um, and she was talking to a teacher in Newport and she was she said something that I thought was massively chilling. And that was about children's innocence. And that she said, I, I, I couldn't quote her, but it was more or less words along the lines of, well, you know, the concept of children's innocence is a stumbling block in some ways because it means that it's going to be more difficult to progress. And she has a view of children's innocence, which maybe other people don't. Yeah. She's actually, what she was saying is that it's up for grabs because when we're behind the scenes and when we talk with children, we know what they want. We know how much they know. And it's far more than is, is encompassed in this label of children's innocence, which is there to protect them. So how can you play with the concept? How can you play with a concept which is an age-old, tried and trusted concept and which belongs to every parent, no matter what, what walk of life they come from or what religion or faith they follow? Yeah. Children are supposed to be kept as innocent as possible. Why put young heads your uh, old heads on young shoulders why do that why give them information that they could distort that might worry them that might lead them into harmful behaviors why do that I, so emma reynolds i would love to have a conversation with her and act actually dig a little bit deeper in with her idea of childhood innocence because it doesn't seem to be the same as most parents and it doesn't be it certainly isn't the same as mine no it's not but that to me was almost oh well we're we're working behind the scenes you know this is the vibes that they're giving out that they're sort of working on the children behind the scenes having conversations with children that maybe the parents haven't had you know and I find that very, very, very disturbing. And what other subject would you find that? It's conspiratorial. It exactly. is actually conspiratorial. It is. It is. And, you know, it's even when you, you look. Sorry, when you we, mentioned, can I just say, because you mentioned your lecturer who was full-blown Marxist. Yeah. Well, in the 60s and 70s, when I was in university, the professor... Uh, in my university, where I was in London, our professor of Spanish, which was the subject that I studied, was a man called Royston Jones. Do you know what? I didn't have a clue what Royston Jones' background was politically until I actually saw him on the street one day with his berry on, um, giving out leaflets to people. He was a card-carrying communist. And I didn't have a clue. Mm. And that was because those ideas, any political idea was never supposed to be there yeah. in a classroom. Yeah, exactly. It shouldn't. We stuck, we stuck to the topics. We stuck to whatever it was that we were studying at the time. And we had plenty to, to discuss. We didn't need his political views necessarily and they never came across so there's absolutely no excuse for that is there no there's no, no excuse for an adult imposing political views onto a child absolutely not no and it's like it even goes back to the fact that now children know the sexuality of their teacher now when we were in school the only reason we would know whether, you know, we would only know if someone was married because it would be Mrs. instead of Miss or they'd have a wedding ring. We wouldn't know if they had a boyfriend. We wouldn't know if they had a girlfriend or, a, uh, you know, if they were if they were gay or straight or bi. We didn't know that. And it was none of our business because it yeah. was a it's a professional relationship. Teacher, student, professional relationship. Yeah, of course, you want to build a rapport with the children so they, 
you know, if you make a couple of jokes or whatever, you know, some teachers have got that sort of, you know, bit of a jokey thing going on. But at the end of the day, it has to remain professional, where the children respect the teachers and the teachers treat the children as students. They do not need to know the ins and outs of the teacher's personal life. The ch you know, the teachers have got a responsibility to safeguard the children whilst they're in school, make sure they are safe. And, you know, like if there is anything that they're concerned about with regards to a child's behaviour and you think there could be something, you know, going on at home, then, yeah, it is your responsibility to, you know, report that or investigate it further. But in terms of this now, it's like the children are knowing everything about what a teacher's sex life almost. That's not appropriate. That that is actually breaking that that that's breaking boundaries that shouldn't be broken at all. And then we've got this element where teachers are teaching the children values. So these values, you know, family values are very, very different. You know, my family values could be different to your family values. We all come from different religious groups, or we, you know, we've we've all got different opinions of like the way that you know children should be you know, like I I I certainly believe that you know you should be in a long term relationship before you even consider any sexual activity. That is my opinion. It may be different to my neighbour or my friend, but that doesn't you know like it's my it's my choice. I should choose how I teach my children. The only time the government or school should intervene if there is something inappropriate going on at home. That is the only time. You don't interfere if, say, you sort of think, oh, I think the parents are a little bit strict with this. No, that's none of their business. That's, you know, that that is a, a parental right to bring up your children based on your own religious or philosophical belief, isn't it, Joan? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and I, I, I don't... I don't I, I can't understand how any parent would feel comfortable um, having that kind of, with that kind of opposition because it will be opposition if it isn't now. It will eventually. Because where is it going to stop? Where is that overreach going to stop? You I know, don't know, Joan, because like, you know, we are seeing articles from England and Scotland, because people are saying, oh, what do you want about? It's all going to be age appropriate. But we are seeing articles. And when you see articles going out, we know there's a lot more going on that isn't actually reaching us. And there one article that really concerned me, and it was the, the Children's Commissioner of um, England, who is actually against this. She's actually against this uh, this sex education. And a young girl as young as nine was traumatised because she was taught about rape. Why would, you know, and she was taught that in the school. Like, why would there any, any teachers see that appropriate? And obviously some teachers are seeing it appropriate because it's being taught in schools already. You know, we... It, the children are coming back with all sorts of trauma because of this education and you know as you know we've said before it's wide open to interpretation so you may have a teacher who has got very high morals and will only teach the children what they need to know and will base any teaching on abstinence and that is what needs to be that is the only way you should teach sex education to anyone under um, the age of 16 anyway but then you it's are going to have to... It's the only safe way, isn't it, Lucia? What's it's that? The only, it's the only safe it way. It is. Like, if you <clears> want <throat> to reduce children, um, you know, teenage pregnancies and SDIs, then you teach abstinence. I'm fed up of them teaching this subject with the, pre the, the presumption that all children are doing it anyway. This is what they're assuming. All children are doing it. So from the age of 12 now, or the age of 11, really, they're teaching children how to put condoms onto full full size dildos. No, that's, you know, you are actually telling those children, well, if you're not already doing it, you should be doing it. Because that, that's the message you're going to bring across. We shouldn't be assuming that all children are doing it. Because at the end of the day, under the age of 16, it's unlawful anyway. So, you know, children should be encouraged as much as possible to delay uh, delay any um, any sexual activity and I think we've kind of missed our slot because I was going to have Miriam Grossman video in at this point but we will try and play it later because at least then you will really see 
um, like understand the damage that early sexual activity can cause to a person, um, especially girls, but also boys as well. Um, so, you know, even though the schools are teaching about, say, sex as in contraception, they're not actually teaching the whole truths. And this even goes into like when they're talking about the gender theory now, the gender, you know, transgenderism in schools. Now, I met a young, I've got to say a young girl because he's a trans, okay? He's transitioned, uh, sorry, she transitioned from a boy to a girl. She was 13. I didn't realize that she was born a male because very much looked like a female. And the attitude was she was on the waiting list for hormone blockers. And it was a bit of a shock to me because even though I know that there are children on this waiting list for the, um, you know, I've, I've heard that there are children on the waiting list for these hormone blockers. It's like you don't fully believe it until you hear it from someone's mouth. This 13 year old is on the waiting list. And when I said, cause I said, please don't do anything permanent. You may change your mind as an adult. And um, the trans, girl said I'm already on the waiting list and I said but what if you change your mind as an adult and um and they replied well I can just stop taking them it's reversible I said no it's not it is not reversible but this child believed and obviously the parent believed as well because the mum has consented to this child being on the waiting list they believe that it's reversible. So if you change your mind, it's fine. You just stop taking them and you'll just be back to a man. So there's a lot of untruths being told here, not just by the, uh, you know, the, the likes of Tavistock and the other sort of uh, transgender um, surgeries, but it's also going to be bringing it, being brought into the schools as well. So that's another objection. Yeah. About. Uh, what you mentioned there, I, I can't remember who I was listening to the other day, but it was someone that was uh knocking around with um whether it was a conference whether it was a rally but there were a lot of people there <clears throat> that had um had gone down the trans route and he was saying how many of these people men uh that were maybe in the 20s or 30s how wizened and old they looked and how some of them were actually on walkers um okay. you know uh oh crutches well yeah no um what do you call them you know little john i'm afraid that's the one afraid. yeah because they got osteoporosis and that they've all they'd all riddled with um arthritis and all sorts i know but i hadn't realized um just from his observations in that crowd uh there might have been 100 or 200 people there but just from his observations he he saw quite a few and he knew what their ages were chronologically but to look at them he said they looked about 20 years older ah. so don't tell me these things can be reversed because they can't there's no. so much evidence by now okay they're still experimental drugs but we know enough by now to know that they're really really harmful don't you yeah we do Absolutely. know. We know that there's no longitudinal studies on it. Um, the long term, well, the medium term effects are horrific. You know, well, we should like. I um, I remember speaking to a journalist, and they said, "Why do you disagree to teaching of gender ideology?" I said, I "Simply don't." So I do not disagree to the teaching of it. I disagree to the part teaching of it. If we yeah. were teaching the full truth, if we were teaching the consequences of and the risks. Right. If we were teaching where this research actually came from, I would fully support and promote yeah. it. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. I would. Okay. And it's the fact that um, only the bits that they choose and the bits that they want are promoted. I will not allow this in our classrooms and I will fight it every single day. We will continue exposing the truth on this topic. Unfortunately, there are going to be some casualties. Those casualties are not on our head, okay? Those casualties are on the head of the people who have failed to investigate this further. Um, failure to investigate this further puts you in the bracket of negligence. That is not our crown to wear, guys, you know? And I'm like I said, I would not disagree to the teaching if it was taught to the extent that we 
know it to be, you know, right from beginning to the end. Play a video of David Reimer on the Oprah Winfrey show. You know, if that was in the curriculum, I would support it. But yeah. until that happens, there's absolutely no way on this earth. But Lou, I did notice you said about we're a bit past time for Miriam's um for Miriam's presentation. Um Darren was supposed to be on it too. But I don't know if you want to go ahead and Miriam's presentation, we could do that if you want, because there is stuff that's going on behind the scenes and that would allow us an hour to deal with that then. Yeah, okay, I'm happy to do that. I just didn't want to intervene with um, with Darren. And then, and then we'll have a little 15 minutes, I think, before Nigel comes on, which means we'll be jumping straight into the queer theory aspect. So things are going to be a little bit jumbled up, but I think the viewers will understand why in the next few hours. And obviously, um, we, we want Darren to discuss um, our, our fighting court, uh, our complaint and things like that properly. So I do know Darren's on standby anyway. This would probably free him up to walk a dog. So I don't, th I don't think he's going to be annoyed. But if you want to go ahead and do the Miriam presentation now, I'm happy to do that. What about you, John? That sounds fine. Yes, really it does. I do, guys. And this is a really good presentation. Before you press play then, Lil, put the timer on um, for 30 seconds so we know where to cut the video to um, play it for. Well, actually, we can do mediums again, can we? Because it's a separate video. It is, yeah. Don't worry about my fussing. Do whatever you want no, to do. Don't, don't apologise at all. I, I've got an... Well, it is. That's my computer science degree taking over. It is. <laughs> <laughs> no. right, do you want me to share the screen then, Kim? Yeah, you go for it, love, you go for it. Guys, we'll be back in about an hour after this presentation. Share this presentation far and wide. It's actually on our um, YouTube channel, PCP Wales. Sometimes you don't see all the videos, so, so click to see all the videos. It's quite far down. It's about two years old. This presentation will never get old because the information is incredible, mm. especially if you're a parent of girls. Please watch this, guys. Get it out there. Yeah, really important. But I just want to add, just before I play it, um, that we are doing a sponsored podcast-a-thon. So any money that you can spare, we are raising money to make sure we can honour all the court case, all the court case fees and all the legal fees because we're fighting this RSE all the way. We're not going anywhere. We're going to be fighting it all the way. However, yes, we are. Woo! However, we do need funds because we haven't got a bottomless purse unlike the government. We wish so, we did. If we did, we wouldn't have to do this, sponsors. We wouldn't have to do all this work because money will do the talking for us. Yeah, and I've just, I'm just going to say on the campaign today so far, we have raised £140. So thank oh, you. Already. Already. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, guys. Thank you. That's amazing. It's brilliant. That's amazing. brilliant. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Really appreciate that. So please keep sharing. Um, please keep sharing this. Please keep tagging people in there. And then, uh, yes, yeah, just get this out far and wide. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's listen now to Miriam Grossman. I'm going to try and do this. As, oh, share screen, isn't it? Have you clicked the box for the audio? Um, There's a little tiny box in oh, the left. Hang on. Nah. Okay, let me just check. Now, some screens let you share audio. Look for the share audio checkbook on the next window. Yeah, so the you... yeah there'll just um, be a tiny little yeah. box in the left-hand corner. I got it, I got it. Um, it's like a good degree again. Right. Oh, it's paying off. It is paying off. I know, Kim, you de you're definitely becoming a bit of a... You, you, you're definitely a whiz on that computer, aren't you? Oh, yeah, right, yeah. can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Can you see it, Joan, as well? I, I put it on large screen, love, so the only screen is them now. They can see that. Brilliant. Okay, I'll press play, and um, let's, uh, yeah, away we go. You know, seeing them, and, and there were basic, basic things that... We're good to go. Yeah. Okay. Greetings, everyone. Oh, thank um, you, Miriam. It's really, it's really my 
pleasure to be able to do this for you. Um, I, I'll just start by saying that I want to, I'm lending my full support to this wonderful organization, um, PCP Wales, and the amazing women behind it. Um, I wish that I could do more. If I could get on a plane and come over there and stand with you on one of your Sunday demonstrations, I would do that in a second. Um, so what I'm, what I'm doing today is explaining from a medical perspective um, the dangers of RSE relationships and sexuality education that your government is trying to um, impose on you, <clears throat> the people of Wales and your children. Um, I am, uh, I, I've been involved in this area of sex education for a long time now, and I want to tell you how that happened. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a psychiatrist, and I was working with students at one of the biggest universities that we have here in the United States. Um, it's in California, the University of California in Los Angeles, also called UCLA. And I was um, a part of a clinic there on campus in which um, we saw thousands of students every year for all sorts of problems. And I noticed, um, I, I, I noticed that a lot of the uh, young people that were coming through my office at the university, and they were essentially between the ages of, let's say, 18 and um, 30, let's say, uh, but but most of them um, between 18 and, and 25, um, and most of them young women. And so many of them were coming in as a result of their the choices that they had made in their sexual lives. In other words, um, they they were very upset because they were diagnosed with an STD or they were having a pregnancy scare and they were terrified that they might be pregnant or they had had an abortion or they were simply um, very confused and upset about a relationship that they were in. Now, UCLA is one of the top universities uh, in, in my country and you have to be a really exceptionally good student to get in there. So the kids that I was seeing were that I, the kids that were coming into my office were very bright, ambitious um, kids, and and you just you know you wouldn't expect them to not have the information that they needed to know about sexuality, and yet here I was you know seeing them, and and there were basic basic things that I'm going to describe to you soon that that they were not aware of. So I started doing some research and I realized that my profession, um, the mental health profession, and also um, the profession of, of sexual education was taken over by, um, by radical, uh, uh, I'll call them activists, radical activists that had a certain uh, vision for how the world should be. Um, and instead of being focused on keeping people healthy and making smart health decisions, they were promoting a certain worldview uh, that, that in fact would bring more kids into the doctor's office instead of keeping them out. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so... <clears throat> As a result of uh, my research, I, I okay. I'm I'm not able to advance my slide here, and I don't know why. Because normally I can advance my slide. Hmm. 
did you say did you do um slideshow from the start yeah i pretty sure that i did okay i'll have to do it this way i guess okay so wait a minute do you guys see on top of this current slide do you see that bar that has all the directions no no you just see the book right you just see the book yes. unprotected yes okay great so I, I wrote this book unprotected a campus psychiatrist reveals how political correctness in her profession endangers every student and um and and in this book uh, every chapter has an example of one or a few students that i saw and how um <clears throat> they were harmed by by the ideology that's in my profession um the the world view of um you know of of uh sexual freedom and um the view that um traditional morality is um is is oppressive and and we need to get away from that and the view that uh children are sexual from cradle to grave uh, i don't I, I hope that a lot of you are, are have already heard these ideas and i know that uh the pcp wales did a fantastic youtube on the history of sex education and they went into that but anyway so I, I wrote this book and I became aware of these problems within sex education. And then I did more research and I wrote another book. Here we go. And that book was called You're Teaching My Child What? And this book really is focused on the falsehoods in sex education and how they harm children. So, um, what I'm going to be doing is taking some of the information, um, the medical information that I provide in these books, and I'm going to explain to you why RSE is dangerous to your kids. Now, um, first of all, if there's anything that I want you to know, that, that I want you to walk away from this lecture. It's that the number one priority of sexuality education is to promote sexual freedom. Sexual freedom means that, uh, that people at any age from cradle to grave are sexual beings and that they have the right to express that sexuality in any way that they are comfortable with, so long as the person that they're with consents to it. So there is no, uh, there's no consideration to what age this person is, what, how, what kind of cognitive development they have, how well they might be able to understand the consequences of what they're doing, whether they are male or female, uh uh and so on and so forth the number one priority is to promote sexual freedom now there's a certain problem that you guys have at this point with your government and that is that uh they haven't provided you with the actual curriculum that they're planning on on giving to the schools <laughs> you don't actually know what's in it and that is a big problem because when you look at the documents um uh that that present the the guidelines or the philosophy behind it um there's many many pages you know hundreds of pages of things that sound quite good and quite noble and and it says that you know, we're going to educate your children and we're going to make sure that they know how to stay safe and that they have the information that they need. Um, and we respect family and, um, you know, it all sounds very good. The problem is, and what I have discovered through the years, and I've done this for many different communities and different countries, what you have to do, you can't, you can't be um, misled by that. 
if you if you are misled and you say, oh, well, this sounds good, you know, I'll I'll go for this. This sounds like what I would like for my child. You are going to be shocked later on when you see what their kids really are going to be taught. And so what I typically do and what I did in this case is that I went to the document Relationships and Sexuality Education. There's um, something called Annex C at the end of it. And they have links to external support organizations. It's on page 19. And you will see there that they link to an organization called childline.org.uk. Now, I want to carefully go through what this website, childline.org.uk, presents to children. Because this tells us what um, RSE is going to be based on what the kind of approach that they're going to be taking to educating and guiding your children. So first of all, they have on that website a page um, in which kids go to when they're not sure if they're ready to have sex or not. And so um, on this page, one option is to get support from our counselors and um, what this this coming slide is going to tell you what the counselors are going to tell the child. The only person who can decide if you're ready is you. Now, this is a big deal, okay? Because uh, think of what we tell people about, or to our kids, for example, about diet, smoking, drinking, drugs tanning salons, we don't tell them the only person who can decide if you're ready is you. We tell them the medical information that they need. We tell them, don't do this. It's dangerous. And this is why it's dangerous. And there's consequences that you're going to have to face if you do the following things. So we strongly advise you to avoid drugs, to avoid alcohol, to... It, it's, you. You know, you get my drift. But in this case, what they're saying is only you can decide. If you're thinking about having sex, these are the questions you should ask yourself. Do I have contraception? Do I know about safe sex? Can I talk to my partner about having sex? Do I feel comfortable with having sex? Will my partner support me if I don't have sex? And will I feel less mature if I don't have sex? If you answer no, to any of these questions, you may not be ready to have sex. Now, let's look at this. Let's say you have, you know, you have a daughter, you have a granddaughter. She's 12 or 14, and she's met somebody that she really likes. And she's thinking, maybe I should have sex with him. And she comes to this web page. Well, do I have contraception? Yeah, I mean, maybe she's gotten something she's gone somewhere to a clinic or maybe the boy that she knows has gone somewhere do I know about safe sex yes can I talk to my partner about having sex yes do I feel comfortable yeah I think so and so on and so forth she can easily answer yes to all these questions you know what at no point are these so-called experts these counselors that your child is gonna your, the government is saying that your child should go on a website such as this and trust the information that they're giving them. At no point do they say, well, you know, how old are you? Um, how old is your partner? At no point do they talk about what some of the consequences might be and that there might be, you, you know, huge, devastating consequences even if you have contraception they never talk about speaking to your parents and this is all terribly alarming i think that you would agree uh, and and this the reason why they're giving this guidance quote unquote to kids is this goes back to the whole philosophy that this is based on that every Everyone at every point of their life is a sexual being and has the right to experience sexual pleasure in any way that they want. 
um, so long as they're using protection, quote unquote, and it's consensual, that no one can come in, no parent or doctor or teacher or any adult can come in and say, you know what, darling, you're not ready for this. This is, this is for adults. Sex is an adult behavior. It's a very big deal with really big consequences. And you're just not ready. You see, that would go against the philosophy that's behind all this. This is more, um, more of what they have on this Childline site. You can contact Childline about anything. Whatever your worry, it's better out than in. We're here to support you. There are lots of different ways to speak to a counselor or get support from other young people. Is that what we want? Do we want our young people turning to their peers for guidance about becoming sexually active, doing things that can forever, just one sexual act, as you well know, can change your life forever. You can get pregnant from one sexual encounter. You can get a sexually transmitted infection from one sexual encounter, which can lead to trouble with infertility, lifelong problems with, you know, with herpes, blisters, terrible things. Do we really want our kids being advised by other people? And the counselors, I would sort of like to know who they are. But what they have is a number that you can call for free. And you know what? It won't even show on their bill. So parents, if, you've, if you have your child, your teenager has a phone, it's not going to show on the bill that they called this place for advice. Even more than that, they have a whole website on covering your tracks. If you're worried, someone will find out that you've used Childline. Our advice can help you keep your visits private. Um, this is very disturbing. And this is furthermore undermining parental authority and undermining the whole family unit because um, relationships within the family and outside the family are based on trust. This website is instructing your child to go behind your back and get information that you may not want her or him to have um, guidance that you may not agree with. And it's all, they're all being instructed to do this in a way that you won't find out. Now, a little bit more um, on the on the site, um, this childline site, they have information about abortion. And for kids that are asking, how do I know what's right or wrong? They say, speak to our counselors. Now, um, I would imagine that every responsible parent um, wants their child to learn about what's right and wrong from within the family not from a random counselor who works for this website. So this is very disturbing. And finally, the website talks about getting help with decisions, the decision of having an abortion. And I've, um, I've put it in red here just to highlight that they say you don't have to talk to your parents. And they're saying, we're here to talk to you. We are here to support you. You don't have to talk to your parents. So um, this is a, a red flag, a big red flag. Your government is going to direct your children to websites such as this. So here's some of the medical information that your teenager will not be getting 
from RSE. First of all, um, we all know if we, you know, anyone that's had anything to do with a teenager knows that they're not fully mature in terms of their thinking, right? And that is because this has been well known within the medical field for now 30 years that um, the, the teen brain is immature and it doesn't fully mature into an adult brain actually until the mid 20s. And the part of the brain um, that matures last is a part of the brain that's right behind the, fore, the forehead, and it's called the prefrontal cortex. Now, this is the part of the brain that's like the grown-up. It's the CEO of the brain. It's the part of the brain that can think rationally and calmly. Do I want to do this or not? What could happen? What could be the possible consequences? What might I feel tomorrow if I do such and such right now? Is this a smart decision? So that's the part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, that is underdeveloped in teenagers, which is why they're impulsive. They do, they do silly things. They do stupid things. And when they come to us the next day as parents and we say to them, like, why did you do that? What were you thinking when you did that? And the teenager will say, you know what? I, 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 actually, I wasn't thinking. It's true. They weren't thinking when they made some dumb or dangerous, risky decision. Because in teenagers, it's been found that many times when they're in highly stimulating situations, when they're driving fast or they're on a roller coaster or they're bungee jumping or they're in a sexually um, stimulating situation, it's their, uh, it's other parts of their brain, what we call more their emotional parts of their brain that take over. Okay. And they just like go for it. They're not using their, the mature parts of their brain. And this has been a very good example of how we are aware of this. In this country, in my country, we have um, a company called Allstate, and it's an insurance company. And um, Allstate has an advertisement that says, why do most 16-year-olds drive like they're missing a part of their brain? You see, because Allstate has to explain to parents why insurance for a 16 year old you can get your license in many states here in the u.s when you're 16 but the insurance for your 16 year old is going to be you know through the roof and so they make this explanation here in their advertisement why do most 16 year olds drive like they're missing a part of their brain and the answer is because they are they actually are missing a part of their brain and this all state insurance says even bright, mature teenagers sometimes do things that are stupid. But when that happens, it's not really their fault. It's because their brain hasn't finished developing. And they go on and they talk about the prefrontal cortex. And it's not really fully mature until they're in their 20s. Now, if a, a car insurance company knows this, well, then certainly sexual Sexuality educators also know it, and they have an obligation to teach teenagers to be, to be super careful when they get in these situations of high stimulation, because even if they have their condom, and even if they have given consent, and even if they know about safe sex and they can talk to their partners, well, guess what? They, they, might very well do something stupid that they later regret. And that's why they should avoid even getting into that situation. But you see, if they were to say that, this scientific information here about the brain being immature, it goes against the philosophy uh, upon which uh, uh, that uh, RSE is based upon. Again, the philosophy of um, Sexual freedom is primary and not sexual health. 
What's primary is to teach kids that they are sexual beings, and that's a wonderful thing, and that they have the right to act on their sexual impulses at any time. And adults can't come along and tell them what to do because they have that right. And by the way, without getting, we can't, we don't have time to get into it, but there's lots of documents and um, official statements that, uh, that have come out of the United Nations and other organizations that affirm this right, a child's right to be sexual and to act on their sexuality uh, without anyone, you know, being able to come in and say that this is not okay. So the RSC plans to tell your kids, starting I think at the age of eight, um, we're going to get to that. Uh, they plan to explain to them where they get these rights from and what the documents are from the United Nations and other organizations that give them these rights. But anyway, I have to go on. Okay, so um, in terms of the teenage brain, one um, psychobiologist explained it this way. He said that um, teenagers are more Kirk than Spock. So any of you that are know about Star Trek know that Captain Kirk was the emotional guy. Okay, and he was always just blurting things out and making decisions, you know, based on his emotions. Whereas Kirk, I mean, Spock, rather, was the, the thinking guy. And in fact, he, he didn't, his emotions really, we didn't really see um, Spock have many emotions. He was always in his head. He was always very calm. He was always thinking things out. So teenagers are more Kirk than Spock. I think that's a very good way of putting it. So biology says, wait. That's the message that science gives. Wait until you're an adult. Sex is not for kids. Now, this is a very important uh, piece of information, a chart that also uh, you won't see from that, that website, ch child. What was it called? Childline? That website that was giving all the information for kids. This is, it says on the top, why don't sex educators emphasize that casual sex of multiple partners is a health hazard? Because look, if you, and the reason I put this up is that <clears throat> one of the questions, you know, when you're advising a young person whether to have sex or not, it's not enough to just say, do you have birth control? Do you, do you know about sex? safe sex, are you being coerced, and so forth. You need to know about this person that you're planning to have sex with. And how many partners has that person had? So the reason that that's important is because when you have sex with someone, you're actually, in a way, from a, perspe a medical perspective, a sexually transmitted infection perspective, you're having sex with everyone that they had sex with. And this chart shows that if one person, if two people, there's two people and they have sex with each other and each of them in the past had sex with two people and each of those two people had sex with two people and onward and onward, um, you're actually having sex, so to speak. You're being exposed to a lot of STIs, many more than you might imagine. So one of those questions that you want to have, one of those conversations that we have to tell kids before they have sex with people is, well, get, a, get some sexual history. And these are adult conversations. Now, another thing that kids need to be told is about how girls and women are more vulnerable than guys. And this is pure science. This comes from the CDC. Um, biological factors place women at a greater risk from men. And why is that? I'm going to quickly explain to you the science. That is because um, the opening of the cervix, um, and what you see here on the left side is the cervix. The 
The, oh, I'm sorry, the cervix is the opening to the uterus. The cervix is the area that gets infected with um, a, a number of dangerous uh, sexual, sexually transmitted infections like the human papillomavirus, um, chlamydia, and, and other things. Uh, and this can happen, by the way, even if a condom is worn. So in a teenager, the uh, the cervix is generally covered by only one cell. It's a very delicate surface. If you look at the diagram on the right, you see on the right that there's a, a part of the cervix that only has those single cells. And on the other side, on the left side, you see uh, you see that that there's many layers. What happens is that as a girl gets older, that area changes and it grows many more layers so that it's harder to infect. It's called the tra this area is called the transformation zone because with time it transforms and it sort of grows its own protective layer. But in younger girls, um, there's a huge area of the cervix that is not protected. And so it's much easier for um, the bacteria or the virus to get in there. Um, so this is a picture of what the immature cervix looks like. And then this next picture shows what a, a an adult cervix looks like. And it's covered by that thicker, um, cell service, su surface, I'm sorry. Now, I have always felt that these pictures, which we've had for decades and decades, I mean, if you can look at a GYN textbook from like the 70s, and you will see these photographs. These pictures need to be front and center. Our girls need to know this. Um, boys don't have this issue to contend with um, unless we're talking about anal sex in boys in which the boy I'm going to try not to get off on this topic but when a boy is the receptive partner for anal intercourse then the entire anal um, canal is also lined with only this thin one cell thick membrane and that's one of the reasons why anal intercourse is so dangerous. But back to what we're talking over here. One of the things that RSE is not going to tell your kids is that girls are more vulnerable. And they're going to pay a heavier price for early sexual behavior than boys are. In the United States, one in four girls have a sexually transmitted infection, and almost 20% are infected within one year of becoming sexually active. And the reason for that is their immature cervix and the girls that used to that sit in front of me when they're a little bit older, and I would tell, yeah, I was mentioning to you how at UCLA I would sit with these young women who are 20 or 25 and they've never heard of this stuff. So biology says that girls are more vulnerable than boys. And this, of course, also goes against the narrative. Uh, that's behind RSC, which they they would never, you know, it, it's against their narrative to say that one group is more um, vulnerable biologically than another, because we all have to be equal and free, and we all have to be able to behave the same as everybody else, regardless of age or sex. And I use the word sex to instead of the word gender, because sex means male or female, I'm not going to get off on that tangent. 
Okay, biology says wait. Real feminism protects women and girls. Now, the other thing that makes girls more vulnerable, and I'm not saying that boys don't also suffer from early sexual behavior, risky behavior with multiple partners. They do. But in terms of the science that we have, um, it tells us more about the vulnerability of girls. And one thing that it tells us is that um, girls are at risk for depression. The developing female brain, with all the hormones and the, it, it has a vulnerability to stress and depression, especially follow, following failed relationships and especially relationships that were sexual in nature. And one neuropsychiatrist who wrote a book about the female brain said, the female brain is so deeply affected by hormones that their influence can be said to create a woman's reality. So I want to go into that a bit. So which hormones are we talking about? Well, one, one female hormone is called oxytocin. And oxytocin, a very, very interesting hormone that boys and men have as well, but not at the levels that girls do. This is primarily a female hormone. And um, this hormone is released uh, during uh, intimate behavior, during uh, intimate touching, uh, when people are connecting and staring, you know, in the eye, into the eyes of someone that they love. Um, it's during orgasm, during uh T uh, touching of the nipple, stimulation, sexual stimulation, and during <laughs> orgasm. Now, what does oxytocin actually do? Um, well, a hormone is a chemical that travels from one organ to another organ with a message. And the message of oxytocin is to connect, um, to emotionally connect and bond with the other person. And um, there's all kinds of fascinating work that's been done in this area. And I, if you're interested, I strongly suggest my books and, and other books as well. But basically what oxytocin does in a nutshell is it switches love and trust on and it switches caution and aversion off. And this, um, this quote is coming from the book, The Female Brain, written by Dr. Brizendine, who's a well-known um, psychiatric uh, psychiatrist, uh, a uh, neurobiologist and psychiatrist who does research into the male and female brains. And so this is very important to know because even if you're with someone that you just met, um, your body is going to react the same way. And lo and behold, uh, and I saw this in my office so often, that a young woman could have, you know, a, what used to be called a one-night stand or just a casual encounter, casual sexual encounter. Um, doesn't necessarily even have to be sexual, but you know, the, the touching and the kissing and all that good stuff that goes on, um, it causes the release of, of hormones that send messages. It, it affects us. What I'm trying to say is that there's a lot going on beneath the surface. It's not enough to use a condom or to use birth control pills and to say that you're protected. That does not leave you protected. Um, that, yeah, that does not, that is, that is not sufficient protection for our girls at, or our boys. And that is why, um, I, I, you know, the, the offices of therapists and doctors are filled with, um, people who have been harmed by this philosophy of, uh, uh, of, of, of early sexuality multiple partners, and just depending on uh, birth control and 
uh, consent. This is a very destructive philosophy that your children are going to have pounded into them by RSE. Now, I'm just going to quickly, I, um, there's just, I, I wanted just to show you that there are so many studies now about how oxytocin causes um, the changes in the brain that, that uh, make us uh, feel trust toward another person, the person that, that we're with. Um, very interesting that oxytocin is being used in people who have autism because autism, as you probably know, is a disorder um, in which there's a, you know, problems with connection, with relating to other people, and oxytocin um, helps those people feel connected and um, uh, feel attached and, 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 and feel trust, which they normally have trouble feeling that. And then there's research that's done with newborn babies on mothers. Anyway, I'm going to go now to another topic, and that is that um, RSE is going to be mandatory in Wales from age three. And that, that's not really up for discussion. Um, from what I can see from the documents, whereas um, the, the sex education that you have right now uh, it's not mandatory. There's an opt out for parents, but that's that's going to be gone. If this goes through, that's going to be gone. No opt out. And they're actually going to have access to your three year old. And I've just what I've done here is present, you know, giving you some photos of three year olds just to remind you what they look like. I mean, three year olds. You know, that's. That should just be a time of, of the epitome of innocence and um, joy and learning about your world and learning how things work and how to get along with your friends and how to share toys, get along with your brothers and sisters. That's what life should be like as a three year old. Um, why in the world? Would the people behind this want to reach your three-year-old? And why would they make it mandatory? So this is, we really have to think about this because the answer that they're going to give you, of course, is that they want to teach your three-year-old how to protect themselves from being abused, right? Being sexually abused. Um, they want to teach them about good touch and bad touch and all that stuff. Um, now, I would argue that that to teach, I agree that children need to be taught uh, that they can't trust everybody out there. Um, oh, I have I have to just get the sun out of my eyes one minute. <laughs> Okay, so I, I agree that even a, a three-year-old, uh, especially if they're not always with family and if they're going to be in a situation where they're not with people that they know so well, um, that, yeah, they should be taught about uh, private, private parts. And the way you can do that, it's very easy. You just say, you know, the parts of your body that are covered by your bathing suit are called private parts. And those are places that no one should be looking or or touching. Like that's that's not okay. That's only for your parents, um, the doctor, uh, whoever. Someone there's a babysitter that might be bathing the child. Those people, that's okay. But anyone else, that's not okay. End of discussion. What else do you possibly need to tell a three-year-old? or a five-year-old um, more than that about to, to avoid, for, you know, to, to educate them about the fact that, you know, to protect them from child abuse. That's what I'm trying to say. Why do they feel such a need to get to your child? I'll tell you why. You see, um, they want to normalize for your child 
the, the experience of talking about these things in school. They want the child to think that, yeah, I mean, this is normal. School is the place where we talk about these kind of private things about, about these body parts and about touching their, what the body parts are called, which is another thing is completely ridiculous. A three-year-old, that these kids don't need to know about the, the proper names, testicles, vulva, vagina. It's just all trying to sexualize the child, focus the child on these parts of their bodies, um, introduce them to the notion that, yeah, I learn about these things in school, not at home. Uh, it's fine to talk about these things so that later on, when they are, you know, at the next step, five, seven, eight, 11 years old, and they start hearing uh, much more what should be shocking to them material, they will already be used to it. So that is the um, nefarious, that is the um, I'm not much sure what word to use, but it, it's it's not about health, and uh, it's something that you should just be saying over my dead body. Are you going to have access to my three-year-old with this material? I will teach my little children what they need to know at home. I'm perfectly capable of doing that. Also, I want to just tell you that over here um, at the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, they are saying, you know what? Children have their own words for body parts. Why don't you find out, you know, what is, what is that word? And... Um, you can speak to them in a way that they're comfortable. So instead of directing as RSE is going to say that, oh, these kids need to. And by the way, how 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 is it that the teachers of RSE are going to teach their little the little kids about these things? They're going to have a diagram. Uh, well, I would like to see that diagram. They're going to have. How are they going to go about teaching this? Um, but. My point here is that the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry is saying that when you talk to your kids about sex, you do not have to use all these um, fancy terms, for lack of a better word. And furthermore, they say that parents should respond to the needs and curiosity level of their individual child yeah. and offer them no more or less information than the child is asking for and is able to understand. It just makes me want to scream. Okay, RSE is going to come in and tell your kids all this stuff that they're going to Someone is... I think uh, someone Rachel, you've got your mic on. Can you turn your mic off, Rachel? Thank you. Okay, Miriam, go ahead. Sorry okay. about that. Um, um, so, so this, which is coming from, this is the professional organization for the, the, the psychiatric care of, of kids and taking care of kids. Um, uh, and this is their advice that you, and let's, let's just say, this is so important. You respond to the level of the child. You don't offer more information than what the child is asking for and able to understand. Um, could you, I want to tell a little story. Do I have enough time? Because I don't know when you want to finish this. Kimberly? No, we intrigued you. You go ahead, Miriam. Okay, I'll just do it quickly, but this, it makes my point. I have a lot of slides left and I don't want to have to cut short, but a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist told me that once, uh, um, uh, a family uh, came to him and they, they, one of their kids had been um, increasingly anxious, uh, anxious 
and they and they couldn't figure out why. Um, and finally, they, they brought in the child, and the psychiatrist spoke to the child, and the child said, "Well, um, my family is is going on a trip, and we're all flying to Europe." And and the doctor said, "Well, that sounds great. Why are you nervous about that?" And he said, "Well, I." I I don't know how to fly. Um, children are not miniature adults. Children think differently. Children can only absorb certain information into their, into their system. They don't have the cognitive ability. And what RSE does is it just goes, goes in there like a bulldozer to these young kids who aren't asking these questions and don't have a need to know this information that they want to give them at an early age. Um, and that is not healthy and not good. And you want to stop that. Okay, let me just move forward. I want to um, present to you this quote from a, a famous child psychologist, Chaim Gino, And he said, children are like wet cement. Whatever falls on them makes an impression. I promise you. If your kids are hearing information at school about sexuality, bisexuality, anal intercourse, gender, you may not be a girl, you may not be a boy or a girl, um, it makes an impression on them. They're going to remember that. Um, and this is why, again, I'm going back to the fact that that child line, um, that, that website that your government is going to suggest to your kids um, this this is the opposite of what we want for our kids we want to be in control of what kind of information your kid is going to get especially in this area um, now unesco says that from ages five to eight and I got this from a UNESCO document, the goals of sexuality education, teach children their rights and what the laws and agreements are. And you know what? When they're going to do a good job teaching that. And before you know it, when your child is nine or 10 or 11 and they're getting onto websites that you don't like, they're going to say, I have the right. They're going to point to these documents from the UN. I have the right to, to get this information. Um, for ages 9 to 12, students should demonstrate respect for diverse practices relating to sexuality. What do they mean by diverse? You're going to see at the end of this talk some examples of what they mean by diverse. Ages 12 to 15, students should learn to question social and cultural norms. So they want them to start questioning. And then and what that means, of course, is questioning the family. The message is that you're going to be giving that at home. They want students to learn to question those things. And then at age 15, they should appreciate that they, they need to develop, to develop their own perspectives on sexual behavior. Not what their family tells them, not what their church tells them, not what their doctor tells them. Again, the number one priority of sexuality education is to promote sexual freedom. And I want you to understand that when sexual freedom reigns, sexual health suffers because you can't have it both ways. Okay, if you're going to be sexually free and start sexual behavior at a young age, which means you're going to have multiple partners because when you start at a young age, you have more partners. Um, your sexual health is going to suffer. If two people wait until um, they are young adults and then they, uh, they, they decide that they are going to be, uh, they're, they're, they're going to commit to each other uh, in their relationship, they never have to worry. These are two adults that never had a sexual relationship with anybody else. They will never have to worry about a sexually transmitted infection. And that is a fact. And that is a fact that young people need to hear. It's an ideal. 
many people will not reach that ideal, of course. But many people, you know, we present an ideal of an ideal weight, an ideal exercise schedule, an ideal of keeping away from drugs and alcohol. So we can also, you know, sexuality is an appetite. It's a wonderful, healthy appetite. And we want to tell kids this. But like all appetites, it needs to be, uh, you need to have self-control. And you need to have uh, goals. Just like you do if you're an athlete, you're going to have goals, you're going to have discipline, you're going to wake up early, work out, avoid fatty foods, et cetera, et cetera. So what I've done next is um, I, I, I'm bringing you some slides that I actually showed when I spoke at the um, House of Lords nine years ago. Um, and Lisa's on this um, currently with us now. And Lisa... Thank you again for your support and bringing me over to London and allowing me to speak. So this is what I discovered um, was going to be presented to um, kids th through the um, RSE program in the UK. Um, this is one slide from a website uh, called the, I think it's Family Planning Association, which is, I think what your Planned Parenthood is called. So I'm not going to read, I'm just going to let, every, oh, there's people that can't read it. Okay. I mean, there's people that are only hearing, they're just listening. So I will read it. Um, the first slide says a fetishist is a person who's turned on by a particular thought, activity, or object, such as the feel or smell of leather. And this is meant for kids who are age 11 and up. The next slide, the sexy stuff, a guide for guys who like guys. And this is from the National Health Service of the UK. I'm sorry. I, I, I mean, I hope no one's about to have dinner or just had dinner. Rimming is when someone uses their mouth and tongue to explore someone else's bum. You might cringe at the very thought, but some people enjoy it. And this is the same thing um, about the same behavior. And it says lots of people enjoy rimming because there are lots of sensitive nerve endings around the anus. The next one is about bondage. It says bondage for beginners from tying up to blindfolding. Here's how to play it safe. This was from a website called thesite.org, which was also recommended by Relationship Sexuality Education by the UK. This is recommended to kids. And the last one is a question. Someone is asking, is it okay for my girlfriend to pee into my mouth? It turns me on. Is that normal? And the answer given is that different things sexually arouse different people. The important thing to remember is not to pressurize your partner into doing anything they are not comfortable with. So let this sink in, folks. I'm just going to give you a moment to let this sink in, this will all be brought into your child's life, into your home, if you let RSE come into your country. RSE is an attack on innocence. It's an attack on girls. It's an attack on family, and it's an attack on traditional morality, which are all things that I believe your culture, the Welsh culture, believes in. So I'm going to ask you, the people of Wales, what are you going to do? What, what are you going to do? 
Is it going to be sexual freedom or sexual health for your young people? Because you are at the crossroads. This is it. If this goes through, this is it. You, you don't you don't turn around. So are you going to let it happen? Or are you going to say, over my dead body, are my kids going to be exposed to this stuff? And that's my question. And I'm going to stop here. And we can do some discussion. Okay. Well, we had some great feedback from that, Lucia. Oh, yeah, sorry, I missed you then. I, it was completely, um, I can hear a lot of noise going on. Is that no, I think you're a little bit quiet, you are, Lou. I had the YouTube still playing then. <laughs> oh, That's what it was, I can hear it now. I thought it was coming from you. <laughs> so I hope you all enjoyed that. I um yeah, it was it was actually good refreshing my refreshing my memory on um on Miriam's on Miriam's video. She's obviously, you know, she's obviously qualified in her field and you know she's taught she certainly taught me a lot. I thought I knew I I, I thought I knew everything there was to know about, you know, sort of sexual health, but she has certainly uh, taught me a thing or two and I know you said the same didn't you Kim yeah and then somebody said bless an attack on boys too yeah it is an attack on boys too um well what I say is uh, a journalist spoke to me a couple of weeks ago and he said you know what is your issue here I said well I raise my son to open doors the schools are raising my son to open legs you know, um, that that is a complete contrast to the way I raise her. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly it. We want our we want our we want our boys to grow up to be gentlemen, so they can, you know, be decent human beings. And you know, I've got a boy and a girl, and I, so, you know, I teach them the same thing. You, I, I teach them they practice self respect, and they also have to respect other people. So. You know, it's um, it's very, it's 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 going against what we want to teach our boys, and it's going against what we want to teach our girls. So yeah, right. Well, we have had news in, guys, and I I can see that Nigel's waiting um backstage there. Um, so we was gonna shuffle things around because the news we've had in, but should we bring Nigel on now? Yeah, for So what we're going to do, guys, the news has come in of the judgment and the judge has ruled against us and sided with the Welsh Government. There is a press release on our website regarding that now. But what we'll do, rather than keep Nigel waiting, we will bring him in. Um, we'll bring Nigel in now because it's part of that judgment, um, which relates to Nigel's work. And then we'll bring Darren on then, guys, and Darren can discuss with you our the what we were challenging and what the judgment has said and we'll discuss with you then things moving forward so let's bring nigel in hi, hi nigel welcome hi, hi, nigel. i'm fine thanks very much uh disappointing about the judgment but uh, you can give more information i'm sure yeah about well that's it you know yeah. this you know we, this is expected if it was a fair process we wouldn't be here anyway there's lots of things to query it my dog is playing with himself there. So, um, yeah, so we got Darren on to discuss that later on. Now, it's a 120-page judgment. So it's not as simple as, um, well, to tell you the truth, I haven't read it. Okay. <laughs> 120 pages, you know. Uh, Darren's that. read most of it. But there is reference to a certain person in there. And obviously, the judge is not aware of this person's background. And I think we all know who that person is. It's Professor Emma Reynolds. So all um, eggs were put in one basket, and obviously the judge does not know what has happened with her, but we, we'll discuss that in a bit. First of all, let's get on to you, Nigel. So this is Nigel Thorne, everybody. Some of you might have seen some of his videos. He's done some incredible in-depth videos relating to the RSE code and what's happening here in Wales, 
uh, the gender ideology, and more specifically, the queer theory. Now, Nigel, I find this really funny. Your name on YouTube is Turfman. And um, to tell you the truth, I was really looking forward to being called a turf myself, but I haven't been awarded that crown. So I'm just labelled far right instead. So, <laughs> so tell us about you, Nigel, and tell us about your work. Right. OK, well, I'll tell you how I got started on this. And it was a couple of years ago and I was a member of a choir in Cardiff. And it was quite a um, uh, alternative, I guess. You had a bunch of people who were kind of green and leftish and all the rest of it. And um, uh, I got friendly with two lesbians there. And one of them, uh, and I, I connected with them on Facebook. And one of them posted uh, a statement saying uh, to all women, you know, if, if a trans woman comes into the um, toilets, don't complain, because that's transphobic if you do. And I saw that and I thought, well, that's ridiculous, you know, because it's if a fully intact biological male comes into a toilet, then there's, you know, women will have a justification to complain about it. So I commented it back and, um, and I had a bit of a pile on <laughs> on Facebook. And what astonished me was the kind of, uh, the, the sort of anger and the moral, uh, they felt they were on the moral high ground, but they didn't want to discuss. I just had to accept what they said this kind of demand. So that really fascinated me because there's something, there was something, there's something really going on, isn't it? You know, this, this is, this is not natural. People use, people discuss things uh, civilly, but this was do what we say, otherwise you're a bigot. And that's what, that's what I found fascinating. So I started looking into this bit more and more and more. Um, and I created a website, um, which was what is a woman.uk. Matt Walsh then pinched that idea and created what is a woman.com and got much more publicity than I ever did. But but you know that 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 did get some traction and some people you know got some uh, it did get referenced on a lesbian website in New Zealand, which I was really chuffed about. So that was good. Um, uh, but then I, I started really digging down into what was causing all this. And it's actually, it's, all it is to do is with language. That's all it's to do with. It's language. So queer theory um, is the basis that um, a, a few years ago, of course, there was a great deal of homophobia in society. Can I, I can remember. I mean, when I was younger, I used to work in Cardiff. And we had a church next door. A Christian church, but it wasn't mainstream. It was um, an alternative one, and and they had visiting pastors, uh, visiting preachers rather, and they advertised the sermons that the preachers were going to do every week. And I noticed one day there was a poster up saying, um, "AIDS is God's judgment on homosexuals," and and that really shocked me. I mean, that was really. You know, because that that is definitely not Christian. <laughs> that just seems that was seemed appalling. And it's only thirty or thirty five years ago where that sort of thing could could been said. Um, so it's a lot a long time back. And and I knew gay people in the church I went to, and and they were afraid of coming out because of you know the attitudes that people would would have to them. So um, homophobia was a big thing still in society now, I think it's less of a big thing now. There's much more tolerance, in my opinion. Um, but queer theory aims to undermine um, heteronorm what they call heteronormativity. So um, the idea is if we change the discourse, then people will become more accepting of, of gay people. And one of the ways we can do that is to say, you know, when you're referring to the partners of um, football team players or rugby team players. Don't refer to them as wives and girlfriends, refer to them as partners, because then you won't make, be making assumptions about their sexual orientation. And if somebody is gay and they, somebody says, bring your wives and girlfriends, that can feel that you're being judged because you're not normal. So changing the language in that way is a good thing. You know, change the discourse to use partners instead of wives and girlfriends. This American academic, Judith Butler, went even further and said, not only are we going to change the discourse, it's a good idea to <laughs> create new words and change the definitions. 
And that is just mad. I mean, that's what's having the consequences now. Are we seeing that a lot now? Absolutely. Language is um, th this a big part of this, the language, you know, and I think that's that's a big part of the reason why they're getting away with things as well. It is it is a battle on language. That's where it lies. It's a complete battle on language. So so uh, that's where I'm fighting against is this, this you know, we, we want to get away from this idea that that women are cervix havers and vagina owners. You know, this is this is madness. <laughs> It is. It is, but Marcus. It's, it's, I was speaking with somebody who used to work um, for the United Nations going back years and years before she had her children. And one of the things, she, she picked up on language back then. So what they what they discovered was if somebody was pregnant, they had no money, um, no support, by taking that person in, helping them, supporting them, you was then engaging in something called forced pregnancy. So then she said she noticed this happening back then, you know, and and she's really seen now how that's unfolded, this language they used. So instead of yeah. supporting somebody in their situation, it was seen as forcing them, you know, forced pregnancy, you know. So the language, as she said, she's the language is really concerning how they manipulated that over the years. Absolutely. And this is what, of course, is being, I don't know what the judgment says, but this is what is in the RSE code. As you can see, it's got this new definition of gender, which is Judith Butler's invention that based on what Robert Stoller, the psychotherapist or psycho, a psychiatrist said, that we all have this in agenda, no scientific evidence for it. We all no, have this. No, none whatsoever. Um, this is why they, this is why they reference themselves. Now, I was asked to go on to um, uh, an online webinar with UK Column. It was cancelled because of illness, and they asked me to address the queer theory. So yeah. that's not my that's not my area. So I spent forty eight hours on it, which is you know for me forty eight hours was with, with my full attention. That's a lot of time. You know, I, yeah. I can get a lot in that time to watch some of your videos. I don't know if it's because I've got a bias. Um, with my own approach anyway. So when I'm reading their words, I remember them from other documents. So I have got that criminological bias there as well. I, I will admit that. But I really found it difficult to pinpoint what queer theory is about. I've also got my own um, my own approach. I know what the kill meant before I discovered queer theory. So to me, it was to queer the gender, then to queer the sexuality, bring you full circle, um, yeah. human behavior, the sexual male, Alfred Kinsey. So I've also got that approach as well. So I'm finding it really difficult to grasp, even though it's a load of nonsense, nonsense, yeah. I should say, yeah. even though it's a load of nonsense, I was finding it difficult to grasp and actually pinpoint what it was all about, you know? And the only things that kept coming up for me was like sexual from birth. There is no childhood. Childhood innocence doesn't exist. And we, we, we are all fair game, you know, anything yeah. goes. That's, in layman's terms, what I could get from it. But, like, I've yeah. spoken to Joan because Joan has, has, Joan has watched your videos. Or every time you've got a new one out, Joan says you've got a new video out. And she's watched your videos. She's read the report from the Safe Schools Alliance as well. And um, it's a really difficult concept to grasp. So how can a teacher incorporate that into their lessons if they need, really need to teach it, they can't. They're only going off what they're being told, what's presented to them. You know, like I said, I spent 48 hours on that and I just got a whole load of nothing from it. Well, it, it's it's hard work. I mean, Judith Butler's work is really difficult to read anyway. I mean, she's just known for being obtuse, you know. Yeah. So, um, but it, because it's it's related to changing people's perceptions, it doesn't. It's not related to truth. It's not related to material reality. It's yeah. using language to change people's perceptions, and that's the dangerous thing of it. So it shouldn't be in schools at all. You know, because if you put it into schools, you're, you're lying to your kids essentially, and that's the danger of what we're doing. We're going to be lying to our children. Now, right, so you know. But so for I a lot of people now, so say people who, who don't know nothing about the academic world and they are being told that this is all peer reviewed, okay? This this research is all peer reviewed. Explain that to people. How how you know who are these peers? Oh, well, that's a good question. Because I mean I, I this is not my background either, but I've just have been doing the research into it. In fact, and, and I think 
Where this is coming from is from two completely different places. I mean, I had a comment recently put on my latest video uh, accusing me of hate because I was, um, uh, it was by an ex-teacher and she had somebody who was, um, had gender dysphoria in her school and she felt that this new language was better for them because it was more inclusive. So I was accused of hate. But, but this is, the, this is the, the problem. We come from two different perspectives. Some people think that changing the language is a good thing because then it gives a rationalization for why these children feel this way, uh, a rationalization that people can understand. You know, oh, it's got a different gender identity than, than, than most people. Fine, you know, let's, let's, let's have, it's all be inclusive and loving. But it's not true. And I, that's, that's, that's the place I'm coming from. There's no evidence for a, for a, a gender identity as an entity. No, it is a, it is a descriptive term, not a definitive one. So it's not something that describes something that's in there materially. So, so all right, you know, you might say it becomes more inclusive, but you're, you're putting kids down a medical pathway by by indulging with fiction, really. Yeah. So it's and that's what it is. It is fiction. It is fiction, and it's incredibly dangerous. And of course, you know, there are children who are boys who are very, very effeminate. Um, and that's long been established. Um, there was two types, there's mainly two types of people who struggle with gender dysphoria. And it's mainly, uh, there's young kids, um, the majority of whom were homosexual or turn out to be homosexual. Um, and then there was older men. And uh, many of those had um, a transvestic uh, vestic fetish. And that was um, what was initiating their gender dysphoria. So um, that's the truth. You know, there, those, there are those two main cohorts of people traditionally who struggle with gender dysphoria. Now, of course, we have uh, in JIDS, we have loads of, of, of older children uh, who come at puberty or slightly older, mainly girls uh, who weren't well represented years ago. Uh, and so where do, where do all these come from? I mean, to me, if, you, if you're if you very naive if you don't think this relates to, to gender theory or queer theory. Yeah, because yeah. Because it's bound to. This is where this new cohort is coming from. And to have this taught in schools, man, this is really, really dangerous. Well, the thing is, they, they, this, this is on their guidance anyway. You know, they're talking about gender. And when you actually hover over the words and you look at their definition, Absolutely. it changes throughout the document. So one minute they, they, they refer into the genitalia and then the yeah. next minute they refer into the identity. Yeah. You know, right. so even, and I, and I have to take a photo of these to prove that that's the difference in them. You know, you couldn't click on it to screenshot that you could only hover over it. So I had to yeah. individually take a photo of each um, definition of these words. So even throughout the guidance and the code, they are messing with the language there. They are, and <coughs> is doing that on purpose. You know, with the the gender resource, when she mentioned her um, protected characteristics, she mentioned both gender and gender identity. But if gender is not synonymous with sex, what is it? You know, if it's not gender exactly. identity and it's not synonymous with sex, what is gender? I mean, well, it's, like, it's, it's I, kind of playing with words all the time. And it's well, my word words. is criminological, and we yeah. make comparisons between male and female crimes. Yeah. You know, a lot of research is around the gender and the gender bias in the laws and things like that. Well, yeah. you know, that's the only way we can operate it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, this, is, this is the Oxford English Dictionary definition. And she's asking that we get rid of it, you know, as, as a synonym for sex. I mean, that, that is insane. <laughs> that is insane. We are living through some serious, we, dangerous times. And what the government are. have done here is radical. It is extremely radical, and I know some, you know, that there, there are, because um, Sally Holland said in the video, oh, this is very radical, you know, so I think she knew it was radical, but I just don't think she ever stopped for a minute and thought, ah, this might be a bit dangerous too. But it's interesting yeah. that the resource that was referenced on agenda, which was on the Children's Commissioner website, has now been deleted from that website. Yes. And you can still well, this see is it. it. If they, this is another thing. If they, and we mentioned this earlier with the um, extraordinary councillors meeting, if this was world class and if this was so great as they say, and why are they so desperate to hide it? Yeah. Why aren't yeah. they shouting this from the rooftops? Yeah. Well, it's it's you know agendas being pushed internationally, so uh, so somebody's been trying to shout it, but of yeah. course 
the, the Twitter accounts now have been deleted and the personal accounts of uh, Emma Reynolds and um, Esther McGinney, I think, have been deleted as well. Mm. The Twitter accounts. Well, well, I would too. I, I'd be able to hang my head in shame as well. Uh, yeah, it's, how it's Absolutely. got so far is just the extraordinary bit to me. So I don't know whether the Welsh Government feel they've been hoodwinked uh, to believing something which wasn't true, or whether they bought into this and thought, yeah, changing language is a good idea. Uh, let's go with it. You know, I don't know. I mean, because it seems mad. It seems utterly, utterly mad. Well, we uh, do I, know I, all four UK governments accepted it at the same time. We know that anyway. So yeah. um, they just at different stages with it. And when you really look into them, uh, you look at the people they reference and you follow their career path. You see they come from the same kind of universities as well. But a lot yeah. of them, we can't find no information for before their professorships. And we yeah. can't find that groundbreaking work for them neither. Yeah. So yeah. Um, rather concerning there, you know, when we've got professors that only have a history with a degree in Latin. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been a long just, time. This doesn't make sense. This has been a long time in the making because Reynolds' uh, work, which you referenced, Butler, initial work, well, I think is the initial one, anyway, was back in 2006. I mean, so they've been planning this for decades, you know, at least 15 years, 16 years. So it's been a long time. These are dedicated people who want to change society by changing language. So yeah, these are, yeah. this has been going on for a long time. And it's like, so it's a hell of a lot to fight back now because they've had a head start of 15 years. It's extraordinary. It's been a, a slow mission creep, hasn't it? Yeah. And, yeah uh, so the, there's such a big cohort there by now. And I think a, a lot of the people in universities are probably tamping mad. Uh, and others are very accepted. But you get the idea. I, I've listened to people talking who work in universities and have actually... There was a film recently, wasn't there? Um, yeah. It was a I video made recently by women. What was it called, Nigel? I, I, I do mean to see it, and I haven't seen it. But it, it was one which was supposed to be screened at Edinburgh University and a trans That's the one. And That's the one. And, and stopped um, the public screening of it. Exactly. So in in that film, I did watch it, and it was very, very disturbing what's going on in universities because it seems that some people, just for speaking the truth, you know, yeah. uh, the what is evident to every human being, uh, as in biological sex exists, it seems that these people are getting sidelined to the point where their jobs are in jeopardy. And one of them said, um, well, one of her colleagues, one of the women that was being targeted, one of her colleagues said, well, I'd love to meet up with, up with you for a coffee, but I can't do it on the campus. I can't be seen to be with you. Now, if you've got this sort of contaminate, contaminated idea in a university, We've all got to worry because this is where our teachers come from. This is where our MPs come from. This this is where these are the people that are forming the fabric of our society. And if they can't face science head on and be truthful, who can? It is it is really worrying because this because it's a lie, they, they cannot accept dialogue. You can't talk about it because it's a lie. So so you can't have dialogue. I mean, you know. Uh, even Mark Drakeford said uh, when he was questioned by Laura Ann Jones, he said, my starting point in this debate is that trans women are women. Well, that shouldn't be a starting point. I mean, you can't no. have a debate. You know, no, that's the end of the if you concede that, you've conceded your arguments. You can't go any further. So um, so that's, that, that is worrying. We can't have dialogue because this new language is being put into place. You have to accept this new language. You're a bigot if you don't. And that's the way we're going to proceed. So this is the definition of an ideology is that I've, ne I've never lived through a time like this. It's absolutely extraordinary. But it but seems like is... one massive cult. It's extraordinary. I know. Um, why, why do you think people are so accepting? For example, uh, an, well, an example that springs to my mind which I alerted my 86-year-old sister who lives in South Africa. She's lived there. She's lived in Africa since she was in her 20s, right? So she's sort of out of our sphere of influence in many ways. And 
I mentioned to her that sanitary products were going to be made available to, dare I say, men in, um, in toilets in the Senate. And I, I, I sent her the little cutting, uh, which has Mark Drakeford's head on it, you know. Yeah. And her reply was, this man needs putting in a straitjacket <laughs> and hauling off to the nearest mental institution. He, and that is the only logical conclusion you can come to. How come everyone is so accepting? Well, how come this it, wasn't yeah. a major it outrage? It might be that trans men are using the men's toilets and they have got a body of a woman, so would need the sanitary products, possibly. I, and maybe that's the thinking behind it. Um, so I guess they don't have single-sex toilets in the Senate anymore. They're, um, I presume they're, um, they're, they're, they're gender-based toilets rather than sex-based toilets, I guess. Who knows? But, but you know, it, we're, we're, we're living a lie, and uh, it doesn't help anybody. You know, it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help the trans people in the long term. Because they can't carry on for years and years and years with presuming that everybody's going to lie for their or sort of buy into their lie for the sake of their mental health because that's not that's unrealistic and it doesn't help our kids who who are gender non-conforming to be told that yeah you may be a boy or you may be a girl if you're um if you act and behave in gender atypical ways yeah it is, it is funny it is so weird what it's go the thing is when you're pushing this and you're show, you know you're pushing this onto children it's going to harm a lot more children than it's going to help now i know personally especially girls i know a lot of women and girls uh, who who were tomboys as youngsters i was one myself my daughter was one you know she's getting more girly now she's getting older my mum was a tomboy so you know in just one fact one one family alone going down that way we've got three you know three of us that could have been um detrimentally affected by this agenda because you know just because you're a just because you don't conform to the gender you were born in does not mean you be, you, you were born in the wrong body and you know this is this is where we're re we are really concerned you know we're concerned about the harm that it is going to to cause for children yeah. And young adults as well, because you know we've we've seen many interviews of, of you know people as old as as forty, and they still get go go into this thinking, oh yes, I need to go into the the you know I I, I don't belong in this body, and they transition and they don't realise the effects of the hormone treatment and the surgery, and you right. know like they're suffering now. You know we discussed briefly earlier, didn't we? Um, Joan, with regards to uh, the damages that can be caused from well, surgery alone of any sort comes with its dangers. We know that, um, but obviously these these hormones as well, the hormone blockers, cross cross hormones, they all come with with damage. And this isn't this isn't um, spoken about, you know, no. efficiently to the people who go through. Them. No, I mean, this. Why, why this isn't mandatory in schools, I don't know. I mean, you know, the dangers of ideology <laughs> should be taught to children, you know, because because this is ideology. You should yeah. be telling children this is dangerous. Uh, but that's obviously not part of the required part of the curriculum. Um, the required part of the curriculum is to talk about gender, which is insane. But it, I, I was at the LGB Alliance conference back in October in London, and Richie Heron, who's a lovely lad, I mean, he's brave. And, and oh, he's he, brilliant. Yeah, I and he's he was in his 30s, but he's, and a lot of these people are really intelligent, the ones who transition. They, I mean, they're so articulate, they can talk about their experiences and why they got into this. Um, but he's a, he was a gay man who was, con who was convinced because of mental health issues that he's uh, actually a girl and went through a surgical operation to uh, have his genitals removed. Um, and that's just, I mean, I mean, it's so tragic to hear him speak now because he deeply regrets it. Now, how do we get into the situation where people think, yeah, you say you're, you say you're a girl, fine, let's go go for it. I mean, that's that's mad. I mean, so so our health system is failing these kids, these youngsters. I mean, because they're not all kids, they're youngsters. Our health system's failing them. The educational system seems to be failing them. And where we're at now, I mean, at, at the D-Trans Reddit is, um, is a place where uh, people who are detransitioners can join in and talk about their experiences. 
And at the beginning of the year, there's 24,000 people signed up to that. And, and at the moment, it's well over 40,000. So this is increasing hugely and very, very quickly, rapidly increasing the number of detransitioners. And the Welsh government, have they ever talked about detransitioners? I don't think they have. I don't think they said a word about detransitioners and pretend yeah. they don't think they have so we are we are at a crisis point because because we can't talk about things that need to be talked about because we can't challenge this queer theory language because it's inclusive and you're bigoted if you challenge it. But we need to start talking about it very very quickly. We do, we do, and you know the devastating news as well. I you know you hear people say things like trans people commit suicide and they they try and say it's because of the. Uh, you know, because society are not accepting them, and you know, sort of bullying, and yeah. and uh, this this unacceptance is is the is what drives them to suicide. However, yeah. when you speak to these detransitioners, you know, they they actually speak out about how these hormones do actually make them feel. It does have a detrimental effect on their mental health as well. And you know, a lot of these um, these unfortunate suicides actually happen to trans people after. They transition, so yeah. you know when they're trying to say that you know transition transition surgery should be more available and should be available you know for 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 youngsters you know at a younger age because they will commit suicide if they don't transition. Well, that's actually incorrect as well. So yeah. you know the truth isn't is 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 not told at all. The truth isn't told at all. Sex Matters, I think, in the last few days produced a report saying that uh, puberty blockers. Uh, are as effective or less effective than placebos in improving a young person's mental health. Because a young person who's got gender dysphoria, their mental health will improve if somebody takes notice of them, if they go to a clinic, if clinicians make a fuss of them, if they, you know, are talked to in a nice, friendly manner. Their mental health will improve just to, through going through that process. So the drugs they take may have absolutely no benefit at all just their mental health may improve because of the process they're going through. So Sex Matters produced a report saying there's absolutely no evidence that the uh, the process that they go through is any more beneficial than them having placebos rather than puberty blockers. So it, there's no evidence, no evidence. And, and as I said, we just need to start talking about this and make this less of a political issue, which of course is what queer theory does. It wants to, um, uh, it wants to undermine their heterosexual matrix heteronormativity the belief that you know to be normal you need to be masculine and sexually attracted to girls if you're a boy and feminine and sexually attracted to boys if you're a girl that's what queer theory tries to do is undermine that it's a political movement and we need to get away from this politics and start talking sensibly about what's the best thing for our kids and take queer theory out of our schools Absolutely. I think the thing that's worried me um, as well, like I haven't looked into queer theory as much as you, but it's like it's breaking down those boundaries between children and sexuality. That's the thing that really yeah. concerns me because yeah. it's like, no, that boundary needs to stay there. Absolutely. Queer theory is a tool. So I mean, so, so, what Judith Butler did was, was specific to gender. So it's, it's called gender theory, really, what she's, she's talking about. But queer theory can be used for other boundaries, sexual... Um, uh, you know, sexual matters for children as well, as well as paedophilia, of course, you know, so it's, uh, um, so, we, you know, we need to be very clear what should be normalised, what should be destigmatized, and what should remain stigmatised, you know, because some things you might say, well, we accept that, but we don't think it's acceptable to be taught in schools, but nevertheless, we shouldn't make it illegal. And some things you think, well, no, we shouldn't ever accept that, and that should be illegal. So there's some things you normalize, you can teach about them in school, some things you destigmatize, you think, well, you don't need to teach it in schools, but fine. And some things you stigmatize because you think, well, that's really dangerous. You know, we need to not do that. Um, yeah. So but 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 queer theory aims to normalize everything by changing yeah. the language to make it acceptable. And that's that's the, the danger, really, is to break down those social norms by changing the language. So yeah. uh, I'm really yeah. sorry about my disappearance, guys. I had um back feed. Is there back feed coming from me according to um no when you come on though the back feed comes on on Nigel's because it wasn't it, I I don't know if it's because there's more than two of us on there. I'm not entirely sure. I don't know. I don't know no. what's going on today. I've actually plugged my a laptop into the Ethernet cable. 
um, this time, and it's, and it's I've had problems for the last couple of days. My laptop's doing strange things at the same time as my handset. It's going insane. It's, I'm sorry about that, guys. And me popping on and off. That's just the way things is. Things are. That's fine. Yeah. But thank you, Nigel, so much for accepting our invitation and for all the work that you do because you do such informative videos. And we and we know how much work goes into that. You know, I don't think people understand how long they take, and yeah, it is time consuming. You know, so it's when people are out there putting this work together for us to see, that is a massive, massive help. It is. Well, it is. Yeah. What's, what's your channel called, Nigel? So people can actually, uh, you know, follow you and 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 listen to some of your videos. Well, I'm on Turf Fan Man. I couldn't be a turf because I'm not a woman, so I can't be a feminist. I would that. So you're so a turf fan man. Fan man. Like <laughs> a fan of turfs, okay? uh, but on, on YouTube, I'm turf fan man as well. So uh, if you look up turf fan man. And what's your website? You said what is a woman dot UK. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. So there we are. So we did. Let's finish on what is a woman, Nigel? It's an adult human female, Kimberly. There we are. Simple as that. Simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for having me. We appreciate you coming on. Thank, Thank you for your time. Okay, but I'm trying See to... See you soon, yeah, Nigel. Take yeah, care now. Okay. Well, you can log me off because I can't work out how to do it. Okay, oh, I can I'll... remove you. There we are. We've gone back there. Right, and without further ado, guys, back to the main story of the day. As you know, we did not... Ex we didn't plan to do this podcast knowing the judgment was going to come today not at all so this is why i'm on off on off emails phone calls it's all going insane here so let's bring on the man with the legal plan darren I would bring Woo -hoo! welcome darren <laughs> how are you doing da oh, you can you hear me Yes. Awesome. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. You? Yeah. Not good, too bad, you. yeah, not too bad at all. So what do you think? Now we've had the news and it hasn't gone our way. Um no. I mean we We weren't overly we weren't hundred percent optimistic that it was gonna go our way. We no. know we're fighting. Um so it's not the major shock that it could be. Um, still, it's a kick in the guts all the same, you know what I mean? Um, but again, you know, I think we've all been somewhat prepared for it, mentally prepared, if nothing else. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, concerned, um, from, from my perspective, the higher, the higher the court, the louder the message. You know, that's... that's... We, we yeah. never wanted to play with the little boys anyway, did we? You know, we, we put on our big girl pants and we yeah. wanted to play with the the big boys. Yeah, I, I mean, it has been in my thought process for a while. I've probably mentioned it on one or two of the videos which I've done. I think it's, it, it needs to go all the way to the top. Um, yeah. It's, it's of such magnitude, the decision... You know, the, the High Court is great. If we had won, they're going to go in and appeal. And the next case which comes along could overrule the decision anyway. The Supreme Court is yeah. is held a bit more firm in law. You know, it's as high as it can go. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, like I say, I have been of the opinion that it will end up going to the top or, you know, as far as we can get at least. We're not far from the very top now. So, so basically, in a nutshell, um, so the, this is the summer, summary I got from it, okay? Mm. I like all written for me. <laughs> right, okay. Let's not, start, let's not start acting like the government now and twisting the truth, Kimberly. Well, disclaimer, now, disclaimer well, before yeah, you go I on. I, I'm, not, I'm not legally trained and this is yeah. not legal advice. Yeah, this is, yeah, so he's not legally trained, he's not legal advice. I'm a computer, what am I now? Stick to what we know. So <laughs> basically, guys, it goes like this. The parents have no parental rights. It's all given by the state. Okay, that's proven. The parents have no 
parental rights. And we argue that our parental rights existed in the Education Act 1986, Education Act, correct me if I'm wrong, okay, 1944, mm-hmm. and the Human Rights Act 1998, plus we were saying that the Welsh Government do not have the power to override existing legislation, and that's under the Welsh Ministers Act of 2006. So that's what we were saying. So we we went in saying those four points, points of law prove that we do have parental rights. But the judge has somehow sided with the government and said there are no parental rights. So they've basically gone on to say parents cannot direct their children in sex, sexual relations, eth- ethics or morality. It's all the government. Okay, so if you look at their own private lives as well if you take your child to a state school it is take it or leave it there is no difference between the school requiring a piano lesson and teaching your child how to sustain long-term sexual relationships of multiple natures okay so there's no difference between sex education and teaching your children about pianos or art or music as far as they're concerned there is no difference right and that's in paragraphs 48 and 132 of the judgment. Parents are free to homeschool. Parents are free to homeschool or send their children to an expensive private school. The practicality is irrelevant, but rich people can provide for their children. Poor people rely on the state. Well, the rich people are making the decisions over the poor people's children. So maybe the rich people should be paying for our children to be educated in a place of our choice. So the state can change the law at any moment and teach whatever politics or religious beliefs to children they want. Simple as that. Right? They've done it. They've proved it. Three-year-olds in Wales can be taught all about body parts, intimate body parts, and parents have no rights. The whole school can be dedicated to LGBTQ+. And last but not least, this is fitting for a modern liberal democracy and if you disagree, the model liberal democracy will coerce and control you. Mm-hmm. Scary. Basically, that's 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 our um, that's our interpretation of the judgment. But I will say as well, um, obviously, we respect the we respect the judge's judgment. You know, she's just going off what what. Um, well, we just respect the judgment. Yeah. But obviously, um, there's like she. I did notice that she referenced our friend Professor Emma Reynolds in paragraph forty three. I think it was, and that's rather concerning because what we've got here is a professor of childhood development. Okay, so that's her title. She's a professor of childhood development. But when you actually look at her work, it's all about gender. It's all about mm-hmm. gender theory and the social construct of gender queer theory so that doesn't actually um fall in line of childhood development because childhood development is a child the population of children developing childhood development does not come from a minority within a minority so she shouldn't really have that title now the judge is not aware that um, emma does have to remove her social media because she's come under scrutiny lately with where her work has um, come from, the kind of people she references, she references her own work, to, uh, in layman's terms, her work is not credible, it does more harm than good. Well, the judge doesn't know this. No, no. How can the judge possibly know that? So the judge is reading a document um, of an education which was put together by a professor of childhood studies, and that's all the judge knows. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I, and to go a little bit further than that, if I can, um, we're in a, a, a bit of a unique position, myself much less than you, on the background. is something else which the judge hasn't seen. Um, you know, the likes of yourselves, I know I'm personally aware of the work that Catherine has put in and I'm pretty confident in saying it it amounts to thousands and thousands and thousands of hours 
which you lot have researched, broke down. But it's it's all there written. It's, it's written down in black and white. There's a paper trail of evidence. Yeah. Um, and again, none of this is taken into consideration. Um, and a, an important point to make as well, I think, that's not because we or you didn't have any yet or the evidence at the time or you felt it was deemed unnecessary to put it in as evidence the formation of a judicial review you're you're limited to certain size documents um four five hundred pages for the original bundle um we had to take stuff out so again you know you're kind of governed by the way the system is written yes um we we could and would put forward a much more um a much stronger argument if you could just go in there presenting all the evidence yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know it, it's factual evidence uh, i believe personally is provable easily with fact but there's no assumptions the the you know there's no ambiguity or anything, you know, it, it, there is a factual paper trail to be led, names, um, and it's quite easily proven. Um, and I think a lot of the people, without sounding derogatory, are, are ignorant to those facts as well, you know. Yeah. It, it's, it's so easy for everybody to just nod and agree the official... The, the official narrative, um, for want of a better word. Um, but now, yeah, you know, the, the, as much as it's a, a kick in the guts, and tell me to shut up if you need me to, mind, because you know I'm well, you liable on. to you ramble, on. I have to pre-warn you. Um, as much as it's a kick in the guts, there are positives from the things which were actually stated Um stated now in case law this you know the judgment is a public document um and so yeah we do. parents actually listen up to this now what Darren is saying okay because like he said it's not all bad even though we will be appealing the judgment the judgment as it stands is not all bad so listen up to this bit guys okay because this can really really help you well, it is bad. In, <laughs> right, hang on. It is bad in the sense that we've still got no parental opt-out. So if your child is in a state school, then they are going to learn, be taught RSE. So it is bad from that point of view. But from a point of view of continuing the fight onwards, um, you know, we've shown that RSE is just a, a renamed product um there's reference to that on a uh, paragraph 44 and 55 um we're now fully aware and and this is something i've said in the past as well after the court case it was quite shocking to me and and you know the judge throughout the, the throughout the judgment the judge has as justified it with the trail of case law and legislation the legal framework behind it but it's shocking to me that we have never according to the government and now the courts have acknowledged this yeah we have never had these parental rights and the rights which you mentioned um in the 1944 1996 act the, 19, the 1944 Act was religious exemption and the latter was sex education. What the what the barrister claimed and obviously what the judge agrees with, they were just statutory um, rights. They, they were just a gift. They, they you know, they, they just Your gave present. us that. So, so, yeah, it was, you know, just chuck us a bone kind of thing. And now they've taken it, they've taken it away. Now, from a point of view of our argument moving forward, just in, from my point of view, just that fact alone should outrage people because we've just discovered this in relation to education. Uh, yeah. You, you know, the, the way I'm geared, and I'm not going to go into that on this because it's irrelevant, but I'm of the consensus that that has been 
put on us across the board. We we don't we haven't actually got any of these rights which yeah. they proclaim we have. Um, so it, you know it's not a massive, huge shock. It it was actually it wasn't it was a big shock to actually hear it put down in a court of law and them ad admit that we've got no rights. I mean that's quite shocking because it's always been my point of view. Um, it doesn't make sense, though, doesn't it? Because if your child, say you've got a child and they do something, they go out and they do something wrong, when you've got a minor, that's your responsibility as a parent, isn't it? You'll even well, go as far as when, when your ch if your children bunk off school. I don't know if they do it anymore, but they were fine in the parents. If your child yeah, doesn't come no, into school, it's the, the parents clear, Right, so, yeah, so what they've done with, what they've done in the case, in my opinion... Um, they've gone out to show, and the judge has agreed, we do have some rights, but they're rights more according to the duties that we have as a parent. So our duty is to give our child education. So the right isn't that we can choose, we can, right, and again, this is another argument while the government have justified their parental opt-out with is the fact, as Kim rightly said, because we've got the option of parental opt-out and homeschooling, they haven't done away with our rights, uh, 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 the, the Human Rights Act. Um, it doesn't infringe on the Human Rights Act. It doesn't infringe on anything else because they haven't taken away our right to education, which is what the Human Rights Act gives us, the, the right to education. Um, I forgot where I was now. I, diver I diverged slightly. Um, so if, if we've got the right to home educate, then surely we should have some kind of exemption where, where we don't have to work then. Well, <laughs> you know, if, if that's yeah, what our choice is, we should work and be supported by the state. Again, yeah. you know, these are all the, you know, these are all side effects of decisions that are made, and these are political arguments, which the, you know, the type of things which will be argued forever. But yeah, no, I do agree. You know, if they're saying that we can't opt out of particular topics in school, then we've got home education. But then they'll just pass it down and say you can go private. Yeah. Yeah, but your answer then will be, well, will they sub subsidize us to go? So you know, it's it's just one of them paradoxes. It'll just keep chasing itself around. They feel no guilt. They never believed we had any rights anyway. They haven't taken anything away from us. Yeah, we just and that's over nothing. Absolutely, that's what they say yeah, basically. Yeah. If we're gutted about it, doesn't matter. You've got two other options there. And um, the real, the bad thing about this as well, like obviously, you know, the high court where this was heard was next, right in the same building as the family court. Mm -hmm. And we do know in the family courts, they can take children away from the parent because if there is a risk of future harm. Now, we have provided evidence that this could, this that there is a risk of future harm with this education. You know, when you're teaching children about inappropriate topics when they're young, they're poor little immature brains bringing all that on, that's going to affect them, especially yeah. if you encourage to engage in promiscuous behaviour, because that's going to, that, that can have a detrimental effect on their future relationships, their future mental health. And, and as we, we've just seen with Miriam's um, um, presentation as well, even their physical physical health as well can be uh, detrimented, you know, it can be affected by early sexual activity. So that was, none of that was taken into account no. here. I'm but, just going to fetch a day on, guys, because obviously she helped this compile the case and she might yeah, yeah, have something yeah. to add, right? So not to just yeah. anyway. They so, feel no guilt. They never believe yeah. we had any rights anyway. They haven't oh, taken anything. Hang on, somebody's playing with me yeah, talking. Yeah, it's a girl it is. that she's uh, on. Hey. Adele, you're actually on the screen now, love. I've moved to do that. Huh? I don't think she can see the screen yet. No. She's, she's listening, isn't she? Yeah, <laughs> Del, just to let you know, Del, if you're listening in, you're actually on the stream, so don't pick your nose, okay? <laughs> Everybody will see if you start picking your nose now. <laughs> yeah. She's just looking like... Maybe she's asleep with her eyes open. <laughs> She might, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's going back to what you said, Lucia, as well. 
one thing which I did pick out from the judgment, um, and I know there was a, a reasonable amount of evidence put in on the topic, was the 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 sex education content. Um, you know, there was plenty of uh, okay, now. Yes, it was from a different jurisdiction, and and again, you know, here comes the trap. So there are various occasions throughout the judgment where the judge points out that did it, we had no evidence was put forward which would suggest that they're breaking any rules or breaking the code or the guidance and therefore breaking the Human Rights Act, etc. And the issue we have there is there is no, oh, there's very little lesson content available. It is, you know, this the school year started literally just before the court case, but after all the evidence had been put in. So I know there was evidence in there from Scotland, um, etc. But that wasn't touched on at all. I feel that most of the judgment was lgbgt based it, it was almost it was almost as if they're trying to suggest that this campaign is an anti lgbgt th do you know what i mean this um and i know one of the, one of the biggest issues with a lot of people i speak to are in fact the claimants and myself is the sex content yeah. um yes. and and but there's very little mention if any it's all it's all the lgbgt and, and pluristic and so on so on so there i think a big part has been missed now whether that was intentionally ignored by the judge because i suppose it's circumstantial it is you know it's that hasn't been taught in wales you can't use that and say that the welsh government are breaching the code and the guidance because it's nothing to do you know so it's one of those things we're at a disadvantage there because we didn't have the evidence to back up the argument. And obviously the government have gone in spewing the narrative that this is nothing to do with a global report, uh, with a global Which rollout. Which evidence there is. Well, um, that's it. The thing is, this is, this is what I'm not, um, I'm not, I didn't even feel sad or anything because the way I see it is, this is another level of exposure. Yes. Yeah. No, um, and you can't, we can't complain at these levels of exposure because this lie is getting bigger. Mm -hmm. You know, and we ain't the ones that are spinning the lie. So it's not us that's going to fall. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We are not the ones, we, we're exposing the truth. And by going against us every single time, you're showing the ordinary folk exactly what you're capable of. And mm -hmm. we couldn't ask for anything better. No, we really and, couldn't ask for anything better, you know. Like I say, going back to the judge, she has absolutely no idea. No, what we, we've been through. Here. If she has got an idea what we've been through, here, then she spent the last five and a half weeks just looking at one statement. Because mm. I know there's two statements in there which are very thorough in regards to how this was made, bang on with the referencing of exactly where it's come from. And I, and I know just those two that are on their own, you know, what's in there, like. So yeah. I don't think, like you said, a lot of us referred to the law. Don't think uh, there's been any attention played to the level of no. deceit, betrayal and misleading, you know? Now, if this was a criminal court... Yes. ...and the government had misled us... Yes. They would, ..they would be stung for that now because it's proven they've misled us, right? If it was yeah. a criminal court, things would be different. And I think that's what a lot of people are... Um, confused about um, mm -hmm. when you're thinking about court you're thinking we're going in cross-examination but that's not the case for a judicial review you know like um people were saying to me why are you not in the court and i was outside well because my statement's in there yeah there's absolutely yeah, it, nothing it's... i can do or say nothing can get done or said that's not in our file we know no. that because we had to cut it down you know yeah so um... uh, it's really different and, and it's very very controlled as well you know very well, the, the criminal court is beyond reasonable doubt. Yeah. And in the civil courts, it's on probability. So if the judge 50.1% believes it's probable 
then they rule in favour of, you know, it only has to be 50.1%. Um, as yeah. long as it's leaning over the halfway mark, then it's probable. Um, and without all of the evidence, you know, and a, a, again, a criminal court, as far as I'm aware, there is no limitation on the evidence you put in. No, nope. and you, 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 you can know, have circumstantial in there as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I you believe you might have to apply. I think you might have to apply for circumstantial, but you are right. Yeah, circumstantial can be admitted as evidence. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the, you know, there's there's a couple of other takes from the judgment as well. Um, let me just find my page. Come on, guys! Don't forget, this is a sponsored event. We need sixteen pence per child to take this to the Supreme Court. Come on, let's get it in there, guys, right? No yeah, can I... No surrender. Yeah, we're on 240 now, so thank you, everyone, who's already um, who's already sponsored us. I Come am... on, guys, and I can see there somebody saying, absolutely get it, but we'll keep going for it. Yes, this is a movement, guys. We've all got to keep going. We, listen, did we ever once say it's all going to end the court? No, we never said that. Even an outright win wouldn't have been great at this stage because they can change it back a couple of years on the line, right? The higher the court, the louder the message. This is what our children deserve to go to the top. So if that means we have to take a few knocks and a few blows to get them there, so be it. You know, at the end of the day, this is how we get them out there. We go up higher and higher every time. We are not scared. You know, we will keep fighting and they can hide behind their desk in their little offices. But guys, we keep going, you know, we keep going. I'm not, I'm not giving up. What about no, you guys? No, neither am I, neither have I. And can I just say as well for all the parents out there, because there are going to be a lot of parents that are going to be concerned, like, like what are we going to do? You've got to keep speaking to your schools because at the end of the day, like some, some of your schools may not actually want to teach this anyway. They have, schools have got some, they have got a bit of say in how they present it. So, you know, as parents, you do need to sort of build relationships or carry on those relationships with your schools to make sure your children support, you know, what you think appropriate. Not just that, this now, this is going to, right, there's a lot of teachers out there who were secretly hoping we'd win, okay? Now, we will get the transcript for you, all right? We'll get a transcript for you from, we have to get a transcript anyway. We'll get a transcript for you from the hearing, all right? You can have my statement if you want it take them to the schools show the schools the government has lied to them right it's as simple as that there's going to be schools out there there's going to be some discussions in classrooms go to the person not the profession right guys if you know this is what it's about now reach out to the person show the government is lying don't worry about this court case we'll continue with this court case we'll continue fighting right you have to be out there working eye to eye, the eyes of the window to the soul, guys, right? If you're not getting no luck in your school, try in the sister-in-law's school. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, you know, we, we're not out to get them all. I'm a firm believer of you plant 12 seeds, at least six are going to germinate, guys. You know, you might not get the results you want, but you're going to get some results. Mm. And that's all that matters, you know? Perception is everything. Mindset is everything. Our children are worth far more than that little court in Cardiff there. I mean, come on. I was really, when I realised we were in that court there, the family court of all things, our children deserve far better than that. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Those are the worst types of court in all of the UK. Our children deserve better. And you would have seen from the... Um, so the argument the Welsh government put forward was all family law related. You get what I'm saying, guys? That's their thing, okay? That's their, that's their thing in that court there. I'm going to shoot up. Um, yeah, something as well, I think, to point out. As proven now in a court of law, we, the collective, are not the minority. The, the anti RSE, we are, we are actually the majority by a long way. So at the end of paragraph 49, um, some questions, and, and the, the judges referring to the consultations, the early stages of the consultations. Um, 
so question 11 in the consultation should the right to withdraw from re and rse be retained question 12 if the right to withdraw is to be retained should it remain with the parent um parent parent includes those with parental responsibility those who have care of the child paragraph 50 the judge published this in a um judgment uh, the resp the results the Welsh Government summary of the responses to the white paper published in July 2019 showed that of the 1,632 respondents, 10.2% agreed with the proposal to make age and development, developmentally appropriate RSE compulsory for pupils aged 3 to 16, whereas 87.5% disagreed. So nearly 90% of the people disagreed with this, but the government decided they were going to do it anyway. What was the point in the consultation? Because they exactly. followed procedure. So when we yeah. take them to court, the judge can look at it and say, they followed procedure, it's great. Right? So is this this all leads? So this they is the scenario the we're in now. but then didn't act on the outcome. It doesn't, right, because I would say so is irrelevant. Right. Obviously, and, and from my point of view now, because this is part of a, a trail which I went through of how we was introduced, or how they got rid of the parental opt-out as per cited by the government's defence yeah. and picked up on by the judge and his various paragraphs. So we had this, um, and, and further in that paragraph, uh, whereas 87% disagreed, of the 1,602 respondents who answered the question whether the right to withdraw from RSE and RSE should be retained, 88.7% agreed it should be retained and 9.2% expressed the view it should not be retained. So less than 10% of the people wanted, the, wanted this, no opt-out. Um, you know, it's nearly 90% didn't want an opt-out. Basically, they wanted the freedom to be able to opt their children out. Yeah, then so after, we, this, well, um, this actually demonstrates then that the government is mm, not working for the benefit. No, no, people. that's exactly my point. So then when you follow on from that part of the consultation, um, they mention, and let me just go quickly through this, they, on, at paragraph 53, um, I, I, and part of it is a little contradictory as well, um, at paragraph 53, a summary of the findings from the Faith Stroke BAME engagement events published in January 2020 that most Christian groups strongly opposed the ending of parental rights to withdraw, seeing it as a state overreach and or an enforced encroachment of values, ethics between state and family. The family, in brackets, their perspective, is the foundation unit of society and therefore should be what forms the value of society, not government. The Jewish faith communities were also opposed to the removal of the parental right excusal of RSE. They mentioned the Muslims here being diverse, ranging from firm opposition to total support. But we had an intervention from the Muslim community where a quarter of the mosques, I believe, in Wales all signed on to that intervention. So we know at least of the quarter of the Muslims, the Muslim community, uh, anti this, as are the Jews, the Jewish people, as are the Christians, as are the general public, 87.4% of the general public. We were all against this. So they asked the Senate Children, Young People and Education Committee to do a report, and they all said, yeah, go on and do it. Um, Kirsty Williams announces, yeah, you're not having any opt-out. The Senate then had a vote whether or not it should stay in, and they lost a vote 40 to 14. So basically everybody said no, except for that little government community and all the little tentacles which we can show are connected to UNESCO, the WHO, Kinsey, so on, so on, so on. Um, it's a scam, as with everything else, in my opinion, you know? So, but the fact that that is printed in case law, that almost 90% of the general public, who they apparently asked, were not in favour. Um, but they still do it. And again, you know, I can only go back then to the fact that they don't think we've got any parental rights anyway. I mean, this has been, this specific 
incident has been brought up, but I can pretty much assure that we'll find lots more of them if they were challenged. Um, rights we thought we had, but actually haven't. Um, and it doesn't matter what we think, evidently. You know, that's, yeah. that's printed in case law now. People can go and look that up and use it as evidence. In other courts, it's a high court ruling that less than 10% of us actually wanted this. We, we are the majority. Whatever you're told, whatever that news, the mainstream media narrative is, is proven in a court of law that we are actually the majority. So don't feel beaten down. Don't feel scared to say something. Don't feel scared to put your point of view across because mm -hmm. you are actually part of the majority. Blatantly, more people are, are, are agreeing with you than not, it would appear. Well, this is it, Darren. Like, even when I speak, like, whenever I speak to anyone about this, and, Me you know, they, they sort of, they, they, they think, even the people that think that the government have got our best interests at heart, when you go through, there, there will be something in that RSC that they are concerned about, and they're mm. like, oh, they're not going to teach that. So when it does come into the schools and it, it, the reality hits, it's going to be a lot of very angry parents. Um. Well, they, they, you know, they've it's, it's only just kind of crept in from September. I know they've been touching on it in the past anyway, um, little bits. But, it, you know, for, since September, it's now compulsory. We know they're going to start learning it. Um, we've already seen stuff. We've, you know, we've seen lots and lots and lots of stuff from around the world. Um, but we're already seeing stuff from Wales. Um well, can I just uh, add to that a second? Because Please obviously do. I work in school myself mm -hmm. and um, I was, unfortunately, because I go into school as agency, I don't necessarily get to see a lot of the work, but quite often I'm always quite gutted when I've missed, uh, uh, they're, they're still not really calling it RSE, they're calling it P PSHE um, still. And um, I was in the staff room the other day and there was a conversation between the staff from the, the ASD base. And it was in regards to a young boy who is obviously experiencing hormones and doesn't really quite know what to do with those hormones that he's, um, you know, that he's, he's feeling. So they turned to now this is not a book from a new resource this is a book that they've always had there so this is an old book they've gone to um or an older book that they've gone to um and they've looked gone to the resources now this is for asd children this resource so they've gone to this to see how they should um perhaps deal with this situation with this boy who is feeling quite hormonal. Um, so they've gone to look up the masturbation sections and the teacher was saying she was horrified going, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't do that. Because it, it goes into detail on how to teach the child how to masturbate, how to teach the child to masturbate another person and for another person to masturbate them how to have intercourse, um, so forth. So this teacher was saying, I would, you know, I, I not go, we're not going to, to teach that. But the fact is, these resources are in the school, sure. you know, and this, this particular resource is specifically aimed for ASD children. And it obviously goes into great detail, um, you know, for for this to be taught, and some might say, "Well, that's great that they do." And I've I've worked, I've worked learning disability for a very long time now, and there are there are boys and girls out there when these hormones kick in, they don't know what to do. Mm. You know, they don't know how to, you know, figure out how to stop this sensation going on in their body. Um, but you know. The answer to that isn't then to give a whole class presentation on masturbation. I know no, that I, 
it's it's not and you know what that's a real that's real dangerous territory as well that is something that needs to be addressed and looked at um on an individual basis especially as team because when those children are left to die like you said with these hormones rage and they don't know what to do with them what we need to remember as well is these are red hot blooded males mm. and when it's left um to manifestation usually there's an innocent <laughs> child involved so these issues do need to be addressed and they actually need to be addressed before. Now, this is the one time I would support, like, not, not our SELCSE. This is where I support the um, early intervention then, where, where we need a team on hand to actually monitor the children with additional needs. Because one thing you want to try and um, promote with this is, like, you need to try and get their attention away from the genitalia. Because once the genitalia is stimulated... That's when, that's when obviously it becomes addictive. You want more and more and more. Now we also know that these children are four or five times more likely to be abused. So how do we know that genitals had not been stimulated? You know, this is why we need to get in there very early with the parents to give them support. They they need to know their child is high risk of being abused and also becoming an abuser. You know, because I was just abuse. going to say that the parents, if you're gonna, if you're gonna engage, if the school is gonna engage in this conversation with a child, that parent needs to know what the school yeah. is telling them. Mm -hmm. You know, because this is something the schools, um, like if you look at the Social Care and Wellbeing Act in Wales, um, it does say for the teachers to familiarise themselves with the cultural um, background of the families but it doesn't actually say how many nieces and nephews are coming back and forth how many uh, aunties and uncles are coming back and forth is the house a halfway house are you a big family they don't know what goes on when that child goes home from school you know so how can they then tailor this education to support that child when every single child's background is completely different anyway you know the dangers are going to be different in each household this is why it's important. This topic is not completely ignored, but it is addressed and enforced on our adults, you know. And like you've said in the past, from when you're having children, you know, um, health visitor level, this is where we need to start working with parents because there is chances your children will have additional needs. There is chances your children will have to have support. So why are we waiting until diagnosis before we even look? Why aren't we preparing for it? We should be preparing for these things because we know it does go on. It's not if, it's when. Mm. And I just just something I want to just touch on there where you were saying about directing them to their genitals. Again, I just want to reiterate, like, so like I said, I've, I've for me personally, uh, severe learning disability non-verbal challenging behavior that has been my my kind of professional you know professional um environment and you're saying that i i had a um well he wasn't so young anymore um but his his obsession with his gender we'd have him come into the day center sometimes he'd walk in that door and he'd walk into the bathroom and he's not leaving that bathroom yeah. for so long. And he's going to get aggressive if you try and stop him. We had a um, we had a student nurse, and bless her, fair play for her to come in back the next day. She'd gone into a bathroom. He was in the bathroom. Um, you know, we do our best to, here's the files on, you know, on each person. We do our best to tell them, like, you know, their behaviours that you know, that are difficult and situations they can be in. But I'm working with very complex young people here. Um, you cannot, in a quick briefing, and meeting a student nurse who's come in on placement, you cannot give her the lowdown on every single person of every single thing. You just cannot. She goes into the bathroom. She goes to help him pull up his trousers, not realising he doesn't need help pulling up his trousers. He's also a hair puller. And this poor girl with this guy sat on the toilet in the height of his, you know, he's obviously finished. She's not realised she's gone in and gone to help him pull up his trousers. The poor girl ends up with her head clamped in a hair lock with her head between his legs down the toilet bowl. Oh. And, like, he is such a complex person to everybody else in the, in that 
you know, we had another friend who would just grab staff, constantly try and put their hands, you know what it, but, but we're staff, but not everybody is always staff. No, no. no. I've looked after older guy, older, older men, the young men, who have, who are living in the community. They're allowed out in the community on their own. And I'm out in the community with them and they're seeing 13 year old girls walk past. They've got little crop tops on. He doesn't know they're 13. Yeah, yeah. yeah he doesn't know. And yeah. he's like, straight away, he's reacting to these girls. Mm. And then you've got to say they're young. You've got to explain they're young. You can't talk to them. But he doesn't see that. He just sees a young, he just sees somebody who's got. I've, look. Um, my own son, when he's speaking to people, he doesn't differentiate between adult and child. You know that, Dad. He'll tell a two-year-old the same joke as a 40-year-old, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this is somebody who does have full capacity, somebody who's very intelligent, independent, <laughs> but even he struggles with that distinction, do you know what I mean? So I can totally relate yeah. to that. You know, I can see how that um, how that happens, and it's a really dangerous situation i mean it's a tricky tricky thing yeah yeah again you're talking about responsibilities on teachers heads and so on and and that's another big issue that i picked up from the judgment as well um I initially thought it when I first read through the code and the guidance a while back that they seem to be put in, or and, and the, the the act, in fact, they seem to be putting all of the responsibility on the, the teachers. Um, there are multiple paragraphs throughout that judgment, which state as such, the judges agree in that, you know, the, the responsibility is hence why they couldn't find anything wrong with the code and the guidance why it hasn't breached any human rights because the responsibility they're saying is on the head or the teacher to deliver the the content which must not fall foul of the code and the guidance so mm. they're all happy but uh, so it's always been a concern of mine and i know yours in fact it became a concern of mine because it was a concern of yours eventually um the tools to assess developmentally appropriate um you now from my point of view that goes above and beyond the role of a teacher you, you know you're bordering on a, a psychological evaluation you're muted kim mm -hmm. um you're bordering on a psychological evaluation in my mind now hidden in amongst paragraph 209 paragraph 209 is almost a full page and we've got a sentence stuffed just in the middle of it um, the claimants express concern that there are no tools or means to determine the age and deve developmental appropriateness of topics or resources. But it is inherent in the 2021 Act that the Senate trusts teachers and head teachers to be able to apply the concept of developmentally appropriateness. So the responsibility for assessing if a child is developmentally appropriate is now down on the teacher and the head and from so what if, i can sorry so if on. something went wrong and they mm, taught that, that was, child something they shouldn't then mm, you as the teacher is going to be liable for that that would that would be my assumption because the government have written this lovely fluffy code and guidance which says you mustn't do anything wrong so if it's done wrong it's done by the head or the teacher um so so let's put this now. Let's apply this to which I wouldn't. I wouldn't want that responsibility on me if I was just a teacher. No, but let's apply know? this to what's actually going on right now. So the government mm. is saying it's all down to the teachers and the head mm. um, to provide to the content. Yeah, this education, but the teachers and the head are telling us they wait in for it off the government. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what's Again, going yeah, on yeah, that? yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, that's it. They they contradict each other. Um, oh, right, guys, I'm going to be, I don't know what the rest of the itinerary is, Lou, if you want to um, inform people what we got coming up. I'm going to be shooting off because I've actually, there's phone calls coming for interviews and stuff like that. I'm trying to keep on top of the emails. 
So if you've just tuned in, guys, this is a sponsored podcast. It's running for 12 hours, 12 till 12. We've had the judgment today. It hasn't gone in our favour, but we are not sad about that. We are simply, well, it was expected, really. I personally expected six of one, half a dozen of the other. Yeah, I didn't too. expect a full no or a full yes. I was wrong, but maybe I wasn't wrong. Maybe I was right. Maybe that's going to be the outcome of the next year then, you know? So we just keep going, guys. We keep going. But I've got to go now because obviously I do, for anybody out there in the media, um, I do record every single interview. So that's why i got to go. <laughs> I'll catch up with you all later. Yeah, see you so. while. Kim will be on later talking about um, sex abuse in schools, won't you? What time do you want me on for that? Right, shall we say then, Kim, what, well, should we say, because we can move a few things around, should we say in about half hour or is that uh, like five o'clock or is that too early? Yeah, that's fine, that's okay, fine. Okay, come back on at five then, yeah? All right, guys, meet you all soon. Okay, ta-ra, ta-ra. <laughs> yeah, um, Let me see if I can change this uh, layout. No, I don't want that. I want a, I want a good layout. Yeah, that's cool. That's a better layout, isn't it? <laughs> We're all quite equal then. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, Lou, I can't access access my mic. It is cutting me off constantly. So I need to come out and I'm going to have to restart my computer. It's telling me I need to restart my computer. So okay. I'll let you and Darren just continue discussing the court judgments a minute. I'm going to restart and then you'll find me back in the waiting room. Brilliant. Okay. Oh. See you all right. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Ah, we're Ta-ra. all getting technical problems, aren't we? One by one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just jumping back slightly as well to uh, where, in my opinion, you rightly stated that if something is done wrong or illegally is down to the head or the teacher, whoever does it, paragraph 167 of the judgment. In relation to the claimant's submission that the code and guidance do not prove sufficient information, oh, sorry, do not provide sufficient information to enable them to know what their children will be taught in RSA lessons, I note, first, that the role of such policy guidance is not to eliminate all uncertainty regarding its application and all risk of legal errors by head teachers or governing bodies. So what they're saying is they they you know they've not tried to eliminate everything because there might be some legal errors by head teachers or governing bodies, but that's nothing to do with the government. Um, wow. So if and again, you know, my my biggest issue, or I can't say it's my biggest issue. One of the big issues that concern me, which I touched on earlier, is the the lesson content. And hopefully I'm wrong, but we do know that it's a global rollout and we do know that this lesson content has been given to children in all of the 51 countries where it's been previously rolled out. It's a fair assumption to assume we're going to get much the same. Um, Like say, hopefully I'm wrong. Well, if not, in because I know I've argued with people because I said, well, it's in England and Scotland. And I've had, I, I remember there was one in particular student, she was like, doesn't mean it's coming to Wales. And exactly I'm like, that. hang on but, a minute. You know, We've you, got a Labour I mean, government as well. And a Labour government will definitely be more liberal than a Conservative government. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 you know, from my point of view, it goes above and beyond our government. I mean, it is a global rollout, literally, for a global agenda, um, yeah. for a, you know, a global order. And we won't in go a lot there. Of ways, um, in a lot of ways, they're just the puppets, really, aren't they? You know? Um, in every way, <laughs> in, in my opinion. Um, well, see, in our mind, we, we it is a little bit different now in England because uh, Rushi, it was, what's his name? Rushi Sunek. Is that, am I saying that right? Right. I, you, apolo- I, I apologize if I've said his name wrong. It's not intentional, but he is a member of the WEF. So that hastens our compliance in a, a, a governmental rollout of everything. Um, but again, we won't go there. We're, we're on a different topic. 
Um, he has put an art. He did. There was an article with with the you know with him. You are talking about the prime minister now, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 He actually expressed concern with regards to RSC. I and the article it was archived. If I can find it, I will put it in the comments. Actually, when I, when we finished here, because it actually him he was actually dead against a lot of the aspects of this RSC and yeah. said that it, it's not age appropriate. So he's expressed concern. We know that there has been people in Parliament, such as Miriam Cates. She was in Parliament expressing concern as well. So there's been lots of people in the in actual in the actual parliament buildings that have been saying this is inappropriate and their constituents are coming up with concerns regarding it. So but a minority it is a minority though, yeah. I believe. Um of a you know, officials parliament. who are actually saying it. Yeah. As for Rushi, if he had any objection to it before. In my view, it's just a pretense. They write acts. It is theatre, um, you know, so they just try to appease the people. In a similar way, you know, we've all believed since the 1700s, since Blackstone's days, we've all believed that we actually had parental rights over what our kids are educated in school. Um but it turns out now, a few hundred years later, that we haven't. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's just a farce. It's, you know, it's an attempt to keep us happy, chuck us the bones. Um, but that's my own personal opinion, again. Um, but, yeah, so back to the, the teacher, head teacher responsibility. You know, I can only look at that from my own personal point of view. Uh, you know, and if I had gone into something like teaching... I would hope I would have gone into it because, you know, it's a fulfilling job and I would be teaching the kids, blah, blah, blah. If they started making me do psychological evaluations to see if a child is developmentally appropriate for a particular piece of sex, um, I, I would... I would I wouldn't be happy with that. I would have real discontent with that, to be honest. Um... That's not part of a teacher's job in my point of view. But, you know, so I, I just rush through. So when I say that the, the judgment on multiple occasions, the st- you know, it, it points to the fact or states the fact that the teacher head are responsible for the lesson content and making sure it conforms to the code and the guidance. I'm, I, the ones which I potted out, plotted out as being particularly relevant and specific paragraph 73 74 76 160 167 201 209 211 212 she doesn't just say it once Mm. the the responsibility is being put on the heads and the teachers and i would be outraged by that if i was a teacher or a head well this Um, is why it's really really important that every teacher and head sees this this response they need to be aware that actually whatever you're teaching you know this is your responsibility now you can't fall back on the government because they're they're shirking responsibility and saying well well, again they have they 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 are shirking responsibility because you know um hypothetically say for argument's sake in the future something does crop up um and there are actually case law examples in this judgment um there's a section which involves a reasonable amount of different european case laws in regard to the human rights um and they tend to be against a teacher or 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 a head um from memory without going back and actually looking specifically there was one in particular which it was it was the teacher as a po it's not my point is they're not taking the government to court when these single singular specific issues arise in a school it seems to be the head or the teacher mm. um and i think that's the way it's been laid because then the government don't get tarnished 
Oh, well, they did that. We told them not to do that in the code and the guidance, but they did this, it anyway. So this fault. is actually demonstrated. There was that. There was um. There was a story of a young. It, well, he was a seventeen-year-old boy, and he 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 seen that his eleven-year-old sister was doing homework, looking at porn. Mm. And when it it was brought to the school's attention, it was almost like they all sort of shirk responsibility. Mm. Oh, it was resources that they. Oh, I shouldn't. Or. or it, sh it, it shouldn't have been I don't know those resources shouldn't have gone to the children it, you know it was all like you know passing yeah. the buck but like, we do know that pornography is part of this RS. well system. yeah I, your porn hub links have been given for to children for research yeah. purposes um you know I, as I say can I just comment there um as you will all know of my experience in the classroom again where I had three eight-year-old boys and one of them was telling the other two boys how they should go on Pornhub mm. or you should have a look at Pornhub and I was shocked um, and I brought it to the teacher and she just kind of giggled and was like oh you know well, uh, uh, should I, I'll, what do you think I should do phone the parents I was like well you need to like you need to follow whatever the procedure is that you need to follow. Um, but yeah, you you this isn't just a, a flippant comment that you well, can then not act on. Um, you... And I was so bothered when I got home. Then I rang Kim and said, like Kim, I've heard this comment, and I'm concerned actually that the schools not going to act on this comment we don't know where this comment has come from maybe the boy has got an older brother and he has walked in on his older brother watching Pornhub but maybe oh sorry uh maybe uh maybe he's being abused and has been shown porn so you know, uh, I emailed it I don't know whatever happened to it but I then wanted it on paper I'd already documented it in school but then I wanted it on email so I emailed the school the the, the principal uh the the head teacher sorry I'm not in America um <laughs> and uh and and then made sure I put it in the email as well then this is what I heard in class today you know I I hope there's going to be procedures that you follow that is going to um find out why this eight-year-old boy is watching Pornhub yeah, probably it's not, serious, isn't it? That is a serious. That's a serious well, thing. That's not something that should just be brushed under the carpet. Again, right? So it, it, we knew it anyway. You know, it's part of the code and the guidance, and it's what everybody says. But it's printed here now in case law on multiple occasions that this is the point of this education, isn't it? To stop things like that corrupting the young minds. Yeah. So for the school to have done nothing is anti what they're trying to achieve with RSE. You know, yeah. they, they, that's the point of it. So if you hear things like that, they should act on it. Yeah. So, you and know, fact, in my opinion, not be blase about it. Ooh, that, no. You know, that's funny. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, can I just say as well, in relation to what Adele said about uh, those lads, which is chilling, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was a massive safeguarding issue, which mm. should have been followed up. I was um, a message. I read a message to PCP, I think it was, or Education Our Way, on um, the other day. And it was from a lady whose seven-year-old child had been directed by the school, maybe inadvertently, to not only her, but another child in the class as well, presumably others, but only two parents were actually agitated enough to mention it, that um, they found that their two children were on plenty of fish. Wow. Dating, um. dating side. I don't know anything about it, but I'm told it can be quite raunchy. Uh, yeah, yeah well, 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 right. I... Seven-year-old. But apparently uh, the parents found them on this dating site, and it was because they the actual um the piece of homework they were doing was on henry the eighth and they had to write a sort of biography for him for pretend that he was going right. on plenty of fish and he was trying to find a date so it was just it was a bit zany it was a bit silly and it wasn't very well thought out was it 
No. And this was a young teacher who probably hadn't thought of the consequences. But there you go, it's happened already. These stories yeah. are legion. They're everywhere. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I've it's... seen numerous. Yeah. Darren, have gonna... we got much more to get through the, the court stuff? Because I'm just I'm no. just sort of like thinking for time. How, how no, no, how right. You... When you want to kick me off, you carry on. Um, I've just been going with the flow and picking out the bits which were relevant. Um, yeah, my, my biggest points, my personal biggest points, I, I think I've covered. You know, we, we've never had, according to the government and now the High Court, we've never had parental right of excusal. Um, once we put them into state school, you like it or lump it, they can and will because there are provisions in the 21 Act for them to change the code whenever they wish. Um, so they can, according to the court, teach us whatever they want. If we don't like it, get your kid out, either homeschool them or put them into private school. That's that's the answer to it. Um Again, you know, the, the, the judge has clarified the renaming of RSE. The judge has clarified that we are a majority. The public overwhelmingly and the religious groups overwhelmingly voted against the introduction of this and the parental opt-out. But the government and their little cohorts decided to put it through anyway. Um responsibility is on the teachers and the, the head teachers so any disgruntled parents and not going to the government because of this education which we know is going to cause issues with at least some people um it's on you teachers and head teachers and unfortunately you're the ones who've just been nodding along with the government without checking anything your teachers you, teachers. you can read have a look you know yeah. you can read have a look and if you can't read which is unlikely being a teacher this video's done for everything reading it for you have a look instead of do you know what i mean it's, it annoys me the most you, absolutely and, you, and you, most on. people know i know this education pretty darn well at this time more than me adele to and be honest my daughter Much. i pulled her out of school she wasn't, she, you know, she was, she wasn't happy out of school. She wanted to go back to school, although I don't feel like she's very happy back in school now. But I am speaking to my daughter's school. Um, I pulled her out of school. She's gone into a school near to where I've moved. But the headmaster from the school she was in is now the headmaster of her new school. So it's great. I've not had to engage in new dialogue. But even myself, I've had a meeting with, you know, just a few weeks ago, I had another meeting with the headmaster and he's getting out his laptop and a video to play me and his words were, let me try and dispel some of this misinformation. <laughs> and I said, Mr. Keane, I am, the according to the government, the, the misinformation. misinformation. Yeah. You know, you're, I'm the I'm the one who's shouting out about this, me and, you know, the, the colleagues I've now been working with. You can't dispel this to me. I'm here to sort you out on the mm. misinformation mm. that the government is giving you. Yeah. Um, but he openly admitted himself he doesn't have time to look into this he's never wow. heard of emma reynolds he's never heard of queer theory he's never you know he doesn't know that the world health organization has any anything to do with this you know he hasn't looked at he does, hasn't looked at the unesco document that's on the hub website you know that the government are referencing to use he hasn't read it he hasn't looked at it so no, for us who are involved in the campaign, Lucia, your kids are in school. Yeah. And so I want to reassure parents, if you are feeling like that your head teacher, we who are involved in this campaign from the beginning are struggling to get our head teachers yeah. to listen and to understand and to take the time to read these documents. So don't feel that you're not doing it 
good enough or well enough if your school is giving you the same stuff because I'm getting it and I know this. You know, I can, I very feel very confident in being able to argue this, you know, with the head teachers and the teachers. And I'm struggling to get them to see the other side of this. Yeah. So I think, you know, that these heads now, these heads and teachers, they really do need to be informed properly because the the onerous is actually on them now. Um, mm. Obviously, we're not going to give up here anyway, aren't we? We're not stopping at this. No. We said it doesn't matter whatever the result was. The fight's going to continue. It will go to appeal. And, you know, if if need be, we will have taken it to the a higher court. Simple as the Supreme yeah. Court, isn't it? So this does this fight doesn't yeah. stop here, but as it is at the moment, new parents still need to be speaking to your schools and you know building a rapport with your schools and uh, showing your concerns. And also, as Darren said, let them know that if anything goes wrong, the government have actually told. You know, that the government have actually said, well, it is actually the responsibility of the head in the schools to make sure they get it wrong. So the schools better make sure they don't get it wrong. And they Absolutely. Better make sure I think it's letting the, the schools know the government has put all responsibility onto your shoulders now. This goes wrong. I ain't no, coming, after the I'm coming after you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's that's it. Yeah, the way the way I see it, there would be no route to take the government because all they would do is produce the evidence they produced you and said we've issued the code and the guidance. That teacher didn't it's follow on it. The school, right? Yeah, it's on the school. I can't see any cause of action to get to the government for these individual events, which are gonna. I'm pretty sure they're going to occur. Um, so that would worry me if I was a teacher, personally. Oh, big um, time. But I do think, you know, it, 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 it's not just the legal battle. It was one route. It, it's, it's, it's one route to success. It's probably the most difficult route to success to actually get the courts to rule in favour and abolish something that the government and the rest of the world are, are trying to implement on us. Mm. Yeah. The other option is having enough people, once enough, in any situation, yeah. once enough people say no, then it stops. Um, yeah. So the court case, even though we've lost, will inadvertently wake up more people. And we know mm -hmm. from the case, from this judgment, we know that we're the majority. We've just got to yeah. get the knowledge to that 87.4%. 87 87.4%, if half of them said no, that's... 50% of the school done. Well, yeah, I really, hope, I really um, hope now that the, the papers, the media will at least give some of the reason. I, I hope that somebody will print that the government said, you don't like it, save your money, send them to private school. You don't yeah. like it, quit your job and homeschool them. I really hope <sighs> One of the media reports, you know, this aspect. Yeah, that the government. The day, if, the day if you can't mail. afford private school or to homeschool, then sod you. You're doing what we tell you. That's, yeah. that's what has been said and what has been agreed. That was the case and, brought by the defence yeah, before the defence, uh, and and the the judge has categorically agreed with it. Um, yeah. So yeah, and, that's where and, we are. If you don't like it, lump it. Yeah. yeah. And getting back to the teachers, you're not just talking about like in the days when I was doing supply in Gwynedd, you'd have a piece S H E teachers, it was called then, I mm -hmm. think. And there was only I don't know how many people in the school, but there was a certain amount that were qualified to teach that. Mm. And I think um I think a lot of it was sort of social responsibility as well. I think it, it was it encompassed. I was never in on a lesson, so I don't know what it was, but I know that sexual education was in there to an extent as well, but other things were. So back in the day, you'd only got very few people that could actually teach. I, as a supply teacher, couldn't do that lesson. 
because it was only for people that have been trained. Yeah. yeah. Now, <clears throat> every single teacher anyway. is going to have to teach aspects of it. Exactly. And who's to say, if there are repercussions, who's, who's going to say which teacher it was, yeah. which specific lesson it was, what, what actually tipped the kid over the cliff? You know. This is it, because it, it could be, it, it may be down to one teacher or, or various teachers. Where do you pinpoint, the, where if, if damage is, does occur, where do mm. you pinpoint the blame? That's you it, know? we can foresee the source of the damage or what the damage might be. Mm. Um, all we can do now is is pick out the imperfections as they, uh, as they yes, occur they and yes. compile it into a bundle of evidence. Um, mm. and, uh, you, you, and I believe challenge again right so they put in all uh, they put in all the responsibility on the teachers and the heads and it is unfortunate for the teachers and the heads so but any complaints which we get which parents have now which looks like it's not conforming with the code and the guidance then the complaint goes to the teacher the head that school and they've these have all got standards to keep up haven't they too many complaints doesn't that not like mm. the school's rating and so on so on so they they do need to be very careful i believe i don't mean now in a threatening manner either yeah. i i no. genuinely i believe they need yeah. to be careful for their own backsides yeah they, they, i need to just check this now because i'm i want to say that we haven't so i know so we've obviously got the code mm -hmm. and england provided guidance um right. The English English guidance, for example, which is why we've seen a lot with England that you know schools are going against the government's guidance because the government guidance for England clearly states gender ideology is not to be taught. You know, mm -hmm. that, but yet we're seeing, and I feel this is a problem we have with our code. Our code isn't stating what can't be taught. Yeah, no. it's great. Um, it's not really it's not really given much of anything no no so, um you know they're saying oh we won't teach this and we won't teach that uh they're not able to say we won't teach this because the guidelines tell us that we're not allowed no yeah. and and that, that, right that's where it becomes difficult for the teacher as well and referring back to some of the case law which was used in in the case and and this this judgment was pointed out um so it would be there, there was one example it, it might i i can't remember because they use various ones there was a, a, a german case and a, a danish case i believe right the one case which actually succeeded i believe um please excuse me for any errors i can check it and correct it later the 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 claimant's child or the claimant and the child was a particular Muslim faction. Um, they were only teaching the, the Sunni style of um, the Muslim religion. This person took offence and the court looked at it and said, yes, it was not indoctrination but because it gave more emphasis to one and not the other mm. then it, it, wa it, it wasn't equal and pluralistic and, and that's why they're saying everything's got to be equal and pluralistic they mustn't be more bias given to one religion than another they must yeah. be objective and there draws the line so if something is being pushed and hypothetically speaking, say for argument's sake, we had, I don't know, a trans teacher then for argument's sake, who is more biased towards the trans part of her education that in effect would be in theory would be provable in the kids work. Yeah. Therefore that is going against RSE. Uh, the the code and the guidance because the code and the guidance specifically says that it must be objective and non biased and not indoctrination. So it's the way that it's it's going to be taught. When I say like say the liabilities on the teacher and the head, I draw the assumption from that or the conclusion from that that 
it depends on if there are any biases. And that's, again, I, I, you know, that seems to be just on the LGBT style of it. There was nothing, there was nothing mentioned with the this, this, this sexually explicit content. I mm. mean, where we will draw the line with that, I don't know. There's no reference to it in the judgment although evidence was entered. So we can kind of draw an inference that if they sway a bias to one way or another, we can go in and say that's anti the code or the guidance yeah. and you've got to stop doing it. And depending on how serious they may be a claim against a teacher or a head, so on, so on. Yeah. With the sex side of it, I don't know because the judge didn't make any comment on what yeah. would be appropriate and, and what wouldn't. The government assure us that they're not going to show us any pornographic material. But then you've got the interpretation of what do the people well, say in that? What is their definition of <coughs> pornographic or explicit material? Yeah. It, it could be much higher than our. Yeah. Again, it's, it's all down to perception and interpretation, yeah. and it just complicates everything. It would be easier to just know. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's too complicated. And these but, teachers have got to sieve through this, these complications as well, knowing now that the liability is on them. Exactly, exactly that. Sorry, Darren, I am going to have to move That's on now. Right. We've no been on this, um, we have been on this subject quite a while. Um, yeah, Sam sorry. has just joined here. No, don't apologise. You're brilliant, Darren. Never apologise. Um, Sam has just asked um, what was the judgment. Unfortunately, the judgment didn't go in our favour. That doesn't mean the fight stops. We are continuing. Um, we are like basically we like whatever happens. We 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 were never guaranteed a win. Good job, um, no. It, it was it was never you know we, we were always prepared that this could happen. So obviously we are going to continue the fight. It will go to the appeal, uh, the court of appeal, and then if we're not successful, then we will be taking it further, higher up again. So please, everybody, do not feel disheartened by this. Uh, you know, we've just got to stick together here. We have to stick together. Obviously, we haven't got as um, we're not as rich as the government because the government have got our money because, mm. you know, our taxpayers money. They're using that to fight against us. So we just need to raise money between us. So this is one of the reasons we're doing this sponsored um, podcast on is to raise money. And um, the link is on the actual description of this but i will put it on here again i know jacks black has just put it on here thank you lisa for doing that um but darren while i've got you on here now i might yeah. as well speak to you about your fundraiser event events pural yeah. because you've okay. done a couple of fundraiser events and you've raised you've raised a substantial bit uh, a substantial amount of cash for our uh out this campaign haven't you I, well, have, I ran yeah. off to the bathroom then, I did, and I heard her go, hello, Dad, I'll run back. <laughs> no, 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 you're all right, you're all right. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I, I have raised a fair old bit of cash, which... You said Dad, I'm really, not because... now. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Sorry, Dad. That's all right. Um, similar, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I had to go and raise it because I haven't got it to give to you personally. Um yeah. You know, although some donations have been made by myself and Catherine and whoever else in the, in our families, um, yeah, there's no way on this earth I could have given you anywhere near that sort of money in a donation. So, you know, I, I get off my butt and do something, didn't I? Um, can you, can you, tell, I, can you I, tell everyone what you've done? Because you've done a few. Um, Start from the first right, one. Yeah, so the first one was I walked from here to St. David's in West Wales. And if you're not familiar with um, Wales, it, it was approximately 140 miles. I did it over five days. I think after that, I did a seven-day fast, a water fast. Um then I believe it was the skate, the twenty-four hour skate. No, the three peaks you, was in between there. No, the peaks, right. So the three peaks that. was in there as well. I mean, obviously the three peaks, the skateathon were group events and outstanding. I mean, I, 
I would so much like to do something similar again, or whatever it is, just with the group. It was, it was both occasions were, were outstanding. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed them. It was a great yeah, bunch of people. Yeah, I think the group events are so much more fun, aren't they? And obviously, I was with you um, for, for both of those. Adele, yeah. Well, actually organised the three peaks, didn't she? So Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I've enjoyed doing it all. And, it, you know, again, I, I've managed to raise some money, but these have all been personal challenges for myself as well. Um, I do like to, you know, I do like to see what I can do. And yeah, more recently, I think a fortnight ago, uh, I walked from Brecon home, uh, coming up close to about 40 mile, I think. Um, I done, well, it took me about 16 hours, if I remember that, or the, them last couple of my, that's of all of the things I've done, that was without doubt the most painful. Them last eight or ten miles really, I really I actually hurt. haven't caught up with you about this <sighs> because you obviously walked it. Mm. Well, the week before, my daughter and I, I we the cycled bike. the very yeah. same route. Mm. Um, and that took us, I think we were at six or seven hours by the time we got to the Goitra. Yeah. And unfortunately my daughter fell in the canal and it kind of cut us off at the limit. So yeah, I actually haven't caught up. So I was curious as to how yeah. long it took you. I, I believe it was yeah, I I left about we were actually walking about ten past six in the morning. Um, because Rosanna had done the first half with us to Langadoc, I believe. Mm. Um yeah, we about ten past six, and if I remember rightly, I got in about Oh, it might have been got just gone 10 o'clock, I think. I might be corrected. Yeah. It might be just gone 9 o'clock. Um, Grace departed at Gavilan, which was roughly the halfway mark, Ooh. just over, I think. Never. From there, once I got to Goitra Wharf, I knew I'm roughly six miles from Pontypool and three miles from home. So I've got, you know, a, a good... Two hours from Goitra Wharf to Pontypool. I knew two hours maximum to there and then a 40 minutes to an hour from Pontypool. But that stretch from Gavilan to Goitra Wharf, um, it was dark. It got dark as well. There was no, I didn't see anybody for most of those hours. And it just went on and on and on mm. and on. And every corner, I was hoping to see signs of Goitra Wharf coming up, and they they didn't come. Um, I got it's to a Goitra... pretty absent walk, isn't it, to Goitra? Because we were the same on the bike. Mm. I was like, "Where is when is Goitra mm. Wharf going yeah, to come, come um, upon us?" Uh, and I got to Goitra, and I I was I was pretty knackered by the time I got to Goitra. Phil was he had phoned me. He was going to meet me at Goitra to do a quick interview. And you know, going to Wharf to get on the other side of the canal, you've got to go down that big slope yeah. under the tunnel and then back up. And I sat on the other side and I was like, oh, I hope he, have, I hope he doesn't turn up. I hope he doesn't turn up because I didn't want to walk down that slope and back up the other side. And yeah. then the lights came on the other side. So I had to walk down and under. Um, but like I say, it was all downhill from then. But by that, my hips, I, I waddled the last sort of six uh, well between six and nine miles i i waddled that way home my my hips just seized up it felt like muscle i don't know if it was muscle or bone but it felt like my bones had seized mm. and that that was that was painful i and i had no alternative but to, to get home Catherine did sneakily say she could get me arranged to get me picked up from pontypool but i declined yeah Oh, um, I mean, Darren. curiosity, Darren, because yeah. that was, like I said, I think the Brecon to, I know Brecon to five locks, I think is 36 miles that, from the thing. I, I, But that was on the fire. Yeah, board. again, so, I, I've estimated it between 35 and about 38 miles. And my best, the, the, re, the, the, the reasons for that estimation is the best I found was a, 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 a rivers and waterways pamphlet for the Mon and Brecon yeah. Canal. Yeah, that's what, yeah. And on the bottom is, so they, they say from the basin 
to Brecon, it adds up to 35 miles. And I know yeah. from the base into home is about three, three and a half. Yeah. Um, so I've come up with roughly around 38 miles from that. I mean, it could vary by a couple of miles either so what way. what I was going to ask was, you know, as you, you walk from, that was over five days, was it? Your walk to St. David. To St. David. David. What was the yeah. longest you walked? About 25 miles. Up? So I, if I, this Brecon was then, ooh, yeah, it, without a yeah, doubt, I had, I had never walked more. more. In in my memory, I've never walked more than twenty five miles. Um, right, in one go. In one go. But you did one hundred and forty in one week, didn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> five days. Um, like, yeah. But it, I mean, in and I had, you know, there was a few days there where I ran into some difficulties, you know, with pains and whatever else, and just the fatigue from carrying that bag. But still, the last section that I walked from Brecon was without a doubt miles harder than the walk to St. David's. I, I, I've, I've assessed the situation. I'm easily comfortable with 25 miles with a backpack or not. Um, I could guarantee you that, however I was feeling. 30 miles is a, is a good limit. I could easily yeah. push to 30 miles and probably get up the next day and do it again. That past 30 miles, that last section, I, I really don't think I could have got up and done it again the next day. I, I was I was yeah, quite painful done. by then. So I would say I, I'm going to draw my limit. I never want to walk over 30 miles again, <laughs> unless it's for a good cause. Um, yeah, 30 miles, it's a long time. See so you next week for a 40 miler. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I'm probably going to do something stupid and ignore all of those. You forget, don't you? Uh, yeah, um, after a right. while. Yeah. But yeah, 25 miles is comfortable. I'm happy with that, with or without a bag. Um, <laughs> but I don't want to go over 30 unless I have to. No. Ever, no. ever, ever again. Well, well, well done. Well done. Well we're absolutely we are grateful anyway we at pcp wales and you know for the all the children as well well it's been a pleasure just that, everybody like even if we just mention you on a live and that the comments that come the gratitude from around the country you know you don't you don't see it you don't even you know so you no. did you know what i well, mean it's, um but the gratitude around the country i i wouldn't say it unless it was there do you know what i mean but everybody just they idolise you guys, you know what I mean? Well, and, and you're a massive part of this movement and it couldn't be couldn't mm. be where it is now without you guys. And like I've said to John, you know, in um, private conversations, if, if it was if it wasn't for you, it would be left down to me. Now I would try my hardest and I would learn it, but my health would never have sustained it. We Ooh. we would you know, that is a fact. That is well, a fact. It's... So that, you it's know, a, that, that we wouldn't be here now. You know, we it's, wouldn't it's, be here now. And I and you know how great it is to be like it's in Darren's hands and not have to be looking over the shoulder. That's just like for well, me personally, I, that's just a huge relief for me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, um, it's a mad old situation for me. I've known Darren since I was knee high to you know, he was well, I think you were 10 years older than me, Da. I, we yeah, lived on the same like street. That, Assuming uh, you're still 21. Assuming I'm still 21, of course. Yeah, we are, yeah. I'm 10 <laughs> years older than you. Sorry, <laughs> but I, I've known Darren since I was little. Um, I knew his younger his younger brother better. But um, I knew would have thought you yeah, we would be all these yeah. years later. But, my gosh, I walked walked into gymnastics one day and he said to me, Oh, do you know Adele Purchase? You look yeah, like well, her. funny enough. <laughs> it was it was following the time that you had been in Ireland for a long time. And yeah. the last time I had seen you prior to that was on the bus stop by the by the blinking owl some years before. Yeah. And you had most certainly changed your appearance in the, between those two occasions. And I was looking and I was thinking, you mega look like Adele. <laughs> mega look like Adele. And then when I asked, he was like, I am Adele. I am Adele. <laughs> but yeah, in well, my it's, defense. It's me but here well, we are all these years later. I and know. even myself, I came across Kath a few years ago because of what you were doing, the battles that you were facing yeah. in your personal life. And yeah, having you on board here, I know you know your stuff. And the moment Kim said, like, 
how would you how would people feel about that get him on well get him on. I do you appreciate know. it, but you know, from a, I'll get told off for this by Catherine now. For you know, from a personal point of view, um, I think you overestimate me. Do you know what no. I mean? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't take compliments very well, to be honest with you. And as much as I, 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 I am, I, I'm, I'm extremely happy and grateful that I've had because again, it's, you know, there, there's some selfish motivations as well. I've learned a lot. Um, you know, I've gained a lot more experience and knowledge than what I did have, you know, and that that's that's the key to me is I'm I'm interested in learning everything. I wanna yeah. know everything. Um you know, You're nosy, got, aren't you, Darren? You need to know I'm the very ins and nosy, outs. very nosy. <laughs> you know, I've got a reasonable capacity for remembering and recalling facts and figures and details and so on, so on. But yeah, you know, I I've learned a lot through my my involvement full stop with TCP and that like I said with the sponsorship things, the fundraisers. It's been as beneficial to me as what it has to you lot. Do you know what I mean? I I've achieved something personally, and you've uh, you know you've gained some money and some support out of it. So, you know. It's, it, it, I've gained a lot from it and you know the same with this whole process as well as much as I've been involved with other court dealings um, never a judicial review um, so now I'm fully competent I, well maybe not fully competent but I'm competent in the process and the procedure for a judicial review start to finish so you, I've learned stuff as well you know what I mean so I appreciate that and thank you everyone for giving me the opportunity to learn more shit oh well and thank oh, you thanks, Darren. thank you Been that's amazing. all right that's okay you're welcome anything else as you know I'll um do my best and I I think Lucia was kicking me off half hour ago <laughs> no still, I yeah. wasn't kicking you off I just wanted to move on to the a bit of talk about the fundraiser but I do yeah. know we want to we want to move on now to yeah no that's fair enough Tim's thing but Darren thank you so no so thank much you for on Thank you. It's and been thank a pleasure. You, you do. Brilliant. Keep, thank you. Keep up the Ta good work, all. Darren. See you soon. Ta 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 thank you. Bye. Ta Ta so, if anyone's just joined us, guys, this is our 12 hour live podcast. Lucia's put more hours than me. I've been skiving on and off. Yes. Um, I jumped in but we know this. you're not skiving now. <laughs> <laughs> we know you're not skiving. You're just doing more work. I, yeah, I did. Yeah, doing additional work. <laughs> so, yeah, guys, today we've had the judgment from the Judicial Review and it hasn't gone in our favour. We are, I, I, like I just, I keep repeating for me personally, I think the shocker is that the judge actually agreed that um, with the government and the government's view is that there is no such thing as parental rights. This is important, especially if you live in England. The judicial system is for England and Wales. So... Even though education is devolved, the judicial system is not, okay? What's law here, as in parental rights, is law there as well, guys, all right? So you should be concerned. This is case law. This will be referenced against you in the future. So be very careful. Um, and I would take this matter very seriously if I was living in England. This is not just a Welsh problem. This yeah. is you as in England as well. That's the judicial review. As for the RSE, CSE, that is a UK problem, including Scotland and Ireland. But today's judgment should concern the whole of England and Wales right now. It really should. It really should. And I just want to remind everyone as well that even though we've lost this part, we do carry on fighting. We're not going to give up. We do need to carry on raising funds, which is part of the reason why we're doing this podcast. So if you can spare any money whatsoever, £1, £2, £10, whatever it may be, please do donate to our fundraiser. It's in the comments. It's on the description. We are at the moment £375. 
that is pretty good but let's make that more come on people dig deep share it on your pages as well because even if you may not be able to give much you might you know maybe you may get the attention of five of your followers they all give money so that's how it snowballs so please do your best to support this and if you are interested in doing a fundraiser event get in touch with me as well and we'll um, we'll get you some um, some sponsor forms over so I'm going to leave yes, it. it guys. That's why it continues. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm going to leave it with you. I'm going to pop off for a short while. I know you want to dedicate this segment now to sex abuse in schools, which is a, a very important part of why this RSC is dangerous as well. So I'm going to I'm just going to pop off and leave it in your capable hands, Kim and Adele and Joe, and um, I'll see you in a short while. Okay, love you. Have a nice little break. Okay. Yes, <laughs> she's held. She's held the fort, guys, for over five hours, and now she's just going to have a little break. So yeah, as Lucia said, guys, this we're going to discuss now sex abuse in schools because we hear a lot about peer on peer abuse, but we don't hear a lot about teacher on pupil abuse. You know, that's something that is hidden. And what we're being, um, you know, a lot of this education is based on the assumption that sex abuse happens at home. And I just seen a comment um, by somebody now referring to Miriam's presentation, saying that she was missing the point about child lying being confidential um, in case a child is being abused at home. Well, if a child is being abused at home, child lying shouldn't be confidential. They should be phoning the police and there should be arrests. So, that you know, there should be no secrets at all when it comes to safeguarding and that's what we're concerned about here and that's what brings us on then to institutional child sex abuse because these statistics are not mainstream statistics so what what people are saying um you know the stats satisfy the fact that sex abuse happens at home perpetrated by a male with a mostly female victim yes that is the record um records of sexual abuse and assault okay when you're dealing with institutional abuse it's quite a different game altogether so institutional abuse isn't as simple as going to the police reporting crimes it is protected so it's protected by the environment it's protected by the positions these people are in so they're in positions of trust so very often an adult um if an adult's told something about somebody they work with very often they don't like to um acknowledge that so we would have heard things like oh they definitely wouldn't have done that they definitely wouldn't have done that but in actual fact that was a person who had done it so institutions they have um a lot of female offenders as well it goes on for longer periods of time and detected multiple victims and just to give you an example of what institutional abuse looks like um i think it was a catholic church um, I think uh, the statistics for them, the amount of priests assaulting children were in the thousands. Thousands of priests were sexually abused and tens of thousands of children. So that's a more extreme example, but it is in line with the institution. Same with the, not the churches. Can, can I just add to that as well, Larry Nassar? I don't yes. know if anybody is familiar with Larry Nassar. I do think there might even be a documentary i'm saying there might be a documentary on netflix actually i think i listened to a podcast larry nassar an american gymnast co uh, coach he pretended that he was no qualifications pretended he was uh like a um physio abused many 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 girls over many decades and this went and in fact in the usa coaches of gymnasts it turned into be a huge scandal with nearly 400 people coming forward saying and this was just gymnastics saying that they well, have exactly girls the same thing abused. happened here with um barry Burnell. so for people who don't know, because we haven't explained what institutional abuse is. So institutional abuse, guys, right, yeah. is care homes, schools, sports clubs, churches, you know, institutions. So it's where the abuse takes place in there. And like Adele said with this Larry Nasa, so Larry Nasa, um, when it does come out and it is taken seriously, you find that they've got multiple victims, right? 
Um, and it seems to be in that field. So loads and loads and loads of gymnast clubs have the same issue going on. Exactly the same thing happened here um, with uh, Barry Bunnell. So when it came out about Barry Bunnell, I think it was over, I think it was 240 odd football clubs. In I was the just going to ask, was that football? Because it's, yeah, it was football. Yeah, yeah, so that was football clubs, you know, and, and FIFA as well investigated it. But guys, you know, let's look at the rate of conviction here. So there were 240 odd football clubs, right? There were loads of boys within these clubs, hundreds of thousands of boys. Where's the convictions? We've had Barry Bunnell. Barry yeah. Bunnell did not operate in all 240 football um, clubs, okay? He, he, it's impossible to be operating at that extent. So therefore, he was not the only perpetrator. And this is what we see happening in schools as well. So we all know about the um, residential schools, private schools and things like that. You know, those scandals come out um, but years later. So this is the issue with institutional abuse because it's a protected environment where very often people know each other as well. Um, the ones who are not engaging in this, they very often see these people of really good character. And like Adele said, with Larry Nasser, he was the best in the business. And he, he was, was managing to abuse girls when their own mothers were next to them. Her. Yeah, when their parents were in the room. Yeah. You know, yeah. so this is, so when you look at an institutional abuse, you're looking at something quite different here. The magnitude is huge. And because it's not uh, reported and recorded in the same way, we don't get those statistics. So we're not dealing with real time statistics. Now, when we when we formulate in policies and legislation, they are formulated off the back of problems. So they are there to address problems. Well, if we don't have the statistics to say there's a problem, we are not going to be creating a policy to address that problem. Yeah. But what we've had recently now, there's been some reports done and, um, and by the Independent Inquiry into Child Sex Abuse, IICSA. And they've done some reports on mainstream schools uh, and sex abuse in mainstream schools. And what they claim is, now this is not me saying that this is their words in their documents, okay? They claim that sex abuse in schools is an open secret. With over 40% of children who are being sexually abused aware of the abuse happening to other people. So we've always got multiple victims and we very often got multiple perpetrators as well. So if we know this is happening there, we know the problems and we don't get the statistics. There are loads of academics out there. I can name one now, Andrea Darling off the top of my head, um, doing lots of work around this, right? Why is our work not being used to create these policies to safeguard our children? We do know this is taking place there. We know the scale of it and we, we never address it. We might report on it when a big scandal comes out, but we never ever address it. So for us then, that begs the question, well, so why is the institution and solely the institution in charge of safeguarding our children for six hours a day, five days a week? yeah yeah you know okay. we, we like we are not denying that abuse happens at home right but we've got a safeguarding system that only addresses potential abuse at home yeah now we're cutting out the parents completely here so we have we've handed everything over from my perspective to the viper's nest yeah Absolutely. you know we did we did freedom of information requests um about two years ago now Dad, wasn't it the yeah. police forces and we asked them in wales you know the rates of child sex abuse and assaults reported so this is the people who've actually reported it now and the, the figures were, were extortionate it was over 100 for north wales over 100 for um was it Gwent? Yeah. No, David Powers. Yeah, and then I think South Wales was over two, was it two, nearly 280 something? No, it was 529 South Wales police in three mm -hmm. school years, 529 sexual assaults and rapes. Gwent told us that it was too much work. So we didn't just ask them for the rates of sexual abuse and, ass and assaults in schools in Wales. We asked them who was, was engaging in these crimes. Was it a child or was it an adult? 
And there was a lot of, of child um, child abusers there. But in many cases, there was far more adults. The most concerning FOI of all was the South Wales Police one. And um, I might actually have that here on my screen. Is this it? Oh, no, that's Gwent. Yeah, so the one, uh, the most concerning one of all was um, South Wales Police. And that was simply because... Have I frozen again? Uh, you've, your screen's frozen, but we can still hear you. Hmm. I'm not sure. I think she's very as you say, as you all, I can say, I sure Joan is moving. I think I just seen her blink. <laughs> yeah. So Joan is still there. Kim is still frozen. Um, as I say. I this know. Happened before uh, today, Adele. Yes, yeah, she's having it's some difficulties. But I know today. Kim has wrote. Obviously, Kim has done a paper as part of her masters, which is mm -hmm. on CSA. Joan, I know you've read it. I've been reading it over the last couple of days. I feel a lot of it, some of it is familiar with me because Kim talks about it so much in her presentations at our demos. But for me, it's been. I've really enjoyed reading this, you know, um, child sex abuse is something that's very dear to my heart. Uh, most people know I have spoken publicly um, about uh, my own abuse. I was abused as a child by my grandfather um, and I was raped as an adult in, in older life as well. Um, so I, you know, this is a, a very dear subject to me, and you know, most people know that. Um, unfortunately, my my daughter has also has gone through some stuff uh, when she was very very young, kind of before an age where, even though you've explained these things to your child, it doesn't necessarily mean they understand it around who's allowed to touch what, where, and when. Um, I have a pages of questions and things that I'd like to talk to Kim about, which I'm hoping we'll talk about some of these things that she's got in her paper. Um, how did you find what she was writing about, Joan? Well, to be honest with you, I was concentrating on all the wrong things because mm. basically what I was doing was proofreading uh, yeah. and, and just trying to sort out any glitches in maybe the way she'd expressed herself or words, you know, the kind of thing. So I wasn't, I wasn't coming at it from um, the same angle as you. And I've got it all printed off. I kept meaning to read it again because um, I thought it was a really important piece of work. Oh, massively, massively. I, I, and I would take, Kim's word for it, uh, she's the expert as, as far mm. as we're concerned, mm. that it's something that badly needs to be explored and her work needs to be peer reviewed and it needs to be out I, there. Yeah, I, I definitely well, agree there that the paper is something that needs to be developed further and, and, and pushed and I hope that everybody gets to read it because in, like, from my view as somebody who's a teacher, like, so even though I saw professionally learning disability is, you know, my job is what I've always done. But when my when my grandmother passed away, I my childcare was lost. I moved into schools and I, I tried to stay with educational needs, special educational needs, even in school. Um, and quite often you can read things, especially when it's an academic paper. It is difficult to understand. It is difficult to digest. It's got jargon. You, you know, it's diff, It's for Joe, Peter and Paul might not necessarily understand. And I feel that this is a paper that every teacher could read. Yes. And when they read it, it is, it is understandable. Uh, sorry, one second. My dog is just eating my Amazon parcel on the floor. <laughs> How obliging of him. I was like, that. what's that she's eating? Oh, a little oh, yeah. prison that might have arrived. Um, 
yeah and i think that because she brings up i get it she's come off the screen here now she brings up so much valid points and has very good arguments you know and that's what her paper is it, you know it's an argument that um so if i her paper is called exploring the extent in which education is a risky space and mm. she puts a really good valid argument across um and one of those arguments is teachers don't know what they're looking for yeah and why aren't we teaching teachers to look for abuse happens in school abuse happens in institutions anyone who denies such a thing is a, a, doing a complete disservice to all our children abuse exists everywhere yes we know that most abuse happens at home now whether that home is whether it's the parent a grandparent an uncle you know uh you know an extended family member or a very good family affair it's seen it tends to be within the home but as we know when when that is not in the home anymore when it's extra familiar abuse um we know that then belongs into these clubs, into these institutions. So why aren't we teaching these other people in these institutions which one of their colleagues could potentially be a predator? Exactly. Because it's such important information. And in fact, it's something that uh, and instead of just delivering RSE to children, I think in the first place it should be delivered to parents. Hundred percent. I always felt I think that. before it goes to the children, it should go to the parents. Yes. You know what um, happens when children don't tend to disclose to teachers; they disclose to their parents or the next most comfortable family member you know, that they feel close and, and, and safe with. But what happens when they do disclose to somebody outside of the family um, and that family, I came from a family which swept stuff under the carpet. Even in this day and age, it was, it was the 90s when I came out with my... My grandfather was a serial rapist, you know, um... He was a, 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 a paedophile and abused many children, um, including his own. And But I came from a family that swept everything under the carpet. I phoned the police. It was The police came to where I was. The police went and got my father and brought my father to me. We all sat in a police car while I disclosed my abuse. And then I got out of the car, the police car drove away, my dad took me home, returned me straight back to my grandfather. And it was just all swept under the carpet. So and how, how are you supposed when that child discloses, <laughs> because the family does nothing. Because the family wants to sweep it under the carpet. They don't want to bring dishonour on their family name. Or they just don't know how to deal with it. Or in my grandfather's case, my grandfather said, sorry, I won't do it again. Okay, we'll be, we believe you. So the education has to come with the adults. Of course it does. Instead of coming with the children, instead of saying, oh, well, if we give the kids all the tools they need, all the knowledge they need, all the vocabulary, that if anything bad happens, um, they, they can explain what it is. They can, they, can, they can tell a trusted adult exactly what's happened. Well, it's too late then, isn't it? Yeah, we and, don't. Yeah, we don't need them to go. This this vocabulary. How much vocabulary do they need, really? Other than someone is touching me here, and they can just say my private. They can point, and I know that no one is allowed to touch me here or here. Somebody makes me. We just need to tell them how to speak when they are uncomfortable. You don't even need to wait for somebody to touch you. How they're talking to me is uncomfortable. A child knows when an adult is making them uncomfortable before they've even done anything. 
you know. A child knows when they're sharing a secret that they shouldn't be sharing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think every child has that voice, that little conscience, whereby they sort of know, most children sort of know when they're erring on the side of secrecy and going into territory that they don't feel comfortable in. And they couldn't yeah. express it in so many words, but they know when they're being, there's a compromise being made, yeah. you know? And pedophiles yeah. are so good of provoking a situation whereby that compromise seems like such a happy place. It yeah. seems like it's such a natural place to be, but yeah. don't let's spread it around. No. We, we know what we're doing. This is our yeah. little secret. And this, as you well know, and, and as I well know, this is the way it works. It's a little yeah. conspiracy between two people. And well, I have to bring up the situation, Adele. How did you go back and confront your family after all that disclosure? Mm. After well, I was in a, so I was in a problematic situation in a manner of. So my grandfather had already started doing these things, but my mother was adopted. My mother was adopted, and she had found her biological mother. Uh, my mum and father. My father lived in Ireland. I was here in Wales. Um, so my mum was going to Australia to meet her biological mother. She was taking our youngest brother with her. So I had to then go and stay with my grandfather for six weeks while my mum was in Australia. I went to a new school uh, during this six weeks, the school that was next to my, my grandparents' house. So I was out there. I even spoke in school and told them what was happening. I got laughed at. I got laughed at in school. It was the most bizarre situation so then when i went back I, I was so from my therapy that i'd had many years later therapy came after stuff had happened to my own daughter and then i just my head exploded why is all this stuff following me around um and the therapist said everything because stuff just constantly gone minimized minimized not an issue okay yeah whatever that happened carry on so it was then hidden from my mother then as well. So when my mum returned from Australia, nobody said what had happened. It was actually my... So I just carried on as normal. Just carried on as normal. That's what it is. I, I can't even remember if anything happened afterwards. or. But then it was a couple of months later again before my mother found out. And that my grandfather told her himself. Unbeknownst to me, abuse had happened already with my grandfather so when my grandfather said to my mum oh when Adele rang the police it wasn't true my mum didn't need to hear anything else she knew exactly why I had rang the police because this had already been exposed in the family once before now this was my father's father not my mum's father um, but again, it was still kind of nothing happened. Another family member who was abused themselves wanted it all to go to court. I think she wanted her own abuse to go to court. But nothing happened. It was it was just all hush-hushed and it was all just brushed under the carpet. And I carried on a relationship. But I actually asked my grandfather himself, why did you abuse? Why, why did you touch me? And his, his reply was, I thought you liked it. I thought you liked it. And the thing is, I remember, and actually, Kim, this is actually touched, because you touch on this in your paper, so you can expand on this. It was confusing for me being abused by my grandfather because I was having biological responses. At times, he was doing stuff, and if it was horror, it was, it was, I, I can't describe, it, it was because you're, in that moment going, this is so wrong, this is so wrong, this is so wrong. Why am I having this tingle? Why is this tingle? Because I don't want this, but this, this, the sensation was in, I don't want to say enjoyable because I wasn't enjoying it, but it was a biological uh, reaction, a reaction that is usually associated with pleasure. Yes, 
Yes. And the, the, predator, the predator only understands it as pleasure. They don't know it's a bio... Well, even if they do know it's a biological reaction, it's used to manipulate the victim anyway. But I would go as far as to say most um, predators don't even realise that that's a biological reaction that's going to happen anyway, you know? And that then, that then I like, kind of... Um, makes it okay to them yeah you yeah. know it was a two-way thing you got something from it and a lot of perpetrators are of that impression you know it was you know we we, we all got something from it mm. what's the problem here there is no um there is no issue could have gone further could have done more do you know what i mean so the child's biological reaction is problematic mm. massively problematic now we know for the males they can have, it's, you can see it, right? I'm not downplaying any, please don't anybody think I'm downplaying anyone's experience, I'm not. But I do talk a lot more about male victims and female perpetrators, only because it's not talked about. Don't think I'm playing anyone's thing down now. But the difference with a male is you can physically see the erection, okay? You can physically see the ejaculation. And that is horrific for the man it's common knowledge as you know as far as as far as the population goes that an erection is usually associated with being turned on yeah maybe not when you're first a teenager like the rev was saying the other day he used to pop up everywhere when he was a teenager you know unexpectedly but the erection is associated with being turned on you know and ready mm -hmm. for sex so that is massively confusing then to a man or boy, you know, who's he confusing? Because why has that just happened? And then it goes a step further, then, and they have the ejaculation, the biological reaction that the female experiences, you know what I mean? So when the female experiences are, you know yourself how that felt. But for the man, it was the erection, then the ejaculation. Do you know what I mean? It's doubling down. Yeah. And um, I've spoken about this to Del, even though there's no studies to prove it, there is no studies to disprove it. I would go as far as to say that that is massively responsible for a high rate of male suicides. Yeah. I I would, I, so I've been listening all day. I, I literally have been listening all day. Every, all day you've been in my hand, coming around with me. Um, and actually, I wanted to touch on this earlier um, about the suicide rate, because, because trans was mentioned with the suicide rates and... Again, this is something that, you know, I quite, so we're being told, you know, this is why we need to, you know, with all the trans ideology is because of the suicide rate. So what are we doing about child abuse? Because I am pretty darn sure there are more adults committing suicide over the abuse they experienced as a child than there are people committing suicide because they're gender non-conforming and don't know how to handle that. Well, that's a valid point, isn't it? And this is why this is why PCP is set up, because there is no cure. There is only prevention. And mm. unless we've got a system hell-bent on prevention, how can we actually cure this? Yeah. You know, nobody's looking into this because because it's a hidden crime. So we got a lot of people that go to the doctor because they've depressed. The doctor will never ask if there's anything in their childhood, never. Mm. So that mm. person then, the first point of contact of the system was the depression to the doctor. Mm. That, now, that now coins that person's entire existence, their character, because they haven't told or haven't expressed what's gone on before. So, mm. and then that takes us back to why they haven't disclosed, why they haven't, do you know what I mean? So this problem isn't even at the point of depression or risky behaviours or drug taking. We have to go all the way back. These children need to be supported from the day they were born. You see what mm. I mean? We need to be preventative. We need to be, this could happen to your child. Mm. This could, this happens to this many children a year. I did, um, in my dissertation, I took... Um, I took the highest statistic of all, right? I took the one in 20 children and I and I put that against the population of Wales. 
So if the one in 20 children are being abused, right, there's 27,000 children in this country right now. Split between the 22 local authorities, we're looking at 1,200 children per local authority right now yeah. on the lowest statistic. Yeah. Right? Now, we, we, do, we are thinking that it's more like one in five. Mm. So how many is that then? One in 10 would be 2,400. Yeah. So one in five then is going to be, we're looking at over 3,000, almost 4,000 children per local authority. Why are yeah. we not looking for it? Yeah. I, mean, I remember only once I read. Listen, okay, we, we, there is so many children being abused that we shouldn't be waiting for them to come and tell us. No, we shouldn't. We should just be asking. Yeah. And that's what they said to you. <sighs> I feel the torn situation of childhood innocence, right? You don't want, but childhood innocence, if you want to be innocent, would be thinking that nobody dies, nobody gets hurt at all. Yeah. So we ruin their childhood innocence, in essence, by telling them they could cross a road, get smacked by a car and die. Yeah. We ruin their innocence by saying that swimming pool, that's so fun, actually is a death weapon. Yeah. You could drown in it and die. So we say we don't want to ruin child, but actually they're in a sense of, oh, nicer. We we spoil it all the time. That over there could kill you, die. You fall off it, die. Yeah. You go in there, drown, die. You know, so we do tell them all the time horrific things that could happen to them. And I'm a firm believer this skirting over good touch, bad touch. Yes, it's spoiled no childhood innocent. No Exactly. Yes, it spoils childhood innocence in essence, but those kids need to be told they're bad adults and they might try to do X, Y, Z. They might try and touch you here, there and there and you've got to say no and you've got to take an, tell an adult. Yeah. You see your friend trying, trying to steal, you tell mum. Well, you see yeah. somebody trying to touch someone, you tell mum, you tell dad, you tell auntie, uncle, whomever. Why, when it comes to the most heinous of things to a child, are we not telling them that that danger is out there? Exactly. exactly. If you think somebody's touching you wrong, then you decide whether you, you like that through consent. You decide whether this stuff is okay. You No. Well, we've already been told that we are misunderstanding this education anyway. So we've got no other choice but to wait for the three-year-olds to come over and explain it to us. Yeah. So, you know, the, everything's been put on them now. Everything's been put on the child. The child must know because of X, Y, Z. The child must know because of this. Well, the child is actually in a cesspit. Where there are children, there are paedophiles. That's yeah. a fact. Facts. But we're all just directed to the house. No, there's dangers everywhere. Yeah. Absolutely everywhere. And we are feeding the education system we are just honestly our children we're just chucking them to the wolves because yeah. there's no scrutiny there there is there's not even a piece of training in this country to address institutional abuse yeah. if there is show me because i can't find it show me one training package that discusses institutional abuse Show me one training package that the teachers do a warning them that their best friend in the staff room could be molesting children. There is none. Mm. There is I don't none. know if you were saying that thing, to hear. Hang on, let me, let me correct myself. The only thing they do mention on training, and i got to say this, i got to say this, sorry, is little Ted and Vanessa George. Okay, That is one thing that they have brought into um, generalised child protection training. Some of them will address Vanessa George and Little Ted's nursery. But what what is that, Kim? So can you remember Vanessa George who was sexually assaulting babies? So this was the woman that went, but she's out now, isn't she? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I know who you're yeah. So, training and media will have you believe that she was manipulated by the male perpetrators, yeah. right? But that's not entirely true. You know, so even though they do have this in, in some of the training, which I've seen myself, um, it's not entirely true. It's like she engaged in that because the men were on the scene, no. Because she connected with these men through the internet anyway. She's the one who offered the stuff up. 
And if you actually look into her background, okay, there's nothing there to say um, she did this, that, and the other, but her relationship with the children, there has been no change. She's always been trusted, trusted with you with the children. She's always had free access to children. Now, you're telling me a stranger off the internet has just had her to sexually abuse babies in their nappies with sex toys. Yeah. You don't get to that level, no. right, from meeting somebody in a few messages online. You don't get to that mm -hmm. level. It's, this crime is, is years old, right? So say one child gets abused today. Okay, this is just for an example. That um, might have been in somebody's mind for 20 years mm -hmm. before they actually acted, right? Then yeah. it's going to take 20 years for it to come out. Well, that one crime, that one act is already 40 years old. Yeah. You know, and this is what people don't realize. This is not like taking someone's purse, taking someone's car. This crime begins in there. Yeah. And it begins in there a long, long time before it comes out to you. And that's another reason why um, people get away with sexually abusing children. Because the people trained to deal with sex abuse understand there's a grooming process. But in an interview with a child, the child cannot recall the grooming process. The child can recall the acts. Mm. Which for the people interviewing them then, because they've been trained about the grooming process, the child Sorry, doesn't recall second, that. Doesn't they can't see that act taking place. So people in this field, trained for this field, understand that there's a grooming process. They understand this crime started long before the act, you know? So why are we not incorporating all this into our training, into our teacher training, into our social service training? It's simply not there. You know, there's a massive gap in provision with that, and it's a serious, serious gap as well, isn't it? What do you think, John? Well, I think everybody needs to be more vigilant. And, yeah. you know, a lot of the points that you raise, many people might not have thought about them because they tend to think of a paedophile as some shadowy figure that lurks somewhere on the horizon, unless they've had any actual uh, knowledge, first-hand knowledge of how they work, you know. So I think people need to look inside those dark places which are the heads of paedophiles. And be, before I finish, I'd love for you to play that uh, that clip that I sent to you of Stephen Adrian. Do you remember? No. Well, oh, the one, the one who was saying how he chooses um, his victims? No. The, the clip that I, I, I sent to you, I'm sure you've seen it before anyway, where Stephen Adrian from Paedophile Information Exchange actually says that we need, in order for children not to be shocked when they have the first, yeah, children okay. should not be shocked. Children, he's not saying children shouldn't have sexual activity. He's saying children shouldn't be shocked when they have it. Mm -hmm. And how would they not be shocked? Yeah. Well, exactly. in his estimation, they would not be shocked if they had the correct... Uh, education from an early age and what did he call that uh, uh, education comprehensive sexual sexuality education right i need to try and find a way now to get this on there she didn't send me a link you, you filmed it yes that was the problem because i was having such a hard job trying to find it i'll find it now don't i do know i've got but it's not a very good copy it's on um Right. What's his name? Adrian or John? Is it Stephen Adrian? Stephen Adrian. Because uh, to me, that was like a ha-ha moment. So, you know, he could have been the man that that, that wrote the RSE curriculum. For all yeah, I could have, because this, this is what I mean. This These are paedophile policies. These are pie policies, you know? Mm. Exactly. Well, this kind of links with, uh, the, with uh, you wrote about this in your dissertation, Kim, which is victim resistance. And I've had an experience of this myself. But one of the, the things you talk about in your victim res resistance, and perhaps you can expand on this, is fear. Now, I remember being a Do you know what? I feel like my childhood was plagued with 
just inappropriateness. But one of those things was there was an older boy that lived on the street, well, a much bigger teenager. And I think we were all playing foxes or hounds or mob, something along that, those lines. Um, he would have been a good few years older than me. And it was obviously well into puberty. And I remember running down the back of this little alley. He was down there and he turned around and got out his penis. Now, I'd never seen a kind of older penis. And it was, I remember it vividly to this day because it was full of black pubic hair. And I remember when he'd done that, my reaction was just, what the, just disgust, fear, something straight. And I just, whoop, turned around, ran the other direction. And obviously you speak about this in your, dis, your, your dissertation. And that is a concern of mine. The more we're exposing children to genitalia, especially adult genitalia, that reaction of oh, like, oh, what is that? That looks big. That looks hairy. That looks scary. And a male penis is scary looking. I think so. And I think as a child, it does. It's it's a, if you're used to seeing your little brother's penis, which is this little penis with no hair, and then you face an adult penis, that is frightening, I think, in my opinion. Well, um, the first time I saw an adult penis, it wasn't erect. Um, I was a toddler at the time and uh, I had gone, you know, my father's in the bath, I'd gone in and I was like, What's that? Um, I was mm. like, ah, get it over here, you know. But I, but that wasn't a big red penis in my face, you know. But it was like, ah, what's mm. that? You know, and that's but even down to a, that is enough for victim resistance. It really is enough for victim resistance. And what concerns me, victim resistance is actually part of safeguarding in our safeguarding policies, official government documentation. They are relying on mm. victim resistance, you know, to safeguard. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And it and is. That's what it... I'm really concerned about. And like I said, I wrote in it away because we know as well when children can engage confidently in discussion about their genitalia, that is seen as a way of consent. Well, again, that mm. brings us back to the grooming process. A child isn't sexually assaulted like that you know what i mean there's mm. talk there's play there's engagement does it tickle does that feel you know it doesn't they don't straight in for the kill sometimes they do but that's very very unusual mm. very very unusual because a perpetrator likes to keep the victims quiet mm. yeah you know they, yeah. they need to keep their victims quiet because there's three things in their toolbox access opportunity and secrecy those are the only three things that need to be present for your child to be harmed access mm. opportunity secrecy you can't see those things you know you just can't you... see those things and this because yeah. obviously we're talking about child sexual abuse here i know that easily we can all differ off this way that way uh i know you know a lot kim you know, we've all been in these schools. So I think it's quite easy now for the three of us to just go off on little little things. But I've read your dissertation and I'm very conscious that there's people watching that's not clued up in child sexual abuse. So I've wrote a few things down, Kim, that I think yeah. is important for people to know. So do you mind if I go through a couple of those things for you to explain? No, no, Can't, go like, ahead. You know, one of the first things you talk about, uh, other than your, your kind of introduction explaining what it is you want to explore, you then go into kind of defining contact and non-contact abuse, the two different categories. Can you explain a little bit about, about both of these? Right, so contact sex abuse is, is, as you suspect, contact, right? You know, it involves touch. Um, and things like that, you're actually there. Non-contact sex abuse. Now, this is really, really tricky. So, non-contact sex abuse is where you're trying to get children to engage in something without actually um, touching them at all. So, whether it's watching something, getting them to pose in a certain way, 
getting them to engage in something. And actually, non-contact sex abuse as well, guys, right, could be through any form of communication via the phone, the internet. So non-contact sex abuse is very, very tricky because your child could be, be um, they've even been abused in your own home by somebody miles away, mm. miles away. So how can you then be expected to protect your child from non-contact sex abuse when the perpetrator is not even there? Do you know mm. what I mean? So this is the control, the manipulation. This is this is what really gets me by this sex education is the non-contact sex abuse. Teachers think I attack them all the time, but this is what I this is my field. This is what I talk about. This is what I do. So I'm always going to look at that environment in that way. I'm always going to talk about it in that way. Just the same as a dentist discusses teeth, you know? So for me, a lot of this education falls in the realm of non-contact sex abuse. So getting children to label parts, getting children to discuss parts, getting children to look at images. That, to me, all falls in the definition of non-contact sex abuse. So that is dangerous then. And like I keep reiterating... You can't possibly expect me to believe people are not getting gratification from this unless you're going to wire their brain up and allow me to read it. You know, so that is the non-contact sex abuse is a very, very tricky one. And this education is fraught with it. Mm. But who is there to define it as non-contact sex abuse? What is the defining moment? You know, what changes it from a lesson to actually a boost? What yeah. is it that actually changes it from that? The answer is we simply do not know. We cannot tell. Therefore, no. it shouldn't be there at all. Yeah. Is it the enthusiasm? Do we go by the enthusiasm of a particular lesson? So they're going to be teach. let's just say, they're going to teach masturbation in a class. Well, no, let's just go down to the condom on the dildo. Right, yeah, okay. Something that's, that just being that's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a lesson everyone has. That's a child putting a condom on an adult sized dildo. People are getting gratification from that yeah. alone, right? That's just so that's not even masturbation, it's not even a sexual act. That's for safeguarding, yeah. Mm. So we've got an adult condom, an adult dildo with an 11 and 12 year old. Pre-pubescent child, the small little hand putting the condom on the dildo. People will get gratification yeah. from that, right? Mm -hmm. And we also get people saying, oh, but the thing is, rather than getting from that than actually touch someone, well, actually, it escalates. Yeah. It never just stays at that. Mm. So even if, say, a teacher was getting gratification from that, right, and that's it. People believe that's it. Now, okay, they've got, no, they're going home. They're going home. Something mm. else is going to come from that. Do you know what I mean? So mm. it doesn't just stop with that. So yeah. even though it's just seen as a safeguarding thing, how is that safeguarding teaching a kid on the front of condom? Well, I actually had condom, this. I had this conversation in my own staff room the other day um, because, well, first it was bananas, then it moved to cucumbers. Now we're on actual actual yeah, just, sorry i had my stepson in a moment ago and the door's not shut properly i just don't want the rest of my house here in my conversation um so i had this conversation the other day and said right okay so teenage pregnancy apparently is still just gone up 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 up, up. Well, we've been teaching the the condom on a banana to a to a cucumber to a, for since the 60s and 90s, I think it came in. Oh, we know older people who were saying as well. Before oh, right, the 90s. Okay. We're talking to people in their 50s who were saying, Oh, well, I did a banana in school, I did a cucumber, but yet clearly the pregnancy rate is still increased. So, teaching the banana is not, you know, the cucumber, the dildo was not done anything. We know from brain development you know i know from psychology you know the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until it's 25 what's this responsible impulse control rational decision making so and i had this conversation the other day in the staff room because that all the teachers agreed that this was a good lesson for 12 year olds you know from year from year seven upwards they agreed that this was a good lesson 
And I said, right, okay. I said, so where's the child getting the condoms from? When I was in school, my God, we used to we used to much school. We would say to school, we gotta to go to the family planning clinic. They couldn't stop us from leaving. You'd literally yeah. have 20 girls walk out all off to the family plan. We'd all go down to the none of us having sex, but we'd all go down, get condoms just because it got us out of lessons. But that's yeah. gone. There's no family cl planning clinic you know, that you can just walk into and get condoms anymore. So if you're getting condoms, you're gonna buy them. So these teenage boys gotta buy their condoms they have to keep them on them so they must be knowing that they're going out to get sex at night because yeah. they've got their condom on it then they have to remember to use it the likelihood is if a child is engaging in sexual activity there's alcohol involved plus the condom doesn't fit the condom so does all these things fit. yeah the condom simply doesn't fit, you know. I had a conversation with teenagers in, in Cardiff the other day and they were really, they had their head screwed on. And I said, come on, boys. I said, I said about this lesson. He said, I had that. He said, I hit my friend over the head with it. I said, exactly. He said, I would have done exactly the same. I said, yeah. so tell me, boys. I said, did that dildo represent your own tackle? No. He said, but I said it did. I said, exactly. Mm -hmm. I said, was yeah. that condom? I said, was that condom really for them? Definitely not. I said, exactly. Yeah. I said, exactly. I said, so if this was for your benefit, it would match your body. Mm. It wouldn't be adult genitalia. Mm. Why do we want children to put it on adult genitalia for a start? We don't have the equipment. We don't have the right size PPE. Mm. So and the these, the, like you said, these, these dildos, as you know, dildos, Dildos, they're not kind of made on your average penis size, which supposedly no. is, what, six inches or whatever. But they're not made. They're not modelled on average. They're modelled no, they above average, which a teenager definitely doesn't have. They're so sex like toys. They're just going to sex, it's sex toys. toy. It's a sex toy. It's a sex toy, exactly. You know, you know? and this is... This is it. We watched a video. We seen a video. We got sent a video in in Wales of these, but they were eleven and twelve year olds, I believe, even eleven to twelve or twelve to thirteen, all still underage. And it was, it was. I I said in the staff room the other day. I think they were all a bit shocked when I went, and I tell you, if I was to find out, my daughter. I'd done this in lesson, heads would be rolling. I, I couldn't yeah. even tell you how angry I would be. And Adele, was this for special needs children? No. So this was this was just, so yes, I'm in the staff room I'm in, um, I, I, we don't get the mainstream teachers. It's us that work with the, you know, additional needs. I don't work, um, so I'm not in the ASD basin in the school i'm actually not gonna mention I, i've i'm actually left the school now this week um but i work then with the deaf children so i do sign language for the deaf children and um even that in itself so we had an assembly pride assembly um where i was so i was with the deaf children now i have uh, one boy um he doesn't speak english He's profoundly deaf, doesn't speak English, doesn't know sign language. Um, it learns basic sign language. He knows basic English, you know, through, you know, he's from Africa. Um, <laughs> and we're sat there doing this pride assembly. They're using the gingerbread man, which is that, you know, uh, there's no, se you know, sex, gender. It's all very intermixed. Um you know, you are what you feel, etc. And um, like there was no, so I've got this boy sitting next to me. Uh, I am pretty darn sure in his culture, um, LGBT wouldn't be very, you know, prominent. And so this, you know, these these screens are come on, and you know, I know. So I'm trying to sign to the girl next to me. I'm trying to explain. So they've got LGBTQIA plus up. Um, they've got they've got two A's in it. Um, 
or two, sorry, two cues in it because they've got cue for questioning and cue for queer as well. Oh. So it's going through this. I am reluctant to sign. Well, I'm signing certain <laughs> bits. I'm also saying it's not true. That's not true. Don't listen to that bit. That's not true. Um, and then a video comes on. So this assembly is pride, inclusive, and blah, blah, blah. This video comes on. I put my hand up and I say, excuse me. Um, this inclusive video, does it have subtitles for the deaf children? No. No, it doesn't have subtitles for the deaf children. But then on pops two men snogging. Well, the boy next to me, who so far has been sat in this assembly, doesn't speak English. So he can't read anything that's coming up on the board. He doesn't know. So he doesn't understand. I don't even know how to sign queer. How do I sign queer? I, like, I don't know how to sign queer. I certainly don't know how to sign explaining what queer means. A bit different. You know, that's all I can say. It's a bit different. Well, these two men come up snogging. This boy, woo, he doesn't have a bloody clue. And no. it's not something he's used to. He's absolutely shell-shocked. He can't believe what he, you know. And I'm trying to, he's looking at me. He's going, woo. I, I, I'm not going to make noises. It's hard because you, you, you do go to imitate the people that you, you know. He, he's not verbal. He's, he's got no language. So it is just noise, hoots, wallers, and whip. Yeah. And it's, and it was like, I just, there's no. It, How did the teacher respond to that, Del? No, just that. No, sorry. No, sorry. You know, just no, sorry. And it, it drives me. It drives me crazy. Like I can go off on all different tangents there, but it drives me crazy then because again, it's this certain aspect where we adhere to a small percentage, um, mm. and you know, there's there is trans pupils in my school. Um, the you know it it, it it is. I'm I'm sat in classes. We've we've got children. I've got. I, it is the male children. It's the male children which are identifying female. Um, certainly the ones that are more open about it anyway are, are, are male. Um, but I, it was just the shockingness of inclusive. You haven't, there was no checking, no checking of what's gone on here, you know, with these children in this room. You know, no checking at, actually there's a boy who's from Africa. This is so foreign to yeah. You know, these deaf children, you, this mm -hmm. whole assembly was about inclusivity. And, and they didn't even no, have subtitles. No. They didn't even have subtitles for the deaf children. This is a school who's got a deaf unit. I know. It, but doesn't that, you know, you who worked with people with all these vulnerabilities, all these sensitivities, and your heart goes out to them, you want to help them, you want to empower them as much as you can. Mm. Someone like you must be noticing how come there's a whole month for pride mm. we don't have one day for people in wheelchairs do we we don't have one day for the deaf we don't have one day for the blind we mm. don't have one day for dyslexic people or whatever and I think when a school is, so this, the school I'm in, it's, you know, it's the high school for deaf children. It has a deaf base. I've sat in it and I'm going, where's the deaf awareness in this school? Yeah. The teachers are, um, like the teachers, teachers have got no deaf awareness. Do you know, there's one or two. There's one, and I have to say, I really, really appreciated a teacher the other day. We was in drama and this, the one boy who, you know, was said, she went up to him, she was talking to him. And I turned around and I said, Miss, you know that he can't? She said, yeah, I know. I know he can't hear me. But I'm, I'm just talking to him anyway. I want to talk to him. And I can't tell you how much I appreciated that. Because I've not had a teacher direct, or I, that I have seen directly. Knowing fully well he can't, doesn't know what yeah. she's doing. But she addressed him anyway. Yeah. You know, and I do, I see it, teachers, they're walking, so, Kim, close to my heart, close to your heart, ADHD, right? 
God, I feel furious. I, I, every day I'm changing what I want, where I want to go, what I want to do and where I want to go with it. ADHD is another example. So I'm in these classrooms now. I end up in the lower set because I'm with the deaf children. They're not so academic. But in this low set, you've got the children who are coming from problematic homes. Yeah. So they're not doing so well in school. They've got stuff going on at home. You've got the children who are just not very academic. So they are in this group also. Then you've also got the ASD children in this group. You've got the deaf children in this group. You've got the children with ADHD in this group. You've got the children with other behavioral issues in this group. All in the low set together is mayhem. It's the only way yeah. I can describe it is mayhem. Because you've got a class with five different needs, groups of children with five different needs. And that's not meeting them. That's not meeting them. That's They're kind of isolating them. But they're in well-being, the ADHD children. I said, where's the ADHD base then? Where's the base for all the ADHD children? Because I can tell you I'm in nearly every classroom and I can identify three or four of them. Yeah. But they're in the well-being because they're naughty kids. ADHD is very much... I ask anybody in school, what can you tell me about ADHD? Can't tell me nothing. And do you know, that's the first thing I say when I introduce my son. I say, he's not a bad boy. I mean, he is not a bad boy. Like, it's like, they, like we've gone through some issues with his mental health, right? And I've had two hospital admissions with him. I've been A&E myself. And um, I'm telling him what's going on. And they're like, it's ASD. It's autism. So they, so the way my son was displaying with really huge additional issues, right, fell in line with their category and their definition of just ASD. They didn't care how he usually responds or what he's usually like because on that day he was presenting how they had been taught he should be presenting. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And this kid was suffering, yeah. really, really suffering. And um, because he, like, fitted the stereotypes. Yeah. I felt it. I experienced it. And I walked out and I said, you know what? If you could diagnose him in 40 minutes with ASD, why on earth did it take me six years to get it? I have had enough, you know? I really did. And it's, and it's because they are put into categories and they are stereotyped. Yeah. And that's even in the medical industry. Yeah. And it's yeah, wrong. And that's it. You take and... someone like my son and put him in the um, additional needs, and all of a sudden he becomes superior. He's the most intelligent in there. Well, that's no good for him. No. Because now and he's, now we, he's all know, we all know we all know your you know? son. And my God, he would develop an ego. Oh yeah. If he was put into a room. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because like you said, he may he may have autism. Not he may, he does have autism. Yeah. Even though so even though we got out he is an intelligent boy. The boy is doing computer systems, inventing yeah. he gets off from me. Yeah. <laughs> he gets off from me. I'll stop rubbing yeah. it. You and your technology abilities. I is his mother's son. <laughs> yes. Because of that, do you know what I mean? All these bit and everything is just but they're all lumped into one classroom. My and that, now that is not inclusion then, that's exclusion. Yeah. Because you know that there's these needs in these children and you just group them together. So let's group the children together and <laughs> let's apply that to RSE. Mm. What's going to happen? Yeah. They're pulling out the dildos, they're pulling out the condoms, they see in the bits, then they get in their erections. Then the universal masturbation, that's good, that's good. Tell me how you were going to explain it to this boy I'm with who doesn't understand English or sign language. Mm. So once you've you shown him the pictures, the pictures that he can see, how do you then explain to him he can't go doing that to other people? Exactly. He's only seen the pictures. And he's seen oh, well, pictures of people happy doing it. Adele, we're... I mean, we haven't seen a curriculum for any of this, have we? No. We've set not um, lesson plans. No. No. I, I just find it, I just find it unbelievable that they're doing everything on the hoof and in a book like this, which Kath will tell you about, 
which is all to do with lesson plans. Is it the right way around? Yeah. Oh, great relationships and sex education. See who's, whose name is there? Esther McGeeny. Ring any bells, Esther McGeeny. Yeah, exactly. Esther McGeeny. Can I, just, can I just interrupt a minute? Let me just interrupt a minute to answer the question there, because I'll be said on YouTube. Well, um, that's the same with anyone's disability. Adele mentioned the deaf children not being very academic. That's because they can't do their intelligence is different than disability. No, no. what Adele meant was no. they, they are seen as not very academic. Yes. So we know yes. people like the, the woman who's just got a first class honours in law because her mother had to read every text of the book to her. Now, she would have been automatically excluded from, from most lessons because she can't see. So we, mm. what Adele's... Uh, 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 I, I know I'm speaking for granted, but I know what you meant. What she means is that's how the school system sees them. They yeah. have these additional needs, so they just go into that room. You know, I'm not like that. It's very it's because their grades end up lower than the other children's because they're still expected to learn at the same pace. Now, yeah. so for yeah. example, I might have three deaf children who all understand sign a little different. Um and all, all most children now are not prof are, are completely deaf because of cochlears. Cochlear is a great invention, and most children now, if they've had a cochlear fitted, have some hearing, some sound. So it's not that they are not academic, but they're expected to be as academic as the others in their class. They can't because they they're waiting for their teacher, their signing teacher, to then. I was sat in a class the other day and the teacher's going on for so long. I've had to start. I've had to start explaining it to the deaf children. Yeah. And then the teacher tells me to be quiet. Well, well like, in, in that case, how am I the adult is only ever going to be as good as the adult. But not just that, by the time she's finished, I can't remember everything she said because she's talked for yeah. half an hour. Now I've got to sign it for half an hour. To, you know, to be, so it's not that they're not as academic, but they haven't got the attention that, but they're learning slower because they need more time to process that information to understand it because they're being explained it in a different yeah. way. Yeah, and, and that's nothing at all is, intelligence. It, it, no. it is a failure on our part for not it's, um providing those children with the right tools. And the yes. right support and academic resources that they need. And this is what I'm saying. And all those children, so you've got the low academic class of set, whatever, set six, whatever set they're in. This is, this is the lowest of the sets. The problem is in that class then is all children of various different things. That are, it's not that they're not academic. They all are learning different, but they've still yeah. got one teacher all teaching them at the same pace. The same yeah, speed, yeah. and they've all got to keep up. Yeah, and that right. is the problem. It's not adapted. Right, wait a minute, guys. Uh, so Lisa's in the chat, dear ladies. What do you want me to tell the gang about how you are seeing things now, Lisa? It is simple for us. Um, we're not the only thing that we are disappointed about is that the judge has obviously um, sided with the government's opinion that parental rights do not exist. So that's a message you need to get across the whole of England uh, because we have the same judicial system as you. But the fight continues. We just, like we keep saying, the higher the court, the louder the message. Still in good spirits, Lisa. Um, so, yeah, the fight just continues. Or we just crank it up a level, that's all. But all this really means is that in law, now we... Um, have been told that parental rights are just lip service, really. So that's something you all need to be concerned about um, in the whole of England and Wales, especially. <laughs> but apart from all these other great concerns, and we'll see you all in the next year. What are you going to do next? You think, appeal? We've got another court date, Lisa. We're starting a movement here. The whole and it of has Wales to is be. Like, you need to come over and feel, Lisa. It, it really is. The energy is great. Um, and I'm looking forward to your your events next year. Uh, absolutely. I, I just want to say something on now, which I commented on earlier. For me, I, I, I don't get it anyway. None of us were really 
ever happy just fighting parental opt-out. We don't want comprehensive sex education. So for me, this was just a stepping stone to get us to, another little stepping stone to get us to where we want. Yeah. Really, I know my heart, Kim, your heart, and your heart, Lou, we want to fight CSE. We want to fight comprehensive sex education coming into our country, not opt-out. Because well, yeah. you and I know that there are children out there then who's got no one to opt them out of it. Yeah. So exactly. it doesn't respect. And, that, yeah. and that's that's why we can't, and that's why the court is never going to, the outcome of the court was never going to stop our workload. It was never going to change our workload. All it was going to do was make it manageable. Mm. You know, for other people, we always, you know yourself, I came into this fighting for the children who don't have parents, the kids from the street. You know, so that's um so our fight was always going to continue anyway, because yeah. we know the origins of this. We were limited to what we could fight. What we could fight was what they published after two years of being under pressure. They published the legislation a whole year before the court, still no less than content. They knew exactly what they were doing. And we we we've got ten years experience at CSA. We knew where they were going, so for us, it was always about getting it manageable and in the public eye. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it just it just baffles me that um that we are now in a in a year in a stage where this, it's not a secret anymore, child abuse. It's not a secret anymore. It has been exposed so openly, so much over the previous decade, whether it be through the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. whether it goes through grooming gangs, whether it has come through these big high profile people who have been abused, Rolf Harris, Jimmy Savile, all these people. People are not dumb now to child abuse. So no. why are we acting like Estelle? Why is it still like, why, like, I, I, I just don't I don't understand the, the 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 people thinking why would people be implementing this? Have you not realized now the people who want to work children are gonna get into the positions of authority where they can do that, whether that's low level and it's being a teacher, being a coach, involving yourself in with your neighbor's family so you can access their children. Or it's putting yourself up even higher so that you are making policies that affect these decisions, involving yourself on research that can affect these decisions, you know, becoming... Po Come on. Yeah. Are we going to still keep pretending that people of authority only want the best? Yeah. Like, you know, it just it, it just blows my mind. It does. It does. It certainly does. Sorry, Adele. I'm going to have to stop this segment now because I've got calf waiting in the background to sort of yeah. move on to the next thing. Thank you so much for um, coming on. Like as always, you've you know you're a you're an encyclopedia encyclopedia of knowledge. And obviously, I'm an ADHD. Don't shut up. Her. What's that? I'm an ADHD. Don't shut up. Her. <laughs> No, but it's great to it's, it's it's great to see you, and obviously, thank you so much for everything you do. You know, without 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 people like you, Adele, you know, we wouldn't be here. It's about sort of fighting this together, isn't it? And I know how mm -hmm. passionate you are um, about this. And I know, especially when I see it. Even now, I've got still twenty more questions I want to ask him that I haven't asked. <laughs> I guess I can see, I can see her now. She's put, she's wrote in the on our comments on you. Oh look, Adele, no chance of her running out of things to say. No, absolutely not. Perhaps you can leave that for another interview, um, Adele. Have yes. like an actual one uh, just for those questions for Kim. Um, yeah, so I would. I'm gonna jump. Yeah, I'm just gonna jump off. Let Calf come on now. I'm gonna pop back on later. Give you guys some company because um, I'm just loving all your guests anyway. And um, but yeah, I'm gonna go and quickly nip in with the family as well. I'm gonna leave this on. Um, thank you for letting me come and speak, ask questions, and thank talk you. and spew my guts, nearly. 
Do what you um, do while talking. <laughs> well, you've got a lot to say. You've got a lot. You all know what I'm like. You all know what I'm like. I know, Joan. I just keep looking. She knows what I'm like too. Um, yeah, so I'm going to get Kath on. I come back on as well a little bit later. And again, everybody donate, donate, donate. I'm going to get sharing this now. I'm going to pop it into some groups. And um, oh, can I just say, Dennis May has just said we have been on the BBC News. Oh, wow. Okay. So we've just been on the BBC. Now I'm guess, going to guess that's about the review. I'm going to have a little look to see what I can find online of anything that's been published of that as well. Oh, so Brilliant. I'm going to have to check that out myself. Well, Ooh. obviously not right now at some point. <laughs> I'm well, sure you carry cool. on then, Lou. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye now. Okay. So, um, Please do donate to the, the our sponsored podcastathon. We are on £875. We do want to make lots more though, because as you know, we have got a big fight on our hands. We do need more money to make sure that we can continue this fight. So any spare cash you have, I know it's Christmas. I know a lot of people are feeling um the pinch as well because of you know like what's going on in in society in general but if you can spare any spare change any money at all please do so or if you can't and you just share this video or share out the the fundraiser link we'd really appreciate that as well so yeah please do keep sharing everyone thank you so much and i am going to have now two very very special guests on kath and lou uh hey Kath, how are you doing? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Oh, unfortunately, oh, Lou is not her camera's not working, so I don't know if she can she come in on an audio. Oh, will it let... I can. Oh, I can ah, there we in. go. Hey Lou, how are you doing? Oh, oh, she's gone again. She's gone again. She's gone. Let's let me try her again. I don't know. She look. might be having. Hi, Lou. Lou. Are you there? No. Hang on. Lou, are you there? Hello. No. Well, shall we? Shall we just make a start and hopefully she will come on at some point? Yeah, she just thingied in the chat that she's here but obviously we can hear you love i know you're watching but we can um you're not on mute but we can't yeah. hear anything unless she's just gone to grab a cuppa <laughs> see if she comes back in now anyway we will, we will. well it's done enough. guys you've been on over six hours now mind absolutely but you and lou are actually the well, you, you're you're the inspiration of this. Yeah. I've got to say, we were. I was. I actually got this idea to do this twelve-hour podcast on because of what you and and, uh, and Louise did through Liberty Tactics, and you actually did a podcast on not not once but twice. Yeah, <laughs> we must be mad. No, well, it's all for a good cause, and to be fair, all of this, all of it, was Lou's idea because I'm not. You know, I can show up and I can and do my thing, but I. I'm useless at things like organising anything. Do you know what I mean? Just don't leave me to do it. I'll turn up, but just don't yeah. depend on me to do it. So in all fairness, it was, it was Lou, you know, 99% of the guests were Lou's guests. Obviously, because she was already established with Liberty Tactics be way before I came along anyway. Um, so it was her idea. She sorted the venue, you know, for the first, well, first and second one, actually, because the second one was just in her house in Devon. But the first one was in a studio in London. And that was the day, right, where it was absolutely, when I say boiling hot, it was, I swear it was, it was the hottest day on like record or whatever. It was maybe not record, but it was, it was a bloody hot day. And we were in that studio and honest to God, I just, for all of that, the first podcast, the was, I was going to say worse. I don't mean worse. What I mean is we didn't have any sleep. Like on the second one, we did have a couple of hours. But this one, we went past, honestly, through the night. I was really concerned, actually. I remember saying to you, Kim, I thought, I don't know what I said. Because I was so, did, I was so, I'd been on for, wake for such a long time by that point. 
I just don't even know what I was on about. And I know I was talking about the more serious things then, like Kinsey and, and do you know what I mean? I was, I watched it back. It wasn't too bad, actually. I mean, you could tell I was knackered and I was just like, you know, on autopilot a little bit, but it was, you know, it was certainly the guests we had on there were outstanding. And um, even though we did sort of, you know, we were, we were, we want, I wanted it all. I did. I was, I'd convinced myself, right, that that podcast, I thought it was, everyone was going to share it and it was going to go everywhere and we were going to get the hundred grand. And we were only, we were on 23,000 then when me and Lou did the first podcast, I thought in, on the 13th and 14th of August, it was on about 23,000. So I think we got it up. I don't know exactly. Lou, you probably know. I think it was probably about 6,000 each one. So about yeah. 12. Something like that, wasn't that. it? And you were really yeah. just, you were like, oh, this is all we did. But in all fairness, that was actually a massive amount of money. I know yeah, it was. It was. You know? It was only because I was like, <laughs> look, you know, we all know that things like, say, a Cancer Research UK campaign will go round in three days, you got 100 grand. It's not yeah. an issue. So from that point of view, we should have had that money, you know, yeah. and, and that's what it was, I think. It wasn't that, you know, we weren't grateful for what we had. It was just like, well, we should have it all. We should have yeah. it all by now. We should have had it all ages ago. I know it comes with awareness, and I, I totally understand that. And we've had a lot of issues, and we had issues, particularly on the first podcast a thon, with censorship, but not just the censorship. They were messing about with the actual fundraiser because mm -hmm. people were trying to put donations in, and it was like, usually, because I've donated a few times, it's really easy, isn't it? You just opt out of the bit that tries to charge you extra, and I go through and I use my PayPal and it's done. But what I was doing, it was making them put in details like name, address, all that sort of thing. And then when they were getting to the end where you donate, it was kicking them out. Yeah. So, like, they were having to go back in. So it was doing really dodgy things, you know. So I think maybe that has been a big issue for us, especially Liberty Tactics have been massive. And, you know, Liberty Tactics has been going since... Oh, Lou would be able to tell you this better than I can. Obviously, going for a while. Yeah. Um, and they used to get thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of hits on some of their stuff. Do you know what I mean? They were well established. But um, since they've been talking about this, it's just the censorship is off. The, just, even with me. And I know they've always kicked me off social media and I'm not allowed on Twitter and I'm not allowed on YouTube and all the rest of it. Like, But when I started speaking about this, this was when they really, really started to pull pull me right down. Because I've been talking about vaccines for years. And I've been saying exactly what I want. Not just about that, but saying exactly what I wanted to. There she is. Hey, she's here. I've had to put my phone on. How are you doing? Oh, there we go. There she is. I love. I was just explaining about how long Liberty Tactics had been going for. But you could probably say, obviously, say more than, more than me on that. Can I then, can I just interject just slightly before um, Lou speaks? Uh, a late, I think it was Lisa just asked how to give her. She wants to give a donation. Very kindly, thank you, Lisa. Really appreciate that. The link is in the description, and I have also just put it in the comments again. So if you're watching from YouTube or Facebook, you should see it in the comments. If you can't see it, let me know, and I'll I'll, I'll redo it. I'll re-put it in. So. Thank you so much for that, Lisa. And hey, Lou, how are you doing? Fine. I hope you can hear me. Okay. I've had to get my phone and do it on my phone because it wasn't connected to the laptop. So yeah, you were having a I bit of an issue. It's been brilliant. It's been. I've only missed about probably about an hour and a half of it, and it's been so good. So. Oh, so we completely well off track. We completely off track with everything, but we've had the judgment <laughs> today. We didn't plan on that, did we? Mm. We did no. And we were sitting there like lemons as well, waiting for the email to come to at two o'clock. Well, actually, that was just the time to release the news. Yeah. So <laughs> literally, we were like, we just sat there, sat there, sat there. And it was a good mm. job that we had a message from the barrister. And he was like, what's going on with that press release? He was like, we waited in for the court. Is the judge going into court to read it out? No, he said it was two o'clock. Share away. <laughs> so um, we we held ourselves up as well. Um, it's all a new process, you know. It's a new process for us. And um, so yeah, we way off time and literally blagging it as we go along. So, yeah, well, this is what well, I, 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 I said to Lou. I said to Lou, if you couldn't fit a song, I know Cass coming on again later with George, so she could always talk about it then if you haven't got time. I don't. We you know we don't want to keep you, but it's been today has been brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I say oh, only for about an hour and a half, probably. I agree, Lou. It's been absolutely fantastic, Lever, hasn't so it? Really informative, like so informative. 
Yeah. And this is why you wanted, guys, at the end of the day, this is about raising awareness as well as raising the funds. And you're telling yeah. it, you know, going into, I'd like to go back. I, the only bit I missed was Nigel's part. So I do want to go back and have a look. Obviously, I can't because you're live at the moment. When it finishes, I go back and find that bit with Nigel because that was that was on the queer theory, wasn't it? Was it the queer yes. theory? But yeah, I wanted to watch that one. And it has. It's been absolutely jam-packed full of information that every parent and every grandparent needs to see. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what we're going to do on the website, What's that? As soon as, as soon as the conversation gets juicy... It just kicks me out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It does. As soon as the conversation gets juicy, it kicks me straight out. Yeah. I've had to restart do. my life. How are you getting I've got on? two handsets. Yeah. Do you think it's going to come through my handset? <laughs> no way. That's Look, so I'm <laughs> so You pause again then, uh, Kim. It keeps happening, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine has been yeah. doing it as well. How is it going on? Um, I haven't had a look for a little while, but I know earlier on you were on like two hundred and something shares from the because you. How many platforms are you streaming on, guys? It's obviously Facebook, the YouTube. website. Yeah. What YouTube. else are you on? And YouTube. YouTube. And YouTube. YouTube. Well, right, actually, okay. the Facebook is just the YouTube embedded. Oh, right. Okay. So I only worked out how to do that the other day. And I was really proud of myself. Whether it's still playing on there or not, I don't know. But um, oh, I'm sure was, somebody uh... would say if it wasn't. Yeah, no, it I think is. Because is... when Lou put on the. Um... Yeah, because when she sent the press release, it, the live stream had like jumbled up all the pages. Um, oh, already. When I looked, I was like, whoa. <laughs> so, yeah, we are streaming. It is working. Lou, it is working. Okay, cool, cool. See, we're learning things all the time, aren't we? <laughs> we are. That's what it is about a grassroots thing, and none of us are pros at any of this. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? We're just learning as we go. Except maybe Lou at radio because she's been doing it. Oh well, no, like... I'm no pro. No, oh no, no you are. I absolutely, no. you know, and I have got to give credit. Oh, your phone's gone. <laughs> I have got to give credit. Oh, for it, this is how pro I. This is how pro I am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm bigging God. you up. You're how pro she is, and we can't even see her. There yeah. you are. There we go. No, but you are. You know, you got all those. And Rick, I got to say as well, right? Because obviously wow. you don't see Rick. You didn't see Rick on the back of those 36 hour podcastathons, but he was. Not? Absolute superstar out of everything. Because Lou, I didn't know Actually, until guys, later. Lou had just you. decided. Lou had just decided to to do the podcastathon, and then sort of just told Rick about it one day, and he was like, "All oh, right, okay, I'm doing that." And all the techie bits are the bits that I don't know. People probably I didn't really think about it before until I did that podcastathon and saw and saw how much work was actually so needed to make it run properly. I was like, "Wow!" You know, with the adverts and the little um. You know, we did the little the videos, um, the one that was played sort of intermittently after stuff. I thought it was fab. It was you, Kim. Um, it was you mostly on it. Was the promo it. video, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the, the promo, promo video. video. The promo videos he does are absolutely superb. So I just want to give a big shout out to him as well because obviously. Well, I'm actually going to video, video you guys. That's I have got a video say. here of your work, so I'm going to see if this actually works. Right, it might not work, but let's see if this we'll works. We'll have a go. I'm this. I've just downloaded it. I don't know if it's going to work or if I have to share a screen, we'll see you now. It's doing a funny circle. I it's hope funny. it's his review one and not our, um, our, not our message one. Oh, that's funny, though. It is or funny. Else. It yeah. is hilarious. Is it working? Um, no. no. Yeah. What have you done it on? Have you, put, have you done the share oh, screen? You're freezing a bit on yours, Kim, as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're all right. You're all right now. Well, I'm gonna. Do... A bit on yours, Kim, as well. I think I'm just gonna. Um... Oh, you're all right. You're all right now. And what I'm gonna yeah. have to do is just share the screen. Oh, I'm not gonna add it to stream. Yeah, I do it. I can do it. It's oh. just I added two perfect guys. <laughs> Well done. This should work now. Oh. Oh, we're back. <laughs> Just we all disappeared off the screen then. 
<laughs> it was looking promising. Oh, here we go. I'll try it one more time. Okay. With the campaign, oh. public allows people's legal quarters to sexualize Asia, sexualization of, of children in British schools. This is a very important campaign, has my support and all the very best. Please uh, check in on the podcast over the weekend and the 15th to 16th of November, the High Court in Cardiff needs our support outside. Public Child Protection, Wales.org. I'm going who are using taxpayers' money yeah. To parents who want to say in their education, yeah. you know they, you know they want to have the right to remove their children from this education. Yeah. And so you're not even allowed to do that. No, no, no. If you don't want this happening to your children, the only way that the government is going to stop is if it cost, right? it's going to cost them only if there's an, a court finding in place that they've crossed the line. You've seen enough ample evidence that they don't care about morality. There's no churches telling them to stop. Uh, they're not going to sway to social pressure. You know how our parties are set up. A few mega rich donors tell the political party to put the leaders in place. The only thing that governments are ever going to stop for now is not common decency in any court order and a court finding. It needs a judicial review in order to find that the filth that's being taught to three-year-olds all the way through school is unlawful and immoral. There's no other way about it than to get a court finding. This requires money for the right lawyers. You know how tricky the courts are. You, you know all this in your rational brain. So if you care about it, you're going to have to do whether the judge Either way, it's going to force the issue. Either the mothers have a victory and in future their case can be waived right in front of the government in Wales and anywhere else, or it has to go to appeal and people become so shocked that they realise that something that's obviously wrong has been rubber stamped by a court. Either way, it's going to need resources to go through judicial review, so you have to donate. So I went to both my kids' schools and I said, can I have your PHSE and PSAP and RSC lesson plan, please, and see what you're teaching them. And I was just blown away by what they were teaching them. Teaching them biology, teaching them um, white privilege, teaching them diversity, inclusion, you know, all, all of the things for, and not things that are appropriate at all for ch children. So you've got to stop taking meters out of people, and not, I'm not particularly referring to George Floyd, but people with severe body dysmorphia and mental illness and a desire to to mess with a child's sexuality. We've got to ban people who are, which is pervert, which is perhaps, isn't it? it it's to be absolutely fine to be sexually attracted to kids. And it's like, no, it's not. We re it really isn't fine, and as a society, I think we should try and extend charity to everyone out there, and you know, keep up the the good work that you guys, which is just amazing. And that message seeps through the cultural consciousness of, of society, school system. It's yeah, I, and, and that um, it's not designed. It's designed for all. It's exactly that's yeah. it exactly. How, how do you make a dog obedient how do you make a wild obedient? you beat it or you traumatize it or you yes. do whatever it is to break it break you its spirit break its soul right yeah. and that's what's what that's the spirits of the all of the ladies in wales have been doing a really great job you've been doing a good job supporting them uh, Lou but at the end of the day it's all to get the message to spread particularly when we can see very clearly now that any changing the government sorry anybody who is challenging the government gender on any subject is not just it's not just these sex 
education of government, you are being censored. Where does all this come from? And I think this is a very important question because in the first instance, who do you have to fight to deal with it? Well, you have to fight local authorities in Wales or England or Scotland who are implementing uh, this agenda in schools. But it doesn't take much digging to understand that actually the agenda is not formed in the low thirties themselves. The agenda is coming in from other places. Yeah. And so there's there's sort of two things that need to be done. One is to challenge the people implementing the policy, and that is your local authority, your local council, your local education authority. And the other one is to be uh, starting to take the lid off where these policies come from. And and last time I joined you, I think we did talk about this a bit because we talked about the United Nations, UNESCO. Why do you want this? Why do you want to let three-year-olds see this stuff and be taught this stuff for free to, you know, and onwards? Just just, just, just why that is the question. So they want to break out. They want, they want to break the family unit, as they say. You want, they want to break the brain. They want to break our spirit, and they want to divide that family as much as possible. These kids are extremely confused. If children are taught this yet, there's only one role, and that's degeneracy. That's yeah. crime. That's yeah. rape. That's murder. Like you're talking the whole of society. Now, one day we're going to get old and we need kids to learn when we're old. Exactly. And guess what? You're going to have a generation of degenerates. Yeah. Kat and I are really going to delve in because it all started in Scotland. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. It's good to be here. Looking forward to a chat. So, this education, we've been dealing with it for how long now? Uh, as the Scottish Family Party, we've been on uh, going on five years. Because the, this is one of the great things, isn't it, about the um, the Great Awakening that's happened in the last, particularly in the last two years, yeah. I'd say, is that people of all different classes and all different backgrounds, people I never thought that I'd be hanging out with at all, and people who never thought they'd be hanging out with the likes of me, Mm. Um, we've all we've all come together because we're united by our awareness that there is this horrible world which has been arranged against us, and which this space. Is, what, I mean, look, the three-year-old children um, about masturbation is of a piece with giving people to well, not encouraging and bullying and, and, and blackmailing them into getting uh, a deadly mRNA shot, which is uh, equivalent to farmers being closed down their farms with bribes or, or, or with with egg chicken farmers being, yeah. being forced to kill their flocks because of an imaginary virus, which is probably the result of the, the shit they pour down from the skies. Etc. Everything connects. So what you're doing, what what public child protection Wales are doing in in this case, relates to everything else. Ukraine, everything else that's going on in the world relates. Yeah. And people who don't get this are are missing. I'm not to be humble and realize that 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 they believe about the world, what their what their teachers taught them to believe about the world, and what their parents taught them to believe about the world was one massive lie. Yeah, yeah. that's we, the we, hardest we, thing for people to accept. It isn't is, it? yeah.
Oh, that was brilliant. That was really good. I don't know if anyone else found there was a, it was a little bit intermittent at times, but I could I could still hear the gist of it. Yeah, I think it might have been. Yeah, that was yeah, my well that was my internet. Place. I don't know why that's happening. What I did was I've actually wired my laptop up today to bypass any kind of problems like that. <laughs> <laughs> You're obviously not going to be a science degree, right? You know, a piece of paper <laughs> isn't going to dictate how the internet operates, you know? In uh, case anyone's wondering yeah. why we keep coming out with Kim being a computer scientist. Oh, are you frozen now? No. Oh, no. oh, have I? No, you're all right now. You're all right. Only oh, yes. a second. In case are. anyone doesn't realise what we're talking about, there has been a troll who has claimed that Kim has not got a degree in criminology. She has got a degree in computer science and engineering. We don't know where she's got this information <laughs> from, but we're just going to keep this joke going because Kim is, um, she's not very, you're, you're not the best on the computer and you're, you, you actually admit that yourself, don't you? <laughs> I'm probably the worst. <laughs> that's well, not so funny. That's not so funny. You Next thing we say, they invented the sat nav. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's some really high profile guests on there, and it was a jam packed. The both occasions were jam packed. You know, 36 hours, guys. That's incredible. £12,000. That's twelve percent of the overall target, you know. And like I know, Kath was Kath was disappointed. She wanted to clean out. She wanted to pay for the court case three times over. And yeah, uh, reach for the stars, girl. That's you know. And uh, but yeah, they did amazing. Let's be honest, it's amazing. And they had us over that halfway, that quarterway mark. And it was as soon as we reached that quarterway mark, everything changed. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. it was on. It had already been running a year, hadn't it? Well, Darren done his walk last year, beginning of September. So you started it then. So from September to August, when me and Lou did the first when it was 23, 23 grand. So it take, took like, well, that's eleven months, didn't it, to get yeah, to that twenty three? Well, as soon as we hit that twenty five grand mark, that was yeah. Everything kind of changed then, didn't they? You know. Okay. Yeah, and it's, it's going up quite well at the moment. I'm, I'm just going to have a quick look to see where you're on at the minute. I keep um, freezing. See what, what, we the got fi out? what the figure is. Well, I, I keep freezing. Let's have a look. Am I freezing, Lou? I think there's been a big donation, actually. We have had 64,728. How much? 64,728. And what did we start So you had a big £500 one as well. Yeah. Well, well for, this, done. For, this, for this sponsored event so far is 875. We've had a couple of big um, donations. We've had Susan Williams has been very generous and she has donated £500. So thank you so, so much to Susan. And there was another lady who has donated a hundred and I am just gonna look at her name because I think I think it's Louise out. someone called Louise I think I saw thank it you is. all so much for this guys because the truth is this the the bills land on the heads of the claimants so um yeah and we can let that happen and we donations that's why I keep my car Okay, is there a Renault deal? Please let me keep my car. Yeah, come on, guys. And the thing is, we've got to keep this going as well. We are going to have a big um, bill now, aren't we? The claim is going to have a big bill from, from me. Yeah. From the, we know that. And plus, we, are, we need to appeal it. We need to yeah. have the money to appeal it because we're not going to stop fighting now. No, absolutely. Going. We just keep going. We knew this was going to, you know, we know how, how they work. Do you know what I mean? We always said it was a small, tiny chance that we would break through at this level. But we knew what to expect. We know it's got to go to the, it's got to go to the top. We What's didn't that, expect Lev? to be granted a judicial review. We were all ready for the oral um, hearing. When we were all getting prepared yeah. for the oral hearing. So to have it actually granted to, to begin with, that was um Well, it was a shock, wasn't it? it was, yeah, it was like a, whoa. Well, the injunction, let's look, look what happened to the injunction. Everybody was devastated. Well, actually, that did prevent the education coming in. That did wake a lot of people up to what was going on. 
And it's the same with this now, you know. Yeah. We know in the court of public opinion, we've won. 100%. Oh, million, oh 100%. 100%. So our court of public opinion is every step that, that we are getting trampled on here is being felt by the whole of the country. And there's only so many times you can stamp on someone, you back them in a corner before they come out fighting, you know? So if yeah. they think they have problems with us, we are not the people that they should be scared of. It's the guys carrying on, minding their own business. When you actually get on their nerves and they stand up, those are the ones you want to be scared of. And that's where we go in now, you know. It's, this is infringing on everybody's rights. And the fact that the court has sided with the government with regards to us not having any rights, I think there's going to be a bit of backlash on that. Every oh, I think there's going to be it. huge backlash because just for that alone, you don't even have to worry about... Well, you know, we'll just take the, the whole context out of that for a minute, that this is about education or it could be medical or anything else. The very fact that they're saying you didn't really have those rights in the first place, regardless of what it's about, is going to make people go, hang on. What do you so mean? So they can do absolutely anything without exactly. children. That's what exactly. Says. This is what people will stand up and take note of now because it's going to affect them. And I did hear earlier on, Dennis had written and said that, the, um, what did he say? He was on the BBC or something. So I, when I come off here, I'm going to have a quick look and see what's going on because I just think, right, and I said this earlier, I did. I when I found out what the judgment was, I was like, oh, you, you know what's coming, right, is a couple of days of, just media splashes everywhere that the government was right and we were wrong and whatever and then I sat back and thought about it and I thought well even if they do decide to plaster it everywhere public any publicity is good publicity at this point right there's going to be people sat out there who knew absolutely nothing at all about any of it and now all of a sudden they're going to have their face with well what do you mean what judicial review what was this about so you're going to have a load more people coming over just from seeing that do you know what i mean so yeah. i don't know whether they might play it a bit safe because they might be aware that it will bring attention i don't know i'll have to see i've not seen anything and, yet but if go yeah. on lou and, and also like people will have all they may have sort of like had a little bit of this education going on in the school or received a letter and sort of like thought mm, hang on this looks a bit strange mm. age three but then just you know, are being told it's age appropriate, and then and then suddenly they're seeing it on the news. Like, oh, there's been a court case about it. Hang on, now that's going to make any reasonable exactly. parents exactly. Think, oh gosh, yeah, I will. Because your gut feeling, as soon as you hear that there's sex education from age three, your gut feeling must be like, Ooh, what the hell is that all about? That's going to be. If it's not, reason. then there's something wrong, isn't there? If that's not your gut feeling, when you you know, absolutely. Yeah, so you know, just... even if they've been, you know, uh, what's the word? Like, um, you know, the, the the teachers have told them, no, 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 it's just about empathy and empathy and kindness. They they're still there's still going to be an element of doubt there in every parent. Oh, and mind. don't forget as well, mind there were still some teachers out there saying they weren't even a bloody court case. Yeah, absolutely. So from that yeah. point of view, the people who were told there wasn't a court case are now going to see, well, there was a court case, whether we were yeah. not. So do you know what I mean? This is going to, it is, it's going to bring a lot of people around, I'm sure of it. And that, and obviously we're going to go to appeal. So then that's the next stage up. Do you know, we're going to have to go all the way with this. This is not, you know, this is like, it's not, we know it's not just that one little thing. We know how many tentacles there are to this and we're fully aware of it. It's an agenda. It's not something that's just come in the last couple of years. This is something they've planned for, you know, there's a long time. You've got to change societal attitudes first. Do you know what I mean? to um yeah yeah are we still there guys i can see hello everyone um oh there we are <laughs> that's all right i didn't know if i had cut off or you would cut off or whatever um i forgot I what say was i saying <laughs> yeah you're really flexing and showing us how well that degree's serving you there yeah you are <laughs> no listen i know that um somebody i know that because you've, you know, your time, I know from doing the other one, you think it's all going to go like this and it's not. But I know that somebody's waiting to come on, right? So I'm going to be back on with you later. Obviously, Lou must have lost her connection. So a massive shout out to Lou. Like I say, it, it, it's all her idea, to be honest, these podcast-a-thons. You know, the two, she's amazing. So, you know, follow us as well on libertytactics.co.uk. And also Obviously. look at Kat's website as well, guys, exposingthelight.com. Oh, yeah. Because the no, information, info. there's, there's, so there's been, um, somebody did phone me up actually and they asked why we weren't talking about certain things regarding this curriculum. 
and I had to explain to them. Go on yeah. Kath's website. Yeah, um, I keep forgetting I got one. Feed, we have to spoon feed people, okay? So Kath, um, this is why Kath's not on the website with us. Because Kath is the person who can say and do what she wants. So look at her website, exposingthelight.com. Lots of information on there. Exposingthelight.info it is, love. Exposingthelight.info. Oh, exposingthelight.info. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I probably is more like a spoon rammed down the throat than spoon fed with me, I think, in it. But, you know, there's there's yeah. lots of content there and whatever, you know, just go and have a look. It saves a lot of time, I suppose, doesn't it? And a quick, sharp shock type of thing. If you're yeah. able to take that, because I know it, you know, I got half the people who absolutely love that approach and the other half who like, no, I can't stand it. Yeah. So do you know what I mean? I'm I'm like that, a bit like Marmite. <laughs> so you're right, <laughs> just either or. But the message is there anyway, guys. So you've done absolutely fantastic today. What are you on? Set six hours, 52 minutes you've been going, yeah. guys. Yeah. You're, the, you're oh, over really? halfway, over halfway. How are you feeling? You feeling all right? Yeah, you really good. Yeah, yeah it's been a weird day because we've been because obviously we had the judgment. So yeah, that's yeah, that threw us kind in a bit, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. But um, I think I think we're managing to wing it a bit, aren't we, Lo? Yeah, yeah, we you're you doing fantastic, we honestly, guys. A bit, but we were expecting that anyway. It doesn't we? matter. It doesn't <laughs> matter. It's been packed full of really good information, and you know, well done to to all of you. Been amazing. Don't forget, guys, who's watching. It is a sponsored event, so. Yeah, donate in public child protection wells.org fundraisers are all over the place now anyway so but you know yeah. and jones there look yeah get a couple of quid out for a pint or whatever share 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 this evening now things will start to get a bit darker we'll be discussing the pawn matt from trans against groomers he can't make it because he's lost his yeah. voice but um, we do have a video interview with back angel anyway as you've just seen pop up in like about the yeah. science degree um yeah so we got loads of stuff going on guys we got uh richard lucas is on then to help us finish the show i haven't got the, the itinerary in front of me but it's gonna start start to get a bit darker guys as we get on now as time goes on right so share 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 away let's get the evening viewers on let's get these donations up let's try and get um let's try and get a nice nice bit of money guys let's go for a grand and a half so it was on putting the fight man red so let's try and clear a grand and a half yeah yeah Maybe that's easily done me. that's easy keep sharing guys i'm gonna let you go and i will see you with george at nine o'clock ish okay well done yeah, guys yeah, lots, lots of love to you take Thank care you. bye bye ah uh, that's brilliant so we've got we've got kirk coming straight on so kirk is a a parent who has also helped with uh, has done his own fundraiser. Hey, Kirk, how are you oh, doing? Oh, I'm not. Oh, I'm not actually a parent though. Oh, so oh, you're I'm not, not a parent. parent. No, I'm not a parent. Wow, oh, no, you're even I'm better. Even better. That no. is, that is when I no. see you at the presentations, is it your brother that's got? Ah, uh, Neil. Neil, my sister got three kids. My nephews, and I, I bring them. I bring them with me now and again. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Well, that's why I got confused. I just assumed that they were your children. And oh, I assumed you were a parent because you obviously, you care so much about this. So when yeah, did you, yeah. when did you first hear about this RSE? Well, I, I, at the COVID protest two years ago, that was the first time I've seen you in Dan Cardiff B. And right. um, I got to be fair, the awareness you've raised since is amazing. But um, yeah, that was the first time I've seen you down by there. Okay, okay, so I suppose you're concerned you've got nieces and nephews and perhaps one day in the future you may have, you know, children as well, so. Yeah, <laughs> it's just to add, I meet someone now with the views I got, so I don't know, I don't know what to do, you know what I mean? Um, it gets harder, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, it does, yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah. I'm sure there's, I'm sure you will find someone very soon, Kirk, um, oh, you know, okay. like, Kirk, we appreciate you fighting for our children. Anyway. We absolutely um, do. we got quite a few fighting that haven't got children of their own. No? And mm. do you know what I find? Oh, they are the ones that you cannot shake. Yeah. They are the ones that's just stuck to this. But I, I think that's that's just um, a demonstration of who they are as a person. Do you absolutely. know what I mean? That's that's just that's just their character. And um they, they are gonna be there whether they have kids or not, you know. And you yeah. gotta have such real respect and admiration for people like that. Because we are here shouting at the parents, mm. and we seem to forget that we've got like Lisa, Leanne, K, 
Luke, you know, we, we seem to forget that we've got all these people as Gary as well, you know, yeah. and, and they're there religiously. So we've got to give a big, massive shout out for that, like, you know. Well, you just... I think, um, as well, kids, if you're not a voice, who are a voice? Every, like every generation is the last generation. If you're not going to stand up for the kids, who, who's going to stand up for them? It's like it's a it's a backlog of everything. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. hard. It's hard not to not to be able to stand up. I think sometimes it comes down to a lack of responsibility with things as well. Like in general, like people don't want to take responsibility, whether it's for, but well, parents maybe sometimes not intentionally. But obviously, where they're working and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, well, it's like one parent goes to work, the other one comes home. So the responsibility of waiting in school, the kids are in school, and they're, they're learning stuff that they're not sure about. It's like there's a lack of responsibility with things then. Do you, do you, do you know what I mean, sort of thing? Yeah. They, everybody's kept too busy, and this is what yeah, we're exactly. finding. So the, yeah. the ones with parents actively in school now, you're correct. Mm. Uh, we seem to be missing our generation because they are kept so busy. And another thing is, like, when they have letters on from schools and stuff like that, a lot of people don't even look at them. They don't even see them. Yeah. I can tell you, my own son, even though, you know, they had my full attention, there would just be letters at the bottom of his bag, you know, and yeah. nobody knew where they were for and the dates mm. were for weeks ago. And <coughs> it's really yeah. difficult to monitor. And um, I think they've done that on purpose. Yeah, exactly. It's it's so we can't see what's going on. Yeah. And, and also our generation as well, they don't like to um they don't like the idea that this could be happening in school anyway, you know. But then who wants to believe that they send in their child to a place where this is yeah, happening? Exactly. Nobody wants to believe that today. It's a place of I, trust, isn't it? I think, yeah, trust. There is there is this pe a lot of people are just blindly trusting. Blindly and trusting, it's easier. Yeah. It's easier to blindly trust, but I do think as well that a lot of parents are fearful, especially yeah. if you're if you're looking at parents, perhaps if their if their children are already seen by social services as as, a, as an example, they're already on the register. They're very fearful because they're worried that if they did sort of sort of step out of line in the eyes of the government, then something bad could you know their kids could be taken off. And so we've got a lot of that going on as well. So. You know, it's, it's, it is, it's very, very difficult to get everybody to stand up. But I'm so grateful to you, Kurt, because, you know, at the end of the day, you could, you should just be out enjoying yourself and not worrying about things like this. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, it, it, it obviously, it obviously affects you as a person to know this is going on. Mm. Yeah, no, it, it, it makes me, I don't know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to fathom how people cannot, who know about this, cannot do something about this sort of things, I mean. Yeah, but the awareness in there, I don't think. Like I spoke to a lot of people when I was leafleting. I spoke to three teachers actually when I've been leafleting. Mm. Two of them were negative experiences, and one was positive. The one who was positive had uh, two daughters with her. One was about nine, and the other one was seven. And she said she's been speaking in a school, and teachers have said that they wouldn't teach it, whether or not that's true or not. I don't know. But the one who was negative was quite strange to be honest. A seven-year-old child. Is identifying as non-binary. Oh, for goodness' and sake! Yeah, that was in, in Newport Town Centre. She, mm. um, she, she said, um, "Well, told me all sorts of things: transphobic, homophobic." I, I said to her, "I don't, I'm, I don't care what adults identify as, but children shouldn't be taught that." And I, I asked her if she, if she teaches science, because mm. biologically you can only have two genders. And she said, "Oh, yeah, I teach science." I said, "You shouldn't be teaching that." Because children should, should be taught factual Fact. information. They shouldn't be allowed to teach something that's not true. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? And when she got a seven year old child who was non binary, I was stunned. I was like, what are you it's, saying? And then she's going in the classroom and teaching other yeah. children. She's it's, got her own agenda to teach and she's spreading her own agenda. If her seven year old child is non binary, yeah, well, obviously, a seven year old is going, if a seven year old is presented with different labels, Mm. And they have to put themselves into a box. You tell me if you felt girl or boy at the age of seven. Because I'll tell you what I felt at the mm -hmm. age of seven. I felt yeah. my older cousin's shell suit being handed down to me. Now, mm. that might have been a boy. That might have been a girl. Um, You know, there was nothing. I was out with the boys, my mm. older cousins. You know, it wasn't like, she's a girl. Watch what she's doing. It was like, chuck her over. Do you know what I mean? How... 
So if I was asked then at that age, um, how do I feel and which box do I fit into? I know exactly which box I would fit it into. And that would have been the boys box. Mm. You know, yeah, there was a lot of other kids and they would have been like, well, I don't feel anyway. You know, and the boys box probably would have been because of my older cousins. You know, mm. they were mostly boys and that's, that's all the things I did. That's all the things I was into. So how can anyone possibly go along with the thing that this child, this seven-year-old child is non-binary? Are they she's even a teacher. Scary thing. She's a teacher. That's what's scary. Exactly. About. exactly. So what we know that these children have been presented with these different options and they've been told to um, choose which one best suits how they feel at that time. Well, mm. would they have felt, would that seven-year-old have said I'm non-binary if that had never oh, been well, I, um, presented that, to them? Mm. Yeah, what's crazy. happened to unisex, Kirk? Well, unicorns, eh? I don't I know. know unisex um, unicorns now is a good one. Make believe, isn't it? It's just, just characters which are not true. <laughs> In kids, stuff, but it's not even real, and it's it's crazy. It's, well, uh, we've got um, we've got a member whose whose child suffers with body dysmorphic, and mm. they, you know, they've been suffering for seven years now, and um, she gets called transphobic. Um, for campaigning against this, even though that woman has spent seven years living in this environment. Uh, like she said, body dysmorphic isn't something you go and celebrate. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it's being presented within this platform as something you celebrate. But when you're actually suffering and you are going through these things, there isn't anything to celebrate. You don't want to show yourself. You don't want to leave your room, you know? So um, going back to something that Lawrence Fox said on our Liberty Tactics video, they are exploiting um, these illnesses in children, you know, and in many cases, they're inducing it. Yeah. yeah. You know, this is... The, the unresolved mental illnesses as well that, that aren't getting the attention that they need. And some of it might even be child abuse. Yes. And unless you explore the reasons why a child is presenting these symptoms, then you're not doing your right job, are you? You're not doing your job as a doctor or a psychiatrist or whatever. How, how can a child who's decided that they want to transition over a period of years mm -hmm. be given testosterone and never have had one single session of therapy? It's At the age of 18, they now have testosterone in their hands they're using these patches and they've never had one single hour of therapy. What does that say? No one hour. And they've been given testosterone. That's They're telling it. us that this is not going to damage children. They're telling us that this isn't an ideology. They're telling us this is support. Mm. You know, I had, a friend who, I had a friend who identified as Jesus. So we didn't get him a donkey, we didn't get him a robe, and we didn't get him a Bible. We got him a doctor. We got him the right support that he needed, you know? A friend's little boy, he identified as a horse till he was 11 years old. We called him Giddy Up Thomas. You know, it... Um, <laughs> it's a simple yeah. thing. My own son, my own son was a dog once, and he wore these little pudsy ears. And he was actually in a dog cage. I towed the line at him having his juice in the bowl. Well, the only way I could get him out of that dog cage <laughs> was to promise him a bigger one for Christmas. You know? But they didn't buy him a bigger one for Christmas. And I certainly didn't put his juice into the dog bowl, you know? No, it's, exactly. You know, they, yeah. this, and very often with a small child, it's imagination. Yeah. Exactly, what it is. It's crazy. Yeah. I've you know, seen in Scotland as well. I seen in Scotland they changed the age today from 18 to 16, haven't they? Where you can legally change your gender. And this this goes against everything, like, like you've said now. So it goes against yeah. science, like basic science anyway. Yeah. But let's look at the psychology. Yes, it's the strange. prefrontal cortex doesn't develop until you're 25. Mm. All of us here are over the age of 25, right? Now I was in a youth offenders by the time I was 18, and I thought I knew it all. But then when I'm in the hospital, almost 22, having my son, I'd never felt so young in all my life. Yeah. Now, then I had my other son at 25. And that was like, 
difficult. He was very, very ill. So it was quite a traumatic experience for me. Eh? But that was the point that I grew up. That was yeah. the point then that I realised, you know, that I wasn't an adult before then. You know, I felt an adult, but I wasn't an adult. And why wasn't I an adult? Well, my brain hadn't fully developed. Yeah. It's exactly the same reason why car insurance is cheaper at 25 than what it is at 21. Yeah. What is the reason for it? You know, it's a psychological fact. It doesn't matter what the age of consent is. It doesn't matter what age they say you're an adult. It's 18 in this country, 21 in America. They're both wrong. Yeah. They're both wrong. You haven't. Your brain has not fully developed. How can you possibly make any informed decisions at that time? You can't. Yeah. Not and, you know, we expect children to make mistakes. We all make mistakes anyway. We expect yeah. children to make mistakes. But let's not allow children to make mistakes that's going to be detrimental to them for their entire life. Well, yeah, exactly. I, I think a, a large proportion of my generation are walking around with tattoos that we that we rather we didn't have. Exactly, but at least it's just a tattoo. And we all went in for those when we were sixteen with fake ID. Right? <laughs> so, um, and every single one of us, well, they've all had theirs covered up, but I had to have the bigger one, didn't I? You know. <laughs> and, um, Mine not to be more on show. So to actually cover mine up, I'd end up with the sleeve. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, but it's just yeah. lucky for me. I've got a friend in the industry who can get rid of it with a laser, but it would cost me hundreds otherwise, you know? Yeah. These are all Absolutely. mistakes that we've made. Scars in my nose from nose piercings. Again, underage, faking a note from my parent, you know? And we will all do these things. We all do it. I had my hair fell out at eight at 15. Because I had died it so much, I had literally had a skinhead and a fringe. These yeah. are the mistakes we should be making. Yeah. Not changing these, our these are mistakes that, that will, Well, even the scars of my nose and tattoos, that's permanent. Isn't that permanent enough? Yeah. I think, I think the problem is as well, they're encouraging you to make these. It's not mistakes. They're encouraging you and they're trying to put you in that way of, that way of thinking and being that way when it's not they're natural. Yeah, they're putting the ideas into the kids' heads when he wouldn't be thinking these sort of things. There's no need for him to be thinking about stuff like this. It's no. not a natural thought process for a child. No, it's not. They're trying to tell us, so, and this, this, is, this is the basis of everything they do. So they're trying to tell us that we are sexual from birth, okay? Mm. So let's explore that theory then, right? We know where it comes from, but let's pretend we don't. Let's explore that theory, sexual from birth. Well, I've got two dogs in this house. And one of them is very, very sexual. He's always on the leg of the other one, right? So why is that not happening in nurseries then? If we were sexual from birth, that's natural. I didn't tell my dog where to put his thing. I didn't tell my dog how to latch on. I didn't teach my dog that. The other dog didn't teach the dog that, right? It's a natural thing. Like as we get older, we have sex. We, do you know what I mean? It's a natural thing. We learn how to do it. So if we were sexual from birth, surely we'd be pulling these toddlers off each other, mm. wouldn't we? Exactly. That's yeah. not happening. That's well, not happening unless these children have been introduced to porn or something has happened to them. That's the only time children are behaving in a sexual way or displaying sexual behaviours. Mm -hmm. It is never in them naturally. If it was, then we would be sexual from birth. Do you agree? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. They would exactly. It would just be a natural thing that they would do straight to, as you said. You know, like with with the with the dog. So it doesn't like, yeah. It it doesn't make sense. It's unethical. It's disgusting to even suggest that children are sexual from birth. We know that yeah. sex is bad when it comes to children. This is when it becomes sinister, and it's just in general the way they're making sex now in the media and mm -hmm. in the porn industry it's just it's making it dirty and, and quite horrible you to know be honest, I, I bet half of them right in about it are no bloody good at it anyway yeah exactly, <laughs> they, exactly. Are. they are they're making it into something that it's not do you know what i mean it's meant to be glorifying it that yeah they're, glor they're glorifying i i almost like i feel quite sick sometimes when mm. i see the way it's being portrayed and then um, I think it was Phil said on his live, there was a, when they, when you did your, when we did the demo, there was a young girl there who was 13 and she agreed that the age of consent should be 
lower to 10. And I was like, yeah, oh. but no, let me, in her, in her defense, she was just being a mouthy teen. And the calf was there and she said, if you had said to her, well, you think it should be three, she would have said three just to, just to have. She was right. just a mighty teen who had to win that argument. There was no, no thought or conviction in what she said. She just well, wanted to win that argument. But she was just a kid. At 13, I thought, I actually still thought it was actually, oh, disgusting. Yeah. I wouldn't have even wanted to be involved in that. Do you know what I mean? But I think kids are getting more and more, well, they're, they're just getting information they shouldn't have. And they should not be excited or looking forward to a sexual experience when they're that young. It, it, it shouldn't even be on their agenda. And well, they, I don't think they do look forward to it. It becomes a bit of a chore because we know that from the from Monica Klein, who was delivering this education in America. She was she was working for um, Planned Parenthood. And she went in and a child put up their hand and she asked how she could give oral sex without gagging. And Monica was like, well, you shouldn't well, you be doing it then. Well, I got to do it, haven't I? Everyone's doing it. And it was at that point that Monica realised that she's actually sexualising these children in these lessons because by introducing this stuff, they believe that this is their ticket to go. You know? Mm. And that's, that's when she joined um, Family Watch International then. But this is it. They, when you're introducing this stuff to children, they think that, that it's time to go then, you know? Yeah, because they're too young to know anything else, aren't they? You tell them, you tell them something, and or they see things on the internet, or you know, in the music industry, and their idol is doing it, so they think, oh, well, I should be doing it too. Yeah. It's like, come on, like let's get rid of all these hypersexualized idols. Get rid of them. That's what we need. We just yeah. the porn industry is way out of control. We're going to be talking about that later with Kath. Um, it's 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 gone so disgusting that it should be banned. I'm sorry, it should just be completely banned because you know the fact that children can access it so easily as well, and the content that they're they're bringing out just getting worse mm. and worse. There's there's just yeah, it, it should either be banned or regulated, you know, strictly oh, regulated. Yeah. So exactly. what's your thoughts on today's Sorry, you know, you know, you know the um the Klein woman that you were talking about and yeah the question that made her question what she was doing well apparently on the bish site you know the bish education site yeah. um there are links i've never tried following them but apparently you can uh if you if you're good at sort of getting on links there are links to the inventor of the site is his name hancock i don't know i can't remember but apparently, he does sort of one-to-one -one with children who ask questions. He, yeah, he does, apparently. And one of the questions was uh, asked was exactly that one. You know, I want to please my boyfriend, but I really can't get on with oral sex. You know, what should I do? Uh, and so you don't have to look at porn because... There are links in so many places where they shouldn't be uh, on these websites. I mean, for example, um, wasn't the one on Childline? I don't know, John. I don't I'm just know. putting it out there. It was something that I, fa I found out through word of mouth, you know, hearing people on videos. NSPCC, I don't think, has been uh, above it either you know yeah. it's amazing where you find these links and they're very often on educational sites i suppose yeah. once people get wind of them they disappear but they've been there and that's that's bad in itself isn't it shouldn't have happened well this is well, it for for that stuff to even be there to begin with joan it should be questionable you know we keep hearing oh, it was a mistake it was a typo error or we're not used in that part. Why are you even having anything that's got something too graphic in it anyway? Shouldn't yeah. you scrap the whole package? Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah. Like putting, it's like putting a child in a car seat, strapping them in, waving them off knowing you've cut the brakes. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. It absolutely is. I know. So it's, it's... Your judgment. Oh, my computer. Just gone nuts. I mean, What's your thoughts on today's judgment, then, 
Do you know what? I did, I've been this eight months of the day. I've, I've, only just, I've only just caught up on it. I've been eight months of the day. And um, I've just seen now uh, they, they lost the judgment, have we? Yeah. It's crazy. I, yes. I, I, when, I, when I was in the courtroom, I thought it was going quite well. I was really surprised that, that, that I was a bit of a shock, really, to be honest. I was. Well, um, it was going well. It did seem, we, we, we yeah. you know, Harris and um, Paul Diamond presented a whole load of information mm. to show that it's the Welsh government have been, you know. Mm. Yeah, it was good information. I, was, I yeah. couldn't believe it. Yeah, it was a lot of stuff that I didn't even know. I was sat in the room with Neil, and I was like, whoa. So the, to gather the verdict you've got is crazy. But I know yeah. you guys are fight, fight like you have been anyways. It's, it's, you've been amazing all the way through it. Thank you. And yes, we will fight. We're not giving no, it. So we, 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 were you sat there for the whole time in the uh, court? On the first day. We never, we never went into the room the second day. On the yeah, first okay. day, we were in the courtroom. You were the there second the whole day. never went in. Yeah. yeah. I know it's a lot. It's, it's a long old day in the it's courtroom, a, isn't it? Yeah, I was actually <laughs> sat and falling asleep in it. I thought, oh, what's going on here? But uh, yeah. it was a long day, very long. It's warm in it as well, it was. Yeah. <laughs> It's all this technical sort of law stuff that they talk about well, as well. Yeah, it was really interesting. Yeah, it was really interesting, like the common law stuff and all that's coming up. I was quite surprised. I didn't think it had a standing in there. I was, it was really good. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed yeah. being sat in there as well, listening to it. Mm. It, was, it was good. But, um, mm. Yeah. But even like the... It, I heard it's been on BBC News. So like I say, it, all, like Catherine was saying, all publicity is good publicity. Whereas... Yeah. Being any publicity is good publicity, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so, Kurt, like obviously, we've had you on here today because mm. you and is it your brother or your brother in law? Sorry, no, it's, my, it's just my best mate, Neil. Oh, it's your best, but oh, you just call yeah. each other, bruv. Like, all right, yeah, right, yeah, bro, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you and your best friend, Neil, yeah, a, you, well, you did ginger, you can't be my brother. Oh, you like to he's ginger. I got that, he's and, 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 and ginger and pale. Oi, I'm as well. My brother's blonde. Oh, yeah, but well, I don't know. To see Neil's my brother would be an hard, hard task, honestly. Obviously, <laughs> obviously, Neil's the better half. Yeah, Neil's the better half. <laughs> yeah. oh, he's been abused so, all his life, him. I, I would say you were the better half. You've got dark hair. <laughs> yeah, that's the first time he's been called my brother, though. No, I assumed you were brothers. Yeah. I just thought, but I think maybe I'd seen you at some point, like saying maybe you called each other brothers. Yeah, we'll we'll like... yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah too sad, too sad. Yeah, so Kirk, yeah, the reason we got you on today was because um yeah, you did that massive challenge, you and Neil, um, the three peaks. So do you just do you want to just talk us through that? Yeah, we didn't know what to do. We were literally scratching rain, trying to find something to do. And Neil came up with the three peaks. But um, he left it to meet the book. I booked the caravan and I were away from Snowdonia. So we had to wait at three o'clock in the morning to travel to Snowdonia because I booked it so far away. But um, yeah, it was, it was we, we done well up until we got the Panavan and the, the weather changed and we, put, we pulled the plug right at the top of the, the ore shoes. Nowhere as it goes up on the on the top bend. We pulled the plug on there when really we probably should have just kept going, but I don't know. I, I don't know. The web yeah. was really bad. And it was such I a shame. I, 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 I we could have lied about it. I was thinking, but you just lying to yourself. We, we got to the top on the corner. It was on the bend. I was thinking, what are we going to do? The web was just painting us. But where it was only two of us, I think we was more worried if something happened. Yeah. If it was That's a group of you or three or four of you, it would have been fine. This you is know? exactly what I was going to say, Kirk. If yeah. you had gone further, you may have lost your orientation when you got up there as well, mm. because it was dark as well. I and you wouldn't have been able to... So you may have ended up... It could have ended up getting dangerous. So obviously you had to do the right thing. If, if it was three of us, we would have kept going. But where it was only two of us, I, it was me. I said to me, I, I don't think we should... Like, yeah. I'm really walk. <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah, a shame yeah. you did do it on a day that we had our last day all before court. Otherwise, we would have oh, yeah. um, come and supported we'll you, you know. But you were done it a year before, didn't you? And we, we did, I didn't even realize you'd already done it. And obviously, we wasn't following you as closely as, as then as we were. No, we were caught in the COVID trap at, at that time rather than, than looking at things that were more or just as important that you girls yeah. were doing. Do you know what I mean. 
Well, when well, we, we did it, we did it, there were 17 of us, right. and we did it um, in, I think it was the end of September, but what date did you do it? Um, so I can remember, I think it's beginning November of the November. 12th. Yeah, it was That's beginning it. of November, yeah. You netters. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know, it was, it was freezing as well. Yeah, never mind, never mind. We'll, we'll have to do a team challenge now on something, guys. We'll have to, won't we? And um, mm. yeah, it's better doing as a team. We were thinking of doing the um, Santa running the ceiling, weren't we? But things just happen, and like, no, yeah. and before we know it, the date is there. We're like, oh, we missed that. Yeah, absolutely. It's hard yeah. as well because there's only so many challenges you can do, there's only a small group of us. So when other people just um, use that initiative and get stuck in. That's just amazing. Yeah. You know, it, it is amazing, you know, because it does. It reaches a whole different audience again, man, you know? Yeah. It, it is just hard to think of challenges, isn't it? It is hard to think of a fundraiser too, because it's yeah. only a certain amount and, you can cycle. And fit them in as well. Like what you and Kirk, um, no, sorry, your Kirk, what you and Neil did, you just went off your own back and you just did it yourself. You, We didn't have to, we didn't have to get involved in anything. So where we've got people like yourself doing that, that's brilliant for us, isn't it, Kim? You know, that's yeah. we just that's what we need because we've never we haven't even got time to post out sponsor forms half the time. Oh, we are even down yeah. to emails and messages. We're like, oh, I'm actually I'm like, and and people don't want to nag us, but they have to. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you yeah, they don't bother you, but they have to, you know, you have to keep on top because it's just so crazy, crazily busy. This is why we need all hands on deck, you know, everybody can do something, can they? Yeah. I think when you went to New York, do you know when you had the one in the New York? How much you made? Sorry, I was just wondering how much you made. Um, we raised 590 pounds, something around that area, I think wow. it was. Brilliant, yeah, brilliant. So, yeah. And I, when you went to the Neon in Newport, that was a really informative um, event that we went to. I think if you had stuff like that, it was so good because yeah. you made it so clear what was going on and the information we was, we was given was perfect. I think if a lot of people could see stuff like that, it'd be, it's, mm. it was brilliant. Like. It was yeah, excellent. that's when we first met, wasn't it, Kirk? I remember yeah, you with a couple of you. Uh, yeah. Down. Yeah, yeah, it was a really good event, I was. Yeah, I think well, that was really happy one of them. Yeah. yeah. We have to keep it going now. We have to edit our presentation now. We're to add in the court bits. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think, um, I think you know, awareness is getting out there more and more, but it is still, oh, if everyone knew about it and everyone knew about the seriousness of it, we wouldn't even have to be actively campaigning like we are because everyone would give a pound. <laughs> if everyone gave a pound, yeah. every adult gave a pound, we'd be well over our, our, our um, amount that we need. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people who were completely unaware and there's a lot of people who have been manipulated into believing that this is, a, this is a good thing and it's all about accepting people. Mm -hmm. But we know it goes above and beyond that. So... Yeah, we've got we still got a bit of a we've still got a bit of a journey, but we're getting there every day. Yeah, we are. We are getting there. We are chipping away at it, guys. Look, let me just let me just give you all a little bit of an idea of where we're after this now. We've got twenty one out of twenty two local authorities active. Okay, that's nearly the whole country. Right, no other country in the world is at that stage. So even though in your own little bubble. You think, oh, you know, not enough people know, nothing's happening. Actually, the whole country is rising. Hence why Jeremy Miles had to put out that false statement, you know. He's even mentioned how we're aggressively challenging the local authorities. Well, how can we aggressively be challenging all these local authorities when we're only charging challenging our own? But that shows that it is affecting them. You know, why would he put that in his statement if it wasn't a problem, you know? Yeah, so absolutely. We are doing, we're doing far better than any country. Yes, we've had this response from the court. Yes, the government think we're irrelevant. Yes, they think we haven't got no rights. But guys, we're going to win. Yeah, We are going to win, you know. And the longer it takes and the harder we have to work, the sweeter the victory. 
Absolutely. And speaking of winning, we are on £958, ladies and gents. Please dig deep. Right, let's let's get this up to a thousand by eight o'clock. Yes, <laughs> what's your number? Nine, nine five eight. Nine five eight. Okay. Let's get it. Come on, let's get up to a thousand, guys. Let's get up to a thousand. Come on. We've got, we got fifty-one people watching. So if everybody yes. gave a pound, we'd be over a thousand. Come on, guys. Yeah, if all you fifty people watching now give a pound, we would make out a target. Yeah, absolutely. Come on. I know Come it's on a hard everyone. price, but you can do bank transfer. Bank details are on the fundraiser page. Just scroll down to the description and the bank details are there. We can add it, send Lucia a message, and we can add it to um Lucia can put add it onto the final, the total. Did I say that right? I think so, yeah. My dog wants to fight me. That's what's getting my attention. Yeah, he wants to fight me because there's chicken in the kitchen. <laughs> Oh, lovely. I don't so, know. So, yeah, we've still, we've still got quite a lot to get through. Anyway, guys, we got our big chat with George and Calf on the pod. we got how many more interviews have we got, Lucia? Right. We have got, like, unfortunately, Matt couldn't make it because he lost his voice. That's Matt from Trans Against Groomers. We may talk a little bit about him afterwards. Yeah. Um, we have got, right, and, and then it's just Richard, then Richard Lucas later on. Oh, we've got plenty of time now. We're on seven and a half hours now. Yeah, yeah, we've got plenty of time because we've got a couple of videos we want to show you as well in between. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're actually doing quite well um, considering we thought that we were behind schedule. <laughs> yeah, we're ahead of, we're ahead of schedule now because we've messed everybody up for the first half. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. But we're, it's all good. It's all good. we got Emma that's going to be coming on at quarter to eight. That's Emma Meredith. So she's done oh, there a lot. there we are then. And after yeah. Emma, then we'll play the back video. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, that is, that's a perfect idea. That's so really we'll, have, we'll have a little tea break again with the Buck Angel interview. Guys, for those who don't know who Buck Angel is, Buck Angel is a transsexual man, entrepreneur, and a porn star. So, you would think that he would be the poster boy for this education. Stay tuned to find out what he has to say about it. There has been some, um, oh, there's been some controversial views regarding him because he does support social transition, okay, of children. So, he does support you allowing your child to dress as the opposite sex. But that is opposed to med medicalization. He yeah. doesn't believe you can go down the medical route. He believes the child's going to grow out of it. So a lot, so a lot of people from over here um, are not happy about his views in that sense. But if you put yourself in America where he is now, he's actually saving hundreds of kids from medical um, these mistakes. Uh, what's it called? Chemical castration. He's actually saving lots of children from long term um, effects. And we do know there's 25,000 children in America registered with irreversible trans regret. So I just wanted to get that out there before we come on to back, because that's his background. That's why he supports the social transition, because he believes children are just playing dress up. Yeah. Well, no, this is it. Like, um, like, let's just give an example of, like, you know, my, my daughter, like two years ago, she wanted to cut her hair short. And I knew she was going to look quite boyish if she cut her hair short, especially if she doesn't ever wore a skirt or anything. But I agreed to let her do it because I thought, well, she's only cutting her hair. Um, you know, it's, it's what she wants to do. And of course she did. She grew out of being, she was a tomboy, proper tomboy. She was for most of her childhood. But, you know, like any time there was any sort of mention about if, if someone had said, oh, you're a boy, you're a trans. I said, no, you're a girl. You just got your hair cut short. That's all. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And I feel it's important. I felt it's important as well to keep reiterating, you're a beautiful girl. You're my girl. Do you know what I mean? But at the same time, I wouldn't stop her dressing as a, well, they say dress as a boy. It's unisex, really, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like never, ever, ever should children make any medical decisions that's going to, you know, affect them. But if a boy likes dressing in a dress when they're little, I don't know. It's it's 
it's not going to harm them, isn't it? But it, it is, it shouldn't be, I should. I don't really think it should be encouraged. But, you know, some, some kids, as you said, they do like playing dress up. So, you know, it's quite, it's, it's, it is quite difficult because you don't want to dampen what your kids want. But at the same time, you don't no, want to No, be because if you look either. at, um, what's his name, John? The one from America, the old man. Walter. Is his name Walter something? The guy who transitioned twice? He did transition twice. What that. happened was his grandmother put him in either a purple or a green dress when he was little. And she told him how wonderful he looked and how pretty he looked. And every single time he went to his grands, he wore that dress because of how he felt and how much she, she showered mm. him with compliments. So he actually transitioned to a woman. And it all started from when she put him in a dress, right? Wow. Then later on, he transitioned back to a man. Then he transitioned back to a woman. And now he's back to a man again. So, And he still goes back to the time when his gran had put him in that dress. Because of the attention, how pretty he looked. And, and every single time he went there, he put that dress on. Wow. That's how he yeah, started. He's, he's a little, isn't he? He's very small with white Yeah, he's hair. very small, yeah. But did he have any chemical, um, did he have any transsex hormones or anything? I think he did, John. Um, he's in my image. What's his name? I just I can't remember. I don't know who you're speaking of, actually. But that was a real... She oh. paused again. I... I... No, I think she's concentrating. <laughs> She's so still, so she's she's still. Still. <laughs> oh, she's, she's, <laughs> she's pretending. <laughs> yeah. No, but this is this is it, isn't it? Is when a child has like a lot of attention with something. If if a child had a lot of attention like that 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 a guy had as a child, of course they're gonna wanna they they love that attention and i think and it's even like the play on words if you are a, if, if maybe a child keeps hearing oh you're just like a boy you you know a girl you're just like a boy you are you're just like a boy you should be a boy if they're hearing boy 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 all the time then eventually it's going to go into their subconscious and they're going to think oh, perhaps i am i am meant to be a boy so i yeah i definitely think it's important like the language that's around them as well you know and obviously like the attention yeah. as well well, so, they're, not gonna think, just... they're not going to think, oh, maybe I should be a boy. They're going to think, oh, I go boyish ways. But when they presented with the um, issue that you could be a boy, hmm, hmm. I could be a boy. Whereas if yeah. that wasn't on their face anyway, they just, you know. They just say, I'm a tomboy. That's fine. It doesn't matter. I'm, in. I'm quite yeah. much. I want to be. <laughs> and, th and think about the situation with Susie Green's son. Uh, she did a TED talk. You know Susie Green from Mermaids? Oh, right, yes, yeah. The now discredited Mermaids. Well, she did a TED talk, and apparently in the TED talk, she more or less said, because I don't know if you know about Susie Green, Kirk. No, I don't know. She was the head, no. head of Mermaids, and they mm. provide lots of resources and help to schools. So they're, they're, big, they're a really big organisation, and they're in America as well, are they? I'm not sure. I know about mermaids, but I don't know about the woman. Right. Well, she's been she's been the head since about 2014, and things changed when she came along, because it it became a very very different focus uh, to what it was before. But anyway, she had a son that um, she reckoned was trans, and she encouraged him, facilitated him was affirmative and everything. By the time he was 16, uh, he got whipped off to Thailand and he had all the business done, you know, all his bits chopped off and everything. And apparently she's got this TED talk where she said that her husband basically, she more or less admitted that her husband was homophobic. So... Reading between the lines, it looks as if her son was actually growing up into a gay boy, a boy who was gay. I don't mean gay boy in a derogatory sense. I mean a boy who was going to be gay, 
who showed every sign of it and it wasn't going down well with the husband so in order to save the marriage she put she turned the it into a girl and i've also heard that by now it's i've only heard it sort of it's not official but it seems that that son has now changed his pronouns back but he'll never be able to get his testicles back will he no and he'll never be able to get his penis back no it's crazy that they get encouraged to do it by their parents. It's like, how are you encouraging them to do it? Like? So but my mother would see Kirk. My mother mm. is the type of person who would absolutely love this. She mm. would love this. Now, if I was a child growing up now, I'd be Keith. Yes. Yeah. I'd be Keith yeah. right away and she'd be on these groups. My daughter's finally admitted she's my son. <laughs> and she always wanted a son as well. She was yeah. disappointed yeah. when I come out without the Wanga boy. Very disappointed as he was. So he would have been right up her street, Queen. Right up her street, you know, this would have. And to hell with me and the long term outcomes, you know? Yeah. And I would have gone along with it because everything my mother said, I held on to every word. Yeah. I always believed it was me and her against the world. And I would I would have believed everything. I would I would have one hundred percent gone down that road, you know? I, I I do hear like some parents as well, you know, when I hear parents say, you know, like your mum said, you know, oh, she would have really wanted a boy. When you have a child, you should be grateful for what, who that child, child is. Yeah. It shouldn't matter whether they're a boy or a girl. It or, Like my concern was I wanted them to be healthy. Apparently that's a bad thing to say because people say, well, if they're not healthy, uh, you know, it doesn't make them any less of a child. No, I, I didn't mean it like that. It's just you don't want your children to suffer ever, don't you? You know, you always want your child to be, be uh, happy, happy and healthy. That's you all wanna I want. Bring that child, you want to bring that child home from hospital in one piece? Yeah. That's what you yeah, want. You, know, you want to bring that child home from hospital in one piece. You don't, you don't care what... Well, yeah, well, it is, you know. But as some parents, they like they get quite obsessed with the fact that, say, if they wanted a boy or a girl, and they get the opposite, you know. I, and I, I don't. I, I just think no. I, I think what well, before I had before I had my first son, my son, I did in my mind. I thought I always wanted three daughters, and the reason I thought that was because I was one of three girls. So I just yeah. assumed they wanted the same as. But as soon as as soon as I met him, you know, it was just like oh, I was the luckiest person in the world, you know. Yeah. So yeah. when people are ungrateful for not having, you know, the child that they, the sex of the child that they wanted, I sort of like feel that that's just that's yeah. Be more grateful. You have There's to. Be wonder why they had the child to begin with. What's that? You've got to wonder why they had the child to begin with yes, if they're not exactly. happy with what, what what they're given, you know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I do think as well, there are cases where parents do push, like say they've got a boy and they wanted a girl, they push the um, the, the girly stuff onto their, their child. And this has happened, hasn't it? And they're like, oh, my child is four. Then he knows he wants to be a girl. And it's like, really? You know? we've, seen a, we've seen a post on social media and the four-year-old had just come out as trans the parent had already spoken to the school, which they were glad because the teacher was trans anyway. The child didn't want to change the name. The child wanted to continue wearing pink clothes, but it had to be trousers. So it's the child doesn't want all the other kids in the class as well, isn't it? They're wearing pink clothes, but it has to be trousers. So because the child won't wear a skirt, it's now trans. Mm -hmm. And you've gone to the school and you're excited about it. Yeah, I think somebody needs to see a doctor. Yeah, it's going to confuse all the other kids in the class as well. It's not yeah, just one, one child is actually a real thing. Are we bypassing mental illnesses now? Mm. So it yeah, seems, and you know, and it is a lot for other children to accept in the class as well, you know. Mm. So, and I'm well, not saying support people absolutely we support people we just don't promote issues that cause further issues we try to minimize that don't we yeah absolutely there was a case as well wasn't it it did it, i think it was in england i can't remember the exact case but a child was called homophobic or transphobic because a six-year-old child because he was asking a question why a boy was wearing a dress 
Yeah. Now this boy was then accused of being a bigot. So the six-year-old was homophobic, um, transphobic. transphobic. Yeah. That's the thing as well. Sensitive, isn't it? These days, if you go, it's like you're scared to say something. A lot of people are because people are so sensitive. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So they're, they're too scared to say anything because they're scared of what they're going to upset. Or... Well, I think Neil will agree with me here now. Nobody's been persecuted more than Ginger's, okay? <laughs> yeah. Nobody has, yeah, right? Tell you, tell you, honestly. So what <laughs> happened to the Ginger's? They had to <laughs> suck it up and get on with it. They toughened yeah. up, you know? And look mm. at us now. Will anyone mess with us now? They might not have picked us in PE 20 <laughs> odd years ago, but they're picking us now, are they? <laughs> yeah. we, are the, we are the true minority so we yeah. know it, and it doesn't matter um yeah. what's different about you that difference will be picked up by other children lucia you had it for being italian, italian. Yeah. yeah i was the no, only italian I, in my like i was my me and my sisters were the only italian in that comprehensive school until i think when my youngest sister joined so she's five years younger than me there was there was a girl in her class that was had an italian background so i was a minority in the school and every day i was reminded i was italian hey yeah. italiano oh luciano pavarotti give us an ice cream i had all that every day i actually like being italian so it didn't bother me but yeah. if i had a chip on my shoulder I, my school days i would have been a wreck because I would have yeah. felt bullied by it. But the fact that I like being Italian, and I was like, yeah, cool. I was I was good with that. It didn't, you know, I was actually, I quite like the banter. It didn't bother them a bit of attention, wasn't it? But the problem is now, where they're talking about bullying in school and stopping, I think bullying should stop mm. anyway. You know, like every, nobody should be picked on. A, we need to teach our children that they should never accept the person they are. So if anyone does make a, you know, a comment about them, it can go over their head. But B, let's teach our children to be kind and to know that everybody is unique. We're all different. We do not bully and pick on people full stop. But instead, they just keep going on and on about the LBGTQ+. That's all they talk about, mm. that we've got to accept people who are trans and people who are gay. Children in primary school shouldn't even understand really what gay is okay they may have two months there may be two months or two no. dads but that's the extent of it they it's not okay no i had a football okay. until so i was about 11 i never thought about anything sexual so i was about till i got to high school i saw i wanted to do was play football and be in the street playing with the boys playing run eight or something no what is this sexual stuff enter my mind it's yeah. crazy. kids really do not care it's yeah, as simple don't. as that they don't care and then you're introducing this stuff to them Leave them alone. Mm. And they and don't care about... You're actually right. Let's be honest here now, right? What is the difference between my relationship with a woman and my relationship with a man? There is only one difference, and that's the way we have sex. So why are we opening that can of worms? If you're not going to talk about sex, that is the only difference. You're telling me all relationships are the same. Okay, accept that. 100% accept it, okay? But there's a difference, and that difference is the way we have sex. So that discussion has to come into it as well. So it doesn't matter which way you look at this, you're going down the road of sex. Yeah. Leave the kids alone. And so the only people who actually want to discuss their sexuality with children is somebody who's got something wrong with them. Mm. Because I don't go telling a child about my sex life. No. So I don't no. Expect, neither would I go telling my child about a sex life if I was with a woman. Mm. Or if I'm with a woman now, do I start talking about my sex life now? Is, is, is that the key to go ahead? No. You don't have these discussions with children. Simple as. And if it's so inclusive, why are they... Uh, one of the results of this gender ideology will be to completely sideline gays and lesbians. Completely. It's not it's not inclusive, is it? <laughs> because they're feeling <coughs> well that yeah, exactly. They're they're now formed LGB, they don't want to be a part of this. And they're afraid that they are going to get um smeared with the same brush, tarred with the same brush. Uh, as the rest of them that are all in the alphabet spaghetti and think it's all wonderful. 
Mm. Because we know what's going to accept it, be accepted eventually. We know what this is all about. Mm. We know where it's come from and we know where it's headed, guys. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And this is why we need well, we've got there's that big um there's that big group gays against groomers and now trans against groomers. Yeah. They understand because they they're gay and trans that. themselves. They understand that there is a sinister agenda out there that's being used to sexualize children. Well, this is exploitation of not just the children, but of the adults as well, Lucia, you know. The platform has been hijacked, it was hijacked since day one with Harry Hay. And um, this is what people don't understand, you know, research where these things have come from. It hasn't all been, um, you know, guys, there's a history. There's a history and you're being used to promote a different agenda. You know, they never cared about you to begin with. They never, ever cared about you. You were just a stepping stone for them, you know. And the truth is this, guys, what happens when this goes wrong? Who's going to be to blame? Who are they going to come after? It's going to be you because it was all done in your name. You know, same as if it was all done in my name. Who would they come after? They'd come after me. So nobody is anti or against anything in that sense. What we are doing is we're trying to protect people from this sinister agenda that is finding its way all around the world. And if you want to understand what our concerns are, have a look at what's happening in America. Yeah. That is our concern. It's the same framework, same curriculum, same research, same references. You know, it's just filtered out and come through the likes of Emma Reynolds and stuff like that. It's not their work. It's not their work. It's other people's work. And it's been, it's been in existence before these people were born. They are just carrying the can to the next stage. And that's all. Right, Lou, is Emma coming on or is Yeah, she, uh... I'm just I'm just sorting her out with a link. I think I missed her out on the on the email. Me being Oh there we are, there, there we are. Like, so I'm literally just sending her the link now as you were all uh, talking. Because we wanna obviously, yeah, we got we we kind of got a little bit of a time restraint here. So if we have Emma on for a quarter of an hour and then we can put on Buck Angel then. Okay, yeah, then. yeah, then I can go and have a cup of tea then. Yeah, absolutely. You're dying for one, yeah. <laughs> and then, my son's cooking in the kitchen. It's, it's, you learn all the pots and pans, and I got the dog. He can smell the chicken. And <laughs> just try and stay seated. Ah, uh, I know, I know. It's, uh, it's well, I haven't got dogs, and I know how hectic it is. Um, anyway, just life. <laughs> well, I, had my, I had to leave my dog down my nan's because my I got a lot of puppy, seven month puppy, a little puppy, and she's crazy. So I had to leave a day my nans because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to be what I'd be on you. Uh, usually, I'm usually I've got a big cheeky. dog climbing up and he sits by there. Yeah, she'd be on my head. Yeah, I've got so. another one coming behind the couch peeking over by there. Yeah, so because I'm on this chair now, they can't. This is mm. all my, my space. Yeah, she is. She's she, in every now and then. Do they know? Say that again. We do pop on the screen every now and then. Oh, so, yeah. guys. So for the, if you've just joined us, guys, this is our 12-hour podcast, sponsored podcast. Please, please, please sponsor us. One pound, two pound, three pound. I know it's a few days before Christmas, but today we've had the judgment. The judge has dismissed our claim on all grounds. It's a 120-page judgment. We will be challenging it. So, guys, we need to take this all the way. Are we are we disappointed? We are disappointed that the court has um, has sided with the government in the sense that they they say that we don't have parental rights. We've never had parental rights. That's concerning. Um, that's a bit of a disappointment. But apart from that, we're not disappointed about anything else because the higher the court, the louder the message. And we want the world to know that we don't want this. So by the world knowing how much we don't want this, will echo across the planet. They are already chanting the same thing anyway. And it's only a matter of time before we all come through into the sunshine, guys, right? It's not a case of if, but when. When will we win? Do we want to win at the bottom stage or do we want to win at the top stage? Let's win at the top stage. Let's give them a fight. Let's take them all away. Let's not back down. We are here. 
we are going nowhere but we do need you guys to support us so if that's sharing this stream now or donating to us one pound is six children in wales guys one pound six children in wales so dig deep guys you can you can um donate through the fundraising link that keeps coming up in the chat every so often if you can't access it through paypal scroll down to the description and you will find the bank details there if you want to pop a message in here to say you've donated through the bank lucia can then transfer the amount over to the fundraiser for you guys yeah thanks kim we're actually at 1023 now that's 19 contributors thank you so much so we we went above a thousand we said by eight o'clock so we've gone above the thousand but please keep giving everyone thank you so much for watching and kirk thank yeah. you so much for joining us today you came on a bit longer than you expected you took me out of my comfort zone to come on you yeah. i've never done anything like this before so just well, thank you for joining us kirk yeah, thank you for and for a single man with no children, mm. I think you're brilliant father material. Have to say, we <laughs> need more people like you. No, no Thank problem. You. Thank you. Thank you. There we are. So, if there's any young ladies out there who want to chat with the first one, come on. Nice ladies only, though. <laughs> we'll have to vet them. <laughs> well, we have to, yeah, we have to vet too. PC people yeah. have to vet too, and it's not a DBS. Sorry, we're more um, thing than that. After vetting, uh, we'll vet too, and then we we'll pass your number on to Kirk. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you, Kirk. And keep up the fight. Thank you. Thank you for always winning. Try, girls. Bye. Okay, ladies, I'm going to get Emma is in the background, so I'm going to get Emma straight on because she's um, waiting here. Here she comes. Hello, Emma. How are you doing, lovely? Hi, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Before right, we start yeah. with Emma, somebody's just, somebody's just made a suggestion. In fact, two people have made a suggestion. We should auction Kirk. Ah! We should auction Kirk. <laughs> Brilliant. That's a great idea. Oh, yeah, if only I was younger. Is this a date in sight now? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get all the trolls, yeah. <laughs> Auction him, I love it. Yeah, Sorry, nice Emma, guy, how are you doing? No, I'm all right. Yeah, you all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You actually look like a postcard. She does. I'm she? sure you I thought I saw it's still still, but she's actually there moving. So yeah. Uh, Are you doing I'm so that? proud I got my tree up. I'm putting it's on show. Nobody else will see it. Ah, looks lovely. Well done, love. Well done. Well, we can see it now, and so can 52 other people who are watching. Yay. So. <laughs> it was probably... worth it. <laughs> There's no roots. <laughs> There's no roots. We can auction like, we'll auction Emma's tree off with Kirk. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Complete Christmas package. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, Emma, you you you've been following well, you've been with us for quite a while now, haven't you? Like almost since the start, I think. Yeah, more or less, I think. Yeah, yeah. When did I, you first hear about? Yeah, when when did you first sort of like start getting um, involved? I saw Kim and Adele talking in Newport, um, right back in twenty twenty. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, because yeah. I know you've always yeah you've always been there. <laughs> kind of yeah, like I was following. Yeah. I I didn't I wasn't active until Adele um, until after Darren did his walk. Um, right. And I was getting so frustrated at not being able to do anything to help. So when Adele asked about people doing the three peaks, I thought, oh, well, that's something I could have a go at. Um, yeah, I just wanted to get involved. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they, oh, that's it. That was the first. See, I, my memory's really bad. That was the first time I, I met you, Emma, was the three peaks. Yeah. And what a challenge yeah. that was. Yeah, it was. But it was great. Yeah, yeah it was It was great. And um, Nice you to were, meet everybody. You're scared of heights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While we were walking up Snowden, you were absolutely fine until the sunlight came out and you realised yeah, how high you <laughs> <laughs> But you did do incredibly well. Like it was, it was, it was a great adventure, actually, wasn't it? A real good way of getting people together. Um, it, got, 
Adele to thank for that as well, because obviously she yes. uh, organised that. Yeah, she was brilliant. And she was so supportive. I, yeah, no, it was great. I was really glad to get involved. Yeah, I know we were glad for you to get involved as well, Kit. Um, Emma, to have you involved. <laughs> um, but since I then, didn't, I didn't realise you had yeah. done that. I didn't realise you went on the three picks. I know you did the walk recently. Yeah, I, ma I managed to avoid being in any photographs, I think. <laughs> okay. Oh, well done. That was massive. I mean, if I went up and down Snowden, I mean, I've done it a few times, obviously, but not recently. But I'd be patting myself on the back, actually, just for doing Snowden. So yeah, how you well, have you managed the best? I don't know. I did as much as I could of each mountain. I just got as far as I could on each mountain and then walked back to the bus. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. that you, was did, you did well. You did incredible. And you had you said you didn't really do much training, mountain training before that as oh, well. Oh, gosh, no, not mountain training. I tried and failed and thought, oh, this is going to be interesting. Um, yeah. But <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I just wanted to, um, because I was struggling to get people's awareness and get people to engage with the subject, and I thought, well, maybe if I did something like that, it would, you know, get people talking. Um, it, it didn't really, <laughs> but I managed to raise some money, so that yeah. was good. Yeah, and obviously you're part of one of the WhatsApp groups, is it Monmouthshire? Yes. Monmouthshire? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Monmouthshire. and I, I know you and some of the, you know, some, some of the supporters up that way. You've been, you've been doing quite a bit, haven't you, to raise awareness in the area? Yeah, we've had some coffee yeah. hours, um, and we've done some leaflet dropping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we went out with the how banners. Do you, how do you find the response from people generally? How do you find? Um, it was sort of the, the people that actually you, you could actually engage with, 70% positive, you know, we're against it and we're really glad to see that somebody was doing something about it. And then you obviously get the odd one um, that wants to stand and argue the point. Yeah. Um, they're all the same, aren't they? They've got that kind of grimace. They... They grip their teeth and they they get very angry and passionate about. Ah! Yeah, you can kind of see yeah. this. It's like just barely suppressed rage about yeah. them. Yeah, I know, I know, and it's quite. It is very difficult when you're faced with this, especially when you know they've got their reasons for agreeing yeah. with the RSC, and usually, usually it comes down to something like, well, you know, when I was growing up as a gay man or a lesbian what you know i is it, i was i was bullied or i felt suppressed because of my sexuality but the thing is when people are speaking and they're saying my age or maybe a bit younger back when we were younger it was actually illegal to get married as a get you know the same 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 sex marriage was actually illegal we've come a long way now yeah. we don't they wouldn't like someone who was growing up as a gay individual now in their say in their teens, they wouldn't feel as suppressed anyway. No, they, they so, wouldn't encounter that. We've had to embrace a lot of change, haven't we, in our generation? Yeah. You know, yeah, I, I, like I, I grew up in a small village that there, there wasn't anybody that we were all white Welsh people. Um, you know, so we we've had to embrace a lot. Our, our children have, have been um sort of encountered different races in school and for us that it just didn't happen so we've had we've had to grow a lot but yeah. you know there's there are certain things that are beyond our morality aren't there so absolutely and this is it isn't it you don't we don't mind change and evolving no. but when it's no it's brilliant to, I, i'm loving it yeah yeah I'm, I'm loving hanging out with muslim people you know that's new to me yeah, it's brilliant. Oh, yeah. You should have seen it when we went for food with them. That was um, oh, amazing. Um, yeah. We were taken and we were given food. These tables were just went to an empty room. Next minute, all tables were up, the chairs were up. Wow. And these big things of food was coming in. And John, John was like, she's not going to eat that food because I'm so fussy. <laughs> and I tell you the truth, it was dried in it a little bit, didn't it? But oh my God. <laughs> absolutely yeah. beautiful and i love this multi multiculturalism now the meat yeah. in their food sorry to the vegetarians out there i'm on with two vegetarians here now right i'm a meat vegetarian i don't eat veg <laughs> absolutely amazing 
they're saying there's a possible there's um they're having issues streaming to facebook that's what they're saying there guys i thought it was my signal then oh hang on um we're having issue trouble streaming to facebook i wonder if that's because we've been on too long do you think at the minute i'll have a look now view on facebook i'm yeah i'm just doing continue to facebook now oh you're all right you, you're doing it are you yeah i think so it looks like it started again <laughs> It might have come on. I think we're only streaming to. Um, I think we're only streaming to um, YouTube now. YouTube. Yeah, we've lost our view. Twenty three. We're just on YouTube now, guys. Come on, everyone, get onto YouTube. So how how about I go onto Facebook now and tell people to go onto YouTube? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Go on. Okay. Go on. So yeah, we'll continue not, chatting beyond them. Where was we? What was we talking about, love? They're not going to cut you off all night today on Facebook. Um, well, I don't know if we let me leave the street, get myself out. Let me just if I can set it back up to get in. Leave the broadcast. So we were you all right after Saturday, Lou? That was quite a busy day, wasn't it? Saturday. Um, Cardiff. Oh, are you talking about the demo on See, I forget what I'd done yesterday. Are you talking about the demo on Saturday? I know. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, because what we had decided to do, because every time we do a demonstration, um, me and Kim, we do it together. Um, but what we decided to do was, because we had two demonstrations, one on the Saturday, one on the Sunday, weekend before Christmas as well. So I decided yeah. I was going to do the Saturday, she was doing the Sunday. Now, it wasn't as busy as it would normally be. And we expected that because obviously there was no trains running. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not going to get all those people that, that would rely on the trains. The, the, there was a train yeah. strike. And it's the last week before Christmas as well. So a lot of people are doing their sort of family things. So totally understood that but we still managed to get a bit of a crowd you know as we carried on um, yes. there was quite a lot of people who were objecting if you like there were some people who were you know expressing that they disagreed with us and um, there was that councillor as well that uh, has been filled yeah um, it was quite a fun day wasn't it it was <laughs> it was a fun day but we did gain some supporters as well who'd never seen us before you know there mm -hmm. was there was a couple of families that were actually listening intently to what what you know what was going on so you know yes. that's what it's all about we've got to expect backlash especially as we get more and more popular there are always going to be people that disagree with this but um but yeah generally um it was you know we we gained some more supporters by being there so it's never a waste of time then isn't it no no and you good. know for me, Emma, and maybe, you know, I like to hear their point of view when people are yeah. opposing us. I want to hear why they're opposing, what their view is, what, what their perspective is on yeah. this RSE and this campaign. And it usually, it's usually because they think that the RSE is about healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. and that, they, that we're full of misinformation when we yeah, know... because they believe the government's line, haven't they? Uh, exactly. Exactly. Totally believed it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. It's a difficult subject to talk about in a sh in, you you to condense it, isn't it? Because everybody's coming at it with a different point of view, and um, it's a hard to get to find a, a like common ground with people. Is isn't always easy. It is with with a lot of people, but not with everybody. Yeah. So it's it's good to get out there and talk to people because they. A lot of them just don't understand. We're all coming at it from a safeguarding children perspective, aren't we? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. This is this is it, Emma. This is it, and this is why when everyone realizes what our stance is, when people the people who have researched it and looked into it, they're the ones that join us. They stay with yes. us because yes. they've seen it with their own eyes and they understand what we're about. But unfortunately, yes. there is a lot of information out there that makes that education look good and 
yeah. it's only when you actually see the con you know when it's only when their children are going to be affected by it that's when they're going to start getting angry but then and it's too late then isn't it because the children yeah. have seen it yeah. and what do you what do you say to some i don't know if you've ever had this experience uh emma or lou uh but what do you say to someone who said well um for example i had a lady in a wheelchair and she said to me well, do you know, I was abused when I was a child. And when I told my teacher that somebody was playing with my, I can't remember what word she used, my tuppence or something, uh, the teacher just laughed. She didn't understand. I'll tell and you what I'd say to that. How on earth, as an adult, do you not, uh, would you not ask, uh, at least would not would ask not an additional question? Because it sounds... Yeah. You know, it's like, so children have got to learn the correct terminology because an adult cannot be bothered to act, or even, like, that would prick my ears. And, you know, yes, I've done the safe, the, the basic safeguarding course over here, but even before I'd done that, that would prick my ears. I'd be like, he, he, he paid with your what? I would, do you know what I mean? Oh, what's that? It would, yeah. I was to ask another question. So if Is teachers it, are being faced with that, Either they're not educated and they need educated, or they can't be bothered. Well, yeah, it's like it's a it's a taboo subject, isn't it? So some people would act with embarrassment and just brush it off because they don't want to be the ones to talk about it, kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, that's it. That's exactly it, yeah. Emma. That's yeah. exactly it. But then right, you're, yeah. you're sorry, yeah. You, you're keeping the, the child stuck in that situation, aren't you? If, if, if you get that reaction, you're not going to bother talking about it again. Exactly. No. Exactly that. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to sort of like just speed this up a little bit now. Em. I just want you to yeah. talk about your your um, sponsored walk you did with Julie and um, Phil. Phil. Oh yeah, with Julie and Phil. Yeah. Yeah, we um we we intended to walk from Newport to Lentoni, but it, I don't know if you remember that weekend was absolutely boiling. Um so we did 15 miles on the canal and then the next day we did 10 miles from where we were camping for the show. We did 10 miles from there up and down the mountain in Lentoni. So we did 5 miles up and 5 miles back. So we, we completed our 25 miles. We just did it in a different place because it was unbearable out on the, you know, on the pavements. It was just too hot. So yeah. we did that. And then we, and then we did, um, we set up a stand at Lentoni show and um, we were there ready, prepared to hand out leaflets. We didn't get an awful lot of engagement on the day, but we were there and, we, you know, we couldn't be missed. We were there. The banner was there. Everybody could see us. So whether they came and spoke to us or not, we were there. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, sometimes that's all it's about, just being there. Because I, I remember, I, I'm not a moot though, I know. I remember, like, this guy, he had seen two posters. Um, he was in work when he'd seen two posters. He did nothing about it. It wasn't until he saw the third poster that he actually rang me with his missus and we were on the phone then for an hour and a half, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It does matter, you know, there's a psychology behind it as well. I'm not being rude, guys. I'm just sharing the YouTube on Facebook. I, exactly. I was going to say to you, actually, my, my daughter's friend the other day was telling us about, well, she was telling my daughter, um, she was helping her friend or her, her relative to get her kids ready for school. And her friend said, oh, tell them to get off their phones and get ready for school. Um, well, the one refused, the two of them did it, but the one refused. And so she said, oh, I'm going to take your phone off you. And she said... The kids said, oh, I don't consent to that. And my daughter's friend's like sort of 21. And she couldn't believe that this seven-year-old was saying to her, I don't consent. She said, where, where did you learn that? Anyway, she took the phone off her anyway and said, don't be stupid, go and get ready for school. Well, she had a phone, they had a phone call from the school to say if that happened again, they would inform the police. What? <laughs> you're not allowed to take their phone off her. You're not allowed to ground them. Well, do you know what? I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I remember hearing something like that for the first time. It was actually on social media where someone had said, someone wrote a report saying that their friends 
had grounded their 15-year-old daughter. She'd been very naughty. She was bunking off school. Obviously, the schools give you a fine, don't they, if your children bunk off. So they couldn't. And so what they did, they took a phone off her and made a, sent her up to a room. Well, she decided, this 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 15 year old girl got really sort of stroppy about it, as they do, teenagers. She called the police on her parents, right? And the police came round and demanded that they give the, the phone back and said, by sending her up to her, her room, that's kidnapping her. <laughs> and she said that. And this is going back years ago now. This is before I even had kids, or, or my kids might have been small. So even back then, the police were working against the parents. Yeah. And that's how I like the right? They are the only, and I used to laugh at this myself. I used to ground my kids. They never used to go out anyway. There was a few at the time that they never left the house. You know, they never went out anyway, but they still listened to being grounded. So, yeah, um, yeah that's an interesting one. What are they going to do to me on that? I haven't actually kidnapped them. They just think I have. <laughs> created the illusion. That's the mind control. That's the mind control. <laughs> I created the illusion that they were kidnapped. <laughs> We'd expect to discipline our children, and we will discipline them in a way that we see fit. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's what we're going to learn from, and that is different to every single child out there. And I'll give you a perfect example now. My son had done something in school. And um, before they punished him, I said, "Well, you make sure." And I said, well, "Give me a ring, and we can talk about it." They went ahead and they and they decided to do their own punishment and they give him an in-school suspension. They didn't contact me. I was waiting for the phone call, no phone call. I got an email off my son. Hey, best day ever. I'm watching Family Guy. <laughs> so they put him on <laughs> suspension. They put him on his laptop. He's got additional needs. Then he um, had to get Wi-Fi and he was watching a program he wasn't allowed to watch at home. That was the best day ever. So I couldn't, I was having a meeting the following day and I couldn't wait to get in that meeting. And that's what I said, I said, you do realise, I said, that you've rewarded him for that. I said, and now there's absolutely yeah. nothing I can do about it because you took that power out of my hands. Mm. You've rewarded yeah. him. Not only have you rewarded him, you've undermined the, the rules in my house because he was able to access a programme he's not allowed to access at home. Yeah. Yeah. Then that, that was born on a safeguarding concern. They had created a safeguarding concern for that, then, because my yeah, son was watching that he was not left to on their premises. We all, yeah, we know our own kids best. I, um, there was, um, not this Saturday in Cardiff, but the Saturday before, there was um, a psychologist and she, uh, she worked for some organization that went into schools, but I can't remember the name of it. Um, but I asked her what her qualifications were. She said she was a psychologist. And um, and she said, oh, so, so are you just a normal mother? And I said, yeah, I'm just a normal mother. But there's other people in the organisation that have got qualifications. And then I thought about it afterwards and I thought, well, yeah, I'm a normal mother, but I've successfully brought up three children. Yeah. So you know, that annoys me. That annoys me. And I used to give Lucia a row because she used to say, I haven't got no qualifications. And we go, you are. Right? Yeah. I hate the term Facebook mums, right? Because nobody, not even the FBI, can research at the rate of a worried mother. Yes. So can you ever, ever, ever undermine the true meaning of the word mother? Because it is yeah. far more than somebody that gives birth. It's far more than somebody that just raises children. A yeah. mother's job is... is you are a private investigator. You are yeah. the FBI. You're the nurse, the social worker, the carer, the decision maker. You are a lot of things. So yeah. for somebody to just say, are you just a normal mum? Yeah. That's the point. You lift up your collars and you say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> are you only a psychologist? Yeah. <laughs> you've got a, you've got a lot to learn, Han, and all people. <laughs> Well, I asked her, had she done safeguarding training? And she said, yes, I'm level three. And I like, look really posh. And I said, like I said, but that's not good enough, is it? And she yeah. was like horrified. And I said, well, Kim's a safeguard leader. I said, but even she says level three is not good enough. Yeah. And um, oh. I said, you wouldn't be able to spot a predator in the classroom, would you? And I, she just, she, she, she was with a bike. She was, she just wheeled off at that point. 
because they don't oh, like God, being God, mics were drawn around <laughs> <laughs> we're drawing a veil over that one eh? yes we are <laughs> Right, ladies, I'm sorry to butt in now. We have got to sort of push on because yeah. we want to get um, the Buffy Angel video I'll out leave you there. To it. I'm excited to watch the rest of it. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Emma. As always, you've been brilliant. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Good, good luck later. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 We love Bye. you, Emma. Foil vow or ciao. <laughs> We're multilingual after all. <laughs> And just just before you do that, just one second. Who was what was the name of the man that produced the law, the UN equality law, that oh. you could not that you could not hurt your child, that you could not smack your child? I've been yeah, looking for it. About that. it. Yeah, but that um, was just to follow on to that. Where where did he end up and what for? He ended up in yeah, jail exactly. for three years. So for those who don't know, the guy who uh, who championed this whole um, no smacking law is actually in prison for paedophilia. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's actually in prison for paedophilia. So, um, yeah, so that's the credibility behind what we're dealing with here. He's actually the head of paedophilia. But a lot of people who work for the UN have ended up in jail. Well, they haven't ended up in jail, sorry. They've been caught up in these scandals involving children. Um, and sexual activity is so um it's not a surprise really is it absolutely not that's disgusting really bad um i just want to thank everyone who was continuing to put money in i've just had ns nh pet pup tv saying he's just put a five in front in our fund thank you so much it is built and i think we are up to what are we up to 1038. So come on, keep giving. Come Let's on, guys. Let's get it up there. Come on, come on, come oh, on. <laughs> so, guys, what we're going to play now is we're going to play an interview I did with Buck Angel about a year ago, I think. Buck Angel, as I said earlier, is a transsexual man. He is tra transsexual. He speaks of himself as transsexual, not transgender. So he is female to male. He's an entrepreneur. Um, he's actually a porn star as well. So um, you would think, obviously, with the promotion of porn throughout this education as well, you would think this man would be a poster boy for this education. But let's just see what Buck Angel had to say, shall we? Hello, everyone. Um, those who don't know me, I'm Kim. I'm the chair of PCPW, Public Child Protection Wales. And at this moment in time, we are sit well taking the government to court. Uh, we're seeking a judicial review, a review of the comprehensive sexuality education, which our government are saying is relationships and sexuality education. And tonight I am joined by someone who I have been dying to get an interview with. This is Buck Angel. And I think it's really important, guys. You listen into this now, you share this because this is this is incredible information. Before I pass you over to Buck, I just want to say, Buck, what I see from you, and this is what I say to the girls, that I, I would have you down as a poster boy for this sex education. That's what I would have you down as. So tell us who you are, explain who you are, and then that will tell everyone why I believe you would be would have been the poster boy for this education. Yeah, right on. So thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate you reaching out to me. And this is a very important topic. So it does mean a lot that you found me. So my name is Buck Angel. I uh, was born a uh, female. So I'm a biological female who transitioned to live as a man 30 years ago here in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, my life has been amazing as a transsexual man. I have nothing, <laughs> I, it saved my life. I, I really believe it saved my life, but I didn't transition until, you know, my late twenties, 30 years old. So I lived most, now pretty much, I just turned 60, half my life I lived as a female and half my life I lived as a male. So, you know, I'm here today because 
I'm a, I'm, I don't want to say I'm an activist. I'm not necessarily an activist, but I'm a person who cares about what I see happening with children. So I don't necessarily talk about adult space. Children, I see uh, a, a very strange thing happening in your country as well as here in the United States with uh, uh, this form of, um, I don't know if I want to even use the word indoctrination, but on some form, this idea that we have to all of a sudden start having this language and these teachings and this idea that everybody needs to be trans and there's some really very dangerous things happening so i'm i'm here as an elder of the community and somebody who transitioned a long time ago and has thoughts and feelings about what's happening and what i what i love about you buck is you um you've got a really good strong platform and a strong following and you put out some educational videos so you share the yes. truth of the journey of transition yes. The, the effects of the medication you yes. discuss you discuss in great you discuss a lot more than what the doctors discuss that's what I get from your videos yeah thank you yes I do because so so one of the things that did happen again I, and when I transitioned no nobody was transitioning right on some level they used me as an experiment the doctor even said he actually called me a guinea pig because they didn't even know what was the hormones were going to do to my body or the surgery so I only had top surgery I never would well, top surgery mastectomy and I didn't have any bottom surgery so that was always sort of like my platform in the world is that I'm comfortable being a man without a penis but that that being said I also had a very horrible thing happen to me from long-term use of testosterone which was called atrophy and atrophy almost killed me which is the removal of estrogen from the vaginal area and it can cause a lot of problems and women get it it's through menopause a lot of times but for people like me they didn't even know it existed and it it literally tore my system apart that I got septic the doctor said if I didn't make it to the hospital in time I would have died I mean it was horrendous and so I really talk about that a lot yet here we are today, and do you know that there's a ton of trans men getting atrophy? After I've educated about it, I put it out there, but the doctors seem not to care about, you know, the, 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 the effects of test testosterone is not natural to my body. Even though I look naturally male, it is not. Not a lot of long-term studies, and that was something that was very detrimental to, to, to me in my life, and it's been very... Um, well, this is it. Um, people are going to be wondering now why, why we're discussing transgender and things like that because we haven't touched it on our platform. Yeah, okay. but it's a massive part of our yeah. education. The things that we say is the gender. Um, we've had some BBC big Joe saying there's 100 genders back in July 2020. <laughs> They've, they've come down. They've come down from two hundred. They've come down <laughs> from two hundred. So they've reined it in a bit. So, yeah, this is a video that they they did have on that education oh. platform. There's one hundred oh. genders. Back in 2020, we found statistics for Scotland that transgender treatment for four year olds had increased by eighty percent. We now know transgender treatment for under 16 year olds in Scotland has increased by 1,500%. There was a school in Brighton um, of age 11 to 16 year olds. And back in July 2020, 187 of them did not know what gender they are. So wow. um, this is why we are bringing this subject forward. And this is why we are bringing it forward from um, a place of experience, not two minutes experience, lifelong experience and truth. We want some yeah. truth because we're not, I'm like you, but I don't use the term transgender, it's transsexual, old school, right. whatever. Yeah. We fully support everyone, okay? Absolutely I everyone. Know. I know. Yes. But there is stuff going on here. Um, as you know, we've adopted your, you know, it's come from America. And the whole point of us speaking is because I want to show people a glimpse of the future. Now, what I've just said, those statistics, now a lot of people are going to be shocked by that anyway, shocked. because like I said, we don't discuss this um, publicly. Yeah. Um, we, we've also got something called the sexual and reproductive rights everyone has now in, in the world, yeah, you know? Sure. But this is something that's being promoted in the classrooms in Scotland. And part of these sexual and reproductive rights mean 
the state can administer medication to a child without consent. Now, we've been told as parents by other parents, it's a load of nonsense. They can't do that. So what's happening in the States? What's happening in America? Same thing. That? Look, first off, I'm a parent. So that being said, there is no way that I want my child who happens to be nine years old, a young boy, nine years old, if they were teaching things at his school that I was not okay with, okay? Why would I be okay with no parents being able to opt out? I'm a parent. I, I on some level, have responsibility for my child. And that's my child. It's not your child. It's my child. Until that child turns 18, I have no more responsibility. But at this point now, I have all the responsibility of his father to make sure that he is guided in a way that I see fit. So if I don't like something that's happening, how the heck am I not allowed to opt out of it? So when you have in your, we, we're getting that here in California, the same nonsense that says that a par parents cannot opt out of this. No. I will opt out of it whether you like it or not. I'll rip my kid out of that school. So that first off is not okay because that's taking away the rights of a parent. These are children. Now, is that called state owned? Do our, does the state or the country own our children now? People wake they, up. They, Do you know how scary? That is actually scary. And you know what happens? They start with one thing. Me, we all look at the history of the world. They start with one thing, which is this, and then it will go go to another thing and it will go to another thing until eventually we have no control over our children or even our own rights to identify how we need to, to identify the fact that they're taking biology out of the equation. They're dead in Wales, are they not? Taking biology off the table. Yeah, well, the four mandatory subjects now are English, Welsh, RVE, which is religion, values, and ethics. And like I've explained, okay. we're not a very religious country. That's right. And yeah. RSE, which is relationship and sexuality education. So those are the four mandatory subjects okay. our government believe our children need to be healthy, happy, confident individuals. Yeah, so do I. But but what how does that how how can you be a healthy, confident individual when you've literally disconnected? kids from their parents here in the states what they're doing is they're having these trans rights that say that if your child says they're trans they're trans, you're not allowed to push back on them we have something called affirmative therapy which is an oxymoron if you ask me because therapy is about pushing back on somebody it's like i went to 10 years of therapy before i even transitioned thank the goddess that my therapist pushed back on me and that's why i've never looked back and i'm a healthy transsexual person today we see a ton of detransitioners because they're going to affirmation therapy which says you have to say yeah you're trans if you're trans that's not therapy that's like paying somebody to say you're right. <laughs> so it, it, and so that's dangerous because these kids are being told that they're trans when they're actually not. So they're taking hormones or doing surgeries here in the States. And then they're saying, uh-oh, I made a mistake. How is that in any way, shape or form responsible? How are we as adults in the room being responsible for these kids when we're leading them down a path that might not even be their path. This is going to Wales. I see it happening there too. And so now parents have been taken out of the equation. You need to take your child away in America. They can actually take your child away from you yeah. if you say that they aren't trans and you're not helping them move to that space. What? So you tell tell us what is Trans. How how would we know as a parent? How what, that's right. you know? That's right. So that's a great question. It's a very difficult thing because they're mixing everybody's brains up. That's what they're doing, and they're doing it on purpose. They're making it so you don't know what's happening, and then finally you just give up and go, okay, that's fine. They can do it. because they're making it so you don't. You don't even know what trans is. Nobody does anymore. But that being said, it's why I reclaimed the word transsexual. I'm a transsexual person. So let me give you the, the, the definition of a transsexual person. A transsexual person is somebody who has gone to a doctor, a therapist, has spent maybe a year or two there, has been diagnosed with gender dysphoria, which is an actual mental disorder. And then to relieve the dysphoria, we move over to medicalization, which means I take testosterone and I have to use that on a weekly basis basis the rest of my life to masculinize myself 
Then I get something called surgery to masculinize myself. And then I change all my identification to male. So now that's a transsexual person, somebody who lives in the binary of male or female, right? So the opposite is for a man becoming a woman. We want to look feel and act like men and women and walk the world that way. We are not trans, trans is our medical space. And so we are not trans, I'm not trans, I'm a man who has a transsexual medical condition. Transgender is an umbrella term for uh, all of those, how many genders? A hundred? Or two hundred, or that's why you cannot, there's no definition for transgender anymore because it's an umbrella term that's the danger and that's why i removed myself and now in america they say transsexual is a derogatory term which is so insane and just it says to me you're trying to eliminate what trans really is and you're trying to indoctrinate all of these people into this way of being that isn't real so that's the definition of a transsexual and a transgender and they're very so, very different things so you said it was a mental disorder and you yes. have to take these hormones to feel better that's right. that's right so i feel like a man and if anyone sees my life where i've done what i've done you can see that i have become a better person prior to this i was a drug addict i was an alcoholic i was homeless i was smoking crack i mean i'm it was insane my life Today, I'm a businessman, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a family man, I'm, I mean, I'm a million things, and I'm, I'm, I'm don't drink out, I'm just like a person, you know, and, and if you, that's what I want the world to see, that this saved my life, and it's not a joke, and there aren't five million trans people out there, this is a very small space, and I, I don't understand how it became so big, other than the fact that these people are choosing it as an identity choice, does that make sense? I never chose this. This is not an option for me. This was a thing that needed to be done to save my life. It's not something I choose to be, and I don't choose to be trans. So that's why people need to see the difference in somebody like me who has been diagnosed with an actual disorder that actually made me better because I have the diagnosis. If I didn't have the diagnosis, I would have never gotten better. And then you have transgender as an identity choice. So children are taking it on because it's the cool new thing to do. I, I get it. They're being sort of, you know, like be trans. It's like, you know, we're all trans now. We're all non-binary. It's become sort of like a, like a, you know, like punk rock or, you know, goth or, you know, it's, it's an identity. It's not a medical space like myself. Yeah. And that's, you know, what? that is, that's really important. Yes. It's really important, yes. you know, um, it, this is a mental disorder, which needs right. in. It does need therapy. It that's takes right. time time i keep saying it i talk to parents all the time slow down now we have a, we were talking earlier we have a huge amount of detransitioners in this country there's a group of twenty five thousand and growing yet the trans so this is where i'm like wait you know that i'm very people need to understand i'm very distanced from the community because i speak out against the things i don't see I you are about that. vicious attacks you know oh, vicious become... vicious they hate me but they, who are they, exactly. right? Because I have a lot of love from people like you and the yeah. rest of the world, because yeah. I'm honest, I'm truthful, I'm not backing down. I care about children. I don't care what an adult does, honestly. I just, if a 20 year old kid cuts their boobs off, I'm sorry, my friend, but you should have done your homework and I, I can't. But when a, when a like 10 year old or a 12 year old is taking hormone blockers that could literally destroy their life for the rest of the world, of, the, of their life, I have to say something as a person who this saved my life. It, it did nothing but great things for me. We don't have, have enough research in kids' hormone blockers. We don't have enough understanding of what that even means for the future of this child. And look at me, I'm perfectly fine and I'm transition as a child. <laughs> it's not like it's gonna destroy that child's life and let the child grow a little bit. Let the child have experiences, let the child find them space. But to medicalize a child immediately is, is very disturbing for, for even me because I don't see this, I don't see them using it, it here. It, it's, it's a problem here. It's not a problem here, if that makes sense. It's a mental problem that we have, that we have to go to therapy, we have to figure it out, and then we have to medicalize in order to move forward. But that's not the way they're doing it. Right, they're medicalizing. 
But it's, it's not a cure, is it? You know, like you no. said, you feel better, no. but you've got to continue the process to feel That's better. Right. That's right. That's right. I work on myself daily. I go to therapy. I, 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 I focus myself. I eat right. I, you know, I do all of these things to be a better person, but I will never be anything other than a biological woman. I'm, I completely understand that. But to the world, I look like a man and I'm this man and I'm very okay with myself because I work on my brain and I, it's a constant space of working on yourself. This is not magic. All of a sudden, you're just like, I have to work on it. That's what these young people don't understand. It's not magic. You're not going to take hormones and grow a beard and then, then just be a man. There's 100% for the rest of your life, you will have to work on this disorder. And it, that's why I don't want to put a child into this space of disorder. And then they're not really that. And then we've just given them a problem that they never really ever had before. Um, you, you're dead against this whole idea of no parental opt-out. Anyway, you've expressed that. What do you think about the um, the trans toolkit, the confidentiality section in there? Nope. And nope. Um, the, so what the school nope. does, the school is told that they are not to tell a parent that a child has disclosed that they're trans. They are to provide the child with a different name and they are to provide the child with a different uniform. We've also got nine-year-olds as well signing contracts in school, promising to be kind to trans. So what do you make what? of this? Oh, that is indoctrination, number one. Number two, oh my God, my language could be really <laughs> I just want to say the F word, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's fine, I'll clean up the name the F is fine. <laughs> That's insanity, insanity. First off, the fact that no parent, the fact that you're keeping secrets from parents, shame on you. That's number one, teaching a child bad behavior. If my child ever lied to me, no, he knows that. He's never allowed to lie to me, no matter what, no matter what. I won't hurt, I told him, it doesn't matter what you did. I will never be mad at you because you were honest to me, ever. I don't care if you even stole something at the store. I, I won't be mad at you. We'll have a conversation about it. We'll figure out why you did it and you'll never do it again but don't lie to me so what is this doing this is teaching a child to lie to their parents that is at nine years old at nine so now you're giving this kid this idea that i don't have to tell my parents everything yes you do there there are bad parents we all know that horrible parents who do really ugly things to their kids and not understand that they might or whatever is going on there so yeah but those parents are very far and few i think most parents care enough about their kid to want to know what's going on in the school how is that even legal to actually tell a child not to tell their parents what's going on i can't even believe that's legal that that is ridiculous and uh, um information we're actually being told that to safeguard our children the number one thing we <laughs> teach them is no secrets <laughs> it's it's like literally hypocrisy this whole thing is hypocrisy that you're telling me right now. It, I've, got, I've got to go into a court and explain this to a judge. You know, okay, this. So, yes, and I get that. And so what I would do, if I was standing up in front of that judge, I would say, do you have a child, judge? And how would you feel if your child was at school right now doing things, not necessarily trans, let's just say something else, doing things that you did not necessarily agree with. Let's say they were teaching your child about, about how to be a Muslim. And let's say you were not cool with that, but your kid wanted to learn it at school because the teacher told you you had to learn it. But don't tell your parents, that. how would you feel about that judge, right? So you have to sort of put the judge in a space of something he can relate to or she can relate to. That way it gets in them in, in their own personal space. People need to start looking at it as their own personal space. How would you feel if they told your child not to tell things that are going on in school or that they were dressing different or that they were doing things that they that are not allowed to do at home, right? Like all of that, none of it makes sense. That's why I think you really need to hit the judge in a personal space. Yeah, we um we ice we're ice skating uphill on this. We don't get no media coverage. Um wow. we, we've got wow. to raise one hundred thousand pounds to get this you know to take this the distance um the government has got a bottomless purse it's, it's obviously our our purse um that's your money that's yeah, your money and, and, that's right you know the lengths are they willing to go to 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 take full control of our three-year-old children three. um it's sinister it's very sinister. very sinister 
Yes, it is. You know, if I could come there, I would. I would come with you and stand in front of that judge. I would. I would stand there and I would say, look at me and listen to me. I'm one of the oldest living trans male out there. Do you know that? I'm actually one of the oldest living. And that's a big fucking deal. I don't care what anybody says. I made it this far. I'm 60 years old. I know I'm really not. 60. I just wow. turned 60. <laughs> wow, you are looking really well for 60. Really well. So my point being is I, I'm not talking out, I'm not talking nonsense. I'm talking real lived experience. I'm talking about, I know a lot more than a lot of other people, than these 28 year old kids who are leading the way. They don't know shit. They just transitioned five years ago. How do they even know what's gonna happen in 10 years? I know what's gonna happen in 10 years. I actually know. I know the dangers of taking hormones. I know the dangers of not having mental health care attached to it. And they're just leading these kids into a space of danger. They are, 100% they are. What would you say, um, I've mentioned as well, you, you've got a friend um, in the UK, Debbie, yes. the head teacher, Debbie, and Debbie doesn't agree with this trans toolkit. So that's if right. you had a message, that's, that's, a, that's a trans head teacher that doesn't agree with it anyway. So, yeah. but we've got parents that's going along with it because they think that little minute yep. population of the children needs saving. So what That's would right. your message be to parents in this situation that yes. think it's not a problem? Okay, so what I would say to you, the parent, is this. It's not a problem. What it is, is you need to look at your child as a unique child, not as a group of children. Your child is one child who is dealing with something. We don't know if it's dysphoria, if it's uncomfortable comfortability, anxiety. There's a many layers of things that could be happening here. So for you to label your child trans right out the gate, number one is a problem. Your child might have dysphoria. Number two, the most important thing you can do for this child right now is a therapist, not medicine, not any hormone surgery blockers, none of it. You need to get this child into a therapist that is a non-affirming therapist, a therapist who will actually dig deep tough. It's hard. It's what I did. It's why I'm here. You got to dig deep. There might be something else going on with your child. It does not mean your child is trans because they say they're trans. That's the number one mistake we're making. Every child says everything. We all know children say they want to be Mickey Mouse. Ch children say they want to be, you know, a race car driver. They want to be everything. They're just hearing. They're hearing trans. So they're thinking that they need to belong to this space. Now, that being said, I'm not saying that every child who says it isn't. There definitely are children out there who could be trans kids, 100%. But I think they're far and few. I don't think there are as many because I don't think we're doing the homework and we're not doing this sort of, it, this is a layered space. It's, it's a very much of a, a system. You have to get your kid into a system and your kid is not going to kill themselves if that's what you're being told. Your kid might have suicidal ideation, but they're not going to necessarily kill themselves. You can't put that in your brain. You've got to get your kid to a therapist and you've got to love your kid and you care about your kid. But I really highly suggest you don't just start pushing them through the medical system because somebody told you that's the way to go. That's it. What we find here is we've got a lot of um, pushy parents as well. Parents seem to enjoy this yes. kind of attention. Is, are yes. you seeing much of that there as well? Oh my God, there's some crazy lady here in America who's her, her daughter's kind of famous. She was the, she was the mother that put her child in the, uh, remember National Geographics? Her, 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 her male to female child it was on a huge magazine and an HBO special. And so I'm like, and so now she's attacking me because I'm saying, wait a minute here. Not all kids are trans when they, she's like, oh, uh, she actually called me transphobic. <laughs> I was like, wow, you're the mother of a trans kid and you're calling me transphobic. Like you're whacked. She's yeah. wacky. Yeah. She's totally wacky. Munchausen. I, I think on some yeah. level, some of the parents really feel like they can take these kids and like put them on the internet. Who puts their kid on the internet? That's like disgusting and gross. And it means to me, look, I know parents of trans kids and they're real, they're real. They're real trans kids. They're real parents. They're real loving. I see the kids are growing up beautifully and amazing. They don't put their kids on the internet and they're not talking about their kids in a way that's like a poster child, right? This woman is a little bit loopy and she's just been very mean and disgusting towards me. So I don't, so, so to me, that says a lot about her. 
Right, there's um so we are being told that this education has to, has to come in um because of, of LGBTQA plus whatever. It has to come in for that. And we also get in then um I, I hate this term. We also get in then why aren't the LGBT people standing up against it? My argument is this because a gay person isn't necessarily LGBT. <laughs> a gay right. person is <laughs> getting on with their life. That's so right. Why That's why right. would they come out of their houses now shouting and screaming about this? Nope. They're just getting on with their life. That's right. You know, this That's is a small, tiny percentage of people right. who are getting their knickers in a twist. That's right. And getting their time instead of jail time. Um, That's right. <laughs> there's a lot of confusion out there, and there's a lot of wokeness. This is an agenda. Is yeah. this something that should be on the curriculum on every nope. single lesson from age nope. three? Nope. From age three, maybe high school, maybe you know, middle school, we could start talking about like, you know, LGBT, but in a very low thing. I don't the way that they're doing it in Wales is so insane. It's it looks indoctrinating to me. LGBT community is very small. It's not big. Trans is very small. Why are they making it the majority of the conversation and confusing other kids? This this doesn't need to be a platform in a school system. It needs to be a thing that says there's people in the world that live differently. Like there's transsexual people, gay people, black people, and they're different kind of people. And we need to say that, that that's okay and move on. But why do but we I, need why do we need to explain? Like you, you live as don't. a man, okay? Why yeah. do we need to explain that you're a transsexual man unless you're going to be showing your genitalia to children? That's right. The whole point of me transitioning is so you don't know I'm a transsexual man. <laughs> Nobody knows I'm trans. When I go down to the market, you think people know I'm a trans man? <laughs> they don't have a clue. That's the whole point of transition. That's why people like me are not feeling connected to that because trans is not my identity. These kids are being led into an identity of trans. And so I see a bigger picture. I see something that's scary to me and I see what's happening here because my community has been literally taken over by a bunch of wingnut people who want to make everyone trans like everyone's trans now I'm like you know it's going to come back on us tenfold it's going to actually destroy what I have built it's going to destroy our community people hate us more than ever it's not making things better it's making things worse I because think we're making what I think is we've got a system where we victimize and demonize They've got yeah. a victim and they've got to yeah. have a demon. And this yeah. is, it's just playing people off against each other. That's I've right. noticed, you know, a massive split amongst the LGBT platform. That's right. Here we've got LGB Alliance um, yeah. being taken into court by Stonewall to remove, <laughs> to remove their charity status. Um, it is. But why? Why does Stonewall care? so much that there's an LGB alliance. By the way, I'm a member of. So that being said, because that's a sexual organization, it has nothing to do with trans. So I so agree. It's also a protected characteristic in the Equality Act. Thank you, thank you. So why is Stonewall spending money that they could be spending on healthcare for trans people that they care about so much, right? If you cared so much, you'd be putting the money into trans healthcare, but now you're spending a shit ton of money on the LGB Alliance, which should have nothing to do with Stonewall. You see what I mean? So people need to see there's an agenda attached to Stonewall. Stonewall is a crappy organization. They have literally lost their mind minds weird stuff that has nothing to do with helping all of us it's only about trans people now so you know what forget it then the lgb people need to move over here i'm part of the lgb community i am totally a part of that but well, england is starting to see a little bit of sense on this whole stonewall thing but in That's wales right. our leader is always in competition with england they try to make out that we're enemies we're not enemies just they so try nice. to make out that we're in opposition we're part of the united gross. kingdom so then, we've got mark drakeford here with his foot on the gas we've got stonewall again funding from each local authority which is 22 right. local authorities wow. plus they again a lump sum from the government which is an wow. undisclosed figure because they don't think it's in the public's interest to know how much it is well, why don't you make a, I don't know how you do that in that country, but here we, we could put in a request and it has to be public. So we did we just say it's not in the public's interest. 
Oh, you are, you got people on that board who do not like you and who are have an agenda attached to it. You need to get some new people in there. It's not an equal board. It's no, literally, no. yep, it's a biased board. That That's not fair. That is actually not fair. Wow. We are in a really, we are in a really wow. difficult situation here in Wales, but like I said, we haven't had less than content like we've had in Scotland yeah. and England. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think the people here don't seem to understand the severity of this. They don't. And how ugly it, it can get, you know? They don't. They don't. They don't. They Clearly, they don't. That's why you got to keep pushing your voice out. It's the only way we're going to make change by connecting with each other, like how we are right now, and really just putting out facts. Facts, facts, facts will always win. That's why this is happening right now, but I might really, in my heart, I, I see it all crashing. And then who's going to be held responsible? This is what I say all the time. I have a medical condition. I need my medicine. I need my stuff. And these people who are just using our system are killing us here in America because all these states are banning trans health care. That affects me too. So they, they don't see what they're doing as a, as a very detrimental thing. They're not helping our community in any way, shape or form. They're killing a, a lot of us because they think doing stuff that they're doing in your country is killing us. It's not helping us in any way at all. It's not, and, it's go no. and it is going to incite hatred, you know? Everybody's right. protective over their children. That's and right. when, so when somebody's child then falls victim to this agenda, um, that's Disgusting. when we, it is gonna be a bloodbath and innocent people are going to get hurt. That's Nobody right. at the top is going to get hurt. No That's one right. person. That's what I say all the time. I, I, you know, all the trans people now and the kids who are transitioning, who detransition or just decide to go on with their lives and they never were trans. Who do you think's left to clean that up? Me and all of us who actually are trans. We're going to have to clean up a huge mess. That's why I sit here going, half of these kids who are being indoctrinated into the space who are not trans at all, but they're using this identity because they're lost. And then they're going to detransition in five years. And then all of that stuff is going to come back on people like myself. And so, no, I'm not going to let this happen, especially watching children being put in a space that was never theirs in the first. Just go read one detransition story. You'll be in tears. You'll be crying. You'll be like, how are we letting this happen? Where are all the adults in the room? Exactly. And this is it. I feel that we have been our right to protect has been taken away. That's right. And um, That's right. We, we really are a lot of options. And the really sorry ones I don't. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. I feel that, um, well, we know we're on a slippery slope anyway. And yeah. what I really yeah. wanted was this opportunity to kind of show people, you know, that this is real. This is really right. bad in the States. Um, right. Like I said, we haven't had the lessons here yet. We have had some lessons, but not really, really hard and heavy. Everything is lined up. The trans toolkit has been used. The children now have sexual and reproductive rights. We have no rights. Um, we're bigots or turfs. Um, oh my God. God. Invented that word. Trans people invented that word. But the thing it, is, I, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones. That's and right. It will never hurt me. So it's, right. you know, if you're easily yeah. offended, you're easily manipulated. And I that's think right. that sums up. <laughs> people that are uh, shouting this from the rooftops. Yeah. Easily ended because you've been manipulated. That's so. right. That's why they don't like me because I, you know, they call me turf all the time because I believe in women's rights. I'm like, uh, excuse me, I lived half my life as a woman. I will never forget that space ever. I, I actually think I'm a better man for it on some, on some, but how dare we try to eliminate women's rights? Trans women are not women. They are trans women. Stop saying that. That is actually disrespectful to the trans space. You're a woman. I'm a trans man who's actually a biological woman. So if anyone's going to say trans men are women, <laughs> it should yeah. be that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <Believe stupid>. um, <laughs> yeah, well, this is it. We need to we need to come together. We've got to get this information out there. Right. Like I said, we are concerned. Our two sex education documents out of the 14,000 words, boy, girl, man, woman, male, female has no mention. Wow. Gender is mentioned wow. over 60 times. Wow. 
Wow. Uh, we've got gender fluid uniforms, so we don't have unisex anymore now. It's wow. you know, this is indoctrination. They yeah. are using this terminology to make you think we're being this inclusive <laughs> and friendly and everything else. It's just a farce. You hear well, it. How is it inclusive? Words. How is it, sorry, how is it inclusive when you're le- eliminating men and women? a woman how is that inclusive it's not it's far exclusion. from inclusive it's exclusion you know it's that's totally right exclusion. that's right that's right and if it's people can't see this anything other than an agenda there's nothing really we can do for them you know well that's why we just have to keep speaking out and little by little i change people's minds daily people write me constantly and say thank you for standing up thank you for speaking out i get it now i'm you know and they respect me because i am an elder and i do have experience i'm not just talking out of my butthole <laughs> i'm just actually really saying things that actually ex- i experience and you know, um, I, I will stand with you because I see your mission and I see what you are trying to do. You're trying to come back to reality. We cannot teach children that men and women don't exist. That is unbelievably ridiculous. The, ha- the 99% of the world identifies as men and women, 99% of the world. So if we're teaching kids something that's 1%, how, how is that even fair? That's what I don't understand. That's what it's people need to really- It's not ethical, is it? You it's know, not, it's, totally it's not, it's not, it's not. Okay, well, I'm going to um, try and wrap this up now and stop the yeah, recording, but we just want to give um, everyone a shout out. If anyone is on this journey um, and you want to follow Buck Angel, you can find him on Twitter, YouTube. He's got a website, lots of information. If you're going through this journey with your children, you want some advice. If you're an adult, you want some advice, please look up Buck. Like I said, I got some lots of information from him. When we're tra- traveling around the country, I'm always talking about stuff you said in your videos. Thank you. And I just think, I just think you're an inspiration. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for actually standing up and speaking the truth. Thank you. And that's it means what a this lot is about. Me. This is it's not it about being right wing, left wing. It's that's about right. doing right. It's about the truth. And I'm telling you, I'm only here because of the kids. Like I said it before, I, I, when adults can do what they choose to do. I am here for the children. I care about those kids. I'm an, a parent and we cannot be treating children like they're just some commodity. And they're just some kind of thing that we can try this medicine on. Whose kids are we experimenting on? Not my kid. So we need to figure some stuff out. But I appreciate you very much. I appreciate that you care. I appreciate that you keep moving forward in the world. And together we can make the change that is the correct sort of change. That's what it's about now. You know, um, technology speeds things up. But at the end of the day, we can use it to our advantage as well. And um, speed up getting this message out there. Our children need us right now. That's right. They That's really right. do. You, you know, this is not, this is not an overreaction. This is nope. not prude parents. Our children genuinely need us to stand right. up and say no. Enough. Enough is enough. I'm I'm there's standing no up as a transsexual. Yeah, there's no negotiation. As a trans, I will not be part of that agenda. That is not right. And um, I don't care what people think about me. I I really don't, as you know that. And so I'm not I'm not I'm not trans to be you know part of a community. I, I'm a human who cares about people and cares about making a better world and coexisting. That's what I care about. I don't care about being trans. Like everyone needs help and we all need to coexist and figure it out. So thank you so much for caring. It means a lot to me. Oh, thank you so much for, for doing this. Um, the, our team will be absolutely thankful. We're all so Excellent. thankful. And I'm going to end the recording now, guys, but that was back Angel. Again, I can't thank him enough. I've stalked him long enough on Twitter. I do hope I understand you're very, very busy back, but I do hope that maybe we can reconnect another time. Of and course. like I said to everyone, please follow back. He is the man for this information. He's been in this game a long, long time. Yeah. He is what we should see as a poster boy, but the poster boy is saying no. If the poster <laughs> boy is saying no, he's saying no for a damn good reason. Thank you all for watching. And guys, keep up the fight, keep up the momentum, keep sharing this information, and we will do it. Let this country on the map for all the right reasons. Thank you all for watching. I absolutely love that interview, guys. 
It looks like I'm the only one on, does it? Yeah, I absolutely enjoyed that interview with that, guys. And like like Buck said, biological female. You know, this isn't um, decisions you take lightly. Affirmation therapy is not the way forward. You need to push back on these things. You need to make sure you're not making um, mistakes. You know, this is real life, guys. These are ideologies we cannot have promoted in school. If we was going to teach this kind of thing in school, I'd want Buck Angel to do it. Um, or Debbie Hayton, the head teacher, Debbie Hayton, as well. He, he said he's good friends with Debbie. Um, this is wrong. This is a whole new level of wrong. And you heard his opinion there, dead against the uh, um, removal of parental rights. He wouldn't have his child engage in this kind of um, education. So I think that speaks, speaks volume, doesn't it? You know, it... Um, that says a lot. You're on mute, low love. Yeah, what I was what I was just saying, if you've got an actual transsexual saying, hey, hang on, this agenda shouldn't be pushed on children. Like he's he's walked he's walked the walk, you know, he knows what he's talking about. And you know, I'm just gonna go back to something we said before about, you know. This, this, this is for, for adults as well as children. What we see, hear, and think becomes our reality. So when yeah. you've got someone that's consistently saying, you could be born in the wrong body, or, you know, let's talk about all these, these different, you know, millions of different LBGTQ flags. If this is what children are consistently being told, then this is going to become their reality. And, you know, that, that's, we don't want that. You do not want children to be led down the wrong path. Yeah. Now, even if right, a child might sort of express some kind of, um, some kind of behavior that, uh, that they may sort of think that they want to be the, the opposite gender, surely, as a responsible, loving parent, you wouldn't want that, even though you would support your child no matter what, you wouldn't want that for them because you know they are going to be facing a lot of difficulty and that is going to be a harder path than a path of, say, accepting the gender you're born in. So, you know, it's, it's, it is about acceptance and it is about like, what you hear, what you hear and, and see is what, is, is what you're going to believe. And another thing, because uh, we're only focusing on the children as the victims, but how about the siblings? I mean, we all, we both, we all yeah. three of us know what happened to David Reimer's brother. Yeah. I mean, this has That's a massive a really effect on the point, family. That's a really good point. Uh, we've had plenty of discussion around the children. We've had plenty of discussion on the parents. But there's never been discussion around siblings. And I think that should be a, do you know what? I think that's an area we should explore. Definitely. Because, because that is a topic nobody discusses, and that would be interesting to explore that word, you know? Because yeah. mental health issues, it doesn't I, matter which, family, which member of the family have them, they're going to affect everyone. They don't I know that myself, having a child, exactly. I know that myself, having a child with additional needs, I've had to spend just as much time on the other child to untangle any... Um, you know what he's lacking confidence and you know i've had to untangle all those things and and talk about how it's his condition and you know there's a, there's a lot of work involved um to try and meet the needs and get the balance right anyway with any mental health issue so but this and i was just sorry i was just going to say you've got a child that ha comes with a kind of label yeah has had an assessment how about those kids that have been presenting really well, doing, you know, good work, all round good eggs, and then all of a sudden something happens and they retreat into their shell and they become surly and they're not communicative. This happens an awful lot. And with children like that, it's, 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 you can't prepare the rest of the family. You can't tell them what's going on. And also, John, you raise a really good point there. Yes, my son has um, a diagnosis, but it took 
a very, very long time. A hell of a lot of assessments. Assessments with the family, assessments without the family, assessments that I wasn't comfortable sending him into a room with a stranger. Um, there was a lot of work that these conditions are in my family, you know, two generations above. Um, there was a lot of work involved. There was a lot of um, professionals involved, always multidisciplinary. So if that that is missing yeah. from this topic. So you raised a really good point there. Yes, my son has had an assessment for it. He does have this diagnosis, but he didn't go to the GP and get the assessment diagnosis there and then. It was a long, drawn-out process. It, they had to get it right. Yeah. But the same is not being applied to this topic. No. So, guys, we're going to jump topic now because another reason we keep hearing we need this education is because of access to porn. Um, we agree access to porn is damaging, and that's what our next guest is about now. Um, but we're not actually um, addressing the dangers of porn in school. We're saying it's healthy in moderation. We do know as well, so anybody watching this, please Google what I'm saying. We do know that some schools have asked children to define different types of porn. That has happened in Scotland and in England. Now, I do remember one, it was um, a, a teenage boy in Hull, 18-year-old boy in Hull caught his 14-year-old sister um, Googling the different types of porn during lockdown. And that went viral because he obviously kicked off about it and they said it was a mistake. Now, if you actually try to access that article now um, and you type it into Google, what you'll actually find is porn. Okay, so you're not going to find that article. You're going to have a whole page on all different sex with schoolgirls, schoolboys, whatever you put into that search, you can't find that article easy, right? So that's a concern. That's where it lies there. So I've gone to look at an old article and I've come up with old porn. These children are being told to look at the different types of porn and define the different types of porn. So they too are faced with an internet full of porn. So that tells us the issue is cannot be addressed at school, even if we were teaching the dangers, you know. So the fact we're introducing it is a bad problem for a start. And how can we possibly, if we was teaching in the right way and we was teaching the dangers, then how can we possibly do that when we have it at the click of a button, you know? So our concern there is big tech and government. They are the ones that's exposing our children to this filth. The schools then are attempting to address it under the guidance of government who are exposing our children to this. and um, But they are doing it in a way that's introducing them to different styles. And we've seen this in the videos now, haven't we, and Joel, we've seen this in the videos, how they make it look fun. Amateur porn, mature porn, hentai, far cry, BDSM, all the music, the colours and everything else. So it's very appealing, you know, very, very appealing. And it's interesting that this is their approach to protecting children from online harms. Yeah. This is a difficult subject because a lot of people out there do watch porn. Okay, it is part of their relationship and part of their sex life. And I don't want to speak for absolutely everyone here because I can't, but I do know with the guests that come on now, I, I know Carl will openly admit, you know, we've watched porn. You know, we have watched porn, it's the truth. You know, and denying that, we would be liars. But knowing now the effects it has, it, you know, it actually turns people physically sick. So mm -hmm. this is why it's important we address this topic mm -hmm. in the way that we're going to address it now. And there's no better way to address this than with Carl <laughs> and George. Well, Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, then. Well done. You're still up and running nine hours, nine minutes now. Guys, you've got less than three hours. You've done absolutely amazing. It's been fantastic. It really, really has. Thank you, Kath. And before you start now, I just want to put a reminder out that this is a sponsored podcast-a-thon. 
The sponsored link is in the comments and on the description. Please do give as much as you can. Even, even if you can just afford a pound, please give that and share the fundraiser because we really do need funds to fight this cause, so uh, to fight to fight this RSE. So, you know, any as I said, any amount counts. And we're at 1,089. So by the time it gets to half nine, let's get that up to, let's say 1,200. Let's reach for that by nine o'clock. Come on, everybody. There's 29 of you watching. Everyone give a pound each and that'll... That will certainly put By us nine in a o'clock. Are you going to put us all in a time machine now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say. tell us that. You didn't it's tell us that. It's nine. <laughs> Pay past nine, no, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's 18 minutes past by, by, by <laughs> half past nine, I meant. Half past nine, let's get it up to 1,200. Come on, everyone. It's a shame that we've lost our stream on Facebook, it is, because I that's know. how we get in the most views, you know. So that's, um, the views just going to be dropped at that point. But anyway, guys, thank you both so much for coming on and talking about the topic that does... Um, caused a bit of a stir on facebook charge just you yeah yeah i'm sorry about that um i did cause <laughs> up a, a lot of I, I didn't expect it to be honest i talked about it with with catherine and lou in the last um show and i didn't expect uh from the people in the truth of community to have uh, to get the backlash that i did um i thought i'd test the waters because you know there's always people coming out of the woodwork and Catherine saw the comments. There was hundreds of them, even on just one post. And you know, if we've got the truthers doing this, then um, we're, we're we got we're in a bit of a problem there, aren't we really. Yeah, mm. yep. yep. So that's what I, I don't mind. I'm speaking up for it. Uh, speaking, sorry, against it, and I'll be the first one to speak up against it because I know the dangers of pornography coming from. A, I'm an ex-sex addict, basically, or, or from porn. So I know the dangers of it. And I don't want anyone else to go through that kind of danger. Uh, it really puts you in a dark place. And there's too many people that are in denial about this. Mm. So come mm. on then, George, tell us about, about the dangers. Tell us your, your story. Well, come on. Well, first of all, I mean, I, I used to be um, a therapist years and years ago, and they were telling us to to recommend pornography to clients um saying you know they didn't tell us though like where porn pornography come from they didn't tell us you know any of the dangers of it they were just saying it's healthy it's healthy and of course they're the experts they've mm. got to be right haven't they um so uh, i carried on doing it that i i stopped watching pornography about six years ago uh, i was moving away from it because of spirituality i was starting to be a bit more enlightened with myself um, but it does put you in a dark place. It isolates you. It uh, your your whole life revolves around it, you know. And it's really really sad. It, it ended up destroying me um, completely. So I've had to rebuild myself. So I think there's so many men that are in denial. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of women that are in denial. Um, but. I want to be open and vocal about it to encourage uh, other men to to speak up about it, to get the help that they need. Because the problem is there's not a system in place to help ex porn addicts. There yeah. isn't. Right. Yeah. I've done it myself. I've I've gone out of it myself, and that's to get into spirituality. That's to get into how the brain works I mean, i'm no brain expert but you get to learn the basics of it and you get to learn why the brain becomes addicted to this um so i want to encourage men to speak up because at the moment they're either watching the football or they're watching porn or they're wearing skirts so where are the men basically <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, you hit the nail on the head, George. It, it, collectively, people are in denial about pornography, just primarily because the majority watch it. You know, when you yeah. look at the views that these, when I was doing, you know, the research to write that blog, when I was looking at, um, and I didn't even, you know, because like Kim said, I admitted I used to watch it, right? And I, yeah. I am absolutely sickened by it now. The thought of it makes me want to throw up. I really can 
you know, I, I'm, I know I'm quite vocal with the way I feel about things, as people will know on Facebook and stuff. But, you know, it is a very, very dangerous, dangerous thing to be to be showing children. But I was looking at so I was reading this report and basically it was on like I hate to even say it, but different genres of pornography. So since your inception of pornography, which would have been, you know, sort of two people having sex, maybe a third person, you now got I don't even want to you've got teen porn, you've got child porn, you've got midget porn, you've got trans porn, you've got you've got all these different genres, but they just don't pop up off the back of nothing. Right. There has to be a demand for these sorts of things. And this is that this is where the addiction side comes into it. And people really don't understand the basically the porn addict's brain neurochemically is exactly the same as an alcoholic or a drug addict. They basically use the same neural pathways. Right. Because they release dopamine, which is the pleasure chemical or the craving chemical. So because they're so that's why we derive pleasure from it. You know, if you take drugs, I know some of us you have in the past or whatever, you derive pleasure from it the same as you would, you know, um, with, through sex. And like even a heroin addict will tell you, you know, jacking up will feel like an orgasm. Do so they very, very, very closely linked? And they are in the terms of addiction as well. So when watching pornography obviously so when with a chemical let's go to the chemical drugs first because we're all more aware of this than, than anything else so if we're taking um any sort of you know illicit drug right you build up tolerance after a while so you can you know you manage more of it you need more of it to get less of a kick well that is exactly the same as what happens in um, a pornography addiction because of the similarity in how they work with a chemical drug so what happens is they build up tolerance, right? So you, you uh, uh, then you get to a point where that's no longer working anymore. So looking at that, you know, man and woman having sex on there no longer is enough to satisfy. So something stronger is needed or something novel is needed. So I don't know if you've heard of the Coolidge effect. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. But basically yeah. what they did is they did an experiment, right? They put a rat in, um, a male rat with seven seven female rats in heat right and the male rat basically mated with every single one of those rats until it was absolutely exhausted right and it even with the female nudges in that laboratory setting it wouldn't move until they added another no, a new rat female rat into that and even though the male rat was absolutely exhausted it got up to mate with the new partner so every time you see a porn scene, every time we uh, it changes to a new porn scene, it's like having a new the new novel partner. So and they did studies on this to show it anyway. They were basically showing that showing pictures of a you know men were aroused at a certain level, and then they cut off. They they stopped getting aroused. But once they introduced another you know another por another porn film or another porn clip, they got them instantly aroused again. So you can see how this this builds up. So when we release dopamine is a protein called delta fos b that's released at the same time and this is it's actually good in a way because it helps the brain remember things right so if you like say you're, you're practicing a you know a basketball shot or something like that and you and you finally get that perfect shot and you have that little burst of joy that's dopamine but then you get the delta fos b that helps the brain to remember how to do that because the brain is really 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 clever but delta fos b is is it can cause addiction so every time you're getting those is because we got this constant dopamine hit because you can get a constant dopamine hit from pornography mind right and this is why we have a problem in the real world men can't even get an erection with a real partner because the dopamine is they've completely rewired their brain and this is why it damages relationships it doesn't it doesn't people think when they're in the moment or during that arousal state that that is that is doing them good because it feels nice this is the problem we got with it i'm sure heroin feels nice too but do you know what i mean that that's that's the problem with it that's the becoming addicted to it um i forgot where i was now because i went off on a tangent i was the on chemicals the in your brain dopamine and delta fos b yes yeah, so, yeah. so delta fos b strengthens the neural pathway so every time they see a new shocking image a new novel image that delta fos b will will solidify that neural pathway so that the brain is only stimulate stimulated by those right so then your addiction that's where the danger comes in and it really 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 does now so porn consumption in adults causes brain 
atrophy, right? Which we know is that's the pre. So we know the prefrontal cortex is not even developed until your mid twenties. So if you're watching porn before then, you're going to have an effect on that because obviously that's the that's the the you know the rational thinking brain, the logical thinking brain it would stop you, you know. You, you know, making you make those decisions and things like that. That's not developed. But even in adults, what porn consumption does is waste away that the prefrontal cortex anyway. So you've got that huge, it's, it's actually physically damaging. People don't see that. They just think, oh, you know, they're addicted to, it's actually physically, it's a brain wasting disease. It's a brain, it's not even just responsible for that. It's responsible for memory loss, anxiety, depression, social anxiety, people isolate themselves. There's a whole host of issues that come with brain, uh, with porn consumption that people just don't, they don't realize. But there are people now, many ex addicts who come out and say, you know, it's actually, you know, like when we're going to detox from, from any toxin then, right? You're going to have like a flu-like symptoms and things like that. Well, that actually happens when people stop watching pornography if they're addicted too. They get like, not only do they get low libido, depression, they get insomnia, they get irritated and things like that, but they actually get flu-like symptoms. So it is possible to to stop watching porn. You obviously got to want to, right? But it takes, and I think there was like, something I read where previous porn addicts had said to people who were addicted to porn now, and it was three things. And they said, number one, it's a hundred percent fixable. Number two, um, oh, what was it? You, if you want a normal sex life, you don't have a choice. And number three, oh, I can't remember the other one. Hang on. I'll see if I can find it on here now because it's important for people to know, because I know there'll be people watching this, right, who maybe won't admit it to anyone else, but yeah. in, they know this is the thing. It's, it's an isolated, it's an isolated it's addiction. Different. So unlike um, other addictions, and so a lot of other addictions are more social addictions. Yes, yes. You know, yes. Right? So but this addiction would be a private addiction. So you yeah. would see changes in somebody. So say as a parent then, okay? So as a parent, if my son was in his room watching porn the whole time i wouldn't know he's watching porn but i would see the effect on his mental health yeah i would see you know how how low mood he is i would see all these things but i would never ever ever connect it to porn because something else something that he does in the privacy of his own room yeah yeah it's also and to then... do with the p programming they'll pick up by watching porn um the, the, how they treat women because they'll, yeah. they'll they'll treat them as the lower lower sex. So, like I mean, that was a prime example on my post, Catherine. You come over, I had to block this guy in the end because he was just talking to just like a piece of crap, basically. And you can just tell straight away they showed themselves up, you know. Yeah. And then you know, and then they defend it, you know. And yeah. It's a classic, you know. You have to really deprogram yourself. You have to notice that kind of behaviour. And and deprogram it, uh, yourself and to to work on it, you have to notice it first. But that's it is, it's key. like it's it's like any addiction, thing. isn't it? Go on, Kim. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say you have to notice it first. You have to recognize it. Mm. So going back to what I said about how, how I would not know the cause of my son being like that is the porn. That's what's happening with the vast majority of the population then. Yeah. So do you think there should be something that a doctor should be asking when somebody goes to them and says they're depressed? Do you think that should be something on the tick list? Number Check one should be the first question, in my opinion. I Now I realised how widespread this is. And I'm going to give you a really scary statistic now, mind right? And it's going to horrify you. But these are the facts of the matter. They did a study in 2015, right? And they found that 22% of... Um, under 20 sorry under 10 year olds accounted for 22 percent of the online porn consumption of the under 18 category a quarter of them were under 10 right i i just the thing is it's like dal said if you remember a couple of years ago when she was in the classroom with two two young boys they were eight years old and she heard one of them say to the other group oh, well, there was a group of them you need to watch porn hub well, because they got it at the click of her fingers look and they are and they're at and you're right George the other thing the reason I wrote that blog was because it was 
pre-internet days, right? So this was on the this was on the the pornography magazines, Playboy, Penthouse, and Hustler. That was all that was available. You didn't have online porn, and I wanted to show the severity of what it was like, even pre then. Do you know what I mean? And there were cases, and they they're horrifying in the eighties, right? Where like there was a ten year old boy and his eight year old brother. They had. They had basically killed an eight-month-old baby by using a coat hanger and a pencil because they saw a cartoon in their mum's sex magazine, right? So basically, they murdered this in infanticide. You had another one who watched, who saw, who picked up a magazine in his in his home, and he raped. I think it was the ten-year-old neighbor and her eight. No, the eight-year-old neighbor and her four-year-old sister. These are real stories. These are pre. These are these kids finding these things under the under the chair or in mum and dad's bedroom at home. So if you're gonna and that they're just two little small amount small ones like they're they're far more than that they're far more than that. So now look what we got look what we got online look what we just we, remind you know, everyone that it takes three tenths of a second for an image to be imprinted on your child's mind three tenths of a second that statistic comes from Doctor um, Judith Reisman I have to chuck that in there Kath because we talk yes, about it true. Is, and people need to understand how quick. That image can be imprinted because people are going to think you're talking there by the extreme level, right? Mm. The extreme, right? They've had all of this magazine now, and this really bad thing has happened. But the reality is this: three tenths of a second. Yeah. So that what bridges that gap in the middle. Yeah. Like, yeah. And the pro the problem we've got then is these children obviously they have no capacity of what they're doing. So you look, you take an example like that with a ten year old or an eight year old has has done something like this to a baby, and it's horrific beyond words. But that eight year old didn't. In fact, the police officers at the time of the on the scene with the coat hanger and the and the um pencil had said whoever left the magazine there should be held accountable for murder because it wasn't re. You know, the eight-year-old boy didn't know what he was doing. He just saw it in a magazine. He doesn't, he no capacity to understand that. Do you see well, what I mean? So, so, there's, so with that, then, there's knowledge without capacity. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yes. And um, we've we've had a case where there was a six-year-old boy and a three-year-old boy, and they, they were stepbrothers, they were. And obviously, we, we knew something was going on in one of the other houses because things had happened before. But on this occasion, the mother had walked into the garden, the front garden in the summer, and the six-year-old was saying to the three-year-old, no, I need to put it in there. And do you know what I mean? The knowledge, uh, and again, concern for the six-year-old, because where's yeah. that six-year-old had that from? Something's happening to the six-year-old. So yes, we're concerned about the three-year-old, but the six-year-old as well. You know, this doesn't just come out of thin air. No, yeah. I know it is. It is so so dangerous. And when you think about it, so I've been. I saw Joan hold it up earlier. The um, the Esther McGinney and Alice Hoyle book, and I had been. I still haven't finished it because I was reading the other one for a bit. But I was when I was reading that, it is all sex positive. So like you said earlier, they're not showing. They're not giving you the consequences of watching pornography. No, not even a little bit. When they're using the likes of Gail <laughs> Rubin and people like her to to push forward, it's a se it's very sex positive. So they talk about you know BDSM and kink and stuff like that. Now this this is for like age eleven to sixteen. I would go absolutely mental if if a teacher was teaching one of those lesson plans to my child. It is a sex positive way. You are, and even with sending them home to look at the um, and not even that. Let's to, they're going to find it because. The littler, littler ones are being told correct terminology. And I did it just because I wanted to see what it was on Google, right? So I typed in Google. Well, I did it with all of them. I typed in penis, vulva, and vagina. And at the top, yeah, it gives you the diagram, as you would have had, as I had years ago when I was in school, right? Just a diagram of it. But then it's like the third or fourth one down is porn. Mm -hmm. So you're telling those children to type in these, and they will type it in. They do. And it's bringing up all these recommended then down the left hand side, right? This is, it's it's gone way, way, way out of control. It really has. And well, it's causing. Have, um, you're saying that about um, they will type it in. So for people that think no, a three year old can't do his internet or whatever, we had an additional needs child. Um, she couldn't read or write, but she had access to a phone. And in her search history, which her mother checked regular, she had 
search for a father having sex with a 12 year old right she had to speak that into the phone okay she had to speak that into the phone so she because she couldn't read and write she'd learned about the voice thing which small children know they don't they have do. to be able to spell them they don't have to be able to type it okay but this is what i'm saying there was a child with additional needs that had searched for that and it took us weeks to get the police to come out to take this phone you know wow. and there was that was i had gone in gone into the uni i had spoken to my mentor and i had said look and i knew it was you would question yourself you always question yourself right and i think you know am i reading too much into this and when i went and i and i said is this knowledge and she said this knowledge you know mm. there was nobody around that child who we knew was 12 year old so we couldn't say us oh, because our sister's 12 or, mm. or it was knowledge so this was a child with additional needs who, who could actually search that verbally you know, so this is a really, guys, it, we, we already in this dangerous situation. We already are. We're already missing children. We're already failing children, you know. This is the point now. It has to be the beginning of the end. This is what we have to learn. I don't want to be sat here in five years' time listening to more horror stories. I want to hear mm. success stories. That's what I want to hear. Yeah, and you know, well, something that Judith Reisman said, and I wrote it in my blog, and it and it struck me like really hard, and I was like, gosh, she is absolutely right. So what she says, her resolution is on this, right? And it seems like an impossibility, but I don't know. I I think there's a lot of people who are coming around to this now as well, anyway. But she said, look, she said the women they can they can raise the alarm right they can show the atrocities that go on with pornography consumption to each other and they can do all that they can be the you know uh, activism on it but it's the men right and that's not to say that women are not um you know because some women are but it is if you took it away women would be okay most of them would even if they're involved in it now yeah. But right. So the only way you're going to do it is for the men to stop, stop subscribing. Right. And that is because the sex industry is too big. But I just want to say something for people out there. Right. Because there are many people and this is my argument with it. There are many people out there who will say this line and it, it winds me up. Yes, it's harmful for children, but not for adults. Can I just say to people then? So you're saying something, you know, is harmful to children. You know that having it around is going to be harmful to children, but it don't matter because of the adults. Do you see what I mean? Like that is highly, highly selfish attitude to have. It says and you can't pretend right there, to care about children if you want to keep it round so that you can have a wank. Excuse me for being crude and whatever, yeah, but this is what it boils down to. It's the safety and protection of children or your fake arousal. Because now you've got men under 20, the biggest, you know, erectile dysfunction is caused by pornography, mind. So you're sending these kids off to go and, to go and wank as much as possible because, you know, that is really healthy for you when in actuality it's really, no. really not, not at all. And it's causing problems. And again, you know, they used to treat them. I don't know if they still do it, but in the medical field, right, to treat people for impotence, what they would do is come in, they'd come in and they'd give them a porn magazine. But you're completely missing the point because the boys can get, they can, the men can get erections with porn. It's the real partner they can't now. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Because they've yeah. rewired their brain to only seek out the porn. They're not even, you know, porn is, is, is a stimuli. At, it's not sex. So they're seeking kinks. out the stimuli. They, they've made kinks mainstream. You know, they yeah. bring kinks into the classroom, guys. There's all this stuff we discuss in here, right? It is fine for our adults, okay? But this it is kinks. Yeah. It's not that we do it in privacy and they are kinks and fetishes that are now in our children's educational documents. It doesn't yeah. matter which level they're at, they shouldn't be in the school full stop. Right? Exactly. No, shouldn't be on the internet with easy access, you know? But the thing is, as well, like when you're talking about all these kinks and pornography, it's almost it is making sex into something quite dirty, isn't it? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, it's making it is. dirty. It's making it sort of, you know, and and it, they're, they're, they are convincing young girls, well, and young boys, to be empowered to. to my do favorite that. term. My favorite term of all, I gotta say, sex is natural. What is? Um, sex is natural. Oh yeah, sex I know. Natural. Yeah, the but not exchange while having sex is natural, which yeah. is having a detrimental impact on your relationships. Yeah. Having sex 
it's another not one that's a, a common one is is that it's it's reduced rape, and I can't believe how much <laughs> how much it, it, I hear it everywhere, right? But when I've sort of posted that on the comments of your article, the amount of people that will not read it is because <laughs> of that fear. They know they're going to be wrong. Yeah. yeah. I've right. got that in there. I've got the Kaczynski yeah. study, study in there. I know which one they're referring to as soon as they say it. I'm like, you're on about the Kaczynski study that I yeah. know they've not read. All they've done is yeah. read that little, little box on the thingy. Do you know what I mean? And it's, yeah. of course they haven't reduced. Well, they, 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 they would send uh, articles of themselves, like, and I would read it. I would take the time out to see what, what, what a load of rubbish it was. But then they wouldn't read your one. I thought, I'm, I've compared both. Yeah, but they don't want to. They don't want to, because your one is going to hit them really at home. It, it is so straight to the point, and they're in such denial. When yeah. when they're in that much denial, it, they've got a long process to snap out of that. Because what's really happening in that denial, I'm telling you for a fact, that they're suffering, and yeah. that's the worst yeah. thing about it. Because yeah. the controllers of the world put these methodologies out there to hook your brain they don't care what you're addicted in there's so wow. many things that that they put out there to, that they just want you addicted to one thing because you're you're imbalanced straight away in the brain and you're never going to use your neocortex from that it's it's an addiction to the right side of the brain but yeah. they are suffering they are um, bad. And they've done a mm, number of the sex, the liberation movement mm, has done a real massive number on men in particular, but the family, because they, that impact on the man has affected the woman and the child and the family unit. Yeah. You know, it, it's been a it's been a, a a constant thing from as we know, you know, a long time. It's been decades long, this has, and it really has it's weakened the the, the male, you know, to the point where we, it's really, really, really bad. It's it's completely screwed families over. It really yeah. has, and oh, totally. um, but not family. even just that. It's not healthy <clears throat> for a relationship anyway. For yeah. the for the same, Lucia, you hit the nail on the head earlier on. I think um, when you said, and it is right. I know that we've all. Been, I was led to believe, oh, you know, go and play the field, do whatever. This is, you know, but actually, when you think about it, what's wrong with just meeting somebody? really getting to know them so that you know that you've got something in contact you know something in um what's the word common with them right so then you have got a base for a family because how many of us get in relationships we have kids we've got nothing in common with a person because it was about sex yeah. because that's what we're made to believe it's all about sex and then when people realize they think then there's something wrong in their relationship because they're not having as much sex as they mate yeah. so they jump ship not realizing that you're just going to keep doing this because you're focused on the wrong thing. That's not just men, that's women as well. I'm not, you know, yeah, that's, but yeah. that's both sides, definitely. Yeah. But that's what it is essentially because there's no connection anymore. There's no yeah. connection between the mind. It's all about sex. And that, and that is because the schools are liberating them most definitely now. And this is what it is all about. How can they use RSE, put that as a mandatory subject and take out science, which does include <laughs> biology. Do you know exactly. what I mean? Like, it's like, biology reproduction all these things are exactly the same. It's all science. They remove which it. should which should be taught do you know what i mean it's yeah, like this they is... have to remove science and they because they have to all these things they got to remove science they yeah because remove... biology completely contradicts sex. what they're trying to say doesn't it so they'll be like oh sod that we'll just we won't bother having that as a mandatory subject anymore sod it we'll just put rse in there and it's like what nuts yeah I know, and like, you know, with this thing, this this obsession almost about, oh, oh good sex, I have a good sex life comes after a relationship is has been, you need the foundation of the relationship first before you, you can have a, a good sex life. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's not, no, I agree with you, Lev, I totally agree. They've spoiled that, though. They've spoiled that, that well, nice This is where all the revenge porn is coming from, do you know what I mean? People feeling um, hurt and scorned and... You know, and in actual fact, you, you just got into there for the kink. Yeah. You got images of yourself in those positions of the kink, and now it's been used against you because you didn't stay there long enough, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's created, it really has been, it's been a public health crisis since the 60s, and we're in 2022 now, mind. Do you know what I mean? We've... I don't even know how we're going to stop it other than spreading the word as much as possible because we the thing is those children are easy to access that computer not a problem like and the thing is because 
they then becoming addicted young they don't see a problem in it so they're not the adults telling them it's wrong for them when they're in the height of being aroused all the time they're going to be like do you know what I mean? It's it's really difficult one. I think it we've really got to is. find a, a solution yeah, like for men. Sorry, sorry, George. No, sorry, go on, lad, go on. Oh, go on, you carry on, love. I was just thinking, like, what I think, sit down and think at home, I think about this a lot. We've got to think about, because the men, obviously the men are supposed to be the protectors and all of this, right, the children and, and, the, and, the, and the women, right? But they're watching an industry where, where the children and the women are being trafficked, right? Mm. Some of them know this because some of them are truthers, but we've got to try and come up with a plan where uh, a solution for men to speak up about it. Because yeah. if you think about it in their, in their shoes, they got a lot to lose because if they're in a relationship and they, their misses don't know that watching porn, that's going to affect the relationship already. So they, they, they're feeling cornered. They probably do want that help, but they yeah. don't know how to ask for that help. Yeah. You know, so they so they're not speaking up. They don't know how to. They probably feel very ashamed to do. And, and these are all the feelings that I, I went through. Even I was single anyway. But I've tried to come up with a solution. I've I've tried to do my own podcast um, about human consciousness, the brain, and addictions, and I linked it up with with pornography. So they have to start thinking about themselves. They have to start realizing they're in so much denial. You know, and and they're in disharmony with themselves. We've got to try and make it a safe place for men men to come forward and say, you know what, they're an addict or, of porn, but they've got nowhere to go to because there's not a system in place. I hope yeah. they can go to my podcast because I openly say I'm an I'm, I'm an ex porn addict, and it's got I've got no problem with saying that. Yeah. Because. Yeah. Yeah someone's got to start the train if you get what i mean i was just gonna say george this is why it's such a breath of fresh air having you on because you're a prime Mm -hmm. example you'll give it is really brave to come out and speak this is why so many are in denial i don't doubt that people want to come off this mind myself i really don't Mm -hmm. many of them don't even know that it's an issue at the moment but there will be people yes you're gonna say many of them probably don't even know they won't they won't it's normal look around we we live in a very hyper sexualized world so Mm -hmm. but there will be those that do want to when it's people like you George that come out and speak that will give them the confidence to think I want to do something about it you know we only need some people to because like yeah. you say a lot of them are backed into a corner they don't know what to do they don't know where to go do you know what I mean so it's like we need to make is if we can get more people talking about it and whatever again bringing it to the surface is the only way that we're going to deal with this problem for people well do you know what you've actually given me an idea guys I'm actually going to go and speak to a GP here and I'm going to ask him to pilot it in their surgery. First question they ask the man is, are you addicted to porn? Yeah. And I know that I know the exact mm. GP I'm going to go to. I know he's a great man to speak to. People in the area would just say, look at him and say, yeah. So I think yeah. that's a really good. I think this has been a really good session because it's got my brain ticking me now. Yeah. And I, it wasn't, like, you know, Kath, I haven't gone around to reading your blog. I wasn't oh, yeah. even aware it's long. of the physical implications like that, uh, like the depression mm-hmm. and stuff like that. I wasn't aware of stuff like that. And given, like, how many men now have we got on Facebook doing 25 push-ups a day for men's mental health? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. I would even go a step further than that and, like, the GP to ask the men if they watch it because they may not actually be aware yeah. or think that they're addicted yeah, that's a good I point. Mean, so we, we can go to this G- We can put our heads together. We can actually go yeah. to this GP. They've said we can go and train them on a Tuesday anyway. And all we have to do is just get a little pitch, go to them and say, look, this is what we found. Pilot this. See what's going on. Yeah, the thing it's is- not going to hurt. Is it the thing is, right, they ask you before you have a blood test. Um, They ask you, have we got any tattoos? Have we been to this country in the last so many months? They're asking you all these questions before you have blood tests anyway. The only thing is with it, and I'm only saying this because I'm actually reading sexual behaviour in the human male now, right? But it's the beginning bit. I am read the child bit. I read that again. And you got to watch, not got to watch, because some people will admit it, but a lot of people, even to the doctor, are so shamed by it, would lie and say no. So yeah. the, that's mm-hmm. the only thing about getting a, a, a yeah, true but that's figure. What I'm saying. So this is a doctor. The doctor I'm thinking of isn't a doctor. He is a GP. But he's yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So he's already got a rapport with them then because that that's, there you go then. This is what I mean. So the, the one I've got in mind, like there's usually when you go to a, a UGP, you've got the doctors are usually from a different place. Um, But this particular one is from the area. They've got the same accent. Do you know what I mean? It's right, but... Yeah, that yeah. kind of language, not not you know stiff up. Oh, that's all right then, because like once that. they got a rapport, they should be fine. That like they should they should be. It just, I reckon you'll find it does. But people, it's the one thing that people wouldn't think. So if they're addicted, or even watching porn, they're addicted or whatever, right? And they're ill, and they're aware that you know toxins build up in the body, and they chew. They're looking for all these different things. It could be that. Because it does poison the body, it poisons the mind, it poisons the body, neurochemically poisoning as well. Yeah. So, do you know what I mean? It, it will, we'll have to figure it out like that, we, I we guess. We work on this, guys, and this is what it's yeah. about. This is, we are not out there saying, stop, 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 stop. You know, and leaving yeah. people high and dry on anything that we discuss, on anything that we're addressing. We are looking for genuine solutions. We want to make yeah. this world a better place, you know. Yeah. That's what I think about, and that's why I want to say to anybody listening, even women listening that that who watch porn, right? But men as well. I'm happy for anyone to contact me, right, to ask for any kind of help to get them out of this addict addiction, basically, you know, because I feel like they haven't got anywhere anyone to go to because there's probably so many feeling i did have not only people on that post were attacking me but some were saying i don't know how to stop they yeah. do they do want that help yeah but there's not a system in place um yeah. for them but I, i'm i'm happy for anyone to contact me and i'll i'll help them i'll, I'll guide them out of this darkness because it's what it is it's 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 really dark yeah. and the one thing that i didn't have was anyone to go to how can you go to somebody like uh, to somebody with this kind of problem that you yeah. constantly w watch porn got to try and make it a, a safe place for, for someone to go to and it'll be completely confidential you know, we've got a lot of material now to to uh, help people. Help, with these exactly. Kind of, yeah. And there is a, a really good website, and it's actually all pornography, and it's called Fight the New Drug. And the new yeah. drug is porn, obviously, right? But they have got some incredible information on there. I would guide anyone who's looking. Down. Yeah, it's a Fight the New Drug, absolutely. Well, how could people contact you, George? Where, where can they find you? Well, unfortunately, because I don't share, I've still got my Facebook, but I've stopped doing the Facebook thing because it's just like the censorship is terrible. But you can still get me um, uh, on my Facebook Messenger. Um, I can give out my email or, or phone number. I, I don't mind if anybody wants to. Oh, should we just tell, right, guys, anybody watching this needs to get a hold of George. Email us at publicchildprotectionwales.org and we will pass any details. Yeah. I'm still on Facebook, so you can send me a message, anyone. So it, it's that. We've, as I say, we've got, I can start them off with, with my podcast. Your article is absolutely like, that will shock people. That yeah. They need some sort of shock factor as well. Yeah. Um, and, and to that will that will be enough to get them to stop. But some of them are not going to stop that easily. They they need some serious <coughs> serious help uh, with yeah. it. But I, I I'm just want to I want to help people. I want to be a voice. I'm trying to do it a different different way rather than Facebook because it wasn't working out for me. But I just want the men to to come forward because you know it's not easy for me to do. But I don't mind doing it because at the end of the day, it's for the children, right? And that's yeah. that's the main main thing but yeah i wouldn't, wouldn't mind having a bit of an arm, a, a army of men as well to yeah. try and you know but to be, to it's be like with you you lot i think i, I think did, just put enough to shine really <laughs> I think men would be the more powerful voice on this front. Yeah, me, that is a fact. That is yeah. an absolute yeah. fact. They they are the most powerful voice on here, which is what Judith Weisman was saying in effect, you know. So it would be great to have people to join, George. And thank you for offering that because, you know, lots of people, I hope there are people watching who will take you up on that, George. Yeah, we, you yeah know, I hope so. It's a lot more common than people think, right? You know, yeah. it really is a lot more common than people think. And we don't know a lot about it as well. in terms of, you know, like Kim was saying earlier, it's a, it is a price. You know, the other addictions are social and they, you know, your drug addictions yeah. are social. This yeah. is a very isolating addiction that, and yes. that's going to bring its own problems. And, and, you know, even not to leave it on a mega thingy, but we're talking, 
what it can cause in you know vulnerable adults as well especially vulnerable adults with with additional needs um what it can do when they when they're exposed to this material you know it's so so dangerous guys we just want everybody on board please check the fight the new the fight the new drug it's re honestly it's really really good and if you do want to have a look at mine mine is obviously is it's overall so it's from the 19 60s and 1970s right up to date so that's on exposing the lie dot info forgot my website then in the news section um pawns of the industry and if you want to to connect that with the other things on it is i did the one on john money as well the john joan case which is a good that's quite good that um, blog and ellie bands ed educate and devastate i called that one but obviously yeah, you know, so educate and devastate that was actually sent out in the um school gate campaigns newsletter as well so guys that oh, yeah, shows, how, about that. That shows yeah. how credible it is so, i mean there's outside rse um campaigns sharing Kath's controversial website. I know because I was thinking that I thought they probably wanted to share the article, but thought, oh, they're going to link up to all her sweary videos and stuff, and they wrote, they shared it anyway. But there's another one on there as well, just about Kinsey, and that touches on the porn industry because obviously pornography was made mainstream through Alfred Kinsey mostly. Yeah. So yeah. is it? It's a, it's a sort of all mixes together to give you the sexual liberation movement and, you know, all of those sorts of things. Any questions, just give me a shout. But, and, oh, any of the other things for the podcast-a-thon as well? Because we, we, I don't know if you've got time to um, share that video. You probably haven't now, guys. But there was a video that we shared on the la last podcast-a-thon. It was only 35 minutes, short, quite hard-hitting. It's called Raised on Porn. You'll probably find that on YouTube. It's about 38 minutes, I think it is. It's well worth a watch as another sort of, you know, a deterrent for people to see how, how involved and how dangerous that, that this industry can get. So if you want to have a look at those, go to libertytactics.co.uk and all of our interviews from the two podcast-a-thons were before then. And if you want to find me on Facebook, I've just been... Well, I'm on Cat New Watkins now anyway. I don't think I've got access to my other account anymore. Um, so, yeah, I'm on that one. So any questions, guys, just ask. But I am quite glad because even though we say, oh, it's quite a silent, you know, it's, it's a shameful addiction. It is. It's, it's a lot of guilt involved in it. I have noticed that my blog, that one, has got the most, so it's one of the most recent blogs I've done, but it's got the most views. And Lou said that when me... And Alex Thompson did one on pornography, um, just on Liberty Tactics, I think it was back in September. That was right at the top, which tells me it doesn't matter. People are watching it. They're listening, right? And the information that we're giving is absolutely spot on factual. And whether people like it or not, the people who do watch pornography will relate to a lot of things that we've just said here. Whether they, you know, whether they admit that or not they to anyone else they will identify with things and you know and maybe that's enough of a deterrent mm -hmm. to go do you know what maybe we should look at this and see it in a different light who knows in there but at the end of the day we've got to keep this away from the kids that is the thing we need to do and um they the schools are sending them to it yeah, yeah. they are they're encouraging it yeah. it's this one who adds as well like whenever you hear uh you know if you look back at in history at anybody who uh, you know, ended up being a an evil figure, if you like, uh, an evil figure of, of of history. They're usually addicted to porn. <laughs> when you go, yes. when you it's norm, that is normally part of the story. Sadism so, and masochism; those are the things that end up happening with pornography use after a while. And you know, that's where it, that's where the damage is. Just mental. It's just so unhealthy and so wrong on on so many levels. To be fair, to be fair, most of the sex offenders will admit that they, they will. The yeah, In yeah, fairness, they yeah. Will. yeah, they you will, know, and that's true. When, There's go on, when, sorry, actually, Kim. when you're actually faced with a criminal conviction for whatever reason, and and you know um, whether that's harming an adult or a child, or you know overstep the mark, whatever, um, that's when you actually evaluate your life. And because you're faced with mitigating and aggravating factors. And it isn't until you're actually faced, like when you actually go into prison or you sat there with your solicitor, I think that's when reality really kicks in. And a lot of the time then, um, like like the, the offenders, that's where the conscience comes in and the guilt. 
and that's yeah. when they really think about it and that's when they will admit then that actually yeah it was porn and if they are sorry about what they've done and they genuinely do want to be rehabilitated that, that's one of the first things you know that, that they will address like and like, like i said they, they, they admit it they, they do, admit it. They nobody do. wants to be a criminal Nobody no. wants to be a criminal. No, nobody, nobody sets out to do that, do they? They don't go, no. I want to be a, a child abuser when I'm older. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. So there's something that happens along those lines. Oh, right. And this, we are, we are creating this hypersexualized society. We have created it. And this is the result. So we have to do something to, and this is what this whole thing is about, you know, bringing awareness and getting us to unite and mobilize and protect the kids in that comment. You know, they, they, they are the most important. And we got to put all our selfish things aside now and and, and come together for them. That is bottom line. Yeah. Stop feeding your brains with filth. That's, yeah. What, yeah. that's what it is. The more yeah. you feed your brain with the filth, the more it needs. And yes. that's, that's when we end up getting these, um, you know, people turning into sex offenders. Love yourselves yeah. instead of Kinsey's kinks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I like that slogan. I do. That's a good one, that is, Kim. We right, well, we'll go because I know that you got. Um, I know you. You obviously you don't want to be. I, I know you're probably off schedule a little bit. So, thanks for having me on again, guys. You've been thanks brilliant today. Up. No problem at all. Be watching the rest of it now until um. Thanks till for you joining finish. us, George. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on, and I'll help. I'll support you, ladies. Uh, no matter what, I'll, I'll, I'm right behind you, and thank you for for doing all that you do. Because without without you, ladies, you're the heartbeat of it all. We wouldn't be able to be fighting this where we are. So I want to play my part, but I can't thank you, you, you lot enough, to be honest. You are the light. And I just hope the men can step up as well. I don't mean to have a go at the men. I, I'm attacking the industry, the, the yeah, porn industry, yeah. not, not the people, um, because I understand where they're coming from. But I want them to, you know, play their role as well. But, in, you know, I don't want them to feel like I'm having a go at them. I want them to come forward and say, look, I need help. For this because the men need to be behind you ladies that's what we yeah. need to do yeah, yeah. George. George you're a real brave man I've got to say you know sort of coming out coming out here and admitting you know like what what has happened to you your addiction your previous yeah. addiction and the fact that you've got out you've come out the other side and now you can help other people it's amazing that's what Perfect. I want to say yeah definitely I mean that's the whole thing it is for, for it for is for the children to to help them because they're the truth they're the light I just want more men to to sort of join the small and I think this might help this might help this this I hope so. I think, um, no, I think, I think no. so yeah brilliant all right guys mm. love you loads thank you so much take care well everyone. then take care we'll see you soon have a, have a 10 you. hours now bye lovely <laughs> Ten hours. Ten hours now, guys. Ten hours. Now. I know. Wow. wow. I am starting to feel it a bit, actually. I don't know about you two. <laughs> oh, this light is doing my head in. Hey, this <laughs> light is doing my head in. I've been thinking all day. I'm not doing no longer than thirty minute lives. <laughs> Right, everyone, we've got a, a special guest coming on, a parent who is absolutely horrified by this RSE. Before I bring her on, I just want to remind you this is a sponsored fundraiser. The fundraiser link is in the description and is also in the comments. Please, 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 please because we really do need to raise as much funds as possible in order to make sure that we can continue this fight. We're yeah, not going in. I get it that we've lost our feed on Facebook because we were up in yeah. the 80s on the news on that. And um, I, I think that's where we get the most traction. Do you know what? I might do it again tomorrow night on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, though, even though we have we are losing our views on Facebook, they, it has been shared. I know Phil is sharing it. He's actually filming it and sharing it. So we are oh, still getting people. Phil. Oh, yeah. Phil no knows. But, Phil uh, no knows. He's, he's, <laughs> he's a good one. Uh, well done, it's Phil. Phil, Phil full news, please. Phil, plenty of news. That was Judgment Day, wasn't yeah. it? Plenty of news. Plenty of news .com. Brilliant. I know he's brilliant, in all fairness. Right, I'm going to bring Nemo on. Are you ready, lovely? I think she's ready to come on. Let's bring her on. Hello. How are you Yay. doing? I'm great. How are you guys? 
Wonderful. Yeah. How are you doing, lovely? I'm great. I'm great. I've been watching you guys all day. Sorry, I'm a bit banged up. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you for yeah. joining us. Not feeling well as well. Yeah, no problem. I couldn't miss it. <laughs> Thank you for the invite. It seems to be a lot going around, doesn't it? And you do you exactly. two sound proper bummed up as well, love you. Yeah, I know. It's the little ones, you know. They bring home everything. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's that season as well. It is the season of mm. coughs and colds and flus. So, uh, this is what I see, isn't it? It's kindness and sharing. And yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you for the invite. Uh, no, you're very welcome. We've been we've been meaning to have you on one of our shows for quite a while, actually. So it's nice to uh, nice to eventually, yeah, get you on. So Nemo, like obviously, when did you first hear about the RSC? When did you first? Just recently, actually, I've, um, in the summer, um, my daughter's school, they said that um, they asked for they sent a letter home asking for consent to teach them. Um, the pants rule and all that stuff so I was about I was like hmm and then they mentioned that RSC is going to be mandatory as of September and I didn't know about that so I did my own research and that's how I stumbled on you guys um and that's was it that was a bit concerning because they went off for summer break um and that's when I did the research and I was looking into it and I was like okay this is a bit um red flag, red flag, red flag. Um, so I didn't quite understand why they were asking us for that, um, the consent to allow our children to partake in those lessons. Obviously I've opted out, but they mentioned that the opt out would be um, taken away uh, in September as well. Again, it's, there's no opt parental opt out. So I was a bit concerned and um, that's what kind of um, got me doing more research as to um, what what is RSC? What is it about? Where where are the origins of it? Where um, like the history of it? Where it came and how it came about? And then that's how I read about the consultation reports. I didn't know I didn't know about that. Um, the framework, UNESCO. So it was very it was eye opening. Um, and when I found you guys, I just jumped on the bandwagon and um, came to your protests and supported you and um, just really try to share um, and bring awareness to everybody in my community, um, some of the parents that I, that I speak to on a day-to-day -day in, in, in our schools, um, and in, in, in general, any parents that I, like within the community, just to raise awareness, because a lot of people weren't aware of RSC and, and, and its contents and how um, damaging the origins are, you know? And where yes, because this is the surprise, and you know, the Welsh Government have been preparing this for the last five years. Yes. We've yes. known about it for, well, the new, new of it sort of before us, but hmm. I think there's a bit of feedback when I talk, isn't there? Is it? There's no. It's probably just me hearing it. Yeah, so the Welsh Government have been preparing it for, for the last, yeah, that's, I think that's better, Kim, thank you. I think the Welsh Government have been preparing it for the last five years. Hmm. We've known about it for like, like been fighting against for the last two and a half years, yet there were still parents when it was actually coming into the schools that still didn't know anything about it. So they have not, the Welsh Government haven't been very transparent. And obviously, this is going to cause concerns. And uh, they are, they're still hiding a lot, aren't they? Exactly. They are. I, because I, I do know that you are one of the mums that has been trying to get information from the school as well. As in, you know, you've been having correspondence with them. How, how, how forthcoming have they been with your questions when you've been asking them? I think I think we've been going around in circles. <laughs> and unfortunately, um, I, I feel like when you ask a lot of questions, you're then labeled as um, difficult or um, challenging. But really and truly, um, parents who are following the ch children's education and who, um, I mean, I'm an educator as well, and I'm my child's first educator. So education is very important to me. So um, what I do is I've been in contact with the head teachers. And been, I've been trying to ask for lesson content, and um, and I'm getting nowhere. <laughs> so it's very frustrating as a parent um, to hear that this curriculum is supposed to be um, progressive and um, given such great outcomes, but then at the same time, you're finding it difficult to get lesson content, you know? Yeah. This is it. This is 
this that, is, that's, it's a red flag. It's, it's it's concerning as a parent. It's something that all parents should have in on the at their fingertips. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Like it should always be a. Th- it's a. It's a three way relationship, if you like, isn't it? Like teachers, um, school, parents, child. Exactly. All, we should all be in it together. It's like if my. Ch- I, I. You know. I remember going back to when my child was little and. Um, you know, my daughter was having uh, struggling with reading. Mm-hmm. It was my responsibility and the school's responsibility. We worked together. It's like because, you know, I, I would go to the teacher maybe for some tips, you know, to to, to get her to read and that. So this should be this should be the case in every aspect of the child's education. Exactly. So how how are we supposed to have a working partnership if you're not giving me the lesson content. <laughs> How am I supposed to consolidate her learning if I don't know what she's learning in the day? Do you understand? So these are the kind of questions I've been asking. And um, uh, I've been getting <laughs> the runaround, you know, the generic Welsh government um, statement. It's a reasonable request, you know, like like Jeremy Miles, the Minister of Education, said the curriculum is available for you all to see. Exactly. So, who's lying? Exactly. Not only that, the commissioner, the children's commissioner, put on her website that we should have access to the lesson content, the activities, and the um, uh, lesson content activities and resources. So, so have so, you written to the children's commissioner to say this is not happening? No, but I've quoted her in one of my emails to the head oh, teacher. Right, right. Yeah. And still so, nothing. Still nothing. No. Well, so it's unfortunate. It's just, I mean, what's that? According to the judgment, this is all down to the teachers and nothing to do with the government. The government just make the guidance yeah. and everything else is the teachers. Yeah. Whereas you know the teachers are telling us they've got to wait for it to come from the government. Yeah, or get or get a second opinion from the local authority. Or advice from the local authority. And the local authorities shut down on all parents. There is no yeah. engagement whatsoever. So, like I said, we're, we're, we're going around in circles, unfortunately. And as parents, it's frustrating because um, you're promoting this curriculum and you're saying that it's progressive and that it's for young learners to be ethical, critical thinkers. Um, but then you won't share lesson content. So that's that's what's so concerning for all of us parents. Where's, where's the ethics and critical thought being done? Exactly. Yeah. So these are the questions that I've been asking and um, haven't been given a straight answer, unfortunately. So how do you feel about today's judgment? A little gutted, but um, like you said, this is just the beginning, right? It's not the end. And so um, we're just going to have to buckle down (laughs) and keep keep moving, keep going, you know? Let's not stop. Let's not stop here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, then, you know, and what we've done here at Wiz is something that nobody else has achieved anywhere in the world. You know, uh, we've seen um, Muslims and Christians joining in America after how long? 10, 15 mm. years of education? Mm. Mm. Ours hasn't even come into full swing yet, and we're mm. already there. We're joined. You know, yeah. it is, there is no right. uh, we're joining, we are one, you know. Mm. We are Welsh and that is it. Mm. Yeah, we said, united, united we stand, divided we fall, right? We have to be united on all fronts. When it comes to the children, the children are at the forefront and we have to be united. And and at the end of the day, public child protection. That's our main yeah. goal, no matter that what. It no matter, does exactly what it says on the tin. Yeah, and, and it's it, it's no matter what race, what color, what sexuality, what ethnicity, whatever, what class, it's, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. What's important is protecting our children. As a mother, that's my number one number one um, main reason for living is to ensure that my children's welfare, mental, spiritual, um, social, emotional well being is at the forefront. This and my greatest talent is taking something really negative and turning it into something positive. So mm-hmm. the more negativity we get, as mm-hmm. a rule. Yeah. Is the more positive it's going to be in the outcome, mm. you know. So I, I we really don't care. Just keep <laughs> it coming, keep it coming, keep it coming, because they're going to route their avenues in the end. Mm. Because there is only one avenue for us, and that is child protection. And mm. like I said earlier on, I became a mother the day I conceived. Nothing's ever going to change that. Mm. Nothing. So nothing's ever going to stop me fighting. Exactly. Yeah. So that's something the government didn't bank on. 
That's mm-hmm. something you can never take away. You can never take away maternal instincts. Yep. Absolutely. A mother, a mother is yeah, a mother is a, child, a child's first teacher. I'm my child's first teacher. I taught her how to walk, taught them how to eat, how to sit. So I should be at the forefront with these teachers and having that working partnership to ensure the the what health and well-being of my child. So if we take the most vital person out of the equation, how do you how do you think the child would develop? That it makes no sense to me. Like the parent oh, trying to opt out that that's just mind-boggling to me. I don't understand it. Well, society is doing its best, isn't it, to try and sort of keep mm. the mum busy in a career that she hasn't got time to actually be a proper mum. Society has done its best to do that. Um, you know, us as mothers, our children are more to us than anything else. Absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll climb the highest mountains for them. We don't, you know, we'll do whatever it takes. Now, I think the good thing about, obviously, you know, we've lost this court case, we've lost this this part now, we are going to appeal, we're not giving up. But the good thing, even though we have lost, there's so many people that are aware of it and so many people that are going to be looking at what their children are learning and being quite happy. Whereas before, you know, if we had been doing this court case, perhaps there wouldn't have been so many people aware and, and looking into it. So I do think that it is going to, you know, sort of lessen the vulgarity, if you like, the vul- vulgarness of this uh, education that's coming to school. We know it's going to be bad, but we've all got eyes on it. Oh, exactly. like there's parents in every school that is going to be checking and, you know, putting pressure on the schools. So, you know... Well, yeah, I- we can push in some of the blow now, can we? You know, there is lots of positives from this, you know, like in the judgment... In the judgment is states, you know, that if the teachers actually overstep the mark, they'll be in deep trouble. Well, for us, that's fantastic because the teachers don't understand the boundaries of this. Mm. You know, they, they are not going into this with their eyes wide open. They are not being properly trained. They're not educated on these topics. They cannot teach these topics in a critical way. Well, this has been reinforced now by Justice Stein's um, judgment that if the teachers step out of line and the teachers have got no clear boundaries, you know, clear guidelines, okay, mm-hmm. then essentially now the the responsibility lies on the teacher's head. So, yeah. you know, we do have a person of blame here, which I believe that's wrong. Yeah. I don't think that's fair. fair. I don't think it is fair. not fair, but mm-hmm. if that's what it takes and we have to make an example out of someone, Mm-hmm. They should have supported us from day one. That is the route we will go down. We are mm-hmm. seeking accountability and we will make examples out of people. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that will, I'm very sorry, probably be an innocent teacher, mm-hmm. just as the casualties are going to be innocent children. Mm-hmm. Okay, we can't help that. Mm-hmm. Collateral damage. Yeah, it's out of yeah. our hands. That's but the way I it is. I- Unfortunately, I think, but the thing is, I, I think Joan mentioned it earlier in regards to um, the the level of responsibility for, of these head teachers, right? They're given the code and then they are responsible to create a curriculum for their learners in their school community. I mean, you can get a head teacher that's woke or you can get a head teacher that, um, is very religious or has, you know, philosophical convictions or whatever. Um, but I think I think it's it's up to interpretation, and I think that's what we're finding very difficult as parents is something as publicly funded education shouldn't be left to interpretation. There should be a standard level of of a curriculum, and how would it be standard if you're giving the option to the Welsh government's given the option to these head teachers to do as they please and to take from what they want. Like I, I really find it very. I don't. I think public education should be standardized, just like testing and assessments are standardized. I think the curriculum should be standardized. It shouldn't and be that national was, interpretation. Exactly, and that was the whole point of the national curriculum. Exactly. Yeah. That was why it came in in the first place in order mm. to standardize education. There should be no room for manoeuvre. No, not on this at all. Topic, you know? I remember someone saying to me once, are oh, you twisting it? Damn, no. yes, I am. 
<laughs> well, of course I am, because that's what <coughs> that is going to do. Not that I have to do a lot to twist, but mm. I have to think like this, because that's that's how you safeguard. Mm. You know, so if you don't want my opinion on how predators are going to approach this, don't tell me this is to prevent predators. Yeah, safeguarding, yeah. Because I, I'm not going to shut up one of the dangers that I see are going to be the dangers I shout from the rooftops. Everybody has a different problem with this. Mm -hmm. I am never going to say um, one person's problem is less of a problem than another person's problem. I am of the opinion that everybody's valid, everybody's mm -hmm. opinion's valid, everybody's opinion should be respected. Absolutely. And if we come to a, a situation where that cannot happen, we avoid the situation altogether. Simple as that. Simple you know, as that. that's, that's equality. Yeah. Inclusion. You know, people, people see it, well, it's mad. Like, look at me, I, I'm barely five foot tall, right? So that's what I'm here. Now, let's, let's look at equality. I've just been given a box, a cool box now, 50 centimetres diameter, and so have you guys. We've been told to stand on our box. I'm still the shortest you. We've been given an equal-sized box. We've all been given that equality. I'm still the shortest you. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So in that case... My box should be slightly bigger than your boxes, so then we've got the equal opportunities, and we can see at the same height. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And this is this is where they're getting it wrong. You know, they, they yeah. think the quality equality doesn't exist. Let's look at equal opportunities instead. You know, even if right, somebody give us now, if we were given a thousand pound each, right, we've all been given a thousand pound each to spend on what we want. That thousand pound means something different to us all. Yeah. Mm. Well, we've been given the same amount for some other do. Equality. Mm. Well, no, actually, because I might only be able to buy a loaf of bread out of my thousand pounds because I owe the nine hundred and ninety on gas and electric. Whereas Lucia, then maybe you can go and splash you was on a pair of shoes because it's just free cash to you. Mm. Nemo then might have an unexpected bill of five hundred pounds, so she's only got half the amount of money. You know, and the story's gonna be different for Joe. Different, so yeah. that is not equality, but we were given the same amount. Mm. You know, this is the same with, with the men and women, isn't it? When you say like women have been fighting for equality for you know since day dot, but when you think of you know equal opportunity, what is it? Equal opportunity doesn't mean equal outcome. Even if we've got all got the equal, like if say me and you know uh, uh, my husband, we decided to do a sprint. We we were doing a sprint, you know, a race. Now, we could do the same exercise and be eating the same food, but chances are he's going to beat me. Mm. Because, you know, he's a man and he's mm -hmm. more built. To, he's able to sprint faster. So, you know, it's like, and this is why... You both, both have had the equal opportunity. You've had the equal food. You've had the equal opportunity to exercise. But on the day, you can't perform equally. Mm. Yeah. There's always going to be one better than the other. This is what we should be teaching. This is how we should be teaching, eh, you know? Yeah. We should be teaching how do we get that person to perform at that level? Not mm. you all got to do this to be this. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah blanket teaching. It doesn't work yeah. like that. But what we've actually got from the judgment is this RSE is no different to teaching piano. <laughs> wow. Sick, isn't it? Which, you know, you again. You know what? With what you've said about um, equality and everything, and how kids fit in, and obviously they're not going to. We're not designed to. We're all unique. So it is a nonsense the concept of it. But with something like RSE and, and specifically gender ideology, that how many opportunities have you got to fit in there? Just think about it. Either, well, between you could a hundred be and a hundred. You could be virtually anything, couldn't you? You know, you could be yeah, a gay pilot. I don't think the BBC is dishing out on that day, John. <laughs> exactly. And apparently in, um, in schools for A-level for, I can't remember the subject, what is it? Um, social sciences or something like that, you know? Oh, sociology, I bet. That's the one. But uh, I've been told by the mother of a student that for the module on gender, her daughter was being taught there were 300. Oh, for goodness sake. Wow. 
That's an well, illusion. This, wow. this is the interesting thing about this education, that it is appealing. It is appealing to some people who can't fit in, who mm -hmm. don't really know what direction to take in life, who, you know, there might have been... I but don't know. know what direction to take in life. So she had five no, 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 no. You know? Yeah. Exactly. You don't even know what you want to do. Look, nine of the ten of us don't know what we want to do as a job at 16. Yeah. yeah. Or even at university, we don't even know what we want to study. And well, sometimes look, we change we change midway through. <laughs> yeah, but, well, life had to kick the crap out of me for me to find my path. Yeah. You know, I was just woo in life, you know? That was just me doing my own thing, being me. <laughs> but even like as children, we don't want, like, you know, you encourage children to do what they're good at or what they enjoy doing, and that's great. But you don't expect them to make a, a, life, a lifetime decision when they're listening. That's what parents are there for, Lucia. That's what we as parents are there for, to, ed to guide and educate our children and to be their light. You know, they're... they're, they're um, like what do you call it? Their um, their guide. You know, their light. Yes. We're, we're we're supposed to help. That's what we. I mean, like like I said, this RSC, right? You wanted to teach. You want children to you know learn about gender and all that. Why don't you lower the driving age if you want children to have all these rights? Lower the yes. driving age. Let them drive as well and drink as well. Like it, it makes no sense. It's it. It's mine, like I said, mind boggling. I, the thing I is, I could it. do with a chauffeur, right? So it would really benefit me right now if my 14 year old could drive me around. Right? <laughs> that would really improve my quality of life. Of life. Right? <laughs> so I think it's a really good idea. We should go down that road. But they wouldn't yeah. love it, would they? No, no. But, but you I mean, you imagine are... if we did that. If I, had, if I had my son driving me around now, the age of 14, I'd be like, but officer, look how tall he is. He's taller than me. Yeah. How mature he is, officer. Mm. Like that's going to stand up, A, in court. In court. In criminal court. B, the family court. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, but it's, pro it's improving all about. Look, officer, I can get lots of work done in the passenger seat. Look how many family days out we're having now, officer, you know? Look how good he is on this roundabout. None of those. It doesn't wash. Okay. It's <laughs> ridiculous. It's ridiculous. That's what I'm saying. Like children are children, right? That's why parents are there to advise them and to guide them, right? So to take the most pivotal person in their life out of the equation, I think it's wrong. On all it's levels. And it's dangerous. dangerous and it's wrong on all levels. And and how do you expect a working partnership with parents? If you can't even provide the lesson content for them, like I, I, I just don't get it. How do you expect me to consolidate her learning if I don't know what she's learning? <laughs> How do you expect me to have a working partnership with teachers when they can't provide lesson content? It's, it's, it's a two-way streak, and I feel like uh, parents are constantly being like battling for something that should be given to them at their fingertips. I don't, I don't understand. This curriculum is supposed to be um, progressive. It's supposed to um, create ethical. Um, children, children who are able, um, are capable and and um, and able to make these decisions at the age of five. <laughs> so um, I don't know. I just they don't know what color beaker they want to drink out of. I, no, I, I, never given a toddler the wrong color cup. Oh yeah, it's, yeah. Meltdowns, oh. meltdowns. <laughs> oh, half no fairy like a toddler's had the wrong color cup. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, well, we're introducing these concepts to children. We don't know if they like spaghetti today or beans tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I don't have like, like that. Like you know, I've had that with my son as well, where he's changed who he's following on YouTube because his friend changed him. Yeah. And then a year later, he had a meltdown. Because he stopped following him and now he's 240 episodes behind. <laughs> that is not really happened, you know, and that's not like peer influence on a YouTube video. Yeah. No, so I just think the children don't, don't, yeah, they don't have the mental capacity um, to understand or critically think um, about all about adult ideologies. That's, I don't, like gender theory, children do not have the mental capacity to understand um, the difference between um, a feeling and biological sex. Like if you yeah. feel, just because you feel like you want to wear a dress today, 
and pants tomorrow doesn't necessarily mean, oh, you know, you're the opposite gender, the opposite yeah. sex. It, it, it's crazy, you know? Just to get back to what you were saying about you as the primary caregiver, notice the phrase I've brought in, you <laughs> as, as the mother. Let's use the correct word, the Thank mother, you, the, mother. the person who gave birth, birth. to yeah. this particular child we're talking about. Yeah. Everyone's losing sight of that because now we have primary caregivers. Yeah. The vocabulary yeah. is changing yeah. in order to shift the, yeah. the caring adults aside and, and demean them, give them another name. If, if we're in a country where we can hardly define what a woman is, mm -hmm. in 10 years' time, will we be able to define what a mother is? Exactly. Well, well, we can't, though. Well, we're a father. Yeah. We've already we've been told today that our children are state-owned anyway, so what are we complaining about, John? We are primary caregivers. Yeah. Know, your place. know your place in society, girl. Wow. Primary caregivers, all right? They are state-owned children. That's crazy. And, and like I said, like I said, um, you change the language, you change the narrative. You know, you if you say um, a primary caregiver or pa or guardian now, it's not mother or father, parent. Um, it's crazy. And even even now, we've gotten a notice, notice from the school saying that they're still going to teach friendships and physical health. So, um, where is friendships? I thought it was relationships and sexuality education. Yeah. So where, where, what, why, why was the language changed? It's so that it can be more digestible and that p parents won't question because with relationship, there's, there's sexual um, connotation, you know, mm -hmm. um, relationships. If you teach relationships, it, they're like, oh, it's family dynamics. No, you're going to teach sexual attraction. I'm like yeah. they, really, they really insult our intelligence and it's just frustrating. No. It is. And it is sexual attraction. They keep saying it's not mm. sexual, but like, you know, mm. this is why I make people read the sexuality section on the mm. matrix of the World Health Organization. Mm. There is nothing about sexuality in it at all. It's mm. all sex, 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 sex. sex. sex that is the difference between all different relationships. So mm. why do we have to teach children about friendship for well, they don't have friends? Exactly. Or why do you have to teach them to share? They just naturally share. Yeah, Why and if you need a curriculum, you tell them you've got to share. It's a simple yeah. job done. That's yeah. I don't. I don't understand why do we need a curriculum to teach children how to share a toy? Oh, and then even consent. Oh, consent is um, consent to share a toy with another child. No, um, consent is sexual in nature. <laughs> exactly. Like the age of consent, like. Parental consent is different, but I don't know. I just, I just find it frustrating as a parent, um, uh, as a mother, as an educator, my child's first teacher. I just think um, if this curriculum is set out to have the results that they say it, it should, then they should be forthcoming and they should have, there should be a lack of transparency um, yeah. between the schools and the parents. We should be able to have access. We should no be able one, to have access to the lesson content. Sorry, Lucia. I was going to say, no one's going to object to a teacher teaching your child to be kind or accepting or, you know what I mean, or share. Share, yeah. you know, it's good to share. It's good to be friends with people, you know, and they don't even, when they're talking about accepting different groups of people, you yeah. don't have to go into this LBGTQ. You just take you just tell your child to be kind and accepting of everyone. Well, and no. they, you know what I mean? My, children, will... my yeah. children both know that they were born different. Logan was born psychologically different and Caleb was born um, physiologically different. Yeah. Everybody's born different. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. You know, I remember my friend has got a stammer. And um, he got in my car once. And obviously my, my son's got no filter. You know, he was about six years old and, and the younger boy was three years old. And my friend got in and he started talking and my six-year-old burst out laughing and he was saying to my younger boy, listen to his voice, listen to it." Oh, and I wanted the floor to swallow me up, right? <laughs> oh, now when I had dropped him off, I'd I given him a row and I, you know everybody's born different. 
you know but that was like that was like new for him and he had just burst out laughing about it you know and he was saying the kid listen to him listen to him but then you know you, everybody's born different yeah. everybody's born different you know and yeah. that's what makes us special now what i would do how i would teach that lesson is i would have loads of pieces of paper that are square and i try to show the children these are you okay so I'd put my square there and I'd put my next square next so it'll fall down. If we're all the same, we fall apart. But then I'd pick up my jigsaw and I'd say, but look at these pieces. Look at these odd pieces. There's nothing perfect about them. But look, they stay together when they flap. They stay together when you hold them up. Look at this other odd shit. Look how solid that. Do you know what I mean? That's how I would teach it to children. You know, the difference is the odd balls that make us strong. This is how we are strong. Yeah. You know, because we're all completely different, completely different. Do you know, we've got so many flaws amongst the group that we just laugh for them. You know, we're actually celebrating the flaws. You know, we, we, we know the flaws in each other's speeches. We wake in for them. We have a giggle about them, mm -hmm. you know, and then, but we really celebrate each other's strengths. Mm -hmm. You know, we really do promote and elevate each other. And that's how everybody should be. That's not happening in the school environment. You know, no. it's not happening at all. Their flaws are being treated. Um, they need to concentrate on their flaws. Their strengths are not being um, promoted. Mm -hmm. The time for their strengths is being taken away on their flaws, on their difficulties. Mm -hmm. You know, less, you know, you can't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. Yeah. But here we are now. We're judging children on their ability to um, discuss Inform. different genders, different sexualities, different ways of having sex, whether to have sex or not, um, where to go for if they are age 11, if they've got signs of pregnancy. What are we dealing with you? It's absolutely absurd. Yeah, it is. Too much. Well, too much. Too much. Too much. 11 year 11 year olds know what to do you know need to know what to do with signs of pregnancy 11 year olds should be in the police station yeah because exactly. if an 11 year old is pregnant we've got a problem yeah and it shouldn't be addressed at school <sighs> you know, can... these, these are well we what people don't realize we're actually discussing crimes here yeah well, yeah, it is. It's, I, I remember speaking actually to a social worker and she completely disagreed with me in fighting the RSE. And she said, you don't realise what's out there. And she mentioned about a circumstance where there was a young girl who had behaved inappropriately with peers and it turned out that she was being a, a, there was abuse going on at home. But I didn't know what she was getting at. I was like, so... That child shouldn't be at home. What's, what's happened to that child? Is that child being taken and looked after? And why do we need to why do we need to inform how to do about it? Because if RSE had been about that girl behaving inappropriately with the other peers, that wouldn't have been picked oh, up. Right. It would be normal. Yeah. So the youth wouldn't have been picked up. So I didn't really understand what she was getting at. And she doesn't understand what she's getting now because they don't do this on a social work degree, you see. And the government have, print, have published a document, jointly published a document with Bernardo's um, September 2020 was published. They say it themselves. You know, so how could they say one thing and their reports are proven something different? Exactly. It's a mess. It's a massive mess, Lucia. It is. It absolutely is. Um, and Nemo, I know you know you you you're not feeling very well um, tonight mm -hmm. as well, um, and we have kept you a lot longer than um, we said. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think we were going to do the groomed video, weren't we? But yes, we can do that. No, we have got time. It's twenty-two That's minutes. Okay, brilliant. So Nemo, thank you so so much for coming on and uh, sharing your views with us. Thank you for having me, guys. It's very nice. Thank you, Nemo, for Thank everything. You. Thank you for all your support and um, look forward to the new year. All right. Happy new year, guys. <laughs> Take Bye. care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Right, guys, now we've got a video for you called Groomed. This is pretty much a summary of what is actually going on around the UK. This video was put together by... Oh, 
Lawrence Fox. I don't know. Wrote it now. Re reclaim. So it's Lawrence Fox and um, Martin Dowby, I think his name is, or Downby. So that's who that's who's actually put the video together. It's a really good video. Like I said, it's a summary of everything that's going on. So let's see if we can get that up and running. Again, I've got good. Have you got it, or shall I get, or shall I put mine up? Um, yeah, I, I have got it, love. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, she's just sharing that. Can I just remind you to please give generously to the fundraiser? Um, we are well. The fundraiser link is in the comments. I'm going to add it in again. So please do do that if uh, any any money would be appreciated. One pound, ten pound, twenty pound, whatever you can afford. So please do uh, please do share our fundraiser out as well. When it came to the thought of which the teacher's job to put the children to the base for them to stay safe and wanted to put sexual transmission and sexual transmission. And whilst most parents are in the family, the universe has been stuck with teachers. Sex education one. Compulsory. However, in the new hypersexualized culture of 21st century Britain, a perfect storm of fear and opportunity has arisen. A new wave of activists and sex-positive liberals saw an opportunity not just to educate and inform children, but to sexualize and radicalize them. Unbeknownst to many parents, many parents our children's children education, education has become, become riddled and proven, proven unscientific, radical, radical sexual, sexual identity politics. The declaration of pronouns is enforced with rigor. Rejecting biology in favor of gender theory is the uniform. Exposing ever younger children to complicated ideas about sexuality is becoming an imperative. In particular, PSHE, or Personal, Social, Health and Economic Education, which includes Relationships and Sex Education, RSE, has become a horror show. Sex education, sex education is, is an example, example that used, that to, used happen to happen in secondary, secondary school. The Conservative, conservative Government for some reason to do RSE, RSE as a replacement for sex, sex, sex ed. And now, and now we have Relationships and Sex, sex ed all into one bracket, bracket which, which means being pushed further down, down into primary school. school. We now have primary kids being taught about masturbation which I think is inappropriate, and I think most parents would. Uh, but this is the slippery slope to age appropriate anymore. Queens, whose very names are often laden with sexual innuendo, are routinely invited to read books to primary age school children. This is Miss Beaver, performers involved in Bristol's drag queen story time. And in Paisley, a drag queen named Flowjob was invited to read books at Glencoats Primary School. Following a parental outcry when Flowjob's highly sexualized social media history was uncovered, SMP MP Mari Black, who was with Flowjob at the school event, lashed out, accusing those with concerns of, yes, you guessed it, homophobia. Mari said she completely applauded the school for putting on such a great day. Last summer in London, a Labour Council invited a rainbow to build the groups in libraries. Drag Queen Story Hour, which does exactly what it says on the tin, has now become a huge growth industry in our schools. However, the apprehension of having drag queens perform with young children is also shared by some drag queens themselves. I have no idea why you want drag queens to read books to your children i have no idea a drag queen performs in a nightclub for adults there is a lot of filth that goes on a lot of sexual stuff that goes on and backstage there's a lot of nudity sex and drugs okay so i don't think that this is a, a an avenue you would want your child to explore would you want a stripper or a porn star to influence your child? 
and then you just move your bum up and down like that, and that's twerking. <laughs> As the outcry about drag queens and schools grows, efforts by the left and the educational establishment to get them into schools will become increasingly aggressive. Taking from them, even after it was the city had spent over two hundred thousand dollars drag queen events for young children. These extracurricular activities are bad enough, but most worrying of all is the British curriculum itself, which now teaches children as young as four about masturbation, consent, and the chilling concept of good secrets. So this education comes from the World Health Organization, United Nations, CECAS, the Kinsey Institute. Um, the first thing that, that startled me, made me aware, was the early childhood masturbation from age naught to four. Now that, 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 you know, I'm a criminologist, so child sex abuse and exploitation are my fields. I want to know who is saying children are sexual from birth? Who? Who is saying children can masturbate from birth? Straight off from the beginning, uh, for the four-year-olds, they were actually learning about masturbation, which is now, um, is, is spoken about is called self-stimulation so we discovered this in 241 schools in england the self-stimulation has a barrier to disclosure which means it prevents children from um it disclosing abuse basically it prones all children in the whole of the country away from what we call a non-verbal disclosure as it goes on we look in um children children are taught to behave in a um behave sexually in a non-offensive way whatever that means and um, they to label body parts it is not head shoulders knees and toes it is nipples scrotum and vulva in secondary schools the menu is even more x-rated as pupils are taught about anal sex facial ejaculation and bondage many parents are starting to ask questions at school and the schools are saying we cannot share the resources with you because they are under copyright and we're not a privilege to share them with people first of all that's a lie to share the resources with a parent is perfectly acceptable and any school that uses copyright as an excuse not to show parents what they're teaching their children uh, should be questioned further each and every parent if they go into their school and they ask to see the pshe or the trans inclusion across the curriculum they will find their schools to be evasive and that should frighten each and every one of us. Because if you don't know what your children are being taught, how on earth can you say that you are a committed parent uh, to the safety and well-being of your children? You just can't. But the area of greatest concern should be the now widespread practice of schools teaching children about LGBTQ plus and trans ideologies. As children of all are told that you don't have to be a boy, you don't have to be a girl, doctors guess your gender at birth. These ideas are not in schools to be discussed. They are imposed and any dissent is not tolerated. We're saying that what's wrong with the website is that there are more than one gender in well, this country. That's your opinion. That is my opinion and that is an opinion which is acceptable in the school. I'm afraid yours, which you're saying that there's no such thing as anyone other than male or female, is not inclusive. there are just two genders. Depending on what I get, I get gender that. You're, you you are choosing to make an issue of this because I said, "Are you really going to do it?" That was your opportunity to, to to keep quiet. I believe we are teaching children to question fundamental truths like biological sex, and then what they do with that is they then have to fill in the gap. So, if they don't adhere to the stereotype of being a boy or being a girl, which is something that gender-neutral parenting used to be, that you're kid, your boy or girl could have a push chair if they wanted. But what it now means is it means that biological sex is not particularly important. It's just your likes and dislikes and what you like to wear that is important. So that is being taught in schools. In fact, not just taught, but the ethos of a school. So that will be in in the can boys and girls anymore. Uh, that will be the receptionist, that will be all the support staff, every single person in that school will have been indoctrinated themselves into then indoctrinating your children. A common sense parent might ask, why are we teaching all of our children about such a tiny minority in society? After all, there isn't even any reliable data on how many trans people there are in Britain. 
it's really a two-pronged approach with critical race theory, which um, has been a big thing over here in the States and really tears down kids. It teaches them that they are bad, especially the white kids that you, you are bad. You're, you're inherently um, white supremacist. And the gender ideology is introduced as, and, and kids are presented with a wide assortment of different oppressed identities that they can step into. So, you know, the worst thing in the world to be is a cis white boy. Even a cis white girl is not, isn't, isn't looked uh, highly on. But if you can step into, you know, a, a trans boy, if you're a girl and you can become a trans boy, all of a sudden you're celebrated. So it's almost like this conversion moment that um, teachers and you know, school administration administrators are kind of guiding kids through with the goal to help these kids become critically conscious, which is another word for woke. So it, it's really about, you know, kind of dividing these kids from their parental influence, setting up this division between the parents and the children in order to make them little political activists for their progressive causes. Rather than liberating individuals, tragically, data shows that trans people are among the least satisfied of citizens in the Western world. Whilst there is a question mark over their methodology, small selective surveys of the LGBT community have claimed that 40% of trans youths have attempted suicide. Trans activists might argue that this is because of society's non-acceptance of transgender individuals. Critics might argue fears of suicide are revved up to terrify parents and teachers to further their agendas. Regardless, those with genuine gender dysphoria deserve our support and our love. But what if the lifestyle itself is the cause of this depression? Which begs the question, why are we encouraging children to adopt the lifestyle of those with the lowest life satisfaction scores in all of society? The figures speak for themselves. There has been an explosion in trans-identifying children in British schools in the last few years. There is a term for this, social contagion, and there are consequences. So we've had one example where a seven-year-old has come out of school. He said to his mother, I can be a girl if I want, and nothing more was thought about it until two weeks later when they discovered the teacher was actually in that class explaining her own child's transgender journey the seven eight-year-olds. Add to that painful testimony from those who have chosen to reverse their sex change procedures demonstrates that buyer's regret is a very real and very dangerous phenomenon in the trans community. Yet from within the trans community, these accounts are dismissed or even met with rage. None of this stops Britain's most activist councils pushing forward, forcing trans ideology on our children, even though parents are yet to be consulted and the government has repeatedly voiced its concerns. And I do want to raise what I think is a very dangerous potential safeguarding issue that we're seeing in this area right now, where schools are inviting outside organisations uh, into schools to provide counselling type services and using their materials Groups like Stonewall and Mermaids who are teaching what I think are dangerous and contested extreme ideologies that don't have a basis in science to our children and it's contrary to DfE guidance. Later this year, Brighton Council is set to roll out its Trans Inclusion Schools Toolkit, which allows biological schoolboys into girls' changing rooms, boys into girls' toilets and boys onto girls' residential trips. Activists are looking to Brighton as a pilot curriculum with an eye to a nationwide rollout as their next goal. Unless we parents take on the stand. You might not want any of this. You might not even be aware that this is going on, but it is, and it is coming to a school near you. Parents have no idea what's being fed to their kids in school. And I think not only are they being fed lies, which is that boys can be girls and girls can be boys and their safeguarding being obliterated. So it means that any of their daughters can be in a changing room. And if that boy says he's a girl, he is then in that changing room and schools are so gutless about it. Like, that's dangerous in itself. The actual 
kind of things that will happen and are being taught. But broader than that, we have to think about what we're doing to children when we gaslight them and groom them um, by lying to them and allowing them or force feeding them the acceptance of lies as truth. And I think that does something fundamentally breaking to the soul um, and to the resilience uh, and mental health of kids. And we talk about mental health all the time, but actually telling children to lie, how is that any better than the kids the way across uh, countries that we may scorn at, like China uh, or North Korea, when they're also being force-fed government propaganda? Some of it's activism in that the teachers want to shovel their agenda or push their agenda, but some of it is just misguided attempts at doing good. And some of the teachers just literally don't know what they're teaching and download the resources of the internet and go with it because they feel like they have to address the subjects. So it's, it's across the spectrum of, of difference of opinion there. But the issue is that when these teachers are pushing it, it's often not some people believe this, other people believe that. It's like this is the new truth. And they want to smash down normativity, as they'll call it, whether that's uh, heterosexuality or whether that's white normativity. It doesn't matter what it is. A lot of these ideas were introduced into education from uh, a guy by the name of Paolo Freire, who was, um, who wrote a, he's famous for writing a book called The, the Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And his whole, um, philosophy was based on the idea that teaching and education is an inherently political act. So he saw great value in education for achieving political ends. You know, the whole point of education was to awaken a critical consciousness in, in students. And, and so his philosophy is like one of the most cited in education schools. And it is gone, you know, throughout the US and I'm sure around the world with that you know, explicit purpose. And so a lot of these uh, educators are trying to kind of sever that bond between the parents and the um, student and between the past and the student so that they can inject you know, their ideology and their worldview um, so that these kids will become little activists for their progressive causes. Critical theory, gender theory, critical race theory, queer theory, all of these really con tested ideologies are being shoveled down kids' throats through PSHE, RSC, citizenship, uh, and the likes. Because make no mistake, business is booming for the LGBT and trans education sector. Brighton's toolkit was formed with the help of trans activist charity, the All Sorts Youth Project, which last year had an income of £509,000, including a £287,400 grant of government money. That means you, the taxpayer, are funding a trans lobby group that wants to change your child's curriculum to include their political activism. All sorts host trans and gender exploring groups for children as young as five, parents being offered a separate space in the building. Their activism goes far beyond gender ideology. Their terminology guys are littered with radical critical race theory definitions of terms like whiteness, race, and cultural appropriation. Last year, trans activist group Mermaids had a gross profit of 1.85 million. The Proud Trust, an educational resource that describes itself as the home of LGBT youth, received £218,000 from you, the taxpayer, last year alone. They flog information packs to schools at £75 a go, and they are eagerly hoovered up by activist teachers. Twinkle, a Sheffield-based publishing company, last year had a turnover of 42.6 million, offering hundreds of LGBTQ or through trans flagging for classrooms and pansexual pride posters. We're sleepwalking into a society where woe activists pose inches are grooming and right into degeneracy, sexualizing and depressing lifestyles. This is an attack on the family unit. Children are being encouraged to override their parents every way they can. They're being empowered beyond capacity. They be given um options that they don't understand. So they begin the being, how can I say, being targeted by these um, flashy trends that's going on, and they are falling for that. You know, we've got 
We've got young girls that they want their breasts removed. They're binding their, they're binding their breasts. They want them removed. We've got young boys who want their testicles removed. This isn't a horror story. This is a reality, and this is where we're headed. You know, people say, oh, they need to learn that there are gay people, etc., etc. Well, they'll learn that in life, as we always have done. It's not a school's place to say this is right, this is not right. That's a parent's job. Yeah. The parent's role is to pass on values. Schools should be teaching the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. They should pass on knowledge, nothing more. The nuclear family has been seen as a um, an obstacle to this kind of Marxist uh, society that they, they want to envision. And so... A lot of the sexual revolution has been about tearing down the nuclear family. You know, they, they want us in kind of a brave new world state where, you know, sexuality is just a transaction between meat machines. And so if they can cause kids to think differently, think that in that way about sexuality, they're less likely to, you know, form a nuclear family unit. And then that, um, you know, vehicle for perpetuating the oppression um, is, uh, is kind of eroded in that way. So what can we do? And there we go. This is not a political broadcast. That's why we cut it off in the end. So what can we do to address the situation? What we are doing, guys, we're uniting the country, we're uniting the kingdom. And obviously we are challenging this in court as well. And I think that brings us on then to our next guest, Lucia. So tonight, guys, to finish us off, we have Richard Lucas. Now, Richard Lucas was a teacher in a school in Scotland. He is now the leader of the Scottish Family Party. We've met Richard on quite a number of occasions now, Richard. Um, you give us an interview when we first started off, when we didn't know what we were doing. We had you on till well after midnight with Sandy, because we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> we've come a long way since then, so thank you very much for joining us. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, yeah, it's great to be here. Yeah, but it's to finish you off, you were saying. Is it that bad? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. We've been going for um, 10 hours and 55 minutes. So oh, that's, uh, that's admirable. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Hours. We go for 12 hours. But this is just child's play compared to our allies at Liberty Tactics. They do 36 hours. Yeah. So uh -huh. we are just, we, we're the babies. We're the puppies of uh -huh. the litter in that sense. Yeah, we're the, we're, we're the amateurs, aren't we, really, with, the, uh -huh. with this? But Richard, thank you so much for you know coming on on our show. Really appreciate your time, and really appreciate all your work as well. We we we've got so much. It, we've we've had we've got so much from your work. You know, so much information, um, and you know we know that you you're fighting this up in Scotland, and it's yeah, um, it's no, pretty bad up there. Yeah, there's huge support for you in Scotland, as well. That there's a, a a lot of awareness. Of your oh, campaign, great. people often mention it, and they're, yeah, they're, they're very encouraged by it. So we're, yeah, we're supporting each other. We are, we are and the it's, 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 it's been great to have all the contacts, and a long may it continue. Yes, definitely. So have you heard our news today? The, the what? Sorry. Have you haven't heard our news today? Then. No. What's the news? We've had our judgment. Uh huh. And it hasn't gone in our favour. Right. The judge has actually um, sided with the government saying the parents' rights don't exist. Uh -huh. uh, we've never had parental rights anyway. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot there. There's a lot of concern uh -huh. there. Was, you know, the, the, the Welsh government had said in the court in November that we, parents' rights don't exist anyway, you know, and if they did, they would only be tiny. And they brought in all these different types of family law and things like that. So to actually hear that the court has, um, really? you know, slightly with that view as well, it is quite a surprise for us in England and Wales because we share the same judicial system. Yeah. So that yeah. is a massive concern there. And it yeah. looks like we'll be going, well, we, we're going to take this the distance anyway. You know, we, we wasn't expecting a full yeah. win. 
we're yeah. dealing with a massive agenda here. Uh-huh. There were some points in the in the judges summing up that we can take moving forward for our appeal. Yeah. For argument's sake, you know, there was reference to Professor Emma Reynolds. I don't know if you've heard news about her lately with the queer no. theory and things like that. Well, well, she's she's come under so much scrutiny now that she's removed her social media platforms. And okay. the Welsh government did put all their eggs into her basket and she's dropped her basket on the floor. So obviously the judge wasn't aware of the, all of that neither. So yeah, it's been interesting. It's a 120 page um, judgment. So I'm sure you'll want to access that and have a look. Yeah, um, I would. The thing that's done there is it, is it shows people um, the, the fact that the government is going to stick to its guns, okay? The, the law's not going to come to the defence. But people have, during your campaign, people have been so engaged and motivated by it, they'll now be saying, and I'm sure they already are, right, what do we need to do? If that's not what's going to fix it, what is going to fix it? Yes. Uh, and that's exactly the uh, the mindset you want, isn't it? Yeah, Because the is. more things people try, the more the more desperate they become, don't they? To try well, the next thing. It. We, um, you know, we, we on the 16th of November, we actually proved in the court, so this is on public record, it's on the judge's transcript, we actually proved that the government had been lying and misleading us. So, obviously, it was referenced in our statements, it's all their documentation, it's all their correspondence, you know, it's their words. So, we'd actually proved that they were liars, that this is a global sex education, it's not Welsh. And we proved that age and developmental appropriate doesn't exist as well. Of, uh, and that, again, was in the government's own words because we challenged them on it through a freedom of information. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so that was really, that was a, that was a victory for us as um, a grassroots movement, you know, that's shown deceit at the hands of government and that, that's exposure, you know. And like I said, this this they've, they've snuck this and you know yourself what's going on in Scotland, you know, uh-huh. that they, they're going hard and fast. So for us to actually get that exposure and to get that out there, that is something um, we do, we. Yeah. Do, do, do you think the timing's deliberate? Are they slipped it out just before Christmas when no one's watching? Well, yeah. this is another thing. They did actually. I'm concerned. So we were first of all told the judgment would take six weeks. Sweet. That was yeah. going to take us between Christmas and New Year. But if you allow for the holidays, you look in early in the New Year. Uh-huh. So the fact that it's covered five and a half weeks after the government had emailed to um push for it, that's concerning. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had media hounding us this morning, well, from yesterday afternoon, really, when nobody was supposed to know that the judgment was coming through. So that as well, yeah, the government were very keen to get this, um, well, attempt to get this done and dusted. But yeah. the government have underestimated us here in this country. Yeah. This is they have underestimated us all the way along, you know. Yeah. Well, what uh, it will make them do, though, it, it will make them think twice with anything in the future. So whatever crazy plans they've got next, they'll think to themselves, "Oh, hang on, maybe this is a bit hot to handle at the moment. Maybe we need to leave this for a little while. We don't want to, we don't want to stir that bunch up again, do we?" Well, this so is it. It will make them just, uh, just be a bit more careful. Well, that's it. So the, the deadline for this education was supposed to be September gone. So that's the deadline, not the start line. Oh. Now, there has been no start line. There is still no lesson content. So we really are um, achieving great things. We've pushed the yeah. Minister of Education to issue a statement as well, you know, trying to um, cover up the damage, damage limitation. We've got 21 out of 22 local authorities active in this country. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, that's all being challenged. The government have stopped them communicating with us. But, you know, that's nearly the whole country. The, no judgment is going to take that away. No judgment now is going to turn those parents around. So you're saying they, the, the government seems to have delayed implementing the curriculum? Yes. It's interesting. Exactly the same thing's happening in Scotland. The Scottish government have been promising new sex education guidelines for years, absolutely years, and they never seem to arrive. And I'm sure it's because they're thinking, we, we just don't want this. We don't want the hassle. We know there's people ready to absolutely pounce on this the moment it happens. And that'll be why it is. We're holding yeah. them with the dam holding them back. Um, well, the thing is, we're not the only pushback, you know, that there are the women's rights movements. And there are other groups out there who, who, you know, who were fighting this on their own before we come along, you know. 
So yeah. there is a lot of, um, and we're all starting to connect now as well. Now, uh-huh. in this country, Richard, we have, oh, if you had been outside that court, you would have absolutely loved it. We have united all walks of life. Uh-huh. Yeah. All different races, religions, different class, different. Honestly, we've got people from all walks of life. The children are there, the children are chanting. The government cannot erase this. There is nothing uh-huh. they can do to erase this now, you know. And, and there's a lot of people, that. a lot of them are educated people. So the government yeah. can't continue. These lies are getting bigger and bigger. So how can we not celebrate that? You know, they'd expose yeah. themselves. The, 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 the big opportunity you've got coming up is they've got to produce some well, guidelines, resources or something or other. And I mean, that, either they'll be so scared They'll be, they won't hardly put anything in it. Well, but when they do, that, that will help thing. just keep the campaign going, won't it? Well, listen, another thing, with all this stuff now, but I'm around now, a lot of the resources came from her. They were called Agenda. Now, uh-huh. they're still available, but on the Hub website now, there's a special passcode to access it. So it's under lock and key. Everything, yeah. You know, it's um, the well, so I'm saying they put their, their eggs in one basket, and our basket is smashed. And so, the government are in trouble, you know, if if we were a problem to them, but these other spanners are coming from all directions, and they certainly wasn't banking on, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, I, I think there's um, yeah, momentum's only going to grow, isn't it? They've, they've had their fingers burned, so they'll be a bit more careful in the future, but they won't be careful enough. No, oh, oh, not, but this is it. This is the out. beginning of the end now. They've overstepped the mark. And like I said, even people in England need to be concerned. We share the same judicial system. The judgment today is going to be referenced in other judgments. This this yeah. should, you know, really wake people up and shake them up. Oh, I wonder if that's what they've been waiting up. for in Scotland. Maybe that's you what the delay's been in Scotland. Maybe to they've been waiting to, to look at the judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can I just ask you, Richard, how much mm-hmm. your party has evolved now <clears throat> as far as RSE is concerned, what we call RSE? How much have how, how much more people do you think you've attracted because you're tackling this thorny subject that no uh, one else yeah. wants to go near? You've exposed so much. I do yeah, admire I, what you've done. I, I would say it's probably our most important policy. As a family party, I mean, we've got a huge range of policies, but mm-hmm. probably the one that attracts most people to the party is, is this one. Because you can put things in front of people's eyes. You don't really need to explain it. You just need to show it to people. And once they've seen it, they're motivated. They want to do something about it. So it's a very important issue for us. And, and we, yeah, we, we, a lot of our supporters would say that that was the key issue that brought them to the party. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and just response from the general public, uh, like you were saying, same as in Wales, huge number of people thinking it, it's just outrageous what's going on. Uh, there's still there's a slight issue that the, the parent generation, they might not be entirely happy, but they don't, maybe don't think it's too big a deal. The grandparent generation are tearing the hair out thinking this is just absolutely beyond the pale. Uh, but the particularly younger parents, they're a bit, oh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's the way the world is these days. Maybe, mm-hmm. yeah, it may be a bit surprising they put that in, but but it's not so far, um, you know, it's not so far off the radar as it is for, for older generations. But we've got people of all ages, including school pupils. Yeah. You know, we have school pupils every now and again get in touch and say, right, this is what they've been teaching us. It's really awful. It's really embarrassing or oh. whatever. Yeah, they're actually expressing, and it's meant to be to empower the children as well. And then, you know, when the children are disliked, because we, we've actually heard stories ourselves from parents where a child has actually expressed to the teacher they don't want to be there, and they're, they're actually forced to stay. And it's like, hang on, this is meant to be about children's rights. Yeah. And, you know, what, what right, you know, you're not really answering to their rights or... If that's what they're doing, you know. Yeah. I mean, the uh, whole the whole comprehensive sexuality education uh, ideology is promoted as a right. Children have got a right to be indoctrinated and corrupted by sex education. That, that's basically what they think. So, if any children are not being indoctrinated and corrupting, they're being denied their right to an education. I mean, which is total nonsense. But 
But so people are not going to think about very much. That, that sounds quite persuasive. Oh, yeah, rights are important. Oh, yeah, we don't want to de deprive them of their rights, do we? Uh, that's the way it's uh, that's the way it's presented. But uh, I, mean, I don't know if you've been following the news in Scotland. I mean, you've had this slipping out just before Christmas. I mean, in Scotland, they've uh, voted through the Gender Recognition Act reform mm. just before Christmas. So now 16-year-olds can change gender without any medical diagnosis. Uh, so that's going to have a huge effect in schools as well. So currently, any child in school, the teachers will say, oh, that's great, you want to be a boy, we're right behind you, what do you want us to call you? Do you want us to tell your mum and dad? Oh, no, okay, that's fine, we'll keep the secret. So that's already going on. But uh, but from now on, so 16-year-olds, the school will be able to say, oh, you know, would you like to change name legally? Would you like us to help you to do that? Shall we give you the form? Shall we show you the website where you do it? You, you don't want mum and dad to know? Okay, that's fine. We don't need to tell mum and dad. Let's just do this. So those steps will be being led by teachers when this law comes in. It was finally passed today. But when it actually comes into force, that's what teachers will be doing in schools. Is we'll I know people to the protest. This might be something different, but I'm pretty sure we we can talk about the same thing here. Is it what I read? They've practically made detransition illegal. Oh, that that that's another thing. That that's um, I, I'm sure gender recognition act reform. I'm sure that will be coming to the Welsh Parliament soon. I would have thought if it's devolved to Wales, maybe yeah. it's not. maybe it's not. Uh, yeah, the other thing is conversion therapy, where there's a law proposed in Scotland, it's early stages, under which if a dad said to his five-year-old son, oh, come on, boys don't wear dresses, he'd be breaking the law because he'd be trying to suppress his gender expression mm. and would be liable to up to six years in prison and loss of parental rights. In other words, children, child taken away from him because that would be classed as, as conversion therapy. I mean, it's, it's really extremely, I mean, it's vindictive. What they're proposing. Uh, wow. Well, do you know good. when they say about conversion, when they talk about conversion therapy, they, um, you know, when people who uh, they don't, they they think it should be banned. They they sort of like say that this conversion therapy is, it's traumatic. It's um, you know, it's a real. It's like bad exorcism. Thing. That's what people talk about. It's like an exorcism. Yeah. yeah. And then when you actually right, okay, so what is what is actual conversion therapy? And you actually put it to them and they don't actually know. No, I mean, the, the, the definition in Scotland they put forward could be anything. It could be someone like sits down and uh, sits next to you on the bus yeah. and says, Oh, I'm thinking about it. It could be for, for example, someone sits next to you on the bus and says, you know, I, I'm a married man, um, but I'm really attracted to uh, uh, another man, a young man. But I don't want to do that because I want, I want to stay with my wife and family. I don't want, I don't, so this is a problem for me. Um, I don't want to go down that path. Can you help me? And if you said to them, yeah, I think you're right. You don't want to do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll help you. Then that would be illegal. <laughs> that would be conversion therapy. So they're trying to associate it with like electric shock treatment and all other yeah. sort of things that are, are already illegal. <laughs> but it actually covers just any conversation including between uh, a parent and their kids so, so literally it says it covers gender expression so dad says to the son no boys don't wear dresses that would be classed as suppressing his gender expression so it's illegal that's insane it it, it doesn't it it's really like they they're, they're trying to damage the kids yeah. Because why uh, why wouldn't you like for example if someone wanted help uh, in you know when you were saying about that if a man sort of sat next to you yeah. on the bus and he he didn't want to you know wanted to stay faithful uh, to his wife and that yeah. no you're not allowed to no. you're not allowed to sort of advise that that's the no. right thing to do and the, the other sort of situation is you can have let's say you've got Adam a Muslim boy fourteen years oh. old um, attracted to other boys so thinking he's gay. And he thinks to himself, oh, I'm a Muslim. You're not supposed to do that. That, that. That's not right in Islam. So he goes to speak to his imam and, and said, look, I'm, I'm feeling attracted to other boys. I, I don't really think I ought to, to act on that because I'm a Muslim. I don't think you're supposed to do that as a Muslim. And if the imam said, yeah, yeah, you're right. But let's have a talk about that. Um, I'll, I'll see if we can help you. Then illegal. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's that's conversion therapy. Now, also, right, now that... that... <laughs> Conversion therapy is actually used for paedophiles, right, as well. So if you're going uh -huh. to ban that, you've got to 
fun an avenue of support right yeah. but what i they'd expect an outside so say now we didn't say they weren't being as ridiculous as that richard let's say it is exorcism style like peter thatchell says right uh-huh. then i'm going online and i'm seeing interviews of protesters outside downing street one of them's dressed as a baby he's wearing a bib that says slut so yeah. how am i supposed to understand and um how am i supposed to have empathy for this exorcism style and then all of a sudden i'm being faced with that outside downing street and you're supposed to take this i was the spokesperson for the campaign by the way uh-huh. okay dressed as a baby wearing a bib saying the word slut yeah yeah no so um, how is the ordinary person falling for this yeah yeah i mean you mentioned peter tatchell i mean you'll be aware i'm sure of his letter to the guardian in 1997. <laughs> yeah we used it in our presentation yeah. yeah i mean i actually know someone who was on a, i think it was a bbc show with him a discussion program mm-hmm. with peter tatchell and before the show the bbc <laughs> said to my friend they said you are not allowed to bring up peter tatchell's letter condoning pedophilia if you bring that up on this show we're just going to turn your mic off and you're off the show. You you wow. cannot mention it. So right. the how about, how about, did they also mention his book or the book that he was involved in? Boy, uh, no, I, I'm aware really of that. Though. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. they didn't yeah. mention that. No, I mean in Scotland, the I mean the paedophile information exchange started in Edinburgh, and it, it was an offshoot of an organisation that's changed names a few times, and it's now the Equality Network which is the government-funded LGBT organization in Scotland. But the Paedophile Information Exchange uh, came from it. And prominent figures from the Paedophile Information Exchange had all sorts of roles uh, in Scotland. Uh, I mean, one of them ran the Edinburgh Pride event uh, until he died just just maybe a year ago. But he'd been a member of the Paedophile Information Exchange. Uh, So he ran this right up until that. And there's... You'll have heard about the man who was in charge of sex education in Scotland who said we need to break down the barrier between childhood and sexuality. I mean, there's there's a substantial number of people. Uh, that's the, I'll tell you another one. A few years ago, the Scottish government was funding this children's entertainer and she called herself Gendersaurus. That was it. So she had this like dinosaur costume. And she did a promotional photograph, which was a, a dinosaur on a pile of books. And you could read the titles of the books. And one of them said, um, harmful to minors. So I looked it up on Amazon to see what it was. Harmful to minors. Mi- minors. And the subtitle was The Perils of Protecting Children from Sex. The Perils of Protecting Children from Sex. In other words, the dangers that, to children if you protect them from having sex. In other words, you know, you're harming children. Uh, uh, saying that, that was in the promotional image of this government-funded children's entertainer teaching school children about gender issues. Um, it's, it's quite, yeah, it's hard to know how much there is of, of that, but there's certainly a reasonable amount. It's not uncommon to come across people who just let it, well, that's not let it slip. It's like the Balenciaga thing, isn't it? It's like they're deliberately putting out there just to provoke and see what they can get yeah. away with. They are testing um, the waters. They definitely test in the waters. You know, yes. we've got Professor Emma Reynolds here, who is a woman. This is what I don't care. Her title is she's a professor in childhood development, but her work is all based around gender and stuff like that. So yes. that is childhood development. I simply do not know. Um, so her title doesn't match her work for a start. And this is a woman who doesn't believe in childhood. She doesn't. She doesn't oh, yeah. recognize childhood innocence. Yeah, it's a myth. In the- in the Museum of Childhood in Edinburgh, there's a display when you go in, and the display explains that childhood was invented by the Victorians. Mm. Um, and before then, there was no oh. such thing as childhood. And, and childhood's just a social concept. <laughs> the childhood is the idea that, that you treat young people, you treat them like a different category of person than adults. No, so the idea is the Victorians invented it, and we now, we now, we now need to just ditch it. It's not necessary. They need protecting and guiding. Yeah, absolutely. The thing is, biology tells us that when when you're first born, you can't look after yourself. Yeah. So you've got to you grow up to opposite. You can't 
you know, as you're growing, you're maturing, and then you're going to be sorry. Is there feedback when I talk? Uh, a bit, yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Okay, I'll try and talk quieter. <laughs> if you turn your turn your speakers down a touch, turn your speakers as quiet as you can you can manage okay. that might help. Okay, I'll see. A, I'll do that there. I don't know how to do that. Or, or move them further away from the microphone. Okay, <laughs> that might work. Sorry, where was I? I can't remember what I was saying now. Um, that's in, that's, um... uh, oh yeah, uh, children are different. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, they do. They need to grow, don't they, in order to mm -hmm. make that decision. So to, to sort of like assume that children need to, I don't know, experience the same things as adults or be able to make decisions the same as adults. That doesn't make sense at all. No. You know, we we, um, we don't we don't develop our frontal cortex until we're twenty five. So, no. you know, through yeah, those... yeah, absolutely, yes, yeah, bizarre. I mean, the, the, part of it is these people are sort of extreme left wing ideologies. So they think everything's a power struggle. Everything in life is a power struggle. So children and adults, that must be a power struggle. Who's got the power? It seems like the adults. So the children are the oppressed ones. So the children need liberating from adult <laughs> authority. Um, so they share the power and then the children will be happy, which is completely mad. It's really harmful to the children. But then alongside then then come the people with a sexual interest in children. They think, oh, I like the sound of this. Yeah, this suits me as well. So they get on board as well because it's absolutely in tune with, uh, with what they want, Treat, treating children like adults, which is what exa that's exactly what they want to do. Absolutely. That is, is, that's, is, that's another interesting thing because I've always been into obviously being a mother of additional needs. You, you, you're into policies. You're always fighting for children's rights. Okay, so it's you know, so I've always like been around the policy thing. So I when I first discovered that we were having the social service and care, social service and and well being act, um, they are they are going to scrap the children's act and the, and the all the UK children's act. And eventually, they'd be bringing the children under under this this one up, the adults and children into one up. I remember thinking back then, mm, that's interesting. I, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how they do this. Then, you know, mm -hmm. the same judicial system, this, that, and the other. But now I can see exactly where they're going. They've lowered the voting age. They've signed the feminist declaration, and we know what's happened with that. Yeah. Uh, I know exactly where it's going. We are not going to have a childhood. The only thing standing between us, um, them, and the road in childhood is us. We are the yeah. only people getting in the way now. Well, well in, in Scotland, Scottish elections, you can vote when you're 16. They're now making it so you can be a member of the Scottish Parliament when you're 16. So you can be an MSP while you're still at school. Wow. We've got the youth parliament, and the youth parliament is cherry picked by Welsh government. Oh, we, we, we've got those as well. Oh, have you? Terrible a, a, the indoctrination that they use the children to to communicate their own messages. Our children's parliament, one time that this is literally true, they made a mural, and part of the mural was children holding up a bill passed by the Scottish government, a climate change bill. So, so the children were holding it up, um, saying how wonderful it was, with all the nice green trees and grass and uh, yeah, the sun shining, mountains in the background, and a crowd of children holding up the government's wonderful bill. I mean, it's like that's like something from North Korea. Well, the thing is, our children are state owned now. The judges rule that. Um, oh. You know that that's that's in law. So we know exactly where we stand now. So what we need is to fight for ownership of our own children. Yeah. yeah. Although I don't like to use the term ownership, well, do you know what? I will use that term. I am their mother. And that yeah. title I, I take very, very seriously. Yeah. Others do. I'll be completely honest. I've experienced women like that. But for myself and the team, I can say that title is mine. I have earned it. I haven't just given birth. I have earned that title. And there uh -huh. is no way on this earth the Mark Drakeford is going to be carrying it. Let me tell you now. Not open uh -huh. hell. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, Nicola Sturgeon called herself the chief mammy. <laughs> chief, 
No way. Yeah. I actually found us saying it on some obscure YouTube video, and it's now become a standing joke about her, but she called herself the chief mammy of Scotland's children. So, uh, and we've had our uh, former children's commissioners from Scotland, but she came here in 1992. Now, she came here as a social worker. I can't find any trace of her in Scotland at all. I can't find any of her previous qualifications. Then she became a professor in Cardiff Uni. There's nothing. There's no groundbreaking work. We just don't know uh -huh. where this woman's come from. But isn't it funny yeah. that she's come from Scotland as well? Uh -huh. John, bon John Bancroft came from Edinburgh University. He's part of the Kinsey Institute. He's edited uh -huh. also the Kinsey series. You know, we we know exactly what's going on here. It yeah. people say, but it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It does to us. It's uh -huh. nonsense sense yeah perfect yeah. sense nonsense yeah you know everything that we're reading in our children's education documents all these guidelines we're equipping these children to become fair game yeah we're empowering yeah. them beyond capacity you know so what's the difference between a 16 year old having sex and a 15 year old having sex then it'd be 15 year old and 14 year old this is where we go in we know yeah. that these documents have been signed investments have been made yeah 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 it's on its way well i think 2023 is going to be an interesting year i think things will inf unfold uh in wales now i think when it's when this is unrolled uh, across the country and there'll yeah. be more and more stories coming through because now you've alerted parents to uh, about the sort of things that are going on there'll be more and more stories of hang on a minute what on earth are they teaching my kids so that as the stories come through that will keep the issue on the boil and let's see where it see where it heads to. I, I better disappear now, but it's great to join yeah, you. Yeah. And well, well done you. on your marathon. Um, and, and uh, we'll have, have another quarter in soon, anyway. So we keep in touch. Yeah, yeah, and I look forward to uh, to see what happens next because obviously the the judge's decision is not the end of this by a long way, is it? This oh is no, 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 chapter two. On to chapter two. All the judge does is help us get in the papers. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Thanks, nice to join you. Have a good Christmas. Thank good you very night. Much. Thank you. Have a nice Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thanks a lot, Richard. Bye. Yeah, bye. So we're almost there, guys. We are we on are. 11 hours, 25 minutes and 43 seconds. I'm a little bit confused because didn't you start dead on 12? No, because you was late. Oh, I th oh you right okay you did wait for a bit you didn't start uh, yeah we only started no we literally only started like one minute before you come on <clears throat> right okay I'm so sorry I was late because now we're not finishing right on time <laughs> so she has taken us all over the time now isn't she I am um, come on one of us has got to be late haven't we Jordan you're on milk love. <laughs> She's usually got blue tack on her camera, so the silence I'm, I'm going up in the world. Oh. All, all your good tactics are brushing off on me, all your <coughs> computer science degree. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not being fair. I don't think Lucia was late, really, was she? She wasn't. She was what? She wasn't late. She was. Eight minutes. I was, yeah. Was it eight minutes? Yeah, because I had to, I had to, um, I had to go live because it was. I knew we'd have to reset it again. You can't reset it for the after ten minutes after. Mm -hmm. So she would have knocked us right. Joey would have been there. Uh, it would have been like being on the phone to you. Otherwise, how early I was. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I literally. Oh, yes. I, what a, what I, a, what's on last year? Your thoughts on the judgment? Come on. Let's hear from you. You've been rather quiet there today. You're making me out to be a liar. When I'm telling them what you were talking, like you've been on there, tight-lipped all day, making me out to be a liar. Well, um, it's it's sometimes a case of getting a word in edgewise. <laughs> <laughs> Joan, I second that. <laughs> <laughs> And also, I'm just here for backup. You know, you are the uh, you are the main spokesperson. You and Lucia. But my thoughts on it was, 
Uh, to be honest, I hadn't expected anything different. This is coming from a big place. This is this is coming from a distance that people don't understand. And it's part of Agenda 2030. And it's not hidden. It's tucked into the agenda, this education strand. So I think to have got as far as we have got has been a tremendous achievement. It's been really exciting. And it's been so exciting to see the movement grow and the pressure grow and just that feeling standing outside the court. No one can take that away from us because we'd witnessed something absolutely spectacular that day. We'd been vindicated. The ones that Jeremy Miles and all the rest of them like to say that was feeding misinformation, alarming people for no reason. We were vindicated on that day. And it's all down in the court records, isn't it? Yes. For anyone to see who wants to. So as far as I'm concerned, we can't we can't get any better than that. No, we can't we can't the only way we can get better is by growing. Because yeah. all of the ethos has been there. The law in a perfect world would have been on our side. But in the court of the public, we we proved ourselves. We have. You we know, they can't been. throw bad eggs and tomatoes at us. And if they, well, they've tried, it doesn't work very well, has it? No, because we can throw them back twice as hard. Mm. They throw them at us, we catch them and throw them back. Yes. Mm. Because that's what happens when you grassroots. When you grassroots, say you're a different breed. Okay, yeah. you're a different breed. And usually, what I suppose what the governments used to get, and no disrespect to anyone out there, I suppose any kind of pushback they get on anything in general, they're usually political issues from mm -hmm. small groups. Um, this is completely mixed group. They know this is an avalanche waiting to happen. That's why they could never go against us in a public battle. No. They couldn't, like Phil said earlier, do you think we should have a referendum on this? They are never going to have a referendum on this because even mm. with censorship, during a referendum, we have to have, this is public, right? So even with all the censorship and manipulation in the world, on the day, they, they wouldn't stand a chance. So they would never have a referendum on this. This is why they don't they don't really want to fight us. They just want to shut us down on every level. They can't go toe to toe with us on a public platform. We will absolutely annihilate them. And for them to believe that most of the population is dumb, mm -hmm. right? Um that's 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 them. That's a that's a reflection of them. Okay, yeah. because we aren't stupid people. Our accent makes us sound stupid, especially mine. But we're not stupid people. And it's only so long you can fool people. Do you know what I mean? You can fool all of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And this oh, is yeah. it. Not only that, the kids are going to come home from school. There's, there's so many different branches to this, guys, so many different aspects. The government have tangled themselves up, don't forget. We yeah. are just outside bouncing that ball of wool, you know? We are not tangled in this web of lies. We are not tangled in it just because it, they've caused all that. We're just out there exposing the truth. I, I, I kind of think, though, that the government were probably banking on or at least hoping that most parents were sort of that woke anyway, that they would accept it. Do you know what I mean? Oh, they knew that. They knew they wouldn't get away with it. That's why they snuck it in, though. Stuck it in anyway regardless yeah, let's be honest there and i we've got to say this there was already people fighting this before we come along right there already mm -hmm. was incredible individuals fighting it right what the government didn't bank on was a pro and activism that's what the government didn't bank on, you know. They just and, um, expected people to just sulk. Well, I think, well, it's, and... a good job, it's a good job that we did um, spot this on accident. Yeah. Do don't forget, this is accidental. Yeah. This was a total accident. This was pure chance. It was yeah. pure chance. But I, I found out about CSE in 2013, right? Mm -hmm. 2020, an online article comes on, we lost our credit locked out. 
I knew what I was looking for. Chance. Yeah. Chance. Poor chance. You happened to see an article thing and it was just like that sort of triggered something. Hang on a minute. Well, this is it. I, I didn't find that document on the 25 studies. Um, the overview of the 25 studies. I didn't find that. It was Adele. I seen the UNESCO and I was going straight after it. Adele then all those little dotty bits. Do you know what I mean? So it was Adele that discovered the whole of the UK was involved. Adele discovered all of that. I just knew what it was. Yeah. And obviously, as you know, the pandemic kicked off and things like that. By the time we got to May, June, that, that just had to try and do something about it. You yeah. know, but it was all a chance. And like, because like, obviously, like, because of my pr previous knowledge, that's why it was never really an option not to fight it, really. Do you know what I mean? And like I said, it was Adela found, Adela joined those dots, you know, not me. Yeah, yeah. I just knew what to recognise it in our documents, and I just knew what it was. But like I said, it, it was Adele that, that um, found. found all of that. I didn't come into this saying, look what this document says. I was just like, says that on page four. You know, and that's like, and, and in actual fact, so I was showing everyone the World Health Organization document, even though I would draft reference to UNESCO. I just knew they went together, right? Yeah. That's all I knew. I didn't know that was a framework. I didn't know those little bits in between. I just knew that they are partners. And that's, that's all, you know? That, you, that's, just that's, find, you just have to find the evidence then of, to, to yeah. actually demonstrate that. Yeah, yeah. Which that was a good job, really. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good well, job. Really. Well, this is well, it goes to show, doesn't it, that you work well, like Adele, you and Adele work really well together. You know, she's um, she's an I said before, she's an encyclopedia of knowledge. You know, she really does well, she, she knows how where what to look for herself. You know, oh, when Adele's got her teeth into something, she's mm. got teeth, and she's really quick at finding things. In yeah. my experience, well, she's know? inquisitive, see, guys. You know yeah. what I mean? She's naturally inquisitive. She's the child that couldn't sit still. Yeah. She's the child who would now, who would have constantly in, in nowadays been told she's not good enough, she can't sit still, she'd be on medication. So Adele, Adele had her schooling at a time before Rick Lynn became really popular, you know? So <laughs> she's and that, that she's inquisitive and, and her brain is naturally like, well, you know, she's thinking outside and she's like Adele doesn't read something and then question it. Adele starts reading something and goes, oh, what's that? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And then Adele might forget where she started kind of thing. But th that's what she does. She just follows these paths. She won't read something and then go, oh, i got to go back and check this. No, Adele checks it straight away. And to be fair, she's... She, yeah, been spot on. I like, yeah, she knows, she knows how to... Uh, Query things throughout the sentence, then you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but yeah. a lot of people they they have to be given a lot of information, and then they have, have to have somebody to kind of tease the ideas out of them. Mm. Yeah. Whilst, but you know, with the Dallas, straight away, it just yeah, comes yeah. naturally. It's like from one springboard to another. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things about UNESCO that makes me laugh is. What makes them equipped? What makes provide this education? Why should we have any trust in them? Does anyone know what UNESCO is? What it stands for? What it's all about? Exactly. Most people don't know, do they? <laughs> who, do, does anyone know who the first director of it was? It was Julian Huxley, the brother of Aldous Huxley. The man that that wrote Brave New World. I don't know if you've read it at all, but it's it's chilling, and it's almost upon us now. It's uh, it it's not it's not a nice read. Him and his brother were obviously very high up, very middle class, influential, and they had an idea because of their connections, literary connections, academic connections, they had an idea of what was coming. And also, they wanted to shape it, because Julian Huxley 
was also a eugenicist. They, um, most of them were. Uh, Planned Parenthood was as well, Joan. Exactly. You know, and, and, and now we're supposed to be the place for, like, family planning. Huh? <laughs> Yeah, this is, this is, this the is what they do, right? They change the words. Like like like, like I said earlier on, uh, we know someone who worked for the United Nations a long time ago. And even back then, um, if somebody got pregnant and you supported them because they didn't have the money or nowhere to live or whatever, you said, it's okay, you can come and live with me. You was then accused of forced pregnancy. It's yeah. insane. And it's like, that like when you when you say forced pregnancy, that sounds that sounds like rape, doesn't it? Really bad. Yeah, it does sound intrusive really and invasive, and um, you know, yeah. it does. It it sounds awful. Yeah, it's almost like saying so that they say like the obviously the way you get pregnant, right? Your the pregnancy's already there. Now they're actually saying you're forcing that pregnancy by not allowing, by not suggesting she has an abortion. But the pregnancy's already there. You're not forcing the pregnancy. Yeah, you're just they, supporting. They demonize everybody, and they they demonizing everybody. You know, yeah. um, all supportive networks now are, are being like spoken down as if there's something yeah. really wrong with them. Yeah. You know, look at these laws coming. People are going. People are going to get criminalized for helping someone. Yeah, I know. Or even like just trying to guide your own children. And you know, they, and the thing is, like when parents want to guide their children, they want to guide their children because they want their children to. You yeah, know, but this is what, right? So, like, people get told horror stories. Oh, we need this because this happens yeah. in some families. This that and the other. When actually. Nine times out of ten, right, regardless of what it is, all right, when your child actually settles on a situation or they've made a decision, as long as they've exhausted all avenues, can you see what's going on here? <laughs> as long as they've exhausted all avenues, look, you are going to support them no matter how reluctant you are on the issue. Yeah. And I'm Sick to death of you, then. If I had had this education, I could have come out sooner. Really? Well, you tell me why. I know a 40-year-old woman who hasn't told her parents she smokes yet. Would she have had this education as well? Yeah. No. Because most of us have only told our parents that we were pregnant because we had to. Because the clock was against us. Everything is circumstantial. It, be, it depends on your environment. It depends on your own confidence. So stop giving me that crap. Yeah. It's, it's like, like yeah, because like, well, for example, like when I was, when I was like, a, you know, sort of 13, 14, God, my parents didn't want, like I couldn't have a boyfriend, you know, they were quite strict. So I wouldn't, do you know what I mean? Like I, if I had be, you wouldn't be that sort of like, oh yeah, I've got a boyfriend because your parents are that strict about it. Now, if your parents, so I wouldn't have come out as lesbian because my well, parents were I've just gone through that. You know, my kids tell me absolutely everything, right? And I really talk quite a bit. Kids, I make some confidence. No, it's not that bad. But what it is now, so my youngest now has started looking, he, he's met a girl. And he wanted to go and meet her, you know? And then, so when he took it, he went, oof, that wasn't as bad as I thought it'd be. I've been thinking about that all day. Aww. You know what I mean? And it, that's natural. Yeah. That's natural. That's your child naturally going into the next phase of their life. That is a milestone. That yeah. is not, that is the, the nervousness. That is natural. Yeah. No, it is natural. Now, my other child, um, oh, it was quite a different story there. He wanted us out of the way. I was scared to leave him on his own because he has mental health issues. I was thinking he wanted me out of the way to have him. Do you know what I mean? I didn't want to leave him alone in the house. And that went on for a couple of months until he was forced to the situation that he had to tell me because I was developing anxieties in other areas. I was petrified to leave him on his own kind of thing, you know? So two different scenarios. 
living in a house where both children know they can tell me absolutely everything. There's mm. there's no privacy in this house. Yeah. You know what I mean? I you know, I, I don't even think I'm gonna they just burst in in the middle of an argument, you know, when I'm in the toilet or whatever. It's just what, you know, there's no privacy in this house, okay? But even in those situations, that there, there's those little things to overcome. Yeah. You know, like um even down to it's the same as smoking. I smoke now. You know, kind yeah. of thing. Like these are milestones and these are and they're gonna naturally feel that nervousness. Yeah. You know, you can naturally feel that. And I, I remember as well, like how old twenty one I was when I was pregnant. I remember do you know what I mean? Trying to tell my father I was pregnant, like and he was like, Yes, oh first thing he said to me, Well, have you told the father yet? I was like, No. He said, Why? Yeah. I have to tell you for do you know what I mean? So this is natural. Yeah. So yeah. don't say you need this education to have these discussions because even in the best situations with the communication there and they told the communications there, you can talk about everything, there's, there is um, inhibitors. Yeah. It is li there's little hurdles to overcome and that's part of growing. Yeah. Not just growing up, that's part of growing in your family parent-child relationship that's part of our growth they adjust into their growth and their new experiences we have to adjust to the fact that they're growing up as well you know yeah. and that is the natural course nobody needs their child to come home from school walking in banging on about anal sex do you know what i mean is no that is not the natural way and if anything, because like they they also might put these arguments across saying, oh, they're seeing it anyway, it's best that they're learning it in the classroom. But why on earth would you want to keep putting their attention on these issues? But it's most like of them are consistently putting it in their brain. But they say, you know, they're seeing it any they know more than us these days. Well, actually, no, they don't. A lot of them are laying. Yeah. You know, a lot of them are pretending they've had sex. Yeah, they're going to brag, aren't they, Kim? Yes. Yeah. No, those teenagers I spoke to in Cardiff, <clears throat> right, when I was singing about the dildo and the condom, he said, oh, we did that. He said, I smacked my friend across the head today. Do you know what I mean? And um, I said, well, tell me, boys. I said, did that represent your your body? No, he said, but I told my friends it did. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, that's just but you know the, but what you were saying about people saying, oh, I would have come out uh, much earlier if I'd have had this education. All I can say is, you know, I've been alive for nearly 72 years and the amount that this society has leapt forward in talking about things in a more open way. And I don't, I used to think this is good. I really used to think, We've achieved something yeah. um, compared to maybe the way I was brought up, certainly the way my mother was brought up, mm. where children, you know, in Victorian times, children should be seen and not heard. You didn't discuss with your parents. You were told by your parents. In theory, obviously, every household is different. Yeah. But how far do we have to come before people can stand up for themselves and say to their parents, well, this is who I am. I'm, I'm sorry if you don't like it, but this is me. How, how much more evolved do we have to be? Because we've had all the laws for gays and equality, haven't we? Yeah. You know, they, they've been in place for, for years. So I, I, think, I think that's such a poor excuse. Well, it is. It, they're, comparing, they're comparing today's time with the time that... It was, you know, the gays were, it was, well, it was illegal. You couldn't, couldn't get married to same sex. Mm. Uh, same sex marriages didn't exist. When did that come in? It wasn't that long ago, was it? When? 2010, I'm sure. Was it David Cameron? I think you're right, Kim. I think it was Cameron. So it was so, David Cameron. So they came into power in 2010, coalition with Lib Dems. So that's when, so that was when that, so, you know, since then, people are talking, they're like my age or a little bit younger, and it's like, well, when we were younger, it was completely different. 
How can they compare? Like, it, being gay is completely accepted now by the majority of people. You but know, nobody is denying that, that there are incidents of phobia or stuff like that. Incidents. Incident, exactly. Yeah, it's always going to be denying it's incidents. Well, there well, are numbers out there, you know. Someone said the other day, okay, let's look at violence against women. How many women are getting killed a week in their own homes? Yeah, there's no exactly. comparison. There is absolutely exactly. no comparison at all. No, and and yet we had a transgender remembrance day, didn't we? And the flag was up on Cardiff yeah. Castle. I don't know where else it was up. And I I was looking at the comments underneath the post about this, and people were saying, "Where are the names? Who are these people?" Yeah. And it, anyway, it turns out that in the past three years. There was one transgender woman murdered, I think it was 2019, but that was almost sort of by, no, I'm not going to say by mistake, that would be crazy, but it was an attack that followed a previous attack. The man had attacked a woman with a knife in the neck and then somehow or other, I don't know the details, I don't know whether she died or not. She was hurt, obviously. And then somehow he ends up stabbing a and killing a transgender woman in her flat. I, I don't know how it happened. Yeah. It wasn't a targeted hate crime. It was, yes. He just killed yes. anyone. Because it, I, think, I think he was supposed to be a woman hater. So in a way... In a dark, horrible way, that was a compliment to her, you know, if that was the case. Yeah. But how many transgender people have actually killed women uh, in, in recent years? I'll tell you, know, you what about, we actually look at. three instances of it. Right, well, I'll tell you what we'll actually look at is, um, let's have a look at the rape charge for women. Let's explore that. There's no such thing as a rape charge for women. Now, don't quote me on these numbers, okay? You're going to have to Google it yourselves. There's no rape charge for women in this country, right? A woman can only get charged with a serious sexual assault, okay? So there's no such thing as a rape charge for women. But either it's either been since 2012 or 2016, I think we've had over 300 women charged with rape. Now, the reason why there's no such thing as a rape charge for women is because they don't have a penis, do I agree with our law? No, I don't. Am I thankful for our law now? Yes, because it tells us how many women have been raped, or how many men or women have been raped by somebody who is identifying as a female. Well, like I said, it's, it's over 300. Okay, it's over 300 either since 2012 or 2016. I can't remember the date. So that's either in the space of 10 years or it's in the space of six years. Either way, it's not good enough. Mm. It's horrific. Yeah. It needs to be looked at. It needs to be investigated. And we can't get away from that statistic, mind. The law is the law. A woman can't get charged for rape unless she has a penis. That's the law. You can't argue with that. And we don't want anybody to be murdered, killed, raped, or whatever. We don't want that. This is what we're trying to prevent. And wasn't something else going on in Scotland at the same time as the gender identity one? Wasn't there something about um, sex criminals that want to identify as women and presumably as men, but I mean, who's going to do, what woman is going to do that, um, can be taken into women's prisons? The, it's already happening anyway. Yeah, it's already happening. Yeah. It's already happening. But, but I th no, I think it was a bit more than that. That they, that it's going to be easy yeah. for them to identify as a woman. You know, right? But I think yeah. they're making the evening the gender yeah. reform bill. Isn't it something like you only have to live as a the opposite gender for three months, and then you can actually? I think it's two now. I think it's two. Two months. But let me just talk about that now, the prisoner issue, okay? So, 
when I was in prison back in 2001, I was on the Youth Offenders Institute, there was um, a trans in there then. But she wasn't allowed anywhere near us. And we only knew she was there because she was on exercise on her own. So when we were in the cells, we could see her. So she was never allowed anywhere near any of us. Whether that's through her child. Nobody's allowed near the young offenders anyway, right? Not even the wing next to us. We, we set that. You know, but she wasn't allowed anywhere near any of us, right? Like, that was like a, a known massive thing. So... When you go to prison, you get risk assessed, right? So that's one thing that it was 2001, there was just one there and they were kept away from everyone. But now let's look at things. When you go to prison, you're risk assessed anyway, okay? So you risk assessed, the first thing you do, you're going in the um, suicide prevention cell, that's the first thing. So everyone's risk assessed for different situations. You risk assessed to move wing, you risk assessed to move prison, that's how it goes. So, men are allowed to go to female prisons. But a woman identifying as a man can't go to a man's prison. Do you know why? Because it's assessment. It's too risky to put a woman in a man's prison, whether she identifies as a man or not. The risk assessment will not allow it. Mm. The risk on her. So what we are actually doing is Put a mess. So we got, you know, so we got a man who could potentially impregnate all these women. But if you put a woman in a man's jail, you know, the chances are they can only get pregnant once every nine months anyway. Do you know what I mean? But it's too risky to put the female to male in a man's prison. But it's okay to put a man in with the women. So again, that is not equality. That is not the same. That is not equal. That's not inclusive. That is twisted. It is. Yeah. 